Hi guys. I would like to invite you to the audiobook service where we upload more than 300 hours of different audiobooks a week, link in details in the video description. Chapter 126 Although Raijin Island is a small island, its area is considerable, and its terrain is quite unique, resembling an altar. The island is surrounded by flat beaches, making it easy to land on from any direction. Moving inland from the beaches, one would pass through a forest, after which the terrain abruptly rises like a towering wall. Climbing over this wall leads to another forest, followed by another wall-like cliff. This pattern repeats nine times on the island, with vibrant life visible up to the fifth layer. Beyond the fifth layer, there are hardly any green plants or animals, and lightning strikes from above, leaving craters in the ground. With each higher layer, the frequency of lightning increases, culminating in a forest almost constantly ablaze with lightning on the top layer, making it uninhabitable for humans. In Simon's words, it's the perfect place to obliterate any evidence anything thrown in there won't leave a trace, not even bones. This island is one of the many islands Nicholas seized from Whitebeard and Charlotte Linlin. Although the environment at the top layer is extremely harsh, the lower layers are quite fertile. The residents of the island call it the Island of Divine Gift, symbolizing it as a gift from the gods. The first layer is mostly forested, the second layer is used for farming, and although the third layer cannot be cultivated, it nurtures lush grasslands. Due to the abundant natural grass, the islanders raise many cattle and sheep on the third layer to meet their daily needs. For the islanders, they once thought that losing Whitebeard's protection would bring a ruthless ruler, but to their surprise, except for the initial arrival of a magical ship that stayed for a while, no one else appeared. Their lives remained unchanged, without any significant alterations. Sometimes backward places have their advantages, Simon remarked as he watched shepherds grazing in the distance. Having spent some time here, Simon's assessment of the island was that it was a great place to retire. I wonder how long the captain will take this time, Simon said, lying on the grass and looking at the lightning-laden mountaintop. Since the end of the battle on Cake Island, Nicholas had come to this island for training, leaving the affairs of the pirate crew to June, while Simon was stationed here. One day, on the grasslands of the third layer, herds of sheep moved in a direction, emitting unusual bleeding sounds. At the center of these herds, a huge rock was slowly undulating. A closer look would reveal a person carrying a huge rock, doing push-ups on the grass with both hands. The process of physical training was always monotonous, regardless of the method used. For physical training, the most important thing was not the method but perseverance. If one did not possess innate monstrous physical abilities like Kaido, Charlotte Lin Lin, or even Whitebeard, the best way was consistent, relentless training. For Simon, although snipers didn't necessarily need the same monstrous physical abilities, they still needed a certain level of self-defense, especially since close-quarters combat required good physical conditioning. Moreover, good physical fitness was essential for executing close-range marksmanship. He also agreed with Nicholas' statement that a sniper who can't fight is an imperfect sniper. Just as everyone thought that Nicholas and the others would quickly expand their influence after the battle on Cake Island. It was unexpectedly quiet, with no major actions taken, only occupying several islands mentioned earlier from Charlotte Lin Lin and Whitebeard. There were no other moves afterwards. Instead, Kaido and Big Mom began a frenzy of expansion, especially Big Mom's pirate crew, which went on several expeditions led by Big Mom herself, clearly aimed at acquiring devil fruits to rapidly strengthen their crew's power. As for the marines, apart from raising the bounties, there were no other actions, seeming to abandon the new world and let these guys wreak havoc in it. Although there were no major moves, all the forces couldn't help but focus on the freedom pirates, speculating on the meaning behind their actions. After all, the freedom pirates had become one of the strongest forces in the world, possessing the capital to stand on the pinnacle stage and compete for the title of Emperor of the Sea alongside other pirate crews. Not to mention, in terms of top combat power within the pirate crew, the freedom pirates were not inferior to the others. Not only did they have Nicholas, who nearly beheaded Big Mom in a one-on-one -on -one battle, facing Big Mom and Kaido without fear, but also Vista, who displayed such strength in the battle on Cake Island that the world was amazed. Although their strength in the middle and lower levels was not enough, for a pirate crew with top-notch powerhouses, it was not a problem. 
After all, the pirates in the New World were like fish in a river, as long as they showed their strength, there were plenty of pirates willing to join them under their command. After all, a pirate crew with the protection of powerhouses meant that they could roam freely in the New World, except for a few other top pirate crews. So it went. Time passed by, and in the blink of an eye, six years had passed. Looking back on the past six years, there have been many major events in the world, some of which have even caught the attention of countless powerhouses. These include Don Quixote family abandoning their celestial dragon identity and leaving Mariehua with their family to settle in the North Blue. And the family of Admiral Zephyr was brutally killed by pirates while on their way home for a family visit, infuriating Admiral Zephyr. In his anger, he destroyed the pirates and the island where they were hiding, turning them to ash. Afterward, he was immediately transferred to a newly established elite training camp in the Marines as the chief instructor. It was more of a protection than a punishment, given Zephyr's status and the embarrassing act of destroying an island. Thus, the Marines found themselves in an unprecedentedly awkward situation, with only one high-end combat force, Admiral, in their ranks. Although the world government and even the fleet admiral offered to appoint Zephyr as admiral multiple times, he refused each time. The marines officially entered a one fleet admiral one admiral mode. Fleet Admiral Sengoku Admiral Zephyr Chapter 127 An island in the North Sea that is not a member of the world government. Hey, you guys go over there and take a look. You guys go to the other end of the street. Today, we must catch those two guys, we absolutely can't let them escape. Today, we must teach those two scoundrels a lesson. A group of adults wielding sticks searched relentlessly in an alleyway, cursing loudly from time to time. Meanwhile, in the foul-smelling sewer, two children who looked to be only eight or nine years old were tightly curled up. The younger child trembled incessantly, tears mixing with the filth of the sewer. The older child, wearing sunglasses, held the younger one close, covering his mouth with his hand to stifle any cries that might attract the attention of the people outside. Carefully peering through the cracks in the sewer, he observed the movements of the people outside. Hey, did you find them? The voice from above made both children tense up. The younger child, with hair covering his eyes, trembled even more violently, while the older child with sunglasses showed signs of nervousness, gripping the makeshift spike made from a steel rod tightly in his hand. We couldn't find them. I don't know where those two brats could have run off to. We searched every trash can, and they were nowhere to be found. Are you sure those two bastards even came into this alley? Several people who had been blocking the other end of the alley approached, looking displeased. If we can't find them, forget it. This town isn't that big anyway. We'll teach them a lesson next time we run into those two brats. Ha ha ha, I never thought we'd see this day. Those high and mighty figures are no different from pigs and dogs after all. To be honest, we can only take advantage of them with our fists. Those who went to the mansion first got a lot of wealth. TSK TSK, that woman wasn't bad looking, but unfortunately, she's sick. If you're not afraid of death, you could try your luck. It's quite thrilling to trample on those once high and mighty figures. Why don't you go try it then? In the sewer, Amidst the filth and stench, the boy with sunglasses clenched the makeshift weapon in his hand, his veins bulging on his forehead. Rosinanti, stop crying. Get up quickly mom is waiting for us to bring food back. The boy with sunglasses wiped away Rosinanti's tears and the filth from his face, then cautiously lifted the sewer lid, keeping a wary eye outside to ensure nobody was around before emerging from the sewer. In the southeastern corner of the island, among piles of trash, Two children made their way toward a house constructed from wooden boards and various discarded items. As soon as they saw the house, the younger Rosinanti rushed toward it, while the boy with sunglasses first stripped off his wet, foul-smelling clothes, then approached a makeshift basin made from discarded bottles nearby. He scooped up seawater and poured it over his head. Cough cough. Hearing the intense coughing from inside the house, the boy with sunglasses, now bare-chested, patted his face to put on a smile before cautiously entering the house. Daffy, you're back. As he entered, a tall, thin man with golden hair and two beard streaks greeted him with a smile. However, 
Daffy didn't pay attention to the man but looked toward the only bed in the room, where a woman sat looking haggard. Cough. Daffy, I'm sorry. The woman coughed while gently stroking Rosinanti, who had buried his head in her lap. Mom, what are you talking about? Rosinanti and I found a lot of good food today. Once you eat and get better, you'll recover soon. Hearing the woman's words, Daffy suddenly looked panicked, constantly pleading with her. Mom, eat. Upon hearing this, Rosinanti hurriedly reached into his embrace and took out a half piece of bread, which already emitted a foul odor, and handed it to the woman. Mm. Watching the woman eat, both Daffy and Rosinanti showed smiles. For them, being able to eat meant they wouldn't die. After all, only the living ate. I never thought things would escalate to this point. Not all humans are human after all they are more like demons than demons. We just arrived, and the treasure we brought was all plundered by those guys. They even burned down our house. My friend, I am so naive. Please, my friend, I will do anything, even if you let my child and wife return to marry Geos first. My wife is seriously ill if she doesn't receive treatment soon, she will die. Please, if we stay here, our whole family will be killed. At night, Homing used his preserved Den Den Mushi to make a call to a friend known to marry Geos. Homing, this is the life you chose. Once something is abandoned, there's no turning back. When we advised you before, you told us you had always been human. You voluntarily abandoned your divine status and chose to become human. Even when I suggested you keep your identity chips as celestial dragons, you didn't care you even discarded all your family's identity chips. If you only abandoned your own identity chip, and your wife and child still had theirs, then I could have tried to petition the highest council to let your wife and child return to marry Geos. But unfortunately, you didn't heed this advice. Since you chose to consort with those humans, you must face the consequences. You, a mere human, shouldn't call us anymore. Click. As the Den Den Mushi was hung up, Homing's last hope was shattered. What Homing didn't know was that this phone call planted the seeds of demons in Daffy's heart. Chapter 128 Celestial Gold Is that the legendary celestial gold that can grant eternal life? Brooke widened his eyes in astonishment. Even he hadn't expected that the treasure mentioned in today's meeting would be this legendary gem. We only have some information at the moment, nothing confirmed yet. But according to the intelligence provided by the captain, that giant lantern fish that was sighted might very well be the enormous island-eating fish that caused alchemy to perish. June looked at the others calmly as she spoke. But does celestial gold really exist? The idea of something granting immortality always sounds strange, Simon voiced his doubts. The legend of celestial gold spread widely after alchemy disappeared, but the information about it granting eternal life came from an unknown source. After all, pirates, treasures, vanished islands, and giant monsters are practically the four main elements of maritime folklore. The legend of celestial gold does indeed exist, but the island of alchemy, where celestial gold was supposedly refined, disappeared over a hundred years ago. Nobody knows if this rumor is true or false. When I was sailing, many people still believed that finding the lost alchemy could grant immortality, Brooke added. Sitting at the far end, Katie tried to look mature as she pondered, moreover, celestial gold is said to grant humans eternal life, but according to the principle of equivalent exchange, there must be some unknown drawbacks to this eternal life. It's indeed hard to say. It's been too long, and no research materials related to it have been circulated. So, no one really knows the principle behind this legendary metal granting eternal life to humans, June supplemented. Yo ho ho ho. Eternal life is indeed a tempting concept, Brooke, the skeleton musician, chuckled. The others cast disdainful glances at Brooke because, after all, this guy who had eaten the yomi yomi nomi probably didn't even know when he would die. Just then, the door to the meeting room opened, and a man nearly two meters tall, with messy long hair and explosive power hidden beneath his clothes, walked in. Celestial gold isn't actually that complicated. It's simply the essence extracted from a large amount of gold through special means, mixed with other materials. It influences the wearer's body with the inert characteristics of the metal, slowing down cell aging, 
thus achieving the goal of immortality. However, the price to pay is that it's challenging for the wearer's strength to improve while wearing celestial gold ornaments. Captain. Seeing the newcomer, everyone in the meeting room stood up excitedly. It was unexpected for Nicholas to attend the meeting of the Freedom Pirates, considering he had chosen to seclude himself in training on Rygene Island. Which was covered with thunderstorms for most of the year, since the end of the Cake Island battle. However, nobody complained about it. After all, for the New World Pirates, the captain's strength was the best deterrent. The stronger the captain, the more transcendent the pirate group's position. Yeah, please be seated. Nicholas sat in the main seat and addressed the others. However, this kind of eternal life is more like pseudo-immortality. After all, a person's lifetime cell division is limited. Although celestial gold can delay this process, ultimately, death is inevitable. As the ship's manager and ship's doctor, June had a significant say. Upon hearing June's words, Simon expressed his disdain, so, it's not real eternal life. I thought that celestial gold could truly grant immortality. In that case, I might as well hope for Brooke to awaken his fruit before I die. Then, when I die, he can just bring me back from the underworld. Yo ho ho ho. Rest assured, I'll do my best. When the time comes, we'll all sail together as skeletons, Brooke joked. However, both June and Katie immediately rejected the idea. For young girls, becoming a skeleton was worse than being killed directly. So, Captain, are we going to fish for that giant lantern fish? Katie looked at Nicholas with anticipation. After all, the liver of the lantern fish, especially one as enormous as that, was a delicacy. Its ingredients must be even more delicious. But how do we fish for it? For such a monstrous creature, the bait needed to lure it must be massive, right? Katie thought of the giant lantern fish's size and felt somewhat at a loss. Fishing for such a large creature would be different from fishing for other fish. It's not that complicated. Based on my speculation, the reason that giant lantern fish swallowed Alchemy Island might have been attracted by the light of celestial gold. So, if we gather enough gold, we might be able to lure that lantern fish out. Gold? That's right. But there's one more thing, we must find the approximate range where that lantern fish usually appears. Otherwise, no matter how dazzling the light is, it won't be able to attract it across the vast ocean. Several days later, in a vast sea area, the water churned violently. The pirates on board were all in a panic, barely able to look down at the sea below. However, one glance almost scared them out of their wits. Underneath the sea surface, there appeared an enormous black shadow. This monstrous size even surpassed that of large sea king species, making their ship seem like mere shrimps in comparison. What kind of monster is this? Help! Quick, flee! Send a message to Lord Simon. Then, the enormous shadow gradually emerged from the sea surface, so immense that it was even larger than a medium-sized island. Finally, they could see clearly it was a giant lantern fish. What's even stranger was that its lantern was shimmering with dazzling light. At the same time, a huge ship raced towards them from a distance, so fast that it seemed to split the ocean apart. The five figures on the deck, including one skeleton, showed no fear in the face of this creature almost as large as a medium-sized island. What an impressive creature, Vista, holding an axe, tightened his grip, as if he could chop down this behemoth with his axe. After all, for those who wielded blades, facing such a large creature made them want to take a few swings. Fish of this size are challenging to deal with, Katie, standing beside Vista with twin swords at her waist, said with a troubled expression. After all, such a massive size would make it inconvenient even to cut with flying slash attacks. As they spoke, the enormous lantern fish, shimmering with dazzling light, finally opened its gaping maw to swallow the entire sea. Meanwhile, the sea sovereign ship was speeding towards the mouth of the giant lantern fish. For Nicholas and his crew, even if they were swallowed, there wouldn't be much danger. As for the pirates responsible for searching for the lantern fish, after some contemplation, surprisingly, not many of them chose to escape from the giant lantern fish's swallowing range. 
Evidently, upon seeing Nicholas and his crew's actions, these people also realized that there was something extraordinary inside the lantern fish. Without greed, without desire, would they be pirates? Chapter 129 Facing the abyssal maw that seemed like a black hole, Nicholas stood at the bow of the ship without a trace of fear. In the end, the pirate ship and a large amount of seawater that appeared in this area were all swallowed by a gigantic lantern fish. Then, this enormous lantern fish contentedly swam towards the deep sea. Like drifting along, entering the mouth of the lantern fish, they followed the huge water currents from the throat of the gigantic lantern fish into its esophagus, and finally slid into its stomach. Because the lantern fish's lantern light was very strong, strong enough to penetrate the body and illuminate the interior, so what the people saw after falling down was not darkness. Ah! What is this, it hurts, it's so hot. Help, someone help. Me. Ah! The ship is melting, we need to find a way out quickly. The lantern fish had three enormous stomachs, each filled with many small islands, all of which had been swallowed by this gigantic lantern fish over hundreds of years, and flowing between the islands was the highly corrosive stomach acid. This stomach acid could corrode even metals given enough time, let alone human bodies. Pirates unlucky enough to fall into the stomach acid would be dissolved into nothingness in a matter of seconds. Without flight capabilities or sturdy enough ships, there was simply no chance of escaping from here. They could only silently wait for death on the islands within the gigantic lantern fish's stomach. Furthermore, because this gigantic lantern fish contained celestial gold, even if one wanted to die, it wasn't so easy. All that awaited them was endless suffering. Hey hey, am I seeing things? Oh my god, is that? Many lucky pirates who hadn't fallen into the stomach acid regained their senses and looked at the distant islands with disbelief. Before their eyes, the beaches of those islands were all covered in golden sand, with various precious gems scattered on top. So, after realizing this, the pirates who had narrowly escaped disaster rowed desperately towards the nearby islands. Fortunes awaited them today these treasures were comparable to the legendary treasures of some infamous pirates. According to the speculation, the island of alchemy, where the celestial gold is located, should be in the deepest third stomach. And where we are now is the edge of the first stomach, which means we still need to go further down. June said lightly while sitting on a chair on the deck of the Sea Sovereign. After a while, Nicholas and his companions finally arrived at Alchemy Island in the third stomach. After easily destroying the mechanisms along the way, Nicholas and his companions entered the laboratory, where the first thing that caught their eye was fist-sized celestial gold shining in cylindrical vessels. So, this is celestial gold. It doesn't look any different from regular gold. Brooke marveled as he examined this metal that was said to grant immortality. Gold that shines by itself. Simon exclaimed in amazement. Although he didn't fully believe the legends about celestial gold, seeing it before his eyes left him no choice but to believe. Heh, if it weren't for the need for celestial gold to accomplish our plan, I wouldn't even bother acquiring this pseudo-immortality. Nicholas looked at the celestial gold in the cylindrical vessel in his hand, which could drive countless powerful figures crazy, and said disdainfully. For him, celestial gold might grant someone a long life, but it would also imprison the holder's power. And in this vast ocean, what good was a long life without strength? Sometimes, immortality was also a form of torment. After taking all the treasure Nicholas tore the fish's stomach, and they left towards a special place. The land of Wayno is a rare and special island in the New World. It is surrounded by sea currents and waterfalls, making it a naturally fortified stronghold. It can be said that this special geographical environment has kept Wayno almost constantly closed off. After all, even ordinary pirate crews would be deterred by the sea currents and waterfalls. Even with a large fleet, it would be difficult to climb up from the sea currents and attack Wayno, let alone launching an attack on Wayno itself. However, this kind of highly desirable defensive advantage, in front of the sea sovereign on the sea, is like a paper tiger. With the ability to fly, the sea sovereign doesn't even need to climb the sea currents and waterfalls to effortlessly arrive above Wayno. This should be the flower capital of Wayno. It's really prosperous. Simon couldn't help but speak as they flew over the city. 
Nicholas stood against the wind at high altitude, looking down at the city streets and the bustling scenery of the flower capital without saying a word. The scenery of the flower capital was indeed incredibly prosperous, but the rest of Wayno was not as good. At least the lives of the people in other areas were not as good. The castle, built on the mountaintop and surrounded by giant pine trees, was too conspicuous. The construction of such magnificent buildings undoubtedly required a huge amount of money, as well as a large amount of labor to complete. It's unknown if it's a unified plan by the royal families of this world, but they always build their castles at the highest point of their territories to showcase their unique status. Even Fishman Island, located tens of thousands of meters below the sea, hangs Ryugu Palace high above. Soon, Nicholas and his companions anchored the ship in a secluded area of Ueno's inland sea, leaving Brook and Vista to watch the ship while the others went to the flower capital. The reason for leaving the two behind is that their features are too conspicuous. Although it's difficult for Ueno to get news from the outside world due to its closed nature, it's still better to avoid trouble if possible. Walking on the streets of the flower capital, it must be said that the happiness index of those living in the flower capital is quite high. At least Nicholas, who has traveled all the way, has found that everywhere in the flower capital is bustling with prosperity. Soon, as Nicholas walked on the street, he suddenly stopped and turned around to look back. It was a good thing he turned around. When he did, he saw the face of the person reaching out to him, and Nicholas was stunned for a moment. Then, he quickly reacted, regained his normal expression, but the shock in his heart could not be dispelled for a while. The person standing behind him, who had followed him for a long time, was a stranger in his twenties. He had short black hair, wore Wayno clothing, stepped on Wayno style wooden clogs, and held a light brown wooden staff. What particularly caught the eye were his tightly closed eyes, and on the left side of his forehead, there were two intersecting scars, each crossing his left and right eyes. His face was filled with sorrow, and if it were an ordinary person, they would probably only see him as a young man who had unfortunately lost his sight and was melancholic. But how could Nicholas not recognize that the person before him was none other than Fujitora, who would become one of the three admirals of the navy after the summit war in the original timeline? Of course, the name Fujitora is similar in meaning to Kizaru Akiji Akainu. It is a special code name for the navy admiral. The real name of the blind youth before him should be Isho. I wonder what the gentleman has been following me for all this time. Nicholas looked at the future great figure, Isho, and asked calmly. Although Isho's strength would be incredibly formidable in the future, Nicholas, at this moment, wasn't afraid in the least, even against the future Admiral Fujitora. Please don't misunderstand. I only noticed the deep animosity you harbor towards this country, so I wanted to ask what exactly you intend to do. Isho made a slight bow. The gesture he made seemed to be too low-key. Nicholas looked at Isho, who had lost his sight, and said calmly, I don't intend to do anything to this country. I simply loathe it. Hate. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, Isho was momentarily stunned, then repeated Nicholas's words in a murmuring voice. Chapter 130 Yes, it's loathing, Nicholas affirmed. With that, Nicholas turned to leave, and Isho, using a cane, followed Nicholas's footsteps. Didn't I make it clear enough? And with your strong observation hockey, is it necessary to pretend to be blind? Don't you know how disrespectful it is to those who are truly blind? Nicholas asked, slightly irritated. However, Isho shook his head lightly and earnestly replied to Nicholas, I have never pretended to be blind, and as for observation hockey, I have not used it. Inner demons? Nicholas thought but didn't comment, understanding that Isho's blindness might be a result of inner turmoil, especially given Isho's current state, before becoming the Admiral Fujitora. Anyway, if you want to follow, then follow, Nicholas continued, moving forward. Soon, Nicholas and his group arrived at a luxurious tavern in the flower capital. Nicholas even generously treated Isho to a meal. However, to his surprise, Isho's expression turned hesitant after tasting a piece of sashimi. Isho looked around the table with his blind eyes, showing signs of indecision. What's wrong, brother? Katie, who was eating lobster nearby, asked in confusion. Is there something wrong with the food? It's the food, but it's not just the food, 
Isho replied with a troubled expression. After pondering for a while, he turned to Nicholas and earnestly said, I apologize for the intrusion, but I feel compelled to speak my mind. Go ahead, your words are yours, but whether I listen or not is up to me, Nicholas replied nonchalantly. Though I lead a humble life, if I'm not mistaken, these dishes are made from top-grade ingredients. The cost of this one dish could cover a family of four for a month, right? Isho sighed and continued, do you know how many poor people in Wayno go hungry and lack proper clothing? Nicholas listened quietly, understanding Isho's point. Fine, I know. But what does that have to do with me? Nicholas replied indifferently. Isho was momentarily taken aback by Nicholas's response. But. Before Isho could continue, Nicholas interrupted, I'm not the ruler of this country. Why should I care about the lives of ordinary people? Moreover, if those people can't feed themselves, why don't they reclaim what's rightfully theirs from those who exploit them? I'm not a saint I'm not that compassionate. I was wrong, Isho murmured, realizing that changing Nicholas's perspective wouldn't be easy. Isho sighed and continued, it's ironic. I blinded myself to escape the ugliness of the world, thinking that blindness would give me clarity. But now, I see that I was naive. Although blind, I was only deceiving myself. Isho then shared his encounters with the ruling elite of Wayno, who cared little for the common people's suffering, which only deepened his disappointment. Nicholas remained silent, prompting Isho to conclude that his methods might have been flawed. I've also calmed down and pondered whether I've been too hasty. In the following years, I traversed the entire Wayno and actively observed the nobility. However, almost without exception, these nobles are all indulgent and arrogant. They disregard the lives of commoners, caring only for their own interests. In their eyes, the lives of ordinary people are worth less than that of a hunting dog. In some places, samurais even take pleasure in using commoners for sword practice. It's incredibly disappointing. After finishing speaking, Isho intended to leave, considering the starving children he had witnessed and feeling guilty for indulging in such extravagant food. Wait. After some thought, Nicholas felt he couldn't let Isho leave so easily and quickly called out to him. As Isho turned around, Nicholas said, Since you've said so much, have you ever thought about what methods to use to change the situation of ordinary people in this world? Of course, I have, Isho replied, somewhat surprised by Nicholas's question. As I mentioned before, I've tried to approach the Wayno general to offer suggestions, but unfortunately, he ignored me. If those methods didn't work, have you considered that your approach might be flawed? Nicholas asked. Approach? Isho's brow furrowed. Yes, approach. If the gentle approach doesn't work, why not try the forceful one? Simply use your strength to tell Odin Kazuki that if he doesn't listen to your advice, you'll find someone else to be the general. But since ancient times, the general of Wayno has been from the Kazuki family. If I were to do that, I'd be opposing the entire country, Isho said, feeling conflicted. You want to empower those downtrodden, so why fear such a confrontation? It seems you've been brainwashed by the Kazuki family, Nicholas observed. Feeling lost, Isho recounted his futile attempts to reason with Odin Kazuki, who dismissed his proposals based on tradition. Nicholas suggested that Isho join the Marines, believing that serving there would broaden Isho's perspective and possibly change his outlook. He even offered his connections to help Isho join the Marines. After considering Nicholas's proposal, Isho reluctantly agreed. Chapter 131 Hey, is what you said true? Inside a tavern in the town of Bakura, a voice of incredulity suddenly rang out. Of course it's true. My wife's brother's wife's brother's son's friend's brother is a guard at Lord Kazuki's estate, and he saw it with his own eyes. Apparently, those thieves who broke into Lord Kazuki's estate were all under the notorious daimyo, Kazuki Odin, from Kuri. That can't be possible. While Kazuki Odin does have a bad reputation, as the heir to the Wayno general, he wouldn't need to resort to such acts, would he? Heh, even you know about the drama of their father-son estrangement that ended in reconciliation, allowing Kuri, who once had a special status in Wayno, to come under the general's rule. Maybe it's the general's arrangement. 
It not only gives Odin a lot of prestige but also allows him to use his powerful force to suppress the cancer that is Kuri in Wano. Since Kuri came under the general's name, the income of the general's estate has skyrocketed. As the customers in the tavern discussed animatedly, a man wearing a kimono and standing nearly two meters tall approached with a bowl of sake, curious. What's this about theft at Lord Kazuki's estate? It's Boskwa, the customers greeted Nicholas with a smile. After all, everyone in Bakura knew Boskwa of Quint Tavern to be benevolent, despite the unfortunate incident where his wife was disfigured in a fire and had to wear a mask daily. Nevertheless, she still occasionally helped the townsfolk by providing free medical treatment. It's impossible not to know those rascals wouldn't miss out on free money like that. When they saw those guys take the money from Lord Kazuki's estate, they went straight to Flower Capital. First, they bought luxurious clothing from head to toe, and they even spent a lot of money to replace their weapons. You see, many of the warriors in Lord Kazuki's estate haven't changed their weapons for many years. And those guys who caused the Mountain God uprising back then, they haven't compensated those who lost their homes to the Mountain God one bit. And that same Mountain God is now under Odin's command in Kuri. Rascals will always be rascals they won't think too much, even if they become warriors. Uncle, your appetizers are ready. At that moment, Katie, dressed in a cute kimono, approached with two plates of appetizers. Eh, Miss Hinata, we didn't order this grilled eel. Surprised to see the grilled eel on the table, the customers thought there had been a mistake. No, Mr. and I said since you're regular customers, this grilled eel is on the house. Then, the customers followed Katie's gaze and saw Mrs. June nodding towards them with her mask on. She's so kind, our lady. The customers quickly thanked her. Boss, I'm back. At that moment, Simon, dressed as a waiter, and the towering Vista returned to the tavern with bags of supplies and ingredients. After handing a handwritten letter to Isho, Nicholas and his group settled in Bakura. After all, compared to other places in Wano, Bakura was more suitable for hiding. At night, while the tavern's door remained closed, a room deep inside the tavern was illuminated. Inside, everyone sat cross-legged on tatami mats. Captain, Vista and I went to Flower Capital, and it seems the current Wano general isn't Kazuki Odin anymore. If I'm not mistaken, the current Kazuki Odin is actually an imposter created by Kurizumi Mochio using his devil fruit powers. And it seems that the current daimyo of Kuri, Kazuki Odin, doesn't seem to have noticed. At this point, Simon, looking perplexed, glanced at Nicholas and said, are they really father and son? How can a father and son not know that the other is an imposter? According to Simon, Odin's displayed strength, even in the new world, made him a formidable opponent. But for such a powerful person not to notice his own father being impersonated seemed incredulous. Who knows? Perhaps, it's just like his rumored personality in Wano, not recognizing his own father is a basic trait. Nicholas nonchalantly replied. He was only interested in Wano because he was waiting for someone only Odin could encounter, and he wasn't particularly interested in other events happening there. Coincidentally, Nicholas had even seen a Shimatsuki member on one occasion, a man who bore a striking resemblance to Zoro, which almost made Nicholas question if he had traveled through time. Hey, are you sure this is the place? In a narrow alley outside the tavern, several men dressed in stealthy attire were scrutinizing the tavern in the distance. How the hell would I know? The boss said this is the place. The one questioned appeared irritated. He was just a grunt following orders whatever his superior said, he did. Should we move now? Let's wait. We'll slip in when those guys in there are asleep. As the words fell, the men decided to wait a while longer, planning to sneak in after everyone in the tavern had fallen asleep. Yo ho ho ho. Just then, a figure cloaked in eerie green dashed past them from the end of the alley. Hey, did you guys hear that? The last person in the group, sweating profusely and swallowing hard, asked anxiously. What? What are you on about now? The others, annoyed by the sudden question, looked at him with displeasure. Seeing that the others seemingly hadn't heard anything, the questioner suddenly felt the dark alley behind him become eerily sinister. It was like walking alone at night, feeling someone's gaze from the shadows. Summoning his courage to look back, 
he saw a skull, emanating an eerie green glow and surrounded by ghostly flames, staring back at him. A ghost. A piercing scream shattered the silence of the night. Then, he bypassed the others and bolted towards the main street, as if he had encountered a ghost. What ghost? There's no such thing as ghosts in this world. Seeing his companion yelling about ghosts and fleeing in panic, the others scoffed. Yeah, where are the ghosts? At that moment, the group suddenly heard a voice not belonging to any of them, and they stiffly turned their necks to look deep into the alley. A ghost. With that, the legend of the vengeful spirit of a warrior who died unjustly a century ago and would emerge from the alleys of Bakura at night to claim the lives of the living began to spread in the town. Chapter 132 Did you guys hear the sound last night? The next day, many people in the tavern were enthusiastically discussing the events of last night. It was evident that many had heard the piercing scream that cut through the darkness. I heard it. It was eerie. I heard it was a few guys who were planning to steal, but accidentally ran into a ghostly skeleton. Heh <laughs> heh, want to know the details? Do you know? Upon hearing this, many turned their attention to the speaker. The man, feeling proud under the gaze of the others, explained, of course I do. It was my wife's brother-in-law's wife's brother's son's friend's brother who serves as a guard at Lord Odin's mansion. He told me about it. Those guys were caught by the patrolling warriors. Tell us what happened exactly. Many became interested at this point. Ahem, let me clear my throat. The man cleared his throat and tapped the table lightly with the empty bowl in his hand. Seeing this, others quickly poured him some more wine. After taking a sip, the man spoke, it's similar to what you heard. Indeed, someone did run into a ghost last night. According to those guys, it was a half-bodied skeleton, filled with the resentment of death. Flames of the underworld surrounded him, and anyone touched by them would turn to ashes. It seems that the skeleton was once a ruthless warrior who died in battle long ago in Bakura, known as the Executioner Slasher. However, Lord Odin has already sent for a monk from the Great Temple in Flower Capital to suppress the evil spirit. It won't be long before it's taken care of. After finishing his story, the man took another sip of wine and noticed a skeleton decoration on the tavern wall. Boss Gua, what's that? The man looked puzzled as he pointed to the skeleton on the wall. Oh, that's just a decoration. My wife uses it to practice bone setting. After all, only with persistent training can one better help the injured. Nicholas explained with a smile, looking at the skeleton decoration. Since their identities were well disguised, even Vista, the small giant, wasn't too surprising in the world of pirates. However, a talking skeleton would draw too much attention. After unanimous agreement, Brooke became one of the decorations in the tavern. Brooke readily accepted, especially after Nicholas told him that in his soul state, he could see all sorts of interesting things in the women's bathhouse. Nine Miles, the port of Curry. A large three-masted ship, resembling a giant white whale, lay stranded on the beach. The ship's three masts were broken, the sails torn, and the hull damaged. Clearly, this ship had sustained severe damage while climbing the waterfall in Wayno. We did climb the waterfall, but why are there islands and a sea here? It seems someone lives on the island. We don't have to worry too much about supplies now. I never thought the ship's hold would flood. Most of our supplies and provisions are unusable. Haha, <laughs> that's my fault. I didn't expect so many reefs in that waterfall. The navigator said apologetically. I'm going to the island to see if there are any settlements and collect supplies. Anyone want to come with me? A voluptuous beauty with bluish hair smiled and asked the others. I'll go, I'll go. Me, and me. I'm Mrs. Guard Dog. I want to go too. A small guy with a pineapple-like head also raised his hand. Little guy, you stay here and help with the ship repairs as an intern. Going to collect supplies with Miss is not your turn. Jozu, what are you talking about? I'm very strong. Don't forget I have the mythical Zoan devil fruit power of the undying bird. Marco, strength? Didn't someone get chased around by a bunch of flame chickens like little foals last time? The undying bird? I think it's more like a ground chicken. 
With Jozu's words, everyone burst into laughter. You. You. Thinking of the embarrassing moment when he was chased around by a flock of flame eagles, Marco's face turned black, and a bluish-green flame began to emanate from his body. Marco, wipe it off. A simple-looking guy standing nearby handed Marco a piece of cloth, indicating he should wipe it off first. Thank you, Thatch. Before Marco could finish, the simple guy continued, it smells. Marco. Ha, huh, that's our esteemed undying bird Marco for you. Ha. Huh. Seeing Marco's embarrassment, Jozu laughed again. It seemed that having an intern on the ship indeed brought a lot more fun. After wiping his head, Marco looked at Whitebeard with resentment, Dad, you must have noticed what happened just now with your observation hockey, right? Why didn't you remind me? To Marco, it was not just about Jozu and the others not reminding him. How could even Whitebeard not remind him? Marco, people need to grow. Do you expect me to remind you on the battlefield in the future, my dear son? Whitebeard reached out and rubbed Marco's phoenix head, seemingly not minding the lump of excrement that was just there. Chapter 133 At this moment in Hakamai, Nicholas watched as June held a booklet printed with Wano country characters and translated the Wano country text on it. In a nearby small box, there were several similar booklets. These texts were actually quite valuable, considering there were only a few booklets and each one cost Nicholas a box of gold pieces. But Nicholas didn't consider them unworthy because most of the content in these booklets contained the closely guarded secrets of various swordsmanship and martial arts schools in Wano country. If these swordsmanship schools found out, they would likely organize forces to retaliate against Nicholas. After all, these teachings were the foundation of their existence. The reason they could dominate over the common people in Wano country was because of the powerful techniques they possessed. For ordinary citizens in Wano, aspiring to become a warrior was one of the main paths to elevate their status. Another way was to pledge allegiance to a daimyo or general, becoming their personal warrior. As for peasants, they had no chance to become warriors the cost of learning swordsmanship and the expenses of a warrior's equipment were beyond their means. As for how Nicholas acquired these materials, it was simple. He bought them from the Flower Capital's military government. As the head of the most profitable organization in Wano, the military government had accumulated the secret teachings of various martial arts schools and even the secret techniques of the families loyal to the Kazuki clan. Now that the military government had been infiltrated by Kaido and the Kurizumi clan, they needed ample funds for their plans. So when Simon approached them in disguise, the two sides quickly reached a cooperation agreement. The night when the covert team sent by Kaido was scared away by Brook in the alley of the tavern, they were there to eliminate Simon and his group. Facing Simon's extravagant spending, they wanted to eliminate him to prevent potential future problems. I never expected these samurai to be so imaginative. Single sword style, two sword style, three sword style, four sword style, and even eight sword style. Katie looked at the translated booklets in amazement. For her, her main focus was swordsmanship, and she never imagined that the samurai of Ueno would be so diverse in their styles. Single sword style was the most common on the sea, as it was easy for beginners to grasp. Two sword style required more skill but was not uncommon. Three sword style was rarer since humans only had two arms it was said that one might not encounter a practitioner even among a hundred swordsmen. As for the eight sword style, it seemed that only the octopus fishmen of the fishman race could achieve it. However, according to the eight sword style school in Wano, it could be accomplished using special tools, grasping weapons with various joints of the body, mouth, and hands. Moreover, when mastered, the moves could be as graceful as a dance, stunning opponents. However, Vista just muttered, all this fancy stuff. Regarding swordsmanship, just observe and learn. The top swordsmen on the sea have all developed their own styles. Merely learning from others will never lead you to the pinnacle of swordsmanship, Nicholas said as he tossed a booklet called Flower Swordsmanship onto the table. Understood, Captain, Katie replied, looking at Nicholas. When Nicholas turned to Brooke, the skeleton was quietly staring at his own hands, seemingly contemplating life. Brooke? Oh. Brooke slowly raised his head to meet Nicholas's somewhat puzzled gaze and said seriously, 
Captain, I specialize in the swift sword style. These things won't affect me. Besides, didn't you already point out my swordsmanship? It's the wraith sword style. Oh, are you? He he he, I'm just pondering. It seems I can't practice this so-called Ryuo. After all, I'm just a skeleton now. Brooke laughed. Ah. Uh. Nicholas couldn't help but glance at Brooke's well-polished bones, shining like jade. He fell silent. Hockey was indeed a significant weakness for Brooke. Hockey was a manifestation of physical strength, akin to observation hockey for the mind and conqueror's hockey for the soul. Without a physical body, Brooke couldn't use hockey, let alone the advanced form like Ryuo. Vista, you should grasp the techniques of flower sword style and Ryuo as soon as possible. If you have any questions, you can come to me. Captain, should I change to sword? Vista inquired. Though your body size is good for heavy weapons, but I think swords are more compatible with you. While learning Ryuo you might get to understand your own sword style, take inspiration from the flower swordsmanship book I gave you. Nicholas looked at Vista and said. Captain, have you already mastered it? Simon looked at Nicholas incredulously. Nicholas extended his arm and clenched his fist, enveloping his entire arm with Ryuo Haki. Wow! Seeing this scene, Simon was utterly incredulous. After dissipating the Ryuo Haki on his arm, Nicholas said, Actually, it's not as complicated as you think. It's like wrapping your body with armament Haki, just release it. As long as your armament Haki reaches a certain level, mastery is only a matter of time. In fact, you can think of Ryuo as an armor layer outside the body. Is that so? Captain? As Vista spoke, Ryuo Haki also enveloped his fist, but unlike Nicholas, his Ryuo was still unstable. That's right. But you need to stabilize it, just like proficiently wrapping armament Haki during battles. Nicholas wasn't surprised by Vista's quick comprehension. After all, Vista's proficiency in armament hockey was second only to himself on the ship. Wow! Brooke, Katie, and Simon were all dumbfounded as they looked at Vista, who was smiling foolishly. They never expected this guy with thick eyebrows and big eyes to be this talented. Just then, the window of the bar was pushed open, and a majestic falcon flew in, flapping its wings. However, its two wise eyes reduced its majesty quite a bit. Cough, June. Can't you change its appearance? Maybe give it some medicine. Watching the silly bird constantly bumping its head against June's feet and cooing, Nicholas couldn't help but speak. June smiled and rubbed the head of the walking chicken, saying, There's nothing I can do. Last time, it drank a potion that could unleash its potential. Once the effect wore off, it returned to its original state. By the way, this little one said, There are pirates appearing in Ida Port in Curry. It seems their ship has run aground there. Captain, should we go check it out? Simon eagerly asked, showing that during their time in Hakamai, his body was getting rusty from lack of action. You all stay here and watch over the ship. I'll go take a look. With that, Nicholas walked out, stepping on his wooden clogs. Chapter 134 The Land of Nine, Curry. Within the Curry Castle, Kazuki Odin was in the study perusing various navigation books. Suddenly, he heard a commotion outside, with snippets of phrases like, Ida. Pirates. Foreigners. Stranded at sea, faintly audible. Upon hearing this, Odin felt a stirring in his DNA, promptly setting down his books and grabbing his swords, aim no habakiri in Enna, before heading outside. Soon, Odin spotted someone reporting to the officials in the Kuri castle. What's this about pirates you mentioned just now? Odin interjected as soon as he appeared. The two commoners reporting, visibly trembling before the towering figure of Odin, hastily responded. Odin-sama, it's like this. Today, we were planning to go to the beach to see if we could find some seafood, but unexpectedly, near Ida Port, we saw a large ship stranded on the beach. It was evident that the pirates had encountered a maritime disaster. The ship, comparable to the size of a castle in Kuri, was stranded there. And many people disembarked from the ship. We were afraid of being discovered by them, so we didn't dare linger and immediately came to report. 
After they finished, they anxiously awaited Odin's response. After all, according to the laws of the Land of Nine, reporting foreign ships to the local lord promptly would fetch them a handsome reward. All right, I understand. Go to the warehouse later to receive your reward. The castle official, aware of the two men's intentions, impatiently dismissed them. Obviously, such commoners didn't warrant much attention from him. Thank you, thank you, my lord. The two men, accustomed to the official's attitude, kept thanking him repeatedly. Odin. Just as the castle official was about to discuss countermeasures with Odin, he realized that Odin, who had been standing there, had vanished without a trace. What? Odin Sama went to the coast. Why didn't you stop him? We must hurry and stop Odin Sama. We must not let Odin Sama come into contact with those pirates. I'll go after Odin Sama now. You go inform Ashura Doji and Rezo. Upon hearing the castle official's words, Kinnaman, the gatekeeper, immediately set off to intercept Odin. Knowing Odin well, if he couldn't stop him, Odin would surely demand to accompany those pirates on their journey. And with Odin's strength, those pirates would hardly be able to refuse. Wait for me, Odin Sama. As Kinnaman rushed towards Idaport, he silently prayed in his heart. Kinnaman, where are you going? Just before leaving the castle, Kenjuro shouted at Kinnaman, but obviously, Kinnaman had no time for him, merely saying, Odin Sama is heading to Idaport. I need to stop him. And he continued on his way. Upon hearing this, Kenjuro's expression changed, and he hurriedly followed after Kinnaman. Is Odin Sama going to drive away the pirates on the coast? Denjiro couldn't help but ask as he caught up to Kinnaman. If only he could drive away the pirates. Kinnaman, hearing the rumors about the pirates in Idaport, felt somewhat troubled. I heard there are pirate ships in Idaport. Yes, and unlike the previous shipwrecks with casualties, this time the pirate crew only had their ship stranded. And it's said that the stranded ship is as huge as the castle of the Curry Lord. I wonder what fate awaits those pirates this time. After all, this is the first time under Odin Sama's rule that pirates have landed on Curry, right? It should be the same as the practices in other regions, directly beheading those pirates and putting them on display. Hey, you guys step back, there's someone formidable coming this way. Whitebeard's expression suddenly turned serious as he looked towards the coast, where a huge earth dragon made of smoke and dust was swiftly approaching. Along the way, all the trees were being destroyed as if by a fierce beast. Is it an enemy? Jozu's eyes narrowed, as he used his powers, and the other members of the Whitebeard pirates also brandished their weapons. For them, they feared no enemy. As Whitebeard and his crew stood ready, a gigantic figure leaped from the forest on the coast, wielding two swords and swinging towards Whitebeard. As Odin swung his swords, Whitebeard also wielded his Najinata, meeting Odin head-on. With the clash of their weapons, the conqueror's hockey emitted by both sides permeated the surroundings, causing several members of the Whitebeard pirates to faint from the overwhelming pressure. Is that guy like you, with conqueror's hockey just like dad? Marco shielded his eyes with his arm, watching the two figures clash, his expression serious. Although he had only recently joined Whitebeard's crew, Marco knew well that opponents with Conqueror's Hockey were quite formidable. That guy is formidable, but Dad isn't using his full strength, otherwise that guy would have been lying on the ground long ago. Jozu, keeping an eye on the battlefield, responded, and the other members of the Whitebeard pirates nodded in agreement. To them, it seemed that Whitebeard was wary of the opponent's identity. After all, the Moby Dick was severely damaged and would require at least a week for repairs. If the guy in front of them was a big shot on this island, knocking him down would only lead to more trouble later. If only you could drive away the pirates. Kinnaman couldn't help but murmur as he observed the confrontation between the two. I am called Kazuki Odin. Although I don't know you, and you don't know me, please take me aboard your ship. Odin, continuing to attack Whitebeard, earnestly spoke. Upon hearing this, Whitebeard became even more certain that the guy before him was not in his right mind. Taking such a person aboard his ship would only spell trouble. Moreover, for him, the Whitebeard pirates were gradually becoming like his family. He wouldn't allow outsiders to disrupt the harmony of his family. 
Facing the strange enemy before him, Whitebeard decided not to hold back anymore. He used his Najinata to block the opponent's attacks while channeling his conqueror's hockey to envelop his left fist. With a loud thud, Odin was sent flying by Whitebeard's punch. Chapter 135 Thrown by Whitebeard's full force punch, Kazuki Odin crashed onto the ground in the distance. His vision started to blur, experiencing a sensation he had never felt before due to the sheer power of the attack. Ha ha ha. After a moment, Odin, in a sorry state, lay on the ground and burst into hearty laughter. This was what he had been tirelessly seeking everything in the land of Wano was just too dull. That guy is laughing after getting punched. Jozu watched with surprise as Odin, bloodied and seemingly on the verge of death, laughed heartily. Who knows? Maybe that guy's just crazy. Marco shrugged nonchalantly. Damn it. Just as Whitebeard was about to return to the Moby Dick, a large group of people suddenly emerged from the jungle, heading straight for Odin. Do you know who this is? This is the Lord of Kuri, the future heir to the land of Wano. How dare you attack Lord Kazuki Odin like this? Kinnaman, brandishing his long sword, expressed his anger. In their eyes, it was a grave offense to harm a person of Odin's stature. Oh, so he's a lord from Kuri. The members of the Whitebeard Pirates remained indifferent. Seeing Odin's subordinates berating them, Marco was furious. Attacking Lord Odin. Have you no shame? Faced with the accusations from Odin's subordinates, Marco and the others responded with equal vehemence. You dare to attack the Whitebeard Pirates? I'll make you regret it. Marco's body ignited with azure flames, his arms taking on the shape of wings. Enough, Kinnaman. Odin, who had stopped laughing, propped himself up from the ground and raised his hand to stop Kinnaman. Odin Sama. Kinnaman looked at the heavily injured Odin with concern, but what no one noticed was the smile that crept onto Odin's face. For him, he had waited for this moment for over twenty years. These few days wouldn't make much of a difference. He would first pacify Kinnaman and the others, and then establish a connection with Whitebeard later. Once the ship was repaired, everything would be smooth sailing. All right then, when the ship is fixed, we'll leave. Hearing Odin's words, Whitebeard nodded. Hey, Denjiro, post a notice in Curry's Lord's residence recruiting craftsmen. After Odin and his entourage departed, Whitebeard sat on a crate, frowning as he gazed at a distant mountain peak. What's wrong, old man? Worried that those guys will cause trouble secretly? Should I secretly follow them? Marco, seeing Inurashi monitoring the Whitebeard pirates from afar, thought Whitebeard was concerned that Odin's people might cause trouble for them. Marco, it's not those guys. Whitebeard shook his head and continued, during the fight, I felt a familiar presence nearby, but when I tried to use observation hockey to locate them, I got nothing. Someone who can evade your observation hockey. Marco was shocked. While observation hockey might be Whitebeard's weakest aspect among the three forms of hockey he mastered, even so, it was Whitebeard. The fact that someone managed to elude his senses was astonishing. Who could it be, then? Marco was puzzled. Anyone who could trigger Whitebeard's sense of familiarity must be a top tier figure on the seas. I feel like it's Thunder Kid but it's unlikely for him to be here. Whitebeard was uncertain. Thunder Kid? The guy who defeated Charlotte Lin Lin and Kaido together. But hasn't he been out of the picture for years? Jozu was bewildered. For many aboard Whitebeard's ship, the name Thunder Kid was unfamiliar. Compared to the prominent figures dominating the seas currently, that guy was too low-key. Let's forget about it. We'll leave when the ship is fixed. Maybe it was just my imagination. Whitebeard waved his hand dismissively. Meanwhile, in the shogun's mansion in Flower Capital, a secretive chamber, a young man with a square face and purple hair knelt on a tatami mat, facing the land of Ueno's shogun, Kazuki Sukiyaki. Who would have thought that Whitebeard would show up in the land of Ueno? Sukiyaki said, his face filled with trepidation. Is that guy named Whitebeard very strong? The young man asked curiously. He he he. Hearing this, Sukiyaki burst into laughter as if he had heard the funniest joke. Orochi, it seems that the land of Ueno has limited your perspective. 
There are countless powerhouses on the seas, and someone like Whitebeard, if he wished, could easily annex the entire land of Wano and control countless islands under his command. Tsukiyaki paused for a moment. But this is also an opportunity. If Kazuki Odin follows Whitebeard to sea, then our plan can proceed even more smoothly. We can reclaim the ancestral lands of the Kurizumi clan and the entire land of Wano. With a wicked smile, Tsukiyaki concluded. Chapter 136 Eh, Kuri is our ancestral land. Orochi looked incredulously at Kazuki Tsukiyaki and asked. Jiao Jiao Jiao. Upon hearing Oroki's words, Tsukiyaki leaned forward and looked at Oroki's face. It seems that the Kazuki clan has erased many things. Yes, Kuri was once the fief of our Kurizumi clan, and your grandfather was once the lord of Kuri. Kuri. Lord. Just as I've told you before, the Kazuki clan is guarded by six major clans, the Shimatsuki clan, the Kurizumi clan, the Yuzuki clan, the Fujetsu clan, Hitaki clan, and the Amatsuki clan. These six clans, serving as the lords of Kuri under the Kazuki clan, collectively protect the Kazuki clan in the flower capital. Later, due to the succession crisis in the Kazuki clan, your grandfather wanted our Kurizumi clan to become the general of the Land of Harmony. As you know, due to the birth of Kazuki Tsukiyaki in our plan being exposed, the Kurizumi clan faced destruction. But your existence, Orochi, saved us from complete annihilation. This is the will of the heavens, allowing our Kurizumi clan to launch the most magnificent revenge against those people. Tsukiyaki's face showed a hint of fanaticism. And Oroki's face also became increasingly resentful. It can be said that in their eyes, all the misfortunes they encountered were brought about by the Kazuki clan. But what should we do to make Odin follow Whitebeard out to sea? Orochi looked at Tsukiyaki and asked. After all, their plan to usurp the throne depended on Odin leaving the land of harmony. Otherwise, with Odin's legitimate heir status and his immense strength, they would have no chance at all. Jiao Jiao Jiao. After laughing heartily, Tsukiyaki looked at Orochi and said, It's simple. Odin, that brainless guy, is determined to go to sea. The only obstacle to his departure is those ruffian warriors under him. After all, in their eyes, only when Odin ascends to the position of General of the Land of Harmony can they demonstrate their loyalty and honor, as the title of General's Retainer is very attractive among the warriors of the Land of Harmony. So what we need to do is to distract those people from Odin and create an opportunity for him. As Tsukiyaki spoke, the smile on Oroki's face grew bigger. Ha ha ha. Jiao Jiao Jiao. After laughing for a while, the two finally stopped. Tsukiyaki looked at Orochi and asked, Did you find any clues from the people I asked you to investigate last time? What are they trying to do by spending so much money to buy those things? Obviously, Orochi, who planned to usurp the throne, was extremely cautious. After all, if something went wrong with such a major event, it would be irreversible disaster. I investigated it. Those people are a group of wealthy merchants. They probably bought those things to enhance their own strength. After all, just like the local tycoons in the Land of Harmony, if you have wealth but no corresponding strength, you'll only be making wedding clothes for others. Orochi said nonchalantly. It can be said that he wouldn't delve into such matters unless they were related to the major clans of the Land of Harmony or affected his plan to usurp the throne. Even if those people really had other intentions, when he became the general of the Land of Harmony, he could deal with them however he pleased. Anyway, increase your vigilance a bit. Kuri. I want to go to sea, I want to have adventures. Odin's voice echoed throughout the Lord's castle in Kuri. This is impossible, as you well know. As the Lord of Kuri and the heir to the Land of Harmony, you are responsible for the future of Kuri and the Land of Harmony. Other matters can be negotiated, but there is absolutely no room for negotiation on this matter. The warriors led by Kinnaman immediately voiced strong opposition. Later, Odin, along with the Nekamamushi and Inurashi responsible for supplying Whitebeard, came to the beach at Ida Port. Let me go with you on the voyage. During dinner, Odin once again earnestly pleaded with the Whitebeard pirates. But Whitebeard took a sip from his jug of sake, looked at the cat and dog who were chatting with Marco, 
and directly refused Odin. You're not the kind of person who submits to others. Recruiting someone like you onto the ship would only bring trouble to the team. I've had too many bad experiences with pirates from previous crews. If you truly want to go to sea, then go by yourself. I sailed alone when I set out to sea. I've tried dozens of times, but all failed. I realized that I have no talent for sailing at all. Odin, rejected, became anxious. If he had to rely on himself to go to sea, who knows how long it would take. Guru Arara. Whitebeard laughed and said, what does that have to do with me? Pirates aren't obliged to help every person who wants to go to sea. If you want to go to sea, you might as well wait for a pirate crew willing to take you in. Did those pirates really say that? In a dimly lit room in the Lord's Castle in Curry at night, a few figures were discussing something secretly. Yes, meow. That big guy rejected Lord Odin's request to go to sea. I heard it with my own ears, meow. Ha ha ha, that's great. Yes, this should dispel Lord Odin's thoughts of going to sea. However, for safety's sake, let's go warn those guys again before going to the flower capital. After all, pirates are lawless fellows, and with Odin's personality, trouble might happen. Chapter 137 The New World and the Grand Line are completely different levels. In the New World, only those who possess hockey can be considered qualified to enter the upper echelons. Otherwise, survival in the New World is impossible. At Nicholas's request, Simon, Katie, and the others will be taught by Vista until they master the advanced techniques of Busashoku hockey, such as Ryo. Meanwhile, Nicholas spends his days with June, assisting her in her training, occasionally supervising Simon and the others' practice. After all, at over 20 years old, they also want to do things they enjoy. As the days go by. Since Nicholas and the others began their training, almost two weeks have passed. Creek. On this day, Nicholas, with bruises on his face and neck still showing traces of red marks, pushed open the door of the room and stepped out. June followed beside Nicholas, gently supporting him as he moved. During this time, he had been focusing on helping June develop the potential of her mushroom mushroom fruit and further explore the powers of his thunder thunder fruit, paying little attention to the passage of time. Perhaps because he was completely immersed in his work, from the moment he pushed open the door, Nicholas didn't feel like much time had passed at all. Instead, it felt as if it had only been a day. How long have we been inside? Nicholas, assisted by June, walked through the corridor and suddenly asked. During this time, he had been so focused on helping June that he hadn't paid much attention to the passage of time. Twelve days. In contrast, June remembered very clearly. Really? Almost two weeks. Nicholas sighed slightly, then turned to look at June and smiled. You've worked hard during this time. Humph. June subconsciously turned her head away, avoiding Nicholas's gaze. Although they were an old married couple, she still felt a bit shy thinking about what had happened between them in the room. Nicholas smiled and withdrew his gaze, looking ahead at the moonlit corridor, reminiscing about the wonderful experience they had shared. Later, Nicholas went to check on the progress of the other members' training, while June returned to her room alone. Upon returning to her room, instead of heading straight to the bathroom, June went to the mirror. She stared at her reflection, her alluring figure, her delicate facial features resembling those of a fairy queen. At this moment, she was no longer wearing the protective suit, but her attention was focused on her purple eyes. The color seems to have deepened a bit, and... June stared at her eyes intently. Under the backdrop of her purple pupils, something strange seemed to appear within her irises. Those things were very faint in themselves, and combined with the purple pupils, they were barely noticeable without careful observation. This change. Is it good or bad? June muttered softly to herself. The change in her eyes was the result of her further mastery of her abilities with Nicholas's help. June suddenly smiled, but she wasn't too worried. With Nicholas by her side, there was no need to worry so much. After a quick wash, June changed her clothes and quickly styled her hair, then looked at the sets of protective suits in the wardrobe and finally picked up the crow mask. Although she no longer needed these things, old habits die hard. Is everyone practicing? 
Nicholas followed the breath of his companions and looked into the distance, watching his companions practicing hockey in the distant mountains and forests. In the night forest, hardly anyone would dare to enter, as it was too dangerous. As Nicholas's gaze swept over, Vista and Simon both sensed his presence. They immediately looked towards the location of the headquarters. Vista and Simon's eyes flickered slightly. Is it finally done? Vista and Simon both thought to themselves. Apparently, they both knew about Nicholas's assistance to June in her training, so Nicholas's appearance now undoubtedly meant that the training was complete. Their reactions did not attract the attention of Brooke and Katie. After all, with their current observation abilities, they couldn't sense Nicholas's gaze from afar. So when Nicholas suddenly appeared next to Vista, it startled Brooke. You nearly gave me a heart attack. Although I don't have a heart, yo ho ho. Brooke looked at Nicholas in astonishment, exaggeratingly patting his chest bone as if he had just had a heart attack. Captain, you finally came out. Katie was really worried about you. Seeing Nicholas's figure, Katie quickly ran over. Captain. Vista and Simon also stopped their practice and looked at Nicholas. Nicholas surveyed his companions, noticing that they were all practicing diligently. Clearly, their strength had improved significantly compared to before. Especially the freezing aura that had been present in Brooke's swift sword strikes. Nicholas could see it clearly. That should be one of the characteristics of the Yomi Yomi Nomi, being able to infuse attacks with the power of the afterlife. With this ability to attack the soul, who knows what Brooke's mastery of the Yomi Yomi Nomi will be like in the future. Thinking of this, Nicholas shook his head with a wry smile. Vista, how are they doing in their training? Hee <laughs> hee, Simon has already mastered the wrapping and release of Busashoku Haki, and as for Ryo, he has grasped some initial understanding. It should take another month or so for him to fully master it. Katie has already mastered the wrapping of Busashoku Haki to some extent and can now maintain the Black Blade state for a short period of time. She's also doing well with her Kenbunchiku Haki, but it will take about a year for her to fully master Ryo. As for Blaze, only Miss June can control it. At this time, I don't know where he is wandering. Vista then looked at Brooke. As for Brooke's training, there's not much I can do to help. After all, the development of Devil Fruit abilities mostly depends on the user's own exploration. Well, that's very good. Nicholas looked at the somewhat embarrassed Katie and Brooke. Given Katie's physical condition, being able to master Busashoku Haki to some extent and maintain the Black Blade state for a short time was already very good. Although it was only a short time for now, with her physical condition, she had a long way to go in the future. Of course, this was also thanks to the support of the Freedom Pirates' vast resources and the guidance of Nicholas and Vista, two masters of hockey. Chapter 138 Two days later. Kuri, Wayno Country. Whitebeard, sailing out to sea without permission in Wayno Country will be severely punished by law, and as the heir to Kuri in the future shogun of Wayno, Kazuki Odin must set an example. So, no matter what Odin-sama says, don't agree to take him out to sea. Kinnaman, dressed in magnificent samurai attire, said solemnly to Whitebeard. Next, he, Kanjuro, Ashura Doji, Kawamatsu, Reizo, and others would go to the shogun's mansion in Flower Capital for training. Therefore, they came again to remind Whitebeard's crew, not trusting them completely. Ha ha ha, it seems we have the same idea. I don't have any intention of taking Odin with me either. Whitebeard smiled and fist bumped Kinnaman in agreement. For him, Kazuki Odin's personality didn't quite fit with the Whitebeard pirates. If it were Roger, he would probably have taken Kazuki Odin away directly. After all, with their personalities, they should get along well. Ha ha ha, there are only five islands in the whole world. Don't talk nonsense. Looking at the surprised Nekamamushi and in Inurashi, Marco seemed to regain his superiority. After all, as an intern on the ship, he had always been teased by everyone, but he didn't expect to have his day today. Eh. Seeing the astonished Nekamamushi in Inurashi, Marco felt even happier. Wow, Marco is so amazing. He defeated a giant bird engulfed in flames. It's unbelievable. Marco is so powerful. Odin-sama, where are you going? 
following closely behind Kazuki Odin, Aizo asked. With the repairs of the Moby Dick nearing completion, and everyone except for the ones going for training in Flower Capital, Aizo was at the point of being overly protective of Kazuki Odin. I'm going to the bathroom. Do you want to come with me? After all, I'm a big shot. Can't you give me a little freedom? Odin said with a frustrated expression. Feeling that he might have been a bit excessive, Aizo said somewhat embarrassedly, Please, Odin-sama. Then, when Odin entered the bathroom, Aizo directly leaned against the side of the bathroom and waited for him. He didn't want to do this, but he had no choice. With Kinnaman, Kanjuro, and the others all going to Flower Capital for training, there were only himself and Odin left in Kuri. If something went wrong while assisting Odin, he would probably have to commit seppuku to apologize. While Aizo was lost in thought, he suddenly felt that something was wrong in the bathroom. Besides the initial sounds, it had become too quiet now. Odin-sama. Are you in there? Aizo tentatively knocked on the door and asked, but there was no response from inside. Odin-sama. Still no response. Then, Aizo directly kicked open the door of the bathroom, only to find that there was a huge hole cut in the back of the bathroom, and Odin was nowhere to be seen. Looking at the night outside the hole and the figure that was about to disappear, Aizo immediately sprinted after him. He knew that Odin was planning to run away. Under the cover of night, the Moby Dick of the Whitebeard Pirates slowly sailed out of Idaport. Although I'm sorry, Odin, we're sailing out to sea under the cover of night. Boys. Whitebeard stood with his Najinata on the deck of the Moby Dick, looking at the gradually disappearing coastline, and spoke. Dad, I think Odin is a pretty good guy. Why don't you want to take him on board? If we're only talking about strength, he would be a great asset, but I don't want to deal with the trouble he'll cause with his personality if I agree to take him. And as the daimyo of Kuri and the future heir of Wano, he has responsibilities to fulfill. By the way, did you leave the compartment as a token of appreciation? After all, he helped us repair the Moby Dick and provided us with food and supplies. Don't worry, Dad, I. Before Marco could finish his answer, a chain suddenly flew over from a distance and wrapped around the mast of the Moby Dick. Hey, what's that? An enemy attack. Marco and the others couldn't help but ask when they saw the sudden situation. Whitebeard, luckily I already secretly found out the time when the ship was repaired. I didn't expect you to be so ruthless and actually want to abandon me. At the other end of the chain, Kazuki Odin, with his massive figure, leaped up from the shore and grabbed the chain tightly. Hearing Odin's misleading words, Whitebeard's forehead was covered with black lines. At almost the same time Odin grabbed the chain, Aizo also jumped up and hugged Odin tightly. With the Moby Dick's pulling force, the two of them rode the waves in the sea. What a reckless guy. But this is it, Odin. You should go back and inherit the position of Shogun. Saying this, Marco intended to break the chain wrapped around the mast. Wait, Marco, bring the guy lying on his back on his shoulder up here. Remember, only bring him alone. Eh. Although he didn't understand, since it was Dad's order, there shouldn't be a problem. After saying that, Marco directly turned his arms into phoenix wings and flew towards Izo's position. Soon, Izo was grabbed by the phoenix claws formed by Marco's feet. Hey, first save Odin-sama. Being grabbed by Marco, Izo looked at Odin in the sea and shouted angrily. You don't seem to understand yet, this is not Wano, but the sea. We pirates are the freest people on the sea. No one can command us. And just when Marco thought his words were very imposing, suddenly a falcon's cry came from above. Screech. Hearing this sound, Marco's whole person was horrified. He quickly turned his head to look around, trying to catch the source of the sound. Shoo. Then, the familiar sound came, and Marco immediately flapped his phoenix wings and maneuvered in the air. But unfortunately, the bird left a pile of SHT on Marco's head, Marco's phoenix brain was hit again, this time it was green, making Marco's head even more like a pineapple. Ha ha ha. Seeing Marco with his unique hairstyle, Izo burst into laughter. Marco, wipe it off. When Marco, carrying Izo, landed on the deck after being hit, Jozu habitually handed over a towel. 
However, Marco did not accept it this time. Instead, he came to Izo's side with a gloomy face. If this guy hadn't moved around randomly just now, he would definitely have been able to avoid it. What do you want, you bastard? Looking at Marco's gloomy face, Izo said fearlessly. In his opinion, even if he died, he had to maintain the dignity of being a samurai of Kazuki Odin. However, unexpectedly, Marco didn't resort to physical violence against him. Instead, he calmly took off Izo's beloved clothes, wiped his head casually, rinsed it with water, and continued to wipe the back. I'll kill you, you bastard. I'll definitely kill you. Seeing his clothes emitting a strange smell, Izo was driven crazy. At the same time, on the beach in Idaport, an old man holding a chemisan gently plucked the strings on his instrument and watched as the Moby Dick gradually became a small dot, a smile appeared on his face. At the same time, Nicholas, seeing the returning bird from a distance, knew that the preliminary plan could be implemented. Chapter 139 Curry, the Castle of the Daimyo What? Lord Odin is missing. And the Whitebeard Pirates, docked at Ida Port, have set sail. Upon hearing the news of Odin's disappearance and the departure of the Moby Dick from the Curry Beach, the group returning from Flower Capital felt a sense of unease. Izo is missing too, and even Nekamamushi and Inurashi are gone. Kikuzo's eyes welled up with tears out of worry, as he and Izo had always relied on each other. Before considering the worst-case scenario, let's search the entire country. Right now, all we can do is pray that those damn Whitebeard guys didn't take Lord Odin with them out to sea. Denjiro, the one with the sharpest mind among them, spoke first, though he couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss, and yet he had no clue where to start. Dad! Is that guy really okay? He won't die at sea, will he? On the deck, Marco, squatting at the rail, turned to Whitebeard, watching Odin struggle in the waves. Odin had been in the sea for almost half the night, and he looked battered and bruised from crashing into a reef earlier. At a glance, one might mistake him for some exotic sea creature. Don't worry about it. And Marco, notify everyone to prepare for a banquet. After all, we're setting sail again. With his Najinata in hand and a bottle of sake, Whitebeard drank heartily, ignoring Odin struggling in the moonlit sea. Hey, Whitebeard, you better pull Odin up soon, or he'll die. That guy is supposed to shoulder the hopes of countless people in the future of Wano. Bound tightly, Izo watched with anger as Odin struggled in the sea, shouting furiously at Whitebeard. To him, this was an insult to Odin and to the whole of Wano. Gararara. Hearing Izo's words, Whitebeard burst into laughter before squatting down and speaking seriously to the bound Izo. Kid, You've seen me refuse him several times, haven't you? But despite that, that guy is still trying everything to set sail. So, let's abide by the rules of the sea. Since he's chosen the sea, there's no room for titles here. I won't let such a dangerous guy just come on board, endangering the safety of our family. If you can persuade him to give up, then go ahead. After all, it's not too far to return safely to Wano with Odin's strength but you've got three days. Then, Whitebeard approached the stern and looked at Odin, who was struggling in the sea, and spoke. Listen, Odin. If you hold on to that iron chain for three days straight, I'll allow you on board to become one of us. Gururara. Ha ha. A gentleman's word. After taking a deep breath, Odin shouted loudly. Of course, a swift horse needs but one whip. Whitebeard responded loudly. Clearly, Odin's determination to sail at all costs touched him, and he was willing to give him a chance. Dad, a fleet has been spotted in the port side direction. Amidst the raging storm, as everyone watched Odin struggle in the sea, a lookout's cry came from the Moby Dick's crow's nest. Upon hearing the sound, all the members of the Whitebeard pirates on board immediately entered high alert. After all, encountering a strange ship in the New World could mean encountering enemies. Captain, a pirate ship has been spotted on the starboard side. Open the cannons. Prepare for battle. Battling at sea required the utmost care to keep gunpowder dry, especially inside the cannons, which were covered with oilcloth until it was time for battle. 
the lookout kept a close eye on the large ship ahead. As it drew nearer, the ship's image became clearer, and through the telescope, the lookout also saw the Whitebeard Jolly Roger flying on the Moby Dick and Whitebeard himself on board. It's Whitebeard. With a terrified shout from the lookout, everyone on board the ship immediately went into high alert. After all, encountering Whitebeard in the New World was enough to intimidate anyone. Their fleet consisted of medium-sized ships, but they were powerful in terms of firepower, with each ship equipped with at least 30 cannons and over a hundred crew members. Ordinary pirate crews wouldn't stand a chance against them. But they had no illusions about facing Whitebeard. He was a monster capable of destroying an entire fleet single-handedly. Inform the fleet to change course and avoid them. Our goal this time is to transport goods. We mustn't engage in conflict with them. If we fail to deliver the goods on time, the consequences will be no different from facing Whitebeard's crew head-on. With the captain's order, the entire fleet quickly changed formation and sailed away. Dad! They're changing course. From the mast, the lookout called out to the Whitebeard crew on deck. Should we pursue them, Dad? Marco asked Whitebeard, wondering why they didn't plunder the ships they encountered at sea, which was standard pirate practice. Let it go. Since they're avoiding us, we'll stick to our planned course. Whitebeard said, and with the storm raging, the two fleets passed each other. In the castle of Curry. How is it? Any news of Lord Odin or Izo? Kanjuru asked anxiously. There's still no news for now. I've asked Lord Yajui from the Shimatsuki family, as well as Lord Fujetsu and Lord Tempura, to keep an eye out. We've also dispatched our men to search every corner of Kuri. Then Jiro looked at everyone and spoke. We can't keep waiting like this. You guys stay in Wano. I'll find a way to get a boat and chase after the Whitebeard pirates. If Odin is on Whitebeard's ship, I'll bring him back intact. After saying this, Kinnaman was about to leave to catch a boat and set sail. But before he could take a step, he was grabbed by the collar by Denjiro. You think things aren't chaotic enough already? How do you plan to sail out? Haven't you heard what Whitebeard said about the dangers of the sea outside? Even their huge pirate ship has encountered mishaps at sea. Do you expect to chase after Odin with a small boat? What do you suggest then? Kinnaman retorted angrily, pushing Denjiro's hand away. He was frustrated. First, let's return. Then, take care of everything in Kuri. Kuri must not have any problems before Odin returns. Also, keep an eye on Flower Capital and any incidents happening in Wano. Denjiro's glasses gleamed with a sharp light. Kinnaman and the others were puzzled by Denjiro's words. I have a feeling that someone in Wano is plotting something behind the scenes. Anyway, caution is our top priority. However, Denjiro didn't elaborate further. He had no evidence most of it was just his intuition. Chapter 140 Days later A fleet approached the waters outside of Wano country. If the Whitebeard pirates were present, they would have noticed that this fleet approaching the waters outside of Wano was the same one that had passed them by in the storm a few days earlier. Captain, is our client this time someone important from Wano country? As they waited for the other party to meet them, a curious crew member asked the captain. The captain of this ship did not answer directly but gave the crew member a cold glance. That one look caused the crew member's expression to change, and he remained silent, bowing his head quietly. In their line of work, it was best not to ask questions, especially when it involved certain important figures. Sometimes, curiosity could truly be fatal. Captain. They're here. With the words of the crew member beside him, the leader of this fleet also picked up a telescope and looked into the distance, seeing a large ship being pulled by several huge goldfish as it leaped down from the waterfall of Wano country. Soon, it arrived in front of their fleet. Once the two ships docked together, a person wearing a fox mask leaped onto the deck from the ship. You're quite punctual. The person with the fox mask looked at the captain in front of him and spoke. That's for sure. After all, our reputation as the top player in the underworld relies on word of mouth. If we say three days, it's three days, no later. The captain said proudly. 
this was also a demonstration of strength. To be able to prepare so many weapons in a short time and deliver them within three days spoke volumes. Let's check the goods first. The person with the fox mask said calmly. No problem. As the captain's words fell, two crew members quickly approached with a wooden crate. They pried open the crate, revealing rows of brand new flintlock rifles wrapped in oilcloth inside. The person with the fox mask casually pulled out a rifle from inside, briefly inspected it, and tested the field before tossing it to the captain. Not bad. Then, he waved to the ship behind him, and several masked individuals from the ship brought down several boxes of gold bars. It's all there. No need, no need. We trust your reputation. Seeing the shining gold bars in the boxes under the sunlight, the person in charge of the fleet smiled like a chrysanthemum. Well then, pleasant cooperation. When we need to place another order, we'll come to you. No problem, sir. With the transaction completed, the ships of both parties left the area. Subsequently, with the help of several huge goldfish, the ships climbed up the waterfall, the only passage into Wano country. Captain, I'm back. By a beach in Hakamai, Simon said to Nicholas, who was sunbathing, as he placed a stack of newspapers on the table. Due to Wano's special policies, Nicholas and his crew hadn't had access to newspapers for a long time. He wondered if anything significant had happened in the outside world during this time. Nicholas reclined on a beach chair, holding a newspaper and reading. Everything went smoothly. Smoothly, and those guys seemed to want to maintain long-term cooperation with us. They even sent us an extra 10,000 lead bullets. Well, rest for now. Afterwards, teach those guys the most basic firearms operation. They can wield hoes and sickles with ease, but handling firearms might be a bit challenging for them. Okay, I'll do it as soon as possible. Simon said and lay down on the nearby empty beach chair, enjoying the rare tranquility. Oh. Glancing over, Nicholas was surprised by the contents of the newspaper. The former noble family of the world nobles, the Don Quixote family, was massacred in the North Sea, with no survivors. In the World Economic Gazette, Nicholas saw this news and paused. He knew the true reason for Don Quixote's death, but he didn't expect the world government to brush it off so easily. Correspondingly, there appeared a new rookie pirate crew in the North Sea named the Don Quixote Pirates, but this news was quite inconspicuous compared to others. The giant warrior pirates, missing for a hundred years, set sail again. Captain, Dory and Broggy, have bounties of 250 million berries each. Shortly after their departure, they encountered a team of 500 professional bounty hunters known as the Giant Hunting Team. Eventually, Dory and Broggy joined forces to defeat the bounty hunters, and none of the bounty hunting team survived. Later, the Blood Axe Pirates and the One-Eyed Pirates encountered the Giant Warrior Pirates but were defeated by Dory alone. Both pirate crews did not survive. Subsequently, they also directly defeated the marine fleet that came to besiege them. For a while, they were unrivaled. Nicholas narrowed his eyes and muttered softly to himself, Is Roger's final voyage about to begin? Since it's so lively, why not make your last voyage even more turbulent? With that thought, Nicholas looked down at the den den mushy on the table. After a moment of contemplation, he dialed several numbers one by one. Chapter 141 Ah! Huff, huff, huff! Just as Da Flamingo was in distress, there suddenly came a rapid gasping sound from beside him, as if someone had just experienced a terrifying nightmare. Rosinante, another nightmare? Don't worry, I'm here. Da Flamingo looked at Rosinante, who was sleeping on the makeshift bed in the office, with concern. Huff, huff, huff it's. It's nothing. Flower Capital, Wayno Country. What? Shogun Sukiyaki is critically ill. When did this happen? Shogun Sukiyaki is critically ill, so who will be the next shogun of Wano country? Of course, it will be Lord Kazuki Odin. That guy from Kuri? But all the other daimyos have already arrived, and what about him? As the son of Shogun Sukiyaki, this is a great disrespect. Originally, the news of Shogun Sukiyaki's critical illness was only circulating in a small circle, 
but with the gathering of daimyos from various regions in the flower capital, it seemed that Shogun Sukiyaki's critical condition was no joke. Cough, cough, I want Odin to inherit the position of Shogun of Ueno country after me. Shogun Sukiyaki, lying on his sickbed, looked at the daimyos gathered around him and spoke. Of course, Shogun Sukiyaki. Yes, it's only right for Odin to inherit the position of Shogun. Seeing the daimyo's unanimous agreement, Shogun Sukiyaki's face showed a hint of difficulty as he continued, but Odin is not in Ueno country right now. So, I have found someone. In the time between my death and Odin's return, I want him to temporarily assume the position of Shogun. Rest assured, this person is absolutely trustworthy. After all, he is like a brother to Odin. His name is Orochi. Orochi, come and meet the daimyos. As Shogun Sukiyaki spoke, he weakly waved his hand towards a folding screen beside him. Then, Kurizumi Orochi respectfully emerged from behind the folding screen and knelt on the ground, bowing to the daimyos. Why is Orochi here? Lord Shimatsuki Yajui couldn't help but ask, as someone who had connections with Orochi and Odin, he knew that Odin might help Orochi, but he would never treat Orochi as a brother. Orochi. Lord Shimatsuki Ashimaru frowned involuntarily. And with Ashimaru's question, Lord Hitaki and Lord Tempura also frowned, apparently, the Kurizumi family had caused quite a bit of trouble for several decades, after all, in that turmoil. The Kurizumi family's daimyo had caused heavy losses to several families, and even the Kurizumi family, which had the fewest people, had been directly expelled from Ueno country. Kurizumi Orochi bowed deeply, and then seriously said, I know that because of my ancestors' heinous actions, I have caused great harm to all of you. But please believe me, I am not the same as my ancestor. I will make amends for the harm caused by my ancestor to all of you. Cough, cough, Orochi, please rise. Shogun Sukiyaki coughed twice to signal for Orochi to stand up, then he said to the daimyos around him, Cough, cough, Orochi is not the same as his ancestor. He is not the ambitious person from the Kurizumi family in the past. Moreover, he has performed well during the time he has been with me. I trust my judgment. Faced with Shogun Sukiyaki's words, although Lord Shimatsuki Yajui had doubts, he couldn't say anything. After all, the authority of the daimyos in Ueno country was not to be offended. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to clear the Kurizumi family's name. I am willing to serve as a slave to repay Shogun Sukiyaki and Lord Kazuki Odin, and I will also atone for my ancestors' foolish actions. I will do my best to prepare for Lord Odin's return and succession. I only ask to be a puppet during Lord Odin's absence, and I ask all of you to lend me your support. If I make any transgressions during my temporary tenure as Shogun, you are free to cut off my head. With Oroki's heartfelt words, and Shogun Sukiyaki's guarantee, the daimyos reluctantly agreed to let Kurizumi Orochi temporarily assume the position of Shogun of Ueno country after Shogun Sukiyaki's passing. What? Lord Odin said that if he does not return, Kurizumi Orochi will temporarily assume the position of Shogun after his passing. When they heard this news, the members of the Kiniman family were so shocked that they couldn't close their mouths. But we don't know when Lord Odin and my brother will return. Kikunajo's delicate face frowned. I just feel something's not right. Whether in terms of seniority or strength, Shogun Sukiyaki should have selected the successor among the daimyos. Even if he was worried about the daimyos making a move, there was no need to worry about Lord Shimatsuki Yajui's prestige in Ueno. But why did he choose Kurizumi Orochi? Kenjuro frowned. Could it be because Kurizumi Orochi poses no threat? After all, compared to those daimyos, Kurizumi Orochi has no military power at all, and in terms of prestige, he is not as good as others. His personal strength is also ordinary. He can be a perfect puppet. Kawamatsu analyzed. But I still feel something's off. Why make it so complicated? We just need to keep an eye on Kurizumi Orochi. When Lord Odin returns, everything will be fine. Ashura Doji said nonchalantly, stroking the blade of his long knife with his finger. For him, as long as Kurizumi Orochi dared to have any bad thoughts about the position of Shogun, he could just chop him down with one stroke. 
Moreover, Lord Odin's departure was just a whim, and when he got bored, he would return to Wano country. Why are you silent, Kawamatsu? With Kenjiro's words, everyone turned to the quiet Kawamatsu. I don't know what to say. All I know is that before Lord Odin returns, we must protect the curry that we have all built together. Yes, we must show Lord Odin a better curry when he returns. By the way, I heard that there have been many disturbances in the Hakamai recently. Should we go and help Lord Yajui? After all, Lord Yajui helped us a lot in the past, and his relationship with Lord Odin is also very good. Kinemon asked Kenjuro, after all, Kenjuro was the intellectual among them. Upon hearing Kinemon's words, Kenjuro adjusted his glasses and said seriously, I've also heard about the disturbances in Hakamai. It is said that a group of peasants gathered to resist the high taxes imposed by the landlords, but they were quickly suppressed and are now hiding in the mountains around Hakamai. Since Lord Yajui has not shown any intention to intervene, it means that the problem should not be big. What we need to do now is to manage curry well before Lord Odin returns. Everything else can wait. Meanwhile, the peasants who had been driven into the mountains around Hakamai were establishing a base, led by Simon, and began systematic learning of tactics and firearms operations. When these people reappear, they will undoubtedly bring about great changes to Wano country. Chapter 142 Hakamai, the prestigious mansion of the Shimatsuki family. How was the handling of the rebellion in the Ebisu Township, Kibi Township, and Kuri Township? Lord Shimatsuki Yajui sat upright at the head of the room, looking down at the group of vassals below. My lord, all rebels have been quelled, and the officials from each township are currently tallying the specific losses and preparing for reconstruction. A retainer with patched clothing smiled as he spoke. The others also smiled, as they believed the insurgents' actions were futile and the outcome was as expected. The rebels were ultimately routed by the samurai. So, what were the specific reasons for this peasant rebellion? I heard it was because the local landlords in these three areas raised rents for the tenants, and the daimyo's administration forcibly requisitioned a significant amount of newly cultivated land. Lord Shimatsuki was evidently dissatisfied with this answer, as it differed from what he had heard. Rumors, all rumors. The rents for tenants in each township are uniform, and there is absolutely no irregular collection. These are just ungrateful people spreading lies. Besides, the newly cultivated land belongs to the Shimatsuki family, as it is reclaimed from Hakamai's land. If the land is reclaimed by someone, it belongs to them. We just need to collect rent. Lord Shimatsuki stated firmly. You are indeed merciful, my lord. We will proceed immediately. Also, my lord, it has been almost two months since salaries were distributed in the mansion. Should we address this? A retainer looked at Lord Shimatsuki and asked, as the maintenance and various expenses of such a large mansion required funds. I will think of a solution. Lord Shimatsuki furrowed his brow. Since the mansion was robbed of a large sum earlier, and subsequently funds were given to the Kinemon family, the entire Hakamai mansion had plunged into an economic crisis. Then, my lord, we shall take our leave. Very well. The group respectfully exited the mansion. Once they were out of earshot, their expressions of reverence turned cold. Prime Minister, does Lord Shimatsuki suspect something? A retainer asked the person who had reported to Lord Shimatsuki earlier. Humph, suspect. What could he possibly suspect, that kind of person? He dares to think he can coexist equally with those peasants, yet he fails to see the expenses involved in maintaining such a grand mansion, including guards and servants. Can his possessions alone sustain it? Moreover, we, the several major families, have assisted him generation after generation. Must we also foolishly live like commoners? By the way, ensure that the nobles in Inahara Township handle their affairs promptly. If they fail, I don't mind dealing with them. Yes, sir. Good. Let's head to Flower Capital. I heard there's a beautiful courtesan there. Afterward, the group changed direction and headed toward Flower Capital. My lord, we won't have enough food for much longer. A man dressed in patched clothing and grass shoes respectfully addressed Nicholas. In the eyes of these mountain dwellers, Nicholas was akin to their savior. 
Not only did he show them the way, but he also taught them how to use firearms to resist the samurai. Don't worry about food. The sea is abundant with resources it's just a matter of broadening your horizons beyond Wano. To address the food shortage, Nicholas personally led the team, accompanied by the temporary group of peasants totaling less than a hundred people. These people were mainly responsible for various tasks on board the ship. As the sails were raised and several enormous goldfish controlled by June Dove into the water, the massive ship entered full speed, reaching over 80 kilometers per hour. This speed was effortless on land but challenging on the sea, where the waves constantly tossed the ship, making it feel like surfing. Nicholas placed his hand on the ship's railing, then activated his ability, creating an invisible barrier around the ship, lifting it from the sea. The ship's bottom skimmed along the water's surface, and the previously undulating deck now felt solid like land. Soon, the people from Wayno witnessed a sight they had never seen before. A colossal six-eyed flying fish, over 300 meters long, soared out of the water like a bird, generating massive splashes, and lunged towards the ship, seemingly about to swallow it whole. The once imposing ship appeared small and helpless at that moment. Before the passengers could panic, a beam of light flashed, and the enormous six-eyed flying fish was split in half. Blood and seawater mixed as they fell from the sky, drenching everyone on the ship from head to toe. Chapter 143 And just as the entire ship's crew was shocked by what was happening before them. On a distant island in Wano, two unfamiliar ships arrived at the harbor. Woman, give up, you can't escape, ha ha ha. Didn't we agree? We promised to take you to the shogun, didn't we? Beauty, don't run, we don't want to harm you. A group of people on the shore shouted at a woman dressed in Wano attire, relentlessly pursuing her. Soon, the woman found herself cornered. Facing the human traffickers closing in on her, she drew the long sword at her waist. You scoundrels are clearly up to no good. I can't believe I fell into your trap. I was so foolish. Confronted with the woman's resistance, the human traffickers simply smiled, seeing her struggle as futile. Originally, they had planned to go to an island engulfed in war to purchase slaves, but unexpectedly encountered this naive target on the way. They knew that such merchandise would be in high demand at the slave auctions in Sabaity. You have the sea behind you there's nowhere for you to run. And as for going to Wano, we can convert the room on our ship into Wano for you, ha uh -huh. Watching the woman, who had nowhere to run, the leader of the traffickers joked. However all of a sudden. Splash. Oh my goodness, there's a sea monster. Mommy, help me. Quick, run. The monster quickly approached her. I heard a woman's cry for help. So, you're saying you're called Amatsuki Toki and you got tricked by these guys when you got lost and want to return to Wano? That's right, I came with Whitebeard Pirates and while I was shopping, I got lost and was kidnapped by these guys, and to think that the Whitebeard Pirates forgot me tt. What's so great about Wano? The people there are boring, and everything is so rigid. Ignoring the latter part and having gradually regained his human form, Odin complained about Wano, unable to understand why someone would desperately want to escape from it. I've always dreamed of going to Wano. Can you take me there again? Toki looked at Odin with hopeful eyes. However, Odin wore a reluctant expression. After all, he had just managed to escape. There was no way he would go back, not in this lifetime. By the way, I don't even know your name yet. Although Odin didn't agree, Toki couldn't help but ask. After all, Odin had saved his life. Kazuki Odin. As Odin spoke, the atmosphere between them suddenly became tense. Even Odin, with his thick skin, sensed that something was amiss, while Toki couldn't help but cover his mouth in shock. After all, both Kazuki and Amatsuki were names that ordinary people in Wano couldn't use. The former belonged to the ruling Kazuki family of Wano, while the latter was one of the five families loyal to the ruling lord. Ordinary people had no right to use such prestigious surnames. Time passed. Another month went by. Lord Simon, we've once again repelled the attacks from those samurai. However, we're running low on bullets, and many people have been injured in battle and need medical treatment. A leader of the Wano resistance army reported to Simon. 
Don't worry about the medicine we can provide as much as you need. Simon was about to respond when June, wearing a mask, walked in seriously and spoke. She then had someone place a box on the ground behind her. The box contains various antibodies, antidotes, hemostatic agents, and anesthetics. I hope it helps you, but I also hope it doesn't. Upon opening the box, the resistance leaders found the medicines neatly arranged on soft cloth wrapped in oiled paper. Counting them, there was enough medicine to last the resistance army for months. Thank you, Lady Saint. Several resistance leaders expressed their sincere gratitude. June had saved many lives among them. Even their wives had learned some basic medical skills and knowledge of herbs from her, and their children had the opportunity to learn to read and write, things they could only dream of before. Lady Saint, why are you helping us? Thinking about the changes in their lives, someone blurted out the question to June. June paused for a moment, then a hint of longing appeared on her fair face. I'm helping you because Nicholas wants to help you. When it came to Nicholas, June's face lit up with happiness. Simon was no longer surprised by this. After all, when he drank with Vista in private, he had heard Vista mention that within their free pirate group, June only truly valued Nicholas. The other members were considered companions, but if June had to choose between them and Nicholas, her choice would undoubtedly be Nicholas. At a certain town's port on an island in the Grand Line. A man sat calmly on a wooden crate, reading a newspaper with his head lowered. In the center of the newspaper was a photo of Nicholas, Big Mom, and Kaido on the battlefield of Whole Cake Island. The local port workers couldn't help but look at the sturdy man with a sense of astonishment. This man, like a statue, remained motionless sitting there for about two hours. During this time, all he did was read the newspaper. Even though he's blind, he's so focused on reading the newspaper, what a strange fellow. The workers thought to themselves. Suddenly, a commotion arose nearby. Why would a marine battleship come to this place? And that looks like Vice Admiral Dragon's ship. It really is. Seeing the flagship with its iconic dragon emblem, the local townsfolk were suddenly anxious. For these townsfolk, the least they wanted to see were ships flying pirate flags or marine flags. As for pirates, it went without saying that each visit from these sea parasites was a disaster for the town's ordinary people. And as for the marines, they usually had special supply towns and wouldn't change easily. Once they arrived unexpectedly, it meant that there might be a notorious criminal or pirate crew hiding in the town. Many people couldn't help but look at the sturdy man sitting there for two hours, reading the newspaper. Noticing the questioning gazes from all directions, the man remained unmoved. At the same time, his sightless eyes slowly moved away from the newspaper and looked towards the approaching warship. Under the gaze of the townsfolk and alongside Vice Admiral Dragon, the man walked towards the gangway. As they stepped onto the gangway together, the crew on deck of the battleship all stared at the man who walked alongside Vice Admiral Dragon. Who is this man? What's his background, to make Vice Admiral Dragon personally come to greet him? The Marines speculated, their curiosity piqued by the man's mysterious aura. After all, it was widely assumed that Dragon would be the next fleet admiral, and even the appearance of the two monstrous individuals who emerged from the training camp only had the potential to become admirals. That's why they found it so unbelievable. Chapter 144 Since the end of the Total Land incident, almost seven years have passed. However, the turmoil caused by this incident has not subsided over time. This can be seen from a man holding a headline newspaper. Through the extensive coverage of the media, Nicholas's powerful defeating of Big Mom Charlotte Lin Lin and Kaido was basically spread throughout the entire Grand Line. Moreover, with the notorious reputation of Big Mom's pirate crew and Kaido's frequent escapes from the Marines, the news of Nicholas's strength was further highlighted. Although Nicholas's bounty has not changed since the Totland incident, and even Nicholas and the entire Freedom Pirate crew have faded from public view for more than seven years, his reputation has not diminished at all. Such is the pirate world. To quickly gain fame, fighting against strong opponents is the fastest way. And with the activities of the remnants of the Rock's pirates such as Kaido, Charlotte Lin Lin, and others on the sea, Nicholas is naturally mentioned by others. The hot discussion in the outside world is still ongoing, 
and Nicholas and his party are still busy in the Udon district of Ueno. They are. In a stronghold in the mountains, Nicholas stood in front of a prison cell with a large area, looking through the prison made of centuries-old pine at about a hundred men inside. Yo ho ho! Brooke, who was in charge of guarding these people, smiled first, then explained, they are samurai who were captured in battles in the past two months. Oh! Nicholas raised an eyebrow, not expecting that these guys, who had only recently learned to use sickles and hoes, would have such combat power so quickly. It is worth noting that although the samurai in Ueno are uneven in strength, being a samurai means that these people can basically handle weapons. When facing ordinary people, they can even easily handle ten or even a hundred opponents. Simon, who was with Nicholas, looked at Nicholas with a speechless expression, implying, ahem, although there are swordsmen among the samurai in Ueno, they are all important figures. These samurai, although their strength is good, are just ordinary people. It is already fortunate for them not to be killed by random gunfire when facing a systematic firearms unit. Although firearms are like toys for strong individuals, the damage they can cause to the human body is still terrifying. Nicholas suddenly understood the meaning behind Simon's words. Indeed, he had subconsciously ignored this point while engaging with strong opponents on the sea, just as ordinary soldiers in the marines appear like ants in front of top-tier opponents. However, if they encounter ordinary pirates with better equipment and more coordinated attacks, the relaxed offensive and defensive style of the marines undoubtedly resembles the Grim Reaper. How do you plan to deal with these guys? Nicholas asked Simon while looking at the samurai. We originally planned to see if we could pull them into the resistance army. After all, as samurai, they can better infiltrate the enemy's ranks. But unfortunately, none of these people are willing. For them, their samurai spirit does not allow them to betray their lord and allegiance. And in their eyes, it seems that we are opposing the entire Ueno. Simon shrugged helplessly. It's a pity. Since they have no value, just get rid of them directly. Brooke, it's a good opportunity to verify your devil fruit ability. Nicholas said calmly. Brooke raised his staff sword and looked at the samurai in the prison cell with a calm gaze. For him, Killing was not much of a psychological burden, as he had been the former pirate of the Rumbar Pirates and had acted as a deputy captain. There was a slow sound of the staff sword being drawn from its sheath. Hearing the sound of the staff sword being drawn, the samurai in the prison cell trembled violently. They all looked up in horror at Brooke, who was slowly unsheathing the staff sword, as if they smelled the breath of death, and the skeletal Brooke seemed to be a messenger from the underworld. Nicholas suddenly raised his hand and pressed down on Brooke's arm, which was about to draw the sword. Brooke looked at Nicholas with confusion. Do you really understand the consequences of death? Half an hour later. Dozens of dazed samurai followed Simon out of the prison. Looking at their appearance, they looked as if they had just experienced a nightmare. In the prison cell. Nicholas looked at the bodies of the samurai on the ground, covered in ice chips, murmuring to himself, does the aura of the soul soul devil fruit cause this freezing effect? Or is it freezing the soul itself? Brooke. Captain. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, Brooke looked at Nicholas involuntarily. Are the souls of these guys really sent to the underworld? Nicholas was curious about the mysterious underworld. I'm not sure, but after these people were killed, something did disappear from inside their bodies. Brooke touched his skull with some hesitation. Several days later. In the training ground in the forest. Several wounded members of the resistance lay on the ground, looking quite miserable. Opposite them were the samurai from before. At this point, their injuries had mostly healed, indicating careful treatment. Seeing the injured people moaning on the ground, the samurai felt quite satisfied. Although they couldn't kill them, giving these guys a lesson was still no problem. At the beginning, these samurai also thought about escaping. After all, they had witnessed the situation in the prison cell, and in their eyes, these sinners who associated with demons would definitely be punished by the heavens. As long as they could bring back the news, they would definitely receive a big reward. In one night, these samurai staged a riot. However, before they could cause any chaos, they were forcefully suppressed by the resistance army, which had been on guard against them all along. 
In the end, out of the dozens of samurai, only these few lucky ones remained. They were surrounded by the despised commoners, trying to uphold their samurai spirit and fight against the enemy. But in the end, what they heard was the sentence, God bless America, Ra. Then came a barrage of gunfire. In a room at the center of the stronghold. Nicholas sat in a chair, manipulating thousands of lightning balls to constantly move and even form various shapes. While accumulating strength for the future, Nicholas also didn't intend to neglect his own strength. After all, in this world where power belongs to oneself, the stronger, the better. The Goro Goro no Mi, as well as more potential to be developed, is just the beginning. He would make good use of this time to further enhance the abilities of the Goro Goro no Mi. Chapter 145 In the second year of Odin's departure, Shogun Kazuki Sukiyaki officially passed away. In the same year, Kurizumi Orochi temporarily took over the position of Shogun in Ueno country. After assuming the role of Shogun, Kurizumi Orochi did not show any great ambitions. Everything was done by the book, and he even actively sought advice from various daimyos, quickly gaining their approval. The daimyos gradually began to overlook their surveillance of the flower capital. Meanwhile, the rebellion grew rapidly, with many towns and villages falling. Those who called themselves rebels raised the status of women, allowed them to establish their own organizations. Liberated tenant farmers to form agricultural associations, and enacted the Agricultural Association Law to ensure the legitimate rights and interests of farmers. Through the Land Reform Law, all the land seized from local strongmen and temples was distributed to landless farmers, marking the first time in many generations that many people owned their own land. Even many farmers, upon hearing about what was happening in the rebel-controlled areas, could not contain themselves. In fact, there were reports of tenant farmers fleeing with their families to the rebel-controlled areas. The rebels ravaged the flower capital, shaking various towns in the capital. At the same time, the lord of the Hakamai, Shimatsuki Yajui, with the assistance of his staff and the powerful families of various towns, raised a force of over 2,000 warriors to suppress them. Dozens of miles from the rebel stronghold of Hakamai town, on a plain, the force led by Shimatsuki Yajui was stationed. Many of the warriors were relatively relaxed, thinking that those rebels had not truly experienced the terror of warriors and believed that acquiring firearms from outside Ueno would be enough to turn the tide. For powerful warriors like them, those firearms were just toys. This time, in addition to the swordsmen who accompanied the suppression of the rebels, there were also several swordsmen. Gentlemen, is there really no room for negotiation? On the open ground, Shimatsuki Yajui, dressed in samurai armor, looked around at the serious faces and spoke earnestly. Lord Yajui, since those people have rebelled once, even if we give them a chance, they will surely rebel again in the future. Therefore, we must kill these rebels completely, otherwise, it will sow the seeds of rebellion in their hearts. The left minister among his aides spoke solemnly. And others echoed his sentiments. Seeing this scene, Shimatsuki Yajui didn't know what to say. After hearing about the rebellion in many places, he was completely baffled. He couldn't imagine where those oppressed tenants got the courage to rebel. Later, he made special inquiries about the various policies implemented by the rebels in the areas they occupied. Finally, he found that what they were doing was unsolvable. Just distributing land to the farmers who had been tenants of local strongmen for generations would make them follow the rebels wholeheartedly. Shimatsuki Yajui also considered learning from their various measures. After all, in his view, once these measures were implemented, there was no doubt that the flower capital could be built into a better place. However, he was strongly opposed by the warrior forces under him. Because if he did so, it would undoubtedly mean giving up their interests to those inferior people, which they could not accept. Even they united and forced Shimatsuki Yajui to launch this suppression against the rebels. There are about two thousand of them. Nicholas's eyes flickered with red light as he calmly stared at the fortified camp in the distance. In fact, when Shimatsuki Yajui's army appeared hundreds of miles away from Hakamai, someone in the information they provided. Including Shimatsuki Yajui, and the warrior families under Shimatsuki Yajui's command, had a considerable force of over 2,000. But even without intelligence, Nicholas could accurately judge from the information feedback of Kenbunchiku Haki. 
In the distant camp, there were about 2,076 troops stationed, including about 130 warhorses. For Nicholas, dealing with enemies of this size, if he wanted to, he could easily resolve it with a single thunderous blow and not waste much time. But since he planned to occupy Wayno for a long time, he had to consider more things, such as letting his followers personally defeat these nobles who had always been high above them. Only in this way could their confidence be enhanced, and they slowly developed the consciousness of being human beings. Thinking of this, Nicholas pointed to the camp in the distance surrounded by various warrior family emblems, and said to the leaders of the rebels beside him with an unwavering tone, Have you seen those people down there? They've come this time to take back your land, kill you all, turn your wives into their private property again, and turn your children into slaves for their families for generations. In this war, we will only help you stop the swordsmen in the enemy's camp. The rest of the warriors are up to you to deal with. If you win, you can survive as human beings. If you lose, you will return to the life worse than livestock. Lord Nicholas, rest assured. We will defend everything we have to the death. If they want to take everything from us, then they have to kill us first. All the rebel leaders can be said to have red eyes. Having experienced a life as true human beings, they would never willingly return to being slaves of those people, even if they died. Then go and prepare, use weapons to defend everything you have. Yes. With Nicholas's words, these people all began to return to their respective teams for pre-battle mobilization. Captain, can we just take out those swordsmen in the camp? Vista asked, holding two beautiful swords and looking at the camp of warriors in the distance. For him, a camp without top-notch warriors was something he could destroy in less than five minutes. No. Hearing Nicholas's words, Simon, Vista, Brooke, and even Katie were stunned, all looking at Nicholas. You don't need to deal with them. Just hold them back. Also, take care of Katie more during the battle. Although she is also considered a Zanbato swordsman, she lacks a lot of combat experience. Captain, Katie can handle it. Hearing Nicholas's words, Katie immediately became a bit unhappy. Almost every time there was a battle, Captain and the others treated her like a child. Yeah, Katie can handle it. June reached out and patted Katie's head, comforting her like a child. Sister June, patting my head won't make me grow taller. On the other hand, while Shimatsuki Yajui and his warriors were sharpening their blades, and the rebels were mobilizing for battle. Shimatsuki Yajui, who was resting on a mat, suddenly woke up. Because just now, it seemed like he saw the annihilation of the warrior army, and even the entire Ueno country was engulfed in flames. What's wrong, Lord Yajui? Shimatsuki Yajui's sudden wake-up call made the inner courtier, who was dozing off, suddenly tremble, and he woke up instantly, looking at Shimatsuki Yajui with a nervous face. It's nothing, just had a nightmare. By the way, when is the attack going to happen? Shimatsuki Yajui waved his hand to indicate that there was no problem, picked up the tea and took a sip, and then asked casually. Chapter 146 At noon on the second day, the samurai assembled and moved forward in formation. In the distance ahead, scattered figures began to appear. Enemy scouts spotted. With a warning, several samurai on horseback immediately charged towards the enemy, even mocking them as they rode. These peasants were indeed peasants their scouts didn't even have horses. Were they planning to outrun mounted scouts with their own legs? Soon these mounted scouts reached the enemy, even able to faintly see the expressions on their faces. The samurai drew their swords, intending to split their enemies in half with the help of their horses. They could even see the calm faces of their foes. Wait, no sign of panic. Before he could comprehend, there was a bang, and the foremost samurai's head burst into a spray of blood, even splattering his comrades behind him. He fell like a bird shot from the sky, kicking up dust as he hit the ground. Firearms. It's firearms. Damn it, everyone, scatter. Scatter. Seeing their comrade fall without warning, the other scouts panicked. It was no longer about killing all the enemy scouts it was about reaching them and taking their heads before being gunned down. Some clever samurai even crouched low on their horses to avoid being hit by stray bullets. So that's the power of firearms. Truly terrifying. 
In the distance, left minister watched as several scouts fell before making contact, his eyes gleaming with greed. It's okay, their bullets miss sometimes. As long as we get close, we're stronger. Charge, for the honor of the samurai. The samurai scout, seeing the enemy reloading, raised his sword high, encouraging his comrades. Bang! 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 Continuous gunfire erupted. After this round of shooting, the samurai scouts were upon the enemy. As one samurai scout charged towards an enemy soldier, he realized the man's eyes were filled with mockery. As he looked around in confusion, he realized he was alone his comrades had fallen, and their horses paced calmly nearby. Can we really win? Before he could process this thought, he was shot in the head, a stark reminder that war knows no mercy. With the scouts annihilated, the samurai army began to move. Simultaneously, the militia in the distance also formed up to meet them. The real battle was about to begin. With the annihilation of the samurai scouts, the lower-ranking samurai hadn't yet grasped the severity of the situation. But some astute individuals were beginning to realize something was amiss. According to their initial assessment, the enemy should have been in a panic upon seeing their plight. But now, not only did the enemy not flee, they were slowly approaching, exuding an aura that only a powerful army could possess. But how could this be? Just a while ago, these people were nothing more than inferior individuals. The lower-ranking samurai were eager for battle, believing that as long as their skilled swordsmen intervened, the enemy would surely collapse. Indeed, as the second round of gunfire began, several figures leaped into the air from the samurai camp. With a flash of blades, they sliced through all the bullets, leaving behind explosions of smoke. After cutting down the bullets, these swordsmen charged straight towards the militia. They aimed to eliminate them before they could cause more casualties. All the militia stood ready, seemingly surprised that the swordsmen who had cut the bullets were coming for them. As the distance closed, the impending approach of the enemy made the samurai even more uneasy. However, they gritted their teeth, raised their swords, and charged forward, with the other samurai shouting encouragement behind them. But just as they reached fifty meters from the enemy, they were stunned by what they saw. Three hundred militia stood in neat rows, with their rifles aimed directly at them. The first row crouched, while the second stood, all aiming their rifles. Hundreds of black muzzles were pointed at them. In almost the next moment, the samurai were sprayed with countless blood blossoms as bullets rained down on them. The samurai who had just charged forward fell to the ground. Even the swordsmen struggled to protect themselves. Behind them, more samurai continued to charge, but the militia calmly holstered their guns and walked away without a backward glance. One samurai who hadn't died lifted his head, seeing another group of militia taking their positions, crouching and aiming their rifles at the oncoming second wave of samurai. In less than a second, they fired again, completing the second volley. And the powerful swordsmen were too preoccupied with the skilled fighters among the militia to make a difference. No, stop it. Stop it. Left minister, witnessing the first volley, was dumbfounded. When their skilled swordsmen were easily blocked by the enemy, he realized the severity of the situation. Initially, they thought that the enemy, upon seeing their plight, would panic. But now, not only did the enemy not flee, they were slowly approaching, exuding an aura that only a powerful army could possess. But how could this be? Just a while ago, these people were nothing more than inferior individuals. Chapter 147 Long ago, Wayno country was a powerful nation with incredibly rich mineral resources. Back then, Wayno was abundant with gold, earning it the nickname Golden Country among people. However, that was many centuries ago. Today, the visible amount of gold in Wayno is scarce. But hidden beneath the Earth's surface, Wayno possesses surprisingly abundant gold and other mineral resources. Even after Kaido made Wayno his base of operations several years ago, the mining of Wayno's mineral resources never ceased. After more than a decade of mining, Wayno's mineral resources remained plentiful, seemingly inexhaustible. In addition to the ore known as sake iron used to manufacture weapons, the renowned sea prism stone, capable of countering devil fruit users, is also mined from Wayno. 
Through C. Prism Stone, Kaido even conducted business with the world government. This is one of the reasons why Nicholas wanted to occupy Wano, controlling the C. Prism Stone resources undoubtedly grants significant influence. After the complete conquest of Hakamai, Nicholas chose not to launch attacks on other regions or the flower capital immediately. Instead, he chose to destroy bridges and roads leading to other regions, isolating Hakamai from the rest of Wano. He needed time to fully integrate Hakamai into his control. On this day, the Sea Sovereign floated in the sky. Suddenly, a colossal entity appeared on the sea not far away, gently dissipating the clouds and mist around it with a light breeze. What, what is that? Simon pointed at the distant colossal entity, astonished. Brooke's mouth also hung open, stunned. It was enormous, incredibly massive. Words could hardly describe its size. At a glance, it resembled a mountain, sending shivers down one spine and causing adrenaline to surge. Watching the colossal zoo, Nicholas observed with awe, but quickly regained his composure. Phew! What in the world is that thing? How could it be so massive? Brooke's eyes were filled with shock. He had never seen such a behemoth. Is it a sea king? Vista also stared at the slowly moving behemoth in the distance, equally astonished. Such a colossal entity, the visual impact was unimaginable. Even compared to giant sea kings, it seemed much larger. It's so island. He took a deep breath and said in a deep voice. Island? Brooke was puzzled. He closely observed and faintly discerned forests, lakes, and even buildings on the back of the behemoth, indicating the presence of towns. Are there towns on the back of that giant creature? Nicholas shook his head. To be precise, this colossal creature is carrying a burden. Upon closer observation, Brooke and the others realized that the behemoth's form was that of a giant elephant. Now, observing the giant elephant up close, they noticed its sluggish reaction and slow movements. It seemed that the long years of traveling the seas had dulled its senses almost completely. An ancient giant elephant that has survived for over a thousand years. Nicholas murmured. Seeing the giant elephant in person was far more awe-inspiring than watching it in animation. His mind was filled with countless thoughts. Over a thousand years ago, such massive creatures existed. What mysterious being or power sealed this ancient giant elephant, turning it into an island and obedient to human commands? The existence of this ancient giant elephant made Nicholas even more wary of this world. After all, being able to control such a massive creature even after thousands of years was not something that could be achieved solely through the power of devil fruits. Nicholas, does Zo Island have the mink tribe you mentioned? Standing beside Nicholas, June looked at the distant giant creature and spoke in a serious tone. Yes, and when you see them, you'll be amazed. The mink tribe is as unique a race as the fishmen. Thinking of the various animal forms within the mink tribe and their ability to transform into powerful Sioux long only during the full moon, Nicholas became quite interested. To him, the mink tribe was akin to the beast men race from western fantasy worlds in his previous life, possessing human-level intelligence yet having the bodies of beasts, making them a perfect race. As they approached the ancient giant creature, Brooke and the others felt a bit nervous. After all, such a colossal creature exuded tremendous power just from its appearance. What is that? In the town of the mink tribe, a young feline mink looked on in utter terror at the sea sovereign floating above. At the same time, the sea sovereign slowly entered a relatively calm area of the sea. As Nicholas and the others disembarked, they beheld a whole new world. This. It's a fantastical kingdom. On the back of the giant elephant, seemingly isolated from the rest of the world for a long time, they could see many plants and animals that had disappeared from the outside world. What's more incredible was that they felt no vibration beneath their feet, as if they were standing on solid ground rather than the back of a giant elephant. It was stable, without any undulations. It's humans. What are you people? What are you doing here? Suddenly, a group of mink warriors emerged from the surrounding woods, blocking their path vigilantly. As members of the adventurer group, they were naturally elite warriors of the mink tribe, possessing formidable strength. But for Nicholas and his crew, they were just that. Even on a full moon night, 
these mink would hardly pose a threat to Nicholas and his crew. Mink warriors, greetings. Allow me to introduce myself. Nicholas smiled and said. I am Nicholas, captain of the Freedom Pirates. And these are my crewmates. We come from Wano country. He gestured to the other pirates behind him and displayed the crest of the Kazuki family. Pirates. And that crest. I seem to have seen it before. Right, I remember now. Our ancestors recorded that this crest is related to our mink tribe like brothers. Hearing this, the mink people became curious. After all, Zo had been almost isolated from the outside world, and they were curious about the intentions of these outsiders. Moreover, the ancient record of the mink tribe being brothers with the Kazuki family was a long-standing tradition. Pedro, you're still practicing swordsmanship. Why not join the celebration? Those are friends from Wayno country, and you need to learn to socialize. A mink carrying a jug of wine approached. His face was flushed from drinking. I'm not of age yet, I don't drink. Pedro replied coldly. Ha ha ha, let me tell you, today's wine was brought by those friends from Wayno country. It tastes different from the wine in our furry republic, very mellow. If you don't drink, you'll regret it. With the mention of the wine jug, the man raised it and took another big sip. Phew. Not drinking. I must maintain a strong physique to become a member of the adventurer group. Alcohol will erode my body. Pedro coldly replied, turning back to his sword training. Chapter 148 At the banquet, the Hitsujisuken also occasionally toasted with Nicholas. Ah, Cat Viper and Dog Storm really don't let people rest assured. When we heard the news that those two set sail on a small boat, we were worried for quite a while. We even suspected that they might have perished at sea. But those two little fellows actually managed to arrive at Wano by chance. The Hitsujisuken raised his wine bowl and took a hearty drink, clearly happy to hear the news of Dog Storm and Cat Viper's safety. After the toast, Nicholas turned to the Hitsujisuken and said, we came here this time hoping to obtain a copy of the historical text. We hope that the Hitsujisuken can help us. For Nicholas, he actually knew that the historical text of the Mink tribe was in the Whale Forest. However, he wouldn't reveal this directly because he wanted to gather more information from the Hitsujisuken. Oh. No problem. According to the records, the dawn of the world is approaching. Have you, in Wano, made preparations to welcome the founding of your nation? The Hitsujisuken, seemingly unsurprised, regarded the historical text as not particularly precious. The dawn of the world. Nicholas asked with some confusion. He had seen the term dawn of the world multiple times in manga, whether it was the promised one awaited by Fishman Island or later when Pedro sacrificed fifty years of his life in the Grand Line just to see the dawn of the world arrive. It seemed that the dawn of the world was recorded among many races related to Joy Boy. Yes, the dawn of the world. According to the legends left by our ancestors, when the drums sound, the warriors of the past will respond to the call and gather under the banner of the legendary figure. At that time, we will once again wage war against the shadows that shroud the world, thus bringing true peace to the entire world. At that time, our mink tribe will also no longer be confined to Zo for generations, and we will gain true freedom. The Hitsujisuken spoke with longing. Nicholas. Finally found you, bastard. Have you decided how you want to die? You scum. Just as Nicholas was about to continue questioning, a burly man with an oval-shaped head walked over from a distance, followed by a group of fierce-looking pirates. They were none other than the Eight Treasure Water Army, the legitimate pirates of the Kano country in the West Sea. All the minks at the banquet stood up and looked in the direction of the voice. They knew that if the enemy could appear here, it meant that their external defenses had been breached. Hey hey, who is that guy with the oval-shaped head? How did he find his way here? Many minks whispered to each other. Initially, it was quite normal for outsiders to stray into Zo. After all, Zo roamed the seas day and night, and although it didn't have a fixed route, it inevitably encountered some pirate ships during its journey. But now, these suddenly appearing pirates seemed to know Nicholas and his crew. Moreover, the relationship between the two sides didn't seem to be good, which made the minks feel wary. 
That's the leader of the Eight Treasure Water Army, Don Chinjo, or rather, because of his strange cone-shaped head, he's called Chinjo the Drill. Simon explained patiently. After all, he had personally participated in the destruction of the Kano country's navy in the West Blue Sea. Don Chinjo. Many minks were puzzled by his strange appearance. He's called Don Chinjo because of his unique cone-shaped head, coupled with his formidable hockey. There's hardly any enemy who can withstand his attacks. Simon continued patiently. Conical head? His head. Doesn't look anything like a cone, does it? Simon. His head was flattened by a powerful person with a punch. Nicholas explained from the side. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Flattened head, that's really hilarious. Many young minks couldn't help laughing when they heard this. You damn brat, have you laughed enough? Chinjo's roar, accompanied by the intimidating aura, made many minks bristle, but surprisingly, none of them fainted. Nicholas also noticed this situation. He could only say that in this world, besides humans, other races more or less had some racial bonuses. Giants had strength and physique, dwarves had explosiveness and speed, fishmen, long arms, long legs. For Chinjo, the reason why he chose to find Nicholas was largely because he realized his own weakness during the battle with Garp. Once a leading figure in the Kano country's Eight Treasure Water Army, Chinjo, as one of the top fighters of the Kano country, was full of confidence. But not long ago, during the battle with Garp, he was directly punched in the head, flattening his once proud conical head. One could say that Garp's punch made him doubt his own life. Moreover, if facing the monster standing with Garp, wouldn't it be the same as saying that he himself was weak? In that case, wouldn't he be unable to avenge his son? And as he grew older, the hope of revenge would only become more and more distant. So Chinjo made up his mind. No matter what, he had to find Nicholas for revenge, even if the final result was death. Bastard brat, what kind of look is that in your eyes? Do you not believe that I will? Are you done with your nonsense? Nicholas' cold voice interrupted him. What? Chinjo was a bit confused. Wasn't trash talking before a fight a standard procedure? After you're done with your nonsense, it's time for you to go to hell. Nicholas' pupils flickered, and then a thunderbolt, several tens of meters thick, slashed toward Chinjo's head from above. You damn brat, you're really. Really underestimating me. The thunder dissipated, and Chinjo trembled with anger. The black hockey covering his body quickly faded away, and at the same time, an unusual smell emanated from his body. The intense pain coursing through his body, along with Nicholas' indifferent gaze, ignited Chinjo's fighting spirit. He leaped into the air, then reversed his body. Chapter 149 Chinjo twitched at the corner of his mouth, while at the same time, he secretly resolved to make this ignorant kid know how tough he was. After all, for Chinjo, even when strong individuals are opposed to each other, they often have a mutual respect. And the attitude of the other party right now only proves one thing, that in his heart, he doesn't consider himself worthy of equal interaction with him. This is unforgivable. However, Nicholas seemed to have no intention of wasting words with him at all. He immediately sent several thunderbolts one after another towards him, while at the same time, hundreds of floating wine iron beads appeared around him, continuously shooting towards him. Facing Nicholas's attack, Chinjo's eyes narrowed, and a tremendously fierce aura suddenly burst out of him, surging in all directions. As he erupted with the conqueror's hockey, the vital points of Chinjo's body were quickly wrapped in dark armament hockey, and then he swiftly charged towards Nicholas. His rich combat experience told him that when facing such a natural opponent, the best way was to quickly approach them and then suppress them with armament hockey and martial arts. Ha! Ah! Chinjo was laughing savagely as he charged towards Nicholas, but suddenly he was struck by lightning. The paralysis effect of the thunder directly immobilized him, and he was hit by dozens of thunderbolts one after another. Making Chinjo feel like his body was hotter than a burning iron, and he was in excruciating pain, as if someone had put him in an oven. Ah! Caught off guard by consecutive blows, Chinjo couldn't help but cry out in pain. He realized that if this continued, he would die. 
so he forcefully lifted his right foot and stomped fiercely on the ground. With tremendous force, the ground beneath Chinjo's feet collapsed instantly, and at the same time, lightning from above also smashed him into the ground. When the lightning disappeared, there was only a ruin where Chinjo had stood, and Chinjo's figure was nowhere to be seen. Just as everyone was looking around for Chinjo's figure, the ground under Nicholas's feet suddenly collapsed, and then a pair of palms covered with armament hockey, like a fan, firmly grasped Nicholas's legs. I've got you. Looking at Nicholas caught by himself, Chinjo's face showed a sinister smile. Once a devil fruit user was captured by armament hockey, it was his turn next. Have you ever been kicked by lightning? Just as Chinjo was about to grab the two legs and tear apart the little brat in front of him who didn't know his own strength, a voice suddenly came from behind him, causing him to freeze. When did you? Then, in Chinjo's peripheral vision, Nicholas appeared in the sky behind him, and the Nicholas in his hand also began to dissipate into lightning. At the same time, Nicholas appeared behind him, and his right leg, surging with lightning, suddenly kicked out, directly hitting Chinjo's spine. Even though he had formed armor with armament hockey on his back at the last moment, he was still kicked away like a soccer ball, bouncing several times on the ground before finally crashing into an ancient building. Nicholas did not follow up, as the feeling of the kick just now made him realize that Chinjo's spine had been shattered, and Chinjo was now basically a useless person. You're truly a terrifying guy. Feeling the excruciating pain coming from his back and the numbness in his lower body, Chinjo said with dread. With the medical skills of the One Piece world and the magical devil fruit abilities, a broken spine was not impossible to treat, but the premise was that the enemy would give him a chance. Truly terrifying. But. Chinjo said, covering his entire body with armament hockey, even giving up defense on other parts of his body. With a fierce roar, he suddenly pushed himself up with both hands, giving himself a huge thrust, and then reversed his body in midair. The armament hockey wrapped around his head, making it pitch black. The shock waves of the eight blows fist were completely concentrated on the flat top of his head, as he plummeted towards Nicholas. My dignity will not allow you to trample upon it. Eight blows fist secret technique, unwoven dragon unwoven nail. The eight blows fist was originally a powerful martial art that combined offense and defense, and Chinjo now abandoned his defense, concentrating all his strength on a single point on his head. For Chinjo, this was his strongest moment, but also his weakest moment. Facing Chinjo's desperate blow, Nicholas's expression remained calm. His observation hockey radiated silently, capturing every movement of Chinjo, then he disappeared completely in front of Chinjo. Boom! Moo! The earth kept trembling and tearing apart. Chinjo's final blow missed, unstoppable as it was, piercing through the earth all the way to the body of the main elephant, causing a huge explosion. Even the sluggish nerves of the main elephant reacted to Chinjo's blow. And when the smoke cleared, a huge pit appeared where Chinjo had struck. Chinjo, lying in the center of the pit, could still be seen below, and above him, one could even see the pink muscle texture of the main elephant. As Chinjo lay in the pit, his head felt dizzy, as if there was a buzzing noise constantly ringing in his ears. The once hardest part of his body, his skull, was now full of cracks, and his lower body, which was not covered with armament hockey, was now hanging on a nearby building. In contrast, Nicholas, not only had a calm aura and a steady posture, but there wasn't even a trace of damage to his clothes. Anyone with discerning eyes could see that this was an unequal battle. It could be said that Nicholas, with his observation hockey surpassing Chinjo, faced Chinjo's attack as if he were playing with a child, as no matter how powerful the attack was, it would miss. You bastard! Looking at Nicholas towering over him at the edge of the pit, Chinjo spat out blood containing fragments of his internal organs from his mouth, his eyes filled with unwillingness. Is this your final words? As Nicholas spoke, he flicked his right thumb, and a wine iron bead the size of a fingernail pierced through Chinjo's skull, the leader of the eight treasure water navy, a key figure among the twelve pillars. Looking at Chinjo's head hanging limply and his internal organs spilling out, he was definitely dead beyond death. There was silence in the arena, especially among the eight treasure water navy who had come with Chinjo. No one dared to believe that Chinjo, who had once roamed the seas and even contended with Roger, Garp, 
would die like this. Impossible, this is absolutely impossible. How could Chinjo, who is so powerful, die like this? Impossible. Faced with the unbelieving Eight Treasure Water Navy, Nicholas chose not to take action, but instead looked towards Hitsujisuken. And the Hitsujisuken gestured to the furry tribe warriors beside him. The furry tribe warriors who received the order quickly took out their weapons and began to kill the Eight Treasure Navy. Chapter 150 As the minks wiped out all of the Eight Treasure Water Army and cleared the battlefield, Nicholas approached Hitsujisuken. You must have realized by now that we are not members of the Kazuki family, right? Is it really that important whether you're from the Kazuki family or not? Since you've managed to reach here and even mentioned the relationship between the Kazuki and the Minx, it means you already know that thing is in Zo. Moreover, Hitsujisuken's gaze turned towards where the sea sovereign that was parked as he chuckled, those hermits who've isolated themselves for hundreds of years can't produce something like that, can they? And, most importantly, you're quite powerful, strong enough that all the warriors of the furry kingdom combined may not be your match. So, is it necessary to sacrifice lives needlessly? I am the king elected by all the citizens of the furry kingdom. As a king, I am responsible to all my citizens. Moreover, that thing only becomes useful when all four pieces are gathered, right? Since the Kazuki couldn't even hold on to the peace they had, why should we sacrifice the lives of our citizens? Although I also look forward to seeing the dawn of the world, it's only meaningful if all the citizens of the furry kingdom witness it together. Upon hearing the words of Hitsujisuken, Nicholas fell silent, acknowledging that compared to his successor, Inurashi Dog Hurricane and Nekamamushi Cat Viper, this one was a qualified king. Don't worry, once we obtain the true historical texts, we'll leave. For Nicholas, there were two pieces of historical texts he could acquire now, one from the Whale Forest in Zo, and the other from the current Undersea Dragon Palace. As for the one from Wano Country, it was only a matter of time, but the trickier one was the piece in Big Mom's possession, as Nicholas wasn't sure when she had obtained it. Thank you, sir. In an unknown sea area, thousands of meters above the sky. Islands floated in the air, surrounded by clouds, exuding a unique charm under the sunlight. It was a scene that ordinary people would find hard to imagine, gigantic islands floating thousands of meters above the ground. At the center of the most prominent medium-sized island stood a magnificent group of buildings. Damn it, how is this possible? How could Roger? Inside the palace, numerous prominent pirates sat cross-legged on the ground, and at the top sat a man with thick golden hair, resembling a lion's mane, staring at the intelligence in his hand, smashing the table beside him with a punch. Yes, this man was Shiki, a great pirate who rivaled G.O.L.D. Roger and Edward Newgate, known as the Golden Lion. A man who dominated the skies. This can't be true. Looking at the intelligence in his hand, veins popped on Shiki's forehead. Captain, what's happening? Pirates below couldn't help but ask, seeing Shiki's rage. After all, not long ago, Shiki had started sending people to secretly gather certain information after receiving a mysterious call. And what he held in his hand now was the intelligence that had been returned. Is it true? I will confirm it myself. Everyone, prepare to set sail, find me Roger's location. Tearing up the intelligence in his hand, Shiki's face was filled with anger, and his eyes were full of ferocity, his golden hair even fluttering without any wind, indicating his extreme rage. On the sea surface, gunfire roared, and the pungent smell of gunpowder made it hard to breathe. The deck's been hit, repair it quickly. Counterattack, counterattack now. Damn it, is that guy Shiki out of his mind? That guy has always been crazy. Gabon, go watch the stern, don't let those guys steal from our behind. Shanks, take buggy and get into the cabin. We don't have time to look after you in this level of battle. Ha ha ha, all hands of the flying fleet, mobilize. Shiki really knows how to make a grand move. Divine departure. The voices resounded on the deck of the Oro Jackson, almost entirely filled with pirates under Shiki's banner. This was a large-scale fleet, with a total of fifty to sixty ships of various sizes, all angrily pouring their firepower towards the central Oro Jackson. But facing the overwhelming elites of the Roger pirates, their attacks were almost ineffective. 
Since the start of the battle, they had already lost several ships. Captain, the Roger pirate's defense is too strong, we can't break through. Anxious voices echoed from one of the ships in the middle. Continue the attack, that guy Roger must die in my hands. Let him submit. A man with lion-like golden hair, sitting in the middle of the deck, looked at the distant battlefield like a general, exuding an aura of majesty and dominance. Yes, sir. The pirates gritted their teeth and responded loudly, but they felt helpless. The Roger pirates were not ordinary enemies. Even their ordinary crew members were enough to match the captains on their ships. To break through their defense line and launch an attack was an extremely difficult task. They also had to beware of the counterattacks from the Roger pirates at any time. However, Shiki had long established his authority in the flying fleet, and they had no choice but to obey. Sweeping his gaze over the battlefield ahead, watching the cannonballs falling into the sea, causing waves, and the burning and sinking ships, Shiki's face was dignified, his eyes full of anger. Originally, on the sea, there was a tripartite balance between Whitebeard, Roger, and him. The three of them propped up this entire era. Nicholas, Charlotte Lin Lin, and even the emerging beast pirates were not enough to compete with the three of them in his eyes. But gradually, Shiki realized that Whitebeard's goal was just to turn his pirate crew into a big family, without any ambition to dominate. And the same went for Roger, who just wanted to explore the undiscovered things on the sea, similarly lacking any ambition to dominate. Looking at it this way, his ambition to see the birth of the king of the sea among the three of them seemed foolish. Moreover, the person he had considered his lifelong enemy, Roger, was actually on his deathbed, which made Shiki even more furious. If he didn't defeat Roger and Whitebeard, then even if he became the king of the sea, he would feel like it was something bestowed upon him by others. Roger. I will definitely defeat you with my own hands. Make you submit. With a deep voice echoing, Shiki's presence surged, rushing towards the sea ahead, and for a moment, the wind and clouds changed, ripples appeared in the space, and the sea surged with monstrous waves. The flying fleet pirates all widened their eyes, shocked by this powerful presence, their minds trembling. Ha ha ha, Shiki, haven't you woken up yet? With laughter echoing, four equally powerful auras emanated from the Oro Jackson. Hey, Buggy, wake up. Feeling the overwhelming will outside the cabin, Shank sweated profusely, trying to wake up his comrade, who was rolling his eyes and fainting with a white nose, inside. Chapter 151 At Marineford, due to the conflict between the Roger Pirates and the Golden Lion Flying Pirates, the Marines have also become more vigilant. After all, a clash between such powerful pirate crews could easily escalate into a large-scale battle that affects the entire New World. In such a scenario, island factions allied with either the Roger or the Golden Lion crew might clash. Even individuals like Whitebeard Edward Newgate, Charlotte Lin Lin, Kaido, who recently escaped from a marine research facility. The elusive thunder god Nicholas, and ambitious pirates might all get involved, so the marines must be prepared to prevent the most dangerous outcomes. Isn't this good? Let them kill each other. Admiral Zephyr, draped in a marine cloak, sat on the sofa and said coldly, showing disgust toward pirates after the events a few years ago. Indeed, pirates killing each other could benefit us, but we must prevent the emergence of a single dominant force in the chaos. The reason why pirates cannot confront the marines directly is because of their disarray and mutual hostility. Even the former pirate king, Rox, couldn't gather all the pirates. If a figure capable of commanding the New World pirates were to emerge, it would be a disaster for the entire world. Admiral Sengoku spoke solemnly. Sengoku is right. What we want is a stable sea. After years of consolidation, the Marines have almost completely controlled the Four Blues and the first half of the Grand Line. Now we just need an opportunity. When the pirates in the New World exhaust each other and are vulnerable, we'll sweep them all away. As the chief of staff of the marines and the person in charge of clearing the North Blue, Tsuru, was quite satisfied with the suggestion made by Dragon. With the marines' large-scale actions, the number of pirates has significantly decreased, and there has been a noticeable improvement in security throughout the Four Blues. By the way, Garp, where's Dragon? Sengoku looked at Garp and asked. Huh. 
I don't know where that kid is. I haven't contacted him in almost half a year. Garp, who was sleeping, was awakened and responded dazedly. You fool, don't you even know where your son is? Upon hearing this, Sengoku's forehead bulged with veins. Obviously, he was worried about Dragon, as it's not common for a Marine Vice Admiral to disappear for extended periods, even though he reports to headquarters regularly. Moreover, with a code name, he was practically the guaranteed next candidate for Admiral. Being so inactive didn't seem right. Never mind, that kid has his own mind. Anyway, I can't control him anymore. Oh, I heard that those kids from the training camp are about to graduate. Send some of them to me. I'll take them to the new world to liven things up a bit. Garp said with a smile to Sengoku. Get lost. The guy you brought back last time is already assigned to your ship. Also, Tsuru, I'll have Isho report to your side soon. Compared to his attitude towards Garp, Sengoku's tone towards Tsuru was much milder. Oh, is that the blind swordsman Isho who already has a reputation at Marine Headquarters? Tsuru asked with interest. Sengoku nodded, that's the result of discussions between Zephyr and me. Isho is a man filled with justice and compassion for the weak, even though he's blind. His unwavering commitment to justice is undeniable. However, precisely because of this, I hope you can take him under your wing and nurture him. I see, I understand. Tsuru nodded, showing that she understood. Although Sengoku and Zephyr didn't explicitly say it, it was evident from their expressions that they wanted to protect the young man named Isho. After all, individuals full of passion for justice often tend to question it after witnessing certain things. All right, let's discuss the most important matter today, which is how we should deal with the Roger Pirates. I believe you've all seen the intelligence. As they mentioned the intelligence, the expressions of everyone present became serious, even Garp's demeanor became solemn. We've seen it. It's hard to imagine that such a powerful man will soon meet his end. Zephyr tapped the table lightly with his fingers, feeling nostalgic. They, including Garp, Sengoku, and Zephyr, had all dealt with Roger multiple times. Even Dragon had formulated several plans against the Roger pirates. Now, suddenly receiving news that their old adversary would soon meet his end felt surreal. What's your opinion, Tsuru? Sengoku looked at Tsuru and asked. The dissolution of the Roger pirates is foreseeable, so the threat they pose to the marines in the future is almost negligible. We don't need to go all out against them. After all, adversaries pushed to the brink are capable of unimaginable acts. Knowing Roger's character, he wouldn't directly attack a nation, but not long ago, he did. And that nation, which lost all its military forces, was annexed by another country a week later. My suggestion is, we continue the pursuit of Roger, but don't push him too hard. Our focus should mainly be on the Whitebeard Pirates and the Golden Lion Pirates. After finishing, Tsuru paused, pondered for a moment, and then frowned, and, expedite the collection of intelligence on the Beast Pirates by the Marine Intelligence Department and the Cipher Pull Department. I have a feeling that someone like Nicholas, who suddenly went silent, is definitely plotting something. While the high-ranking Marines were discussing, on a hill behind the Marine training camp not far from Marine headquarters, Isho sat cross-legged on a rock, overlooking the bustling port with numerous warships. Dragon San, you're here. Without turning his head, Isho spoke, and behind him, in the empty space, Dragon's figure appeared. You have sharp perception, Isho-sama. Dragon, looking at Isho's back, showed his trademark smile. It seems that what Nicholas said is true. Dragon San has already made a decision. Isho sighed. Dragon also stepped forward and stood beside Isho, looking at the imposing Marine headquarters in the distance. The Marines' ideology conflicts with mine, and I cannot change the Marines or this world within it. This world shouldn't be like this, so Isho sama, would you be willing to help me? Let's change this world together. Dragon extended an invitation to Isho. Dragon San, when Nicholas recommended me to join the Marines, he told me that I could see the essence of this world more clearly. Now, I have indeed seen many unpleasant things, but I have also seen many shining aspects within the Marines. So, I will continue to stay in the Marines and try to change it from inside. 
Isho spoke in a solemn tone. In the Marines, he saw individuals oppressing ordinary people and colluding with pirates, but he also saw Marines fighting to protect ordinary people against pirates, even though they were weaker. Seeing someone so weak but still daring to stand up to the powerful was admirable. Then, let's hope for a better future for both of us, Ishosama. As he finished speaking, Dragon's figure had disappeared. Hopefully, we will see the dawn of a new world, because the time before dawn is the darkest and most chaotic. After speaking softly, Isho got up, picked up his sword cane, tapped the ground, and walked down the mountain towards the base. Chapter 152 This is the main text of history. The text is really strange. In Hakamai, Nicholas and others, who obtained the main text of history from Zo, gathered around the table, staring blankly at the historical text on the table. Strictly speaking, among the entire Freeman pirates, only June and Katie are cultured individuals, and Nicholas can be considered half due to his background. As for Vista, Simon, and Brooke, they are three illiterates. It's fine to let them fight, but asking them to study historical texts is no different from killing them. These words should be from a thousand years ago, and there is no resemblance to the current common language. June frowned and said, obviously, the so-called historical text should be an ancient script. Under normal circumstances, based on some historical documents and records, one can try to deduce its meaning using the current language. However, with the existence of a hundred-year gap, not only did historical documents have gaps, but the same script also had gaps. Unless someone has been preserving various materials from the past, or analyzing them from historical ruins, it is difficult to decipher the meaning of these words. Captain, can I make a copy for research? June looked at Nicholas and asked. Although she and Nicholas had a good relationship, asking directly, Nicholas would surely agree, but they are still a group. You can just take it, anyway, we can't understand it. Nicholas waved his hand. On the other side, in the flower capital, various daimyos from the capital gathered. Everyone, you must be aware of what happened in Hakamai, right? How do you view this? Dressed in gorgeous attire, Kurizumi Orochi sat on the shogun's seat, looking at the daimyos from various regions and asked. Obviously, this was the result of his discussions with Kurizumi Higarashi and Kurizumi Semimaru. Although they already have a certain amount of hidden power, they are preparing for the future. They cannot use it to suppress Hakamai. Now that Hakamai has cut off its ties with other regions, we temporarily do not know the situation inside Hakamai. Moreover, the enemy has amassed a large number of troops in the areas bordering each region. Without a large number of troops, it is impossible to break through. In addition, according to the intelligence we received, Daimyo Shimatsuki Yajui has been captured, and his samurai forces have been wiped out. Moreover, those thieves have redistributed the land, dividing the wealth accumulated by countless generations of samurai. This has caused all the common people in Hakamai to lean toward them. If we go to war with Hakamai, we will not only face those rebels, but also the common people on the land of Hakamai. The daimyo of Kibi spoke solemnly. Obviously, the rebellion in Hakamai had completely caught them off guard. So, how many troops can each daimyo mobilize? Kurizumi Orochi looked at everyone, obviously, in his opinion, this is the best opportunity to weaken the strength of these daimyos. Whether it's them or both sides of Hakamai, the more losses they suffer, the more advantageous it is for him. We, the Ringo, have a harsh environment, and we can mobilize a total of 200 samurai. Shimatsuki Ashimaru spoke. We, the Udon, can mobilize 300 samurai and provide weapons. We, the Kibi, can mobilize 100 samurai. Hearing these words, Kurizumi Oroki's face slowly became numb. It only adds up to a thousand people. It is impossible to expect these people to recapture Hakamai. After all, more than 2,000 samurai under Daimyo Shimatsuki Yajui were wiped out. Is it that at this time, you still want to preserve your strength? Are you just going to watch those rebels plague Ueno in the future? Facing the instigation of Orochi, everyone remained unmoved, and even Denjiro had time to calculate how many days it would take to complete the construction of the Kirasuna Reservoir. In the end, this conversation ended without agreement. Damn it! Damn it! 
Back in the bedroom, Orochi directly threw various porcelain items on the ground, venting his anger. And beside him, the face of a courtier changed for a while, revealing the face of Kurazumi Higarashi. Is the venting enough? Kurazumi Higarashi looked at Orochi and asked. Those guys are really unreasonable. The calmed down Orochi said with a fierce look. Is it that you haven't noticed that those guys are unwilling to use all their troops just to guard against you? After all, the black history of the Kurazumi family is deeply ingrained in their hearts. Kurazumi Higarashi's face turned gloomy. What should we do then? If we wait for Odin to come back, we will lose the position of shogun that we have worked so hard to obtain. Orochi was extremely irritable. It can be said that before Odin returns, weakening the strength of various daimyos in Ueno, coupled with the power he has secretly accumulated, may still be able to resist Odin and finally seize the position of shogun in Ueno. But now, those guys have chosen to preserve their strength. Once Odin returns, as long as he calls for support, there will be a large number of supporters. By then, he will just have to step down dejectedly. And, my revenge is not yet complete. The hatred of those Kurizumi who were beaten, thrown into the river, beheaded, and burned alive is all on me. Orochi roared in anger, for him, the parents burned to death in the fire, the playmates who were beaten, thrown into the river and laughed at by those righteous people, are his eternal shadows. For him, the position of shogun in Ueno is not so important, what is important is to retaliate against this country. Even because of the excitement of emotions, several snake heads began to emerge from his collar. And Kurizumi Higarashi looked at the snake heads on Oroki's body, feeling a bit panicked for a while. In that case, in order to completely seize Ueno and retaliate against this country, we just need to lure that guy here. After all, at this time, he is eager for a territory that can provide a large amount of resources to develop his forces. Kurizumi Higarashi said with a sinister smile. Who? All sixteen eyes of Orochi stared at Kurizumi Higarashi. Kaido, where are we going next? In a luxurious building full of Nordic style, Kaido was sitting on the sofa, drinking wine leisurely. And beside him, a young man with black wings, brown skin, and white hair was looking at him and asking. Around the two of them, there were scattered corpses all over the ground, obviously they were unwelcome visitors. Gulp gulp gulp. After drinking heavily, Kaido looked at the young man in front of him and said, King, next, we need to recruit soldiers and expand our strength, then launch a grand war that will shock the world. What that guy rocks couldn't achieve, I will do. But it's really interesting, you moon tribe remnants once considered yourselves gods, but now you've become pitiful test subjects, with even your former dwelling places invaded by others. It's truly pathetic. Gods. They were just some arrogant fellows who called themselves that. Just like those pigs in Mary Geos now, not just anyone can bear the title of God. But they're all just a bunch of. Bururu. 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 Just as King was about to speak, the Den Den Mushi on Kaido's waist began to ring. Chapter 153 The climate in the New World is capricious and ever-changing, but this capricious and ever-changing weather doesn't seem to affect the islands of the New World. Even if there is an impact, compared to the exaggerated natural phenomena at sea, the islands are much milder, seemingly due to the magnetic field carried by the islands mediating such harsh weather. At this moment, outside of the land of Ueno, dark clouds covered the sky, fierce winds blew, stirring up terrifying waves, and fist-sized downpours relentlessly hammered into the sea. Meanwhile, on the tumultuous sea, a massive pirate ship bobbed up and down with the waves. Hey, what's going on? Why did the weather suddenly become so terrible? I have no idea, according to the forecast, the weather shouldn't be like this. How much longer until we reach the nearest island? According to the compass, we'll be there soon. Once we enter the harbor, we'll be safe. Suddenly. All the pirates on this pirate ship suddenly felt a palpitation. As seasoned pirates who have navigated the new world, these people almost simultaneously had a slight change in their gaze. Quickly gripping the hilts of the long swords hanging from their waists, then abruptly looking up at the night sky where the disturbance originated. Almost at the same time. 
accompanied by a lightning bolt illuminating the night sky. What they saw was a blue dragon meandering through the night sky, stepping on flames. That's a dragon. Looking at the giant dragon appearing in the night sky, the members of the pirate crew were dumbfounded. Clearly, they couldn't fathom why such a legendary creature would appear here. In the night sky. The dragon seemed to have noticed them, its cold eyes scanning towards the sea, and soon the gazes of both sides met in the air. Facing the oppressive aura emanating from this terrifying creature, many pirates couldn't help but swallow hard, and their muscles trembled uncontrollably. At that moment. Boom. Without warning, a thick purple lightning bolt flashed out of the clouds, striking towards the direction where the pirates were. In an instant, the pirate crew, along with the pirate ship, were engulfed in dazzling purple lightning. Kaido. Just as the dragon was about to leave, a roar suddenly came from the direction of the pirate ship, and a red light shot up from the ship. Apparently, there were survivors from the previous strike, and they recognized Kaido. In the night sky. Kaido, in dragon form, immediately sensed the commotion on the sea surface. With fierce and indifferent eyes, a disdainful expression appeared on his face. Faced with such a furious attack. Kaido could easily dodge by twisting his body, but there was no need. Boom! The attack struck Kaido's dragon body. Then, the shockwaves dispersed. This seemingly fierce attack did not cause any harm to Kaido, not even leaving a trace of damage. What a joke! The person on the pirate ship whose upper body had turned into a cannon couldn't believe it. This attack was almost his strongest. The dragon-shaped Kaido lowered his head and looked down at the cannon man, saying coldly, Huh, your attack is far inferior to that guy from Vegapunk. Thinking of Vegapunk's methods, Kaido felt his body starting to ache faintly. Pain, it's too painful. Then, with a massive sweep of his dragon body, Kaido released a series of long wind blades, flying towards the pirate ship below. There were too many wind blades, completely sealing off any space for evasion. And the speed was extremely fast, arriving in front of the cannon man in the blink of an eye. Hmm. This guy. The cannon man's heart trembled, quickly transforming his upper body into a gatling form, and solidifying his armament hockey, covering his body. Bullets shot out like raindrops, aiming at the oncoming wind blades. He didn't even think about dodging the wind blades. Once a devil fruit user lost their footing on the sea, there was only one way to go. So he only thought about using his powerful firepower to forcibly offset the wind blades, thus neutralizing this formidable attack. But. As his bullets hit the wind blades, he realized how naive he was. This power, this intensity, this sharpness. Only to see the wind blades pierce through the barrage and cut into the cannon man's body. Swoosh. In the pouring rain, limbs and innards mixed with a large amount of blood splattered into the air. The captain of the weapons pirates, with a shocked expression, dropped his head, still wearing an incredulous look even as his head fell to the ground. This. Was an absolute disparity. Lord Kaido, aren't we supposed to expand our influence? That guy has some strength, why not recruit him? Looking at the sinking ship below, a pteranodon, with wings burning in flames, flapped its wings beside Kaido and asked. The reason why the members of the weapons pirates didn't notice this winged dragon earlier was that compared to Kaido's huge dragon body, this winged dragon was too small. Unfortunately, he's not an animal type. We're forming a pirate crew consisting entirely of animal type devil fruit users. All right, King, let's hurry up and head to the land of Wano. I can't wait to see my territory. Said Kaido confidently, according to the information provided by King, the only thing to be feared in the land of Wano right now was the renowned Kinemon, while the other so called samurai were all inferior in Kaido's eyes. Chapter 154 Lord Kaido, those samurais are quite troublesome. Watching Kaido's confident demeanor, Kurizumi Orochi couldn't help but speak up. At this point, Kaido was his last hope for revenge against Wano country. If Kaido couldn't suppress Wano country, then his good days were likely numbered. Samurais? Kaido shook his head disdainfully. If those samurais were truly formidable, Wano country wouldn't have remained closed off for so long. 
Don't underestimate those samurais, Lord Kaido. Take the renowned name in Ringo, Shimatsuki Ashimaru, for example. His ancestor, Shimatsuki Ryuma, is said to have beheaded a divine dragon in the skies of Ueno. It said that at that time, the divine dragon was directly decapitated, and its blood stained the land of Ueno. Kurazumi Orochi spoke with a fawning smile. What did you say? With Kurazumi Oroki's words, Kaido erupted in fury. If what was said was true, then the previous user of the fish fish fruit, mythical Zoan, dragon form, had been beheaded in Ueno. This was a disgrace for Kaido as a fellow devil fruit user. Subsequently, a strong wind swept through the room, and Kaido's body began to transform into a dragon. He flew out of the window, transforming into a massive dragon in the sky, heading towards Ringo. Lord Kaido. Seeing this, King followed suit, leaping out of the window and transforming into his toothless winged dragon form to chase after Kaido. Ha ha ha, it seems that Kaido is also a simple-minded fellow. Watching Kaido and King disappear into the distance, Kurizumi Orochi let out a strange laugh. Dum dum. Accompanied by the sound of musical instruments, Kurizumi Higarashi approached Orochi, watching the dragon in the sky and King chasing after him, and said, that's because of confidence in one's own strength. If you, Lord Orochi, had the power of the top-tier figures on the sea, you could easily take over Wano country. Lord, can we just sit idly by while Hakamai falls? Lord Yajui is a member of the Shimatsuki clan after all. Exactly, we can't just stand by and watch. Inside the mansion of the Ringo Daimyo, several samurais spoke earnestly to Shimatsuki Ashimaru sitting at the head. However, Shimatsuki Ashimaru just picked up his sake gourd, took a few sips, wiped his mouth, and looked at them. Seeing Shimatsuki Ashimaru's actions, all the samurais quieted down. Ever since the Shimatsuki clan became the daimyo of Hakamai, they've cut off ties with the Shimatsuki clan of Ringo. Don't forget, if it weren't for the poisoning of the Kazuki clan by the Kurizumi clan, the daimyo of Hakamai wouldn't have fallen to the Shimatsuki clan. The fact that the Shimatsuki clan could hold the positions of daimyo in both Hakamai and Ringo might make it seem like they were second only to the Kazuki clan in terms of strength. But the forced departure of Shimatsuki Kosaburo from Ueno was a huge blow to the Shimatsuki clan. Only the samurais understood the immense value of a master swordsmith like Kosaburo, who could have attracted countless samurais to join the Shimatsuki clan by forging exceptional swords. At that moment, a strong wind arose outside, and the samurais inside the room sensed something amiss. Shimatsuki Ashimaru was the first to grab his sword and rush to the rooftop. Then, figures appeared from all around, all facing upwards. That's a dragon. Seeing the dragon in the night sky, many samurais were filled with fear. Shimatsuki Ashimaru, on the other hand, had a sudden palpitation in his heart and shivered all over. As someone who had heard stories of his ancestors slaying dragons since childhood, he knew how terrifying these mythical creatures were. But as someone who aspired to surpass his ancestors, he saw an opportunity right before him. As the massive dragon's cold eyes swept over the ground, they met Shimatsuki Ashimaru's trembling figure. He could tell that the opponent was not afraid, but excited. Clang! Shimatsuki Ashimaru drew his sword in a swift motion. Veins popped on his forehead. Dual sword style, great dragon whirlwind. Shimatsuki Ashimaru swung his sword with all his might, unleashing a massive tornado of sword energy towards the dragon in the sky. In the night sky, Kaido, transformed into a dragon, noticed the approaching tornado of sword energy. He looked down at Shimatsuki Ashimaru, wearing a cold smirk. Is this all you've got? This result left Shimatsuki Ashimaru incredulous, and the surrounding samurais were equally shocked. Kaido's dragon body, unaffected by the seemingly powerful dual sword style Great Dragon Whirlwind, didn't sustain any damage, not even a scratch. If anything, his scales gleamed brighter after the attack, as if they had received a polish. The outcome left Shimatsuki Ashimaru incredulous, and the surrounding samurais were equally astonished. Dragon form Kaido looked down at Shimatsuki Ashimaru, nostrils spewing out sparks, and coldly said, Oh ho ho so this is the descendant of the dragon-slaying warrior from years past. Quite disappointing. 
It seems that what your ancestors slew was nothing but a pseudo-dragon with an empty reputation. Do not tarnish the name of our ancestors. Follow me, everyone, let's slay the dragon. As soon as the words fell, Shimatsuki Ashimaru and the surrounding samurais directly shot up from the ground, wielding their blades as they charged towards Kaido in the sky. Meanwhile, the serpentine dragon body of Kaido, swirling in the night sky, resembled a tangible spiral cyclone. Dragon Cyclone, Demolition Gust As the massive dragon body rotated, it released numerous elongated wind blades, assaulting the samurais below. The quantity of wind blades was too many, completely sealing off any space for evasion. And their speed was extremely fast, reaching the samurais in the blink of an eye. The continuous onslaught of wind blades slashed at the samurais. Hiss. Limbs and arms mixed with a large amount of blood were splattered onto the ground. The long sword held by severed arms fell from the sky, embedding itself into the ground, emitting a faint, mournful cry. Shimatsuki Ashimaru looked around at the hellish scene, his companion's blood splattering on his face, turning his vision crimson. Ancestor At this moment, Shimatsuki Ashimaru looked at the figure of Kaido in the sky, and the unmatched power, unable to help but mutter to himself. Only by facing such an opponent firsthand could one truly feel the strength of Shimatsuki Ryuma back then. Then, Shimatsuki Ashimaru once again raised his sword and charged towards Kaido. After all, he was the descendant of Shimatsuki Ryuma and couldn't afford to disgrace his ancestors. You are weak. Seeing Shimatsuki Ashimaru on the rooftop not far away, panting heavily with dual swords in hand, Kaido felt somewhat bored. If the opponent's strength was just a bit higher, perhaps they could have pierced through his defense. But after so long of stretching his muscles, he was getting impatient. He didn't feel like wasting any more time here. With that in mind, Kaido opened his dragon mouth and began to brew a scorching dragon breath. Dragon's breath. The scorching flames erupted from his dragon mouth, aiming to engulf Shimatsuki Ashimaru below. At that moment, a white figure flashed in and stood before the approaching flames. The white figure raised his right hand, facing the incoming scorching breath head on. The scorching flames clashed violently with the white figure in mid air, scattering into all directions. Small flames fell to the ground like a grand fireworks display. After a moment. As the flames dissipated, the scene in the sky was revealed. Nicholas. High above, facing the sudden appearance of the figure, Kaido roared in anger. And Nicholas, surrounded by crackling purple-black lightning, hovered in the air, looking down coldly at the dragon-shaped Kaido. Kaido. Kaido's dragon face was filled with cold killing intent as he sneered, Oh ho ho. I never thought I'd encounter you here. Do you know how much I've missed you? Albert Nicholas. In response, a Z-shaped lightning crackled with a dazzling purple-black light. It was Nicholas's newly developed technique, Z-Flash. A lightning attack with penetrating properties, it sliced through the air in a Z-shape, hitting Kaido squarely in the jaw. The force of the attack lifted the front half of Kaido's dragon body high into the air, and the scales on his jaw shattered into pieces. With a body this massive, what use do you have other than bullying those weaker than yourself? Nicholas raised his hand, and around him, numerous iron sand particles floated in the air, indicating his intention to unleash the railgun. Immortality? Just watch and learn, did you really take your fragile scales seriously? Chapter 155 Lying horizontally in the sky, the giant dragon was an unbeatable sky monster for the weak. But for strong individuals like Nicholas, it was just that. Moreover, due to its size, it was almost a huge living target. After firing off a Z-flash, Nicholas didn't stop there. He directly reached out towards Kaido, who was rolling backward, unleashing more iron sand bullets ignited in the air. Accompanied by sharp whistles, streaks of fire tore through the air, illuminating the night sky. Facing the massive body in the air, there was no need to adjust angles to ensure accuracy. Just as Kaido barely steadied himself, brilliant light beams rushed towards him, and the next moment, dozens of blood holes appeared on his dragon body, shattered scales and blood flowing down to the ground. The raging power and the intense pain coursing through his body made Kaido's dragon face contort slightly. 
this feeling. In a daze, Kaido's mind flashed with the images of several figures wearing white coats. Without much thought, dozens more iron sand bullets flew towards him, pounding against his grim dragon head. Seeing the battered Kaido in the air, Nicholas chose not to continue attacking but simply stared at him. Regardless, being hailed as one of the four emperors, Kaido undoubtedly had immense potential among the few in the world. Nicholas stood there quietly, watching Kaido roaring in pain in the distance. Faced with this scene, deep within King's heart, a long-lost sense of despair surged up. However, even though he saw no opportunity, it didn't mean he would sit back and do nothing. Since he chose to follow Big Brother Kaido. Even if it meant death, he would help Big Brother Kaido deal with the opponent. A glint of observation hockey suddenly appeared in King's eyes. From Nicholas's appearance to his action, in King's view, there was no possibility of negotiation between the two sides. This was an enemy relationship. So, King, who had been inactive from the beginning, suddenly made a move. Without any hesitation or fear of Nicholas's strength and reputation. The black wings on his back suddenly closed, and his massive body, like a projectile, shot straight towards Nicholas. Just as he approached Nicholas, he transformed back into human form, and the samurai sword gripped tightly in his hand, like his shoulders, also ignited into flames. Flame. King, who appeared in front of Nicholas in an instant, unleashed the full power of Busashoku Haki in his Lunaria tribe strength, swinging the samurai sword enveloped in flames downwards at Nicholas. Nicholas stared at the flaming sword coming straight at him, his eyes reflecting a sharp strike in King's determined gaze. As the attack neared, aiming directly at Nicholas's vitals. But Nicholas remained unmoved, just calmly watching the flaming sword approach. Then. A large black hand suddenly shot out from behind Nicholas, directly grabbing King's face. Seeing the large black hand appearing behind him, King's pupils constricted, instinctively reaching for his sword to defend. However. The next moment, the hand seized his face, forcibly pulling him from the air and slamming him to the ground. Nicholas looked at King, who was suppressed by Vista, calmly stating. Albert. Didn't your old man tell you about my identity? Silenced by Vista's suppression, King remained silent, his body got tense as he tried to break free from Vista's restraint. But for the still somewhat inexperienced youth, Vista was clearly not someone he could contend with. Meanwhile. Shocked, Ashimaru looked at King being suppressed by Vista and the massive dragon rolling in the air. In a moment of confusion, he seemed to find Wano Country becoming very unfamiliar. As one of Wano Country's top-tier fighters, he appeared weak in front of these people. Attacking the enemy with all his might, only to have his moves effortlessly blocked by the enemy, unable to penetrate even the opponent's scales. But in front of that person, the sky-roaming dragon's scales seemed as fragile as paper. The man surrounded by lightning, the massive dragon swimming in the air, and the man with flames burning on his body, it was like a scene of mythical gods fighting. So strong. Ashimaru murmured to himself. Although both sides had only briefly engaged in battle, Ashimaru deeply realized the gap in strength between himself and them. Thunder Emperor. Quiet down, it's our boss's fight, what are you panicking about? And according to our seniority, you should call us uncles, understand? Facing King's resistance, Vista scolded him and directly slapped him on the head with a Ryuo palm. And at this moment, the still young King, facing Vista, could only stare at him with stubborn eyes. Kaido. Nicholas looked up at the rapidly rolling black clouds in the distance. The sudden change in the sky seemed to reflect Kaido's current mood. Even the seemingly insane Kaido, after being repeatedly struck head on, was likely to be angry, not to mention the current Kaido, who had not yet been tormented by Vegapunk properly. After all, mad scientists and the like were very likely to leave psychological trauma. In the sky, Kaido's dragon body swirled, and the muscles of his body also writhed. Countless deformed iron sand bullets were squeezed out of his body, and the wounds that had been opened began to slowly heal along with the muscle movement. It could be said that Kaido's immortality was somewhat exaggerated, but the title of strongest creature still had some truth to it. For such a guy who awakened his devil fruit and had a monstrous physique, if he couldn't be taken out in one shot, even if he was severely injured, 
he could quickly recover from his injuries with his terrifying physique. This, as someone who had fought many monsters, Nicholas knew very well. Kaido's words. There's some use to them, but it's also a headache. Nicholas looked at the sky-blue dragon that had returned to human form, its bloodied wounds now barely visible. He held a intimidating wolf-tooth club in his hand, crackling with red electrical arcs. Obviously, upon reverting to human form, Kaido immediately employed Haushiku Haki, after all, he could handle small fry as he pleased. But Kaido knew that Nicholas was not among them this was an opponent who could kill him if he wasn't careful. Last time I bled. When was it? Oh ho ho, Nicholas, our old grudges, I'm going to settle them with you today. Kaido raised the purple lightning-wreathed wolf-tooth club, assuming the stance of Thunderbugwa. His eyes full of ferocity, crimson light shining in them. An aura as fierce as a wild beast, unbridled, radiated from him, blowing the surrounding ground debris towards the distance. Nicholas narrowed his eyes. It seems that Vega Punk's care for you isn't enough. Next time we meet, I should give him some advice. Hearing Nicholas' words, Kaido's rough face was a little stunned at first, and then suddenly became furious. Chapter 156 Kaido, who had returned to his humanoid form, seemed like a humanoid beast. The coiling purple lightning around his wielded kanabo emitted a dauntingly dangerous aura. A fierce expression crossed Kaido's rugged face. Clearly, Nicholas's words had deeply wounded him. The events he experienced in that research facility were something he never wanted to recall. And for Kaido, the best way to vent his frustration was. Thunder Bagua. Kaido suddenly moved, his figure disappearing into thin air. It was a speed so extreme, completely contradicting his burly physique. Facing the rapidly approaching Kaido. Zing. Nicholas casually undid the upper part of his clothes, revealing the fierce dragon tattoo on his body along with strange symbols intertwined with the dragon's body. It seems I'll have to FCK you up a bit, Kaido, Nicholas said, adjusting his neck. FCK me. Kaido looked at Nicholas, his eyes cold, and the power on his kanabo intensified. He intended to use his big club to crush the person in front of him, who had repeatedly brought him shame. But Nicholas just smiled, silent. With a thought, the dragon tattoo on his body seemed to come alive, and the strange symbols on the dragon's body flickered. At this moment, Nicholas maximized the power of the Goro Goro no Mi to its fullest extent, performing a Kalasvara Madra he chanted. Domain Expansion, Eternal Thunder Empire Underneath the dark clouds, above the earth, all the lightning in the sky seemed to respond to their sovereign's call, converging from all directions towards Nicholas. Seeing this scene, Vista didn't hesitate and swiftly carried Alber, striding away. Similarly, seeing the situation, Shimatsuki Ashimaru had already left the central position of the battlefield without a word. Countless thunderstorms surrounded Nicholas, forming a thunderous kingdom around him. Buildings, flora, even thunderous creatures all created from lightning illuminated the area as if another silver sun had risen on the ground. Awakened abilities, huh? But this seems to be a natural type. Kaido looked coldly at the constantly active thunder around him. At this moment, all these thunderstorms had turned into terrifying weapons. Even a small flower made of lightning was enough to destroy a town. It was a sea of lightning, overwhelming and destructive, with an aura that made one's soul shudder. Witnessing Nicholas's thunder empire, Shimatsuki Ashimaru and Albert were astonished. Even from afar, it was terrifying. It was hard to imagine the ordeal Kaido was enduring within it. Wororororo, quite interesting indeed. Facing Nicholas's power, Kaido focused entirely on enjoying this fight. With a determined gaze, Kaido didn't hesitate to unleash his rarely seen human beast form to its full potential, covering his entire body with armament hockey. SCZT. Horns sprouted from his head, eyebrows ablaze like flames, hovering over his vertically slit pupils filled with a ferocious gleam. Blue dragon scales rapidly appeared on Kaido's cheeks and exposed skin, becoming more prominent around his sturdy shoulders, surrounded by flaming ribbons that extended to his wrists. At the same time, a strong and powerful tail swept behind him. Squeak. Purple electric arcs danced around Kaido's body. Clearly, Kaido, fully armored in hockey, 
now had the capability to move within Nicholas's Thunder Empire. With a fierce gleam in his eyes, Kaido surged forward, wielding his kanabo and smashing towards Nicholas. As Kaido charged, he became an enemy within this thunderous world. Countless bolts of lightning struck him, causing his skin to split open, revealing bone, and his body to turn black as he endured unimaginable damage. Though severely injured, Kaido's spirit soared. Far from being defeated, his fighting spirit only grew stronger. Wurururoro bring it on. With a swing of his kanabo he dispersed a chunk of lightning in Nicholas's domain, but the void left by Kaido was refilled by the persistent lightning again. Nicholas, looking at Kaido, smirked disdainfully. Destroyer of Death Thunder Bagua. Conqueror of Three Worlds Ragnaraku. Kundali Dragon Swarm. Thunder Bellow Bagua. Burrow Blast. Kaido simultaneously used five of his strongest moves but inside Nicholas's domain, everything was useless. You bastard, I will kill you at any cost. The lightning constantly charred his body, but he recovered in the next second. Kaido on the verge of blacking out screamed like a beast. Hmm. Nicholas inside the domain felt a strange aura on Kaido, he even felt a tinge of threat from him. Is this the second awakening of devil fruit? Looks like it's time to end this farce. Deity summon, thousand hands Avalokiteshvara. Nicholas forming a praying gesture chanted, on the dragon tattoo, the blue runes glowed. His voice ethereal as a deity chimed all across Wano. A 100,000 feet tall bodhisattva figure appeared in the skies of Wano. Anyone who saw this scene was flabbergasted and prostrated in reverence. Far away Vista was solemn, even if his conqueror's hockey was superior to Nicholas, he could never surpass this majesty. Like others, he also prostrated. Meanwhile Kaido was even more excited, he has never been excited this much in his entire life. This majesty this is a god. In his entire life Kaido has never been afraid of anyone, even now, even if there was a deity in front of him, even if death was ahead of him, he never thought of taking back a step. This was the dignity of a true emperor. Nicholas admired this trait, therefore without any chit-chat he used his full power to attack Kaido. Seal With a domineering voice, Nicholas commanded the thousand-arm Avalokiteshvara to thrash the foe in front of him. The thousand-arm Avalokiteshvara started its flurry of punches. Boom! 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 Minutes later, as the thunder subsided, leaving behind a devastated landscape, Kaido's appearance had drastically changed. He now lay on the ground, many wounds exposing bone, his body battered and burnt, resembling one who had endured brutal torture. Stand proud Kaido, you are strong. Nicholas, now reappearing beside Kaido, squatted down to observe the unconscious figure. It appeared that the idea of immortality was just a joke. Kaido must still have had scientific value, or else the navy would not have pursued him. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to explain why Kaido hadn't caused the navy any more problems after Vegapunk was able to successfully clone his lineage factor to create an artificial devil fruit. Looking at Kaido on the ground, Nicholas directed a warning to Albert and Shimatsuki Ashimaru, who had stayed alert. Take Kaido away. And when he wakes up, tell him he can do whatever he wants in Wano, but it's best not to interfere with me. Understand? With that, Nicholas turned and left. His purpose for coming here had been achieved having a physical conversation with Kaido. As for what Kaido planned to do in Wano, it had little relevance to him. His priority was to ensure his own interests in Wano. After Nicholas and Vista departed, Albert, now in his pteranodon form, lifted Kaido from the ground and flew off into the distance. Before Kaido recovered, Albert wouldn't head to Flower Capital. No one knew what schemes the members of the Kurazumi family were plotting. With everyone gone, Shimatsuki Ashimaru tightened his grip on his twin swords. He knew that from this moment on, the situation in Wano had completely spiraled out of control. Chapter 157 New World, an island with towering trees. The island seems to have just experienced a great battle, as all the animals on the island are hiding. Roger, the marine seemed to be probing more frequently lately. Rayleigh, with his sword resting on his shoulder, expressed some concern to Roger. It's quite normal. After all, that fellow golden lion seems to be as mad as ever. 
Speaking of which, I feel like that Golden Lion guy is more diligent than the Marines themselves. Roger, holding a Marine officer draped in a cloak of justice in his hand, turned to Rayleigh. Then, he addressed the Marine in his hand, can you tell me why the Marines have been acting so unusually lately? Mr. Marine. Cough cough. After a couple of coughs, the Marine officer, covered in blood, forced his eyes open and looked disdainfully at Roger. For other pirates, the mighty Roger might be a dominant force on the seas, but for him, pirates were always pirates. Wanna know? Dream on. Oh, forget it then. With that, Roger released his grip, letting the marine officer fall to the ground. Captain. Captain Roger, the Moby Dick of the Whitebeard Pirates has been spotted on the other side of the island. Buggy, holding a spyglass, shouted to Roger from a distance. Whitebeard, huh? It's been a while. Roger's face lit up with a smile upon hearing the news of the Whitebeard Pirates. He then reached out and placed his hand on Shanks, who was squatting nearby, eating marine rations. He took the captain's hat off Shanks' head and put it back on his own. Shanks, I'm not dead yet, but you're already itching to be captain. Before Shanks could respond, Roger turned to his crew behind him. Our old friend Whitebeard is ashore. Let's give him a warm welcome. Hee <laughs> hee, I didn't expect someone to be even more enthusiastic than us. It seems that Whitebeard's crew has gained an interesting new member. Looking at the figure leaping from the Moby Dick, Gabon chuckled as he spoke to Rayleigh. That should be the second division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, the powerful swordsman Kazuki Odin, I heard. Rayleigh's glasses gleamed as he mentioned Odin's strength. As the second in command of the Roger Pirates, he was determined to help Roger achieve his dream. The opponent's king was Roger's rival, and Rayleigh's job was to suppress the opponent's second in command to prevent interference in Roger's battles. Wait, Commander Odin. The enemies this time are completely different. That's the Roger Pirates. Don't act rashly. Apparently, someone from Whitebeard's ship had also realized the identity of the pirate group on the island and spoke up in alarm. Odin, two sword style, gun, Madoki. As Odin spoke, a member of Roger's crew who had charged forward was instantly sent flying. Seeing his attack hit the enemy but not causing the immediate death he was accustomed to, Odin was surprised. He rarely encountered opponents who could withstand his attacks head on. Even many pirates with bounties exceeding a billion had fallen beneath his blade. He had never expected to be bested by a member of the Roger pirates. What an amazing guy, knocking out two of our comrades with just one move. Quickly, stop him. We can't let him continue causing trouble. Gabon, wielding dual axes, also spoke seriously to Rayleigh. Wait. Don't worry, I'll protect you guys. Just as Rayleigh and Gabon were about to take action, a strange voice suddenly came from behind them. Then, a figure rushed past them. Hey Samurai, Divine Departure. From Odin's perspective, he had just finished off two small fries with his two-sword style and was about to find their captain when suddenly, a weird guy rushed out of the crowd and swung a sailor's knife at him. Before he could react, he was sent flying. Looking good, Roger. With his captain's hat on, golden hair cascading, and a distinct crescent-shaped white beard, white beard stood tall, looking down at Roger. Long time no see, Newgate. Then, both of them spoke in unison, hand over all your valuables. After saying that, they both realized the situation and burst into laughter. Gururara. Waha. Then came the time for greetings. Gabon, are those two interns? Sitting on a rock, not joining the exchange, Marco looked at Shanks and Buggy curiously and asked Gabon. Yeah, those two have been on Roger's ship for a long time now. They don't seem that strong, but they look very arrogant. Seeing Marco's evaluation, Gabon couldn't help but scoff. And Marco agreed with Gabon's assessment. It wasn't easy to make the honest Gabon feel someone was arrogant. Hey, Shanks, have you seen that guy over there with the hat? Yeah, why? For the past few nights, he seems to have never slept. Yeah. Why's that? Apparently, he hasn't slept a wink since birth. Eh, really? Well, isn't that twice as happy as others? 
Hearing his companion's strange focus, Buggy got angry. He hadn't expected his companion to be so unreliable. Idiot, that means that guy's a monster. Don't you get it? A monster. Oh. As Buggy was about to say something more, he suddenly noticed that Rayleigh, Gabon, and others all stood up, their gazes wary as they looked toward the direction of the coast. The Whitebeard pirates also stopped their conversation and looked in the same direction. Seeing the sudden silence amidst the previously cheerful atmosphere, Buggy was taken aback. Uh, what's going on with everyone? As Buggy spoke, he saw Shanks next to him nervously grip his shoulder and say, He's here. He's here. Who's here? With Buggy's words, a figure slowly appeared from the direction of the coast, carrying a huge gourd on his shoulder. Yo, everyone, are you welcoming me? That's very polite of you. Seeing the members of the Roger and Whitebeard Pirates, Nicholas flashed a brilliant smile. Nicholas, what are you doing here? Marco was the first to speak, with caution toward such a dangerous figure not being unwarranted. Ha! Huh. I'm just here to catch up with Roger. Do you believe me? Nicholas then waved his hand toward the people behind him. Sasuke and Naruto, long time no see, Roger and Whitebeard. Gururara. Wahaha. Then followed the time for greetings. At the center of the island, three men sat cross-legged. And at this moment, Nicholas finally got to use a basin-sized wine cup in front of the two men. Chapter 158 and almost as soon as Nicholas appeared on the island's coast, the marines who had been defeated by Roger's crew turned pale. For the past three days, they had been tending to the wounded and trying to repair their ships, so they had been closely monitoring the battles between Roger's and Whitebeard's crews. The fact that the two sides, who had been fighting for three days, were now sitting down to a banquet had already made them nervous enough, but the sudden appearance of another formidable individual made the situation even more tense. Vice Admiral John Giant, according to the information provided by our surveillance and intelligence operatives monitoring Whitebeard's and Rogers' crews. It has been confirmed that the individual who recently landed on the island is the notorious Nicholas with a bounty of one. Eight billion. Upon hearing his subordinate's report, Vice Admiral John Giant, wrapped in bandages, also turned pale. Although Nicholas's bounty was not as high as Rogers or Newgate's, it was because he had been inactive for a long time. In terms of danger, he was no less than Roger and Newgate. Damn it, what the hell is going on? Get me connected to headquarters immediately. Vice Admiral John Giant ordered his wounded deputy. Yes, sir. Bololulu, this is headquarters, I'm Sengoku speaking. Vice Admiral John Giant, do you have any new developments regarding Whitebeard and Roger's crews? Soon, Sengoku's voice came through the Den Den Mushi, and ever since Vice Admiral John Giant and his Marines survived their encounter with Roger's crew, their communications had been given high priority at headquarters. Especially with Whitebeard's crew appearing and engaging Roger's crew in battle, if not for the need for the Den Den Mushi to rest and eat, headquarters would have demanded constant contact. Admiral Sengoku, it's bad news. Nicholas has landed on the island of Burton. Vice Admiral John Giant's voice of panic came through the Den Den Mushi, and it could be said that Whitebeard's contact with Roger, at most, would have raised the alert level for the Marines and prepared them for battle. After all, the relationship between these two pirate crews was known to the Marines. Although they were opponents, they were also friends. It was normal for them to fight and then hold a banquet, demonstrating their camaraderie. But Nicholas's appearance changed the significance of the situation entirely. It could be said without exaggeration that if these three individuals joined forces to attack headquarters, the Marines might not be able to withstand it. Vice Admiral John Giant, maintain vigilance. The Marines stationed at G1 Branch are prepared to assist you. Sengoku said solemnly, but he had never thought about starting a war. With the current strength of the Marines in the New World, confronting those three would be suicidal. So, are you really going to die? Yeah, I don't have much time left. Roger grinned, seemingly not bothered at all by his impending death. But why can't I tell that you're about to die? Putting down his wine cup, Whitebeard scrutinized Roger, furrowing his brow slightly. 
Then he looked at Nicholas, apparently realizing that the news of Roger's impending death didn't come from Roger himself, but from Nicholas. I'm sick, terminally ill. Roger said nonchalantly, not seeming to be troubled by his impending death but rather carefree. Sick. And Crocus's power can't cure you. Whitebeard's expression grew heavy as he picked up his wine, no longer seeming to enjoy it as much. Shaking his head, Roger smiled without saying a word, but the meaning was clear. Should I let Marco take a look at you? Your kid on the ship. Can the phoenix's ability cure diseases? Hearing Whitebeard's words, Roger was somewhat surprised, recalling the little guy who emitted blue flames all over his body and turned into a phoenix. Gururara. Marco is a great kid. Apparently proud of Marco, Whitebeard said. Indeed, Newgate, you found a great family. And Nicholas, thanks for spreading the news that I'm dying everywhere. I appreciate it. Raising his wine cup, Roger clinked it against Whitebeard's and Nicholas's, then took a sip and continued, My illness can't be cured by Marco. Is that so? Whitebeard didn't question Roger further, as it was completely unnecessary. By the way, why have you been inquiring about Odin during our voyage? Whitebeard furrowed his brow, as he still hadn't figured out the connection between Odin and this matter. Ah, that's because I asked a historian I met during our voyage to look into it. She told me that in her research, she found a significant connection between the historical texts and a country called Wayno. I promised her that if the historical texts were deciphered, I would give her a copy. Originally, I was planning to head to Wayno, but when I heard about the guy named Kazuki Odin on your ship, I knew he was the person I was looking for. Roger spoke cheerfully, drinking as he recounted. It could be said that the historian had been a great help to them. Although her research on the historical texts had just begun, she had still been a great help, at least pointing them in the right direction, preventing them from floundering aimlessly. Especially with Roger's terminal illness, time seemed especially precious. Hearing Roger's words, Whitebeard also paused, then looked at Nicholas. Roger had come for Odin, but was Nicholas also here for Odin? Chapter 159 Similarly, Roger also looked at Nicholas, as the skill of Kazuki Odin was his hope to complete the final voyage. Don't look at me like that, Newgate. I have no interest in that guy named Kazuki Odin, Nicholas said, surprising both Whitebeard and Roger, who found it hard to believe. If not for Odin, then what are you here for? Can't an unprecedented feat like circumnavigating the world entice you? Roger looked surprised at Nicholas, thinking that circumnavigating the world was a feat worthy of the history books. And then? Nicholas responded calmly. And then? Roger echoed, taken aback. For me, what I want is to be able to sail freely on the open seas, to tread every corner of this world without any concerns. I want to visit countless miraculous islands and natural landscapes on this planet. I want to become the freest person on the seas. Nicholas declared. Wow, that's an impressive dream, Roger said, raising his cup, gesturing for Nicholas to clink it with his. Then I wish you the best in achieving your dream, Roger added, pouring more liquor into Nicholas's cup. What is your purpose in coming here? Whitebeard asked, furrowing his brow. I have two reasons for coming here this time, one regarding Roger and the other regarding you, Nicholas replied, taking out a small box from his pocket and handing it to Roger. As Roger opened the box and looked at its contents, he made a puzzled face. Hey, Nicholas, what's this about? We're both guys. And I have someone I like. Roger said seriously, showing the gold ring in the box to Nicholas, as if suspecting Nicholas had ulterior motives. Pfft, I have someone I like too. Besides, who would be interested in someone whose nose hair looks like a beard? Nicholas retorted, unyielding. Roger was infuriated by Nicholas's remark. That's artistic on the pirate flag, not me. My beard is a beard, not nose hair. Right, right, even if it's not nose hair, Nicholas conceded. It's not nose hair in the first place. What do you mean, even if it's not? Roger protested. Does she know about your illness? Nicholas suddenly asked, changing the atmosphere. She does, Roger replied looking at his cup with a mix of longing and guilt. 
If you leave, there won't be many drinking buddies left in the world, Whitebeard lamented. There's still Shiki, Garp, Sangoku, Zephyr, and Lin Lin, right? And if you're bored, you can always go to Marineford for a stroll. With your strength, you can easily retreat if things get hairy, Whitebeard added. Forget it. Whitebeard shook his head and clinked his cup with Rogers. I forgot, you only care about your family, Roger said, slightly surprised. Roger hesitated for a moment, and then didn't force the issue. Gururara. Whitebeard chuckled but didn't say anything, implicitly acknowledging it. Hey, Nicholas, why did you suddenly give me this gold ring? Roger asked, playing with the ring while speaking. It's just a reward to attract firepower to you. And don't mess around with that thing, it's precious. It's so precious that as long as you don't get beheaded, you can live for a long time with it, even prolonging your terminal illness indefinitely, Nicholas explained, looking at Roger who was playing with the gold ring with some astonishment. Almost at the same time, two figures quickly approached Roger. One firmly hugged Roger from behind, while the other snatched the gold ring from Roger's hand and held it carefully. Hey hey, Gabon, Rayleigh, you two trying to harm the captain? Rayleigh, locked by Gabon, called out desperately. Rayleigh, holding the gold ring, looked at Nicholas with a serious expression. Nicholas, are you telling the truth? Although Rayleigh tried to remain calm, his excitement was evident in his tone. Ah, it's not a fake, Nicholas said lightly, and the atmosphere suddenly quieted down. Of course it's not a lie. The thing in your hand can indeed save Roger. After all, there are many treasures in the sea, and the one in your hand is one of them, mixed with celestial gold. Moreover, I also know of two devil fruits that can also save Roger. Remember, it's a complete salvation for him, not just prolonging his life like celestial gold does, Nicholas said to Rayleigh, looking at him directly. It could be said that Rayleigh was the brain of the Roger pirates to a large extent. Roger rarely interfered with Rayleigh's decisions unless it was a matter concerning the entire crew. Celestial gold, so you really found the lost alchemy? Rayleigh, holding the gold ring, tightened his grip. When he found out about Roger's terminal illness, he had tried various methods to save him, and celestial gold was one of them. What celestial gold? What alchemy? Roger, who had swapped positions with Rayleigh without knowing when, pressed Gabon, locked by the strong man, to the ground, looking puzzled. You don't need to know so much, just give me your hand, Rayleigh said to Roger. Ha! Huh. Roger was baffled, apparently unaware of what Nicholas had told Rayleigh to elicit such a dramatic change in his attitude. Out of trust in Rayleigh, Roger didn't hesitate to extend his hand, and Rayleigh quickly put the gold ring on it. Watching Roger, who was curiously looking at the ring on his hand, Rayleigh directly said to Gabon, Gabon, go call Crocus. Tell him the captain has a situation. Apparently, the other members of the Roger pirates were unaware of Roger's terminal illness. Soon, the drunken Crocus was carried over by Gabon. It could be said that everyone on Roger's ship who knew about his condition was present. Hey, aren't you Nicholas, who last sent the Rumba pirates to Twin Cape? Crocus said with surprise. Long time no see. Crocus, attend to the captain first, Gabon said, urging him. That's odd. Crocus furrowed his brow after examining Roger's body, causing Rayleigh and Gabon to become tense. Hey, Crocus, if you have something to say, just spit it out. Don't keep us in suspense, Gabon urged. Gabon, don't rush him, Crocus showed good manners before turning to Rayleigh. It seems that the progression of the captain's illness has slowed down countless times, and the rate of cell division in his body has also decreased significantly. So what does that mean? Roger couldn't wait to ask. Bam! Roger was punched directly to the ground by Rayleigh. Crocus, continue, Rayleigh said. It means that if Roger's body continues to maintain this state, his remaining lifespan could be several times or even dozens of times longer than it is now, Crocus explained. Upon hearing Crocus's words, Rayleigh couldn't contain his joy, and Roger couldn't help but laugh, touching the back of his head. Obviously, nobody would want to die if they could continue living. Nicholas, the Roger pirates owe you a huge debt of gratitude. Rayleigh said to Nicholas earnestly. 
Chapter 160 The favor owed by the Roger Pirates is truly massive, Whitebeard remarked after taking a sip from his sake bowl. Now that we've dealt with Roger's matters, what's the issue concerning me that you mentioned, Nicholas? Whitebeard asked, his tone intimidating as he placed the sake bowl on the ground. Unlike Roger, who was nearing the end of his life, Whitebeard was at the peak of his life. His body was in perfect condition, so he was curious about what Nicholas had to say, especially if it involved him. Ah, it's about your matter, Newgate, Nicholas replied with a smile after running his hand through his hair. I also want to find someone from your ship, but rest assured, I won't take her away. I just have some questions to ask her. Oh, so you're also interested in my family members? Whitebeard's aura began to gather as he stared down Nicholas, his expression fierce. Unlike Roger, who was willing to negotiate, Whitebeard was known for his protectiveness over his crew and family. Who? Whitebeard finally spoke, knowing that if Nicholas mentioned someone, he would go to great lengths to accomplish it. Though he didn't trust Nicholas entirely, it was challenging to guard against someone with lightning speed like him. You'll find out once you call her over, Nicholas said confidently, meeting Whitebeard's gaze without fear. Hey, Nicholas, what do you mean? Newgate asked, unable to contain his curiosity. If you want to know, just call her over, Nicholas replied calmly, seemingly unfazed by Whitebeard's imposing presence. Whitey Chan, do you have any business with us? After a moment, Odin, who was somewhat tipsy, walked over with Toki. Obviously, he was quite happy with the exchange meeting of the Roger Pirates, as he had heard many interesting things about the sea from them and had seen many things he had never seen before. Not me, it's him. With that, Whitebeard pointed to Nicholas sitting there. Following Whitebeard's finger, Odin and Toki also looked curiously at Nicholas, wondering why this person who knew Roger and Whitebeard suddenly came to find Toki. And Roger, Rayleigh, and others were also assessing the two, as Odin was crucial for their upcoming voyage. The woman next to him seemed to be from the same country as Odin from her appearance, and she was quite good-looking. They were also curious why Nicholas was looking for this woman. Could it be? Seemingly realizing something, Rayleigh, Roger, and Gabon exchanged glances, revealing a gossiping expression. I wonder what business you have with us, sir. Odin asked Nicholas in a serious tone. Toki. As Nicholas spoke, the expressions of Odin and Toki changed suddenly. Then Odin directly stepped in front of Toki, placing his hands directly on the two swords on his waist, as if they were about to go to war at the slightest disagreement. Who exactly are you? Odin asked again, this time with his swords already drawn. With Odin drawing his sword, the atmosphere between the two parties became even more tense. Even because of the sudden burst of aura from this side of the island, the original exchange meeting between the two parties also stopped, all looking towards the position of Whitebeard, Roger, Nicholas, and others. Hey hey, Shanks, let's discuss something. Seeing the somewhat eerie atmosphere, Buggy whispered to Shanks on the side. Huh, are you suggesting that if they fight later, we should find an opportunity to take out that guy? Before Shanks could finish, Buggy directly covered Shanks' mouth with his hand. Don't you know anything about planning in secret? Anyway, that guy gives me a bad feeling, just like Teach. I even feel that guy will bring us huge trouble in the future, so it's better to kill him in advance. Buggy frowned and said, apparently feeling quite bad about the guy on Whitebeard's ship, even worse than Teach, who had approached the Roger Pirates not long ago. Of course, this was when Teach had something to deal with and wasn't on the ship. Buggy dared to talk back only then, otherwise, with Teach's character of not putting anyone but Roger in his eyes, Buggy wouldn't dare to say anything even if he had ten guts. Hey, Buggy, are you crazy? Don't you know how protective Whitebeard is? If we take out that guy, Whitebeard pirates will probably declare full-on war against us. Shanks couldn't help but say, as he knew that if he and Buggy really took out the monster Buggy mentioned, facing the furious Whitebeard, Captain Roger would definitely rush forward with his sword without a second thought. In terms of how protective he was, Captain Roger was no less than Whitebeard. It doesn't matter who I am. I just want to know what happened back then, what are the world government's trump cards? And how did Joy Boy fail back then? Nicholas' words puzzled everyone, 
but Toki's pupils suddenly contracted. Although she didn't know the specific details of that battle, it was undoubtedly a disastrous defeat for them. In fact, the reason why she kept using the time fruit to constantly travel to the future was because one of Joy Boy's partners, the Mermaid Princess, had been told by a fortune teller at the time that she hoped for the future. But now Nicholas had almost blurted out the secret she had been hiding in her heart for so long. Chapter 161 I do not know what you are talking about, and I need to go take care of the children. I'll take my leave. With that, Toki turned and left, evidently having no intention of continuing the conversation. As she turned away, beads of cold sweat formed on Toki's forehead. It could be said that she had a mission upon arriving from her time period, which was to wait for the arrival of the next Joy Boy in Wano. And to inform the future generations about the mistakes made by the previous Joy Boy to avoid repeating them. But why would that guy know about such matters? Thinking about this, Toki felt even more agitated. With Toki's departure, both Odin and Whitebeard focused their attention on Nicholas. It seemed that any slight movement from him would trigger a storm of attacks. After Odin and Whitebeard left, Nicholas spoke a few words before leaving as well. Watching their departure, Rayleigh and Gabon also left on their own accord, leaving only Roger, Nicholas, and Newgate on the scene. Wow, Nicholas, what did you mean just now? Does that woman really know about the issues you mentioned? After Rayleigh and Gabon left, Roger couldn't wait to ask, evidently quite intrigued by Nicholas's words. Originally, he had only come for Odin, but now it seemed that he had stumbled upon something remarkable. Upon hearing Roger's words, Newgate also looked towards Nicholas, waiting for his explanation. Since teaming up with Nicholas in God Valley, Newgate believed that Nicholas knew many hidden secrets. I said I'm a prophet, guiding the world towards dawn. Do you believe me? Nicholas joked, then saw Whitebeard and Roger nodding seriously, apparently agreeing with this statement. Are the strong in the pirate world really this naive? Anyway, it's just a joke. I only discovered a few clues in history. Nicholas spoke up. Hey hey, don't leave us hanging like that. Seeing Nicholas unwilling to continue, Roger quickly spoke up. Cough cough, have you noticed encountering people with the initial D in their names? Indeed, we sometimes come across people with D in their names. I have someone named Teach in my crew. By the way, what does D mean? Do you want to know? Forget it, not really interested. You. Seeing Whitebeard not taking the bait, Nicholas felt speechless. It could be said that if they wanted to obtain valuable information from Toki, then they couldn't bypass Whitebeard. Roger, you should know, right? After all, there seems to be a will in the world that brings people with the initial D together. With that, Nicholas turned his gaze towards Roger. At Nicholas's words, Roger's expression changed. Because he thought of the person waiting for him on the Petrela Island, it seemed that their meeting was a destined one. That's a story from a long time ago. Roger muttered to himself, while Whitebeard furrowed his brows and seemed surprised, his facial expression changing constantly. Nicholas unexpectedly discovered that in Roger's words, individuals with the initial D in their names seemed to possess remarkable talents. Guru Rara, what amazing news, but Nicholas. Whatever you're after, I won't let anyone harm my family. With a fierce glare, Whitebeard shouted. At that moment, the cape behind him fluttered without any wind, and his halberd was raised and slammed into the ground, emitting a dull sound. Buzz. The void trembled and an even stronger conqueror's hockey swept out, rushing towards the surroundings of the island, causing the surrounding trees to sway wildly as if in a hurricane. Ugh! Plop, plop! Watching the alert navy members in the distance, one by one, their eyes rolled back, and they collapsed to the ground, unconscious and powerless. Everyone, retreat! You can't withstand this pressure! Vice Admiral John Giant looked around, his face changing dramatically, and he shouted loudly to the Navy. The Navy immediately retreated, and a tense atmosphere permeated the air, with everyone's hearts on edge. Facing the pressure from Newgate, Nicholas's eyes narrowed. Newgate. You know this move won't work on me. You'd better put it away, or else your sons might not be able to hold on much longer. 
In Nicholas's observation hockey, many figures from Whitebeard's crew couldn't even withstand this strong will and fell to the ground, losing their combat effectiveness. With one tall and one short figure, their eyes were fixed on each other. Everything seemed calm around them, but the battle between them had already begun. Guru Rara, are we going to fight? Roger, sitting on the side, was not affected at all and even showed an interested expression. Are we really capable of dealing with such a monster? Although the two hadn't made a move yet, the alert navy members around them could already feel the aura emanating from the two figures in the distance, making anyone or anything in their eyes seem extremely insignificant. For the first time, they suddenly felt that the reason why the navy had been unable to strengthen its control over the new world was not without reason. If these monsters wanted to destroy the navy's base in the new world, aside from the admirals at headquarters, no one could stop them. Guru Arara, lightning brat, you haven't disappointed me after all these years. Whitebeard gazed at Nicholas, who was unaffected by his conqueror's hockey, his face filled with excitement, as if he was eager to spar with a strong opponent. I'm curious now, just how strong are you? His voice echoed across the island, clear and unmistakable, reaching the ears of everyone on the island. Upon hearing this, Marco and the others changed slightly, and Roger's gaze also became serious as he stared at Whitebeard. Nicholas didn't speak for a while, but in just a few words, he already understood what the other party meant. That is, if he wanted to obtain information from Toki, and if Whitebeard agreed, then there would be no objections. If the other party refused, then he would have to defeat Whitebeard to get the information he wanted. In the end, for Whitebeard, the safety of his recognized family members was the most important, and everything else was beyond his consideration. Newgate, aren't you afraid that I and Roger will join forces to take you down? Your impulsive actions may lead to the downfall of the Whitebeard pirates right here. Nicholas's indifferent words reverberated, containing a chilling meaning that made many of Whitebeard's crew pale. At the same time, they subconsciously looked towards the members of Roger's crew, as in the three-day battle. Whitebeard and his men realized that although they had the numerical advantage, except for Whitebeard, who was on par with Roger, the two crews were undoubtedly stronger in strength. Now with Nicholas joining them, once Roger and Nicholas both attacked Whitebeard, it was indeed possible for the Whitebeard pirates to be destroyed here. Whitebeard, however, just smiled dismissively. Neither Roger or you are the type to back down. And even if you both were to come at me together, the outcome would still be uncertain. On this vast sea, who has Whitebeard ever feared? In this sentence, there was an aura of domineering supremacy, yet it was undeniably genuine. At this moment, Whitebeard was at the peak of his power, truly terrifying to the extreme. His entire body, unlike during the summit war, was not riddled with accumulated injuries, nor did he require constant intravenous drips to sustain his life. At this moment, he was like a lion in his prime, experiencing the strongest moment of his life. Nicholas's expression turned serious, and after a moment of silence, he spoke slowly. It seems that in the end, we'll have to let our fists do the talking. Nicholas's gaze was firm, and the light in his eyes grew brighter and brighter. Only by fighting against strong opponents could he advance further. Chapter 162 Whitebeard, Edward Newgate This is a legendary name. In the future, although this name did not obtain the title of Pirate King, it still sparked a second great era after the era of the Great Pirates, just like Roger did. He admitted with his own mouth that One Piece is a real existence, starting the second wave of the Great Pirate Era. It can be said that Whitebeard is a synonym for greatness on the seas after Roger. Even after the Golden Lion Shiki fell silent, the so-called Four Emperors were still seen differently from Whitebeard by the public. Although Whitebeard is a pirate, in the chaotic era of the Great Pirate Era, he sheltered countless islands. As long as there was a place where Whitebeard's flag was planted, it would not be attacked by pirates. Even the Marines, in some respects, admit that Whitebeard has done remarkably well. And now, Nicholas is facing a living legend at his peak. At this moment, although Nicholas seemed calm, the powerful heartbeat proved that he was not as calm as he appeared. Expectation, excitement, exhilaration, all kinds of emotions surged up. Arriving in this era, being able to truly battle with these legendary figures is incredibly thrilling. 
Just like Zoro facing Hawkeye for the first time, even though he knew he was outmatched, he still drew his sword. This is about sticking to one's beliefs. Moreover, for Nicholas, how could he know who is stronger between Whitebeard and himself without a fight? In the upcoming battle, you better be careful, kid. I won't hold back. Whitebeard said in a deep voice. Ha, talking big already. Be careful not to embarrass yourself later. Nicholas retorted without hesitation. You guys, we set sail now, or we'll be in trouble later. Facing the impending collision between Whitebeard and Nicholas, Roger laughed and greeted his crew as he ran towards the ship. Dad! Seeing Roger and the other's actions, Marco also flew anxiously to Whitebeard's side and asked urgently. After all, Whitebeard fighting Nicholas was no small matter. Marco, tell everyone to get on the ship. The upcoming battle is not something you can intervene in. Whitebeard said to Marco in a solemn tone. And seeing the look in Whitebeard's eyes, Marco swallowed the words he was about to say, then waved his wings to inform everyone. All right, lightning boy, it's time for us to start too. When Oro Jackson and Moby Dick began to leave the range of the island, Whitebeard put down his sake cup, wiped the wine stains from his lips, and stood up slowly. Well, don't hold back, Newgate. Nicholas stood up, and his coat fluttered in the wind. His gaze at this moment became particularly solemn. The sea breeze blew, and the sail of the Moby Dick, representing the Whitebeard pirates, suddenly swelled up, swinging in the wind at this moment. And on the Moby Dick, the pirates watching from afar suddenly felt nervous in the presence of the two towering figures. The relaxed atmosphere from earlier when they were laughing and drinking was long gone, replaced by a sense of tension. In front of these two men, it seemed like even the sea breeze was holding its breath, and the ocean waves ceased their undulation. Captain, who do you think will win between Nicholas and Whitebeard? On the Oro Jackson, Rayleigh looked at the two men on the island and asked Roger. Ha, huh, no one will win between the two. It's more likely to end in a draw. Although that guy Whitebeard is terrifying, Nicholas is no simpleton either. Who knows if he has any tricks up his sleeve. After all, that guy is the man that even Lin Lin still hasn't forgotten until now. Ha ha ha. Finally, Whitebeard made the first move. Who? Whitebeard tightly gripped his Najinata, and the air became heavy at that moment. His eyes suddenly became extremely solemn. Leave this place. It's about to begin. The great battle is about to start. The marines on the island, who had just reacted, suddenly roared, their expressions tense and anxious. Many of them rushed towards the half-repaired warships, not even bothering to pack their belongings. Although the warships were not fully repaired and there was a risk of sinking, it was still better than staying on an island about to erupt in battle. Then, the bow turned, and the massive warship staggered towards the direction away from the deserted island. It wasn't until they were several miles away from the deserted island that the people on the warship finally relaxed. Don't stop, we could still be affected here. Hearing this, the marine spat and continued to row the warship towards the distance. Lightning boy, I won't hold back at all. With a towering figure and a ground-shaking step, Whitebeard's speed surged almost instantaneously. With a swing of his massive strength, the Najinata created a tremendous pressure. Very strong, kid. Whitebeard roared loudly, his thick arms bulging with veins as he exerted all his strength. And just below the Najinata, a long sword intercepted fiercely, firmly blocking it. In the blink of an eye, Nicholas's figure appeared. Under the collision, more powerful force erupted. The trees around them shattered, creating a vast open space in an instant. Gur. The Najinata and the long sword trembled violently. The overwhelming aura surged between them, with Whitebeard's Najinata surrounded by black red lightning, while Nicholas's long sword was enveloped in blood red lightning. The two locked eyes, both filled with intense fighting spirit. It seems you're excited too. Nicholas spoke, then shouted loudly. With both hands gripping the long sword, he swung it upwards. With Nicholas's swing, their attacks also separated, releasing intense energy in all directions. Cracks appeared on the ground, and sand and dust filled the air. Bang! In a flash of lightning and sparks, the collision occurred again. 
With even greater force this time, the trees around them cracked and shattered, clearing a large area in an instant. Huh, that was exhilarating. Whitebeard laughed heartily, extremely satisfied with Nicholas's performance in battle. The blades clashed, sparks flew, but this time, after a brief stalemate, Nicholas was sent flying backward. Retreating more than ten meters, leaving deep marks in the ground under his feet, he finally stopped his backward momentum. Kid, you're no match for me in terms of strength. Whitebeard said with a laugh. With giant's blood running through his veins, his physique was countless times stronger than an ordinary person's. And Nicholas, being a regular human, no matter how hard he trained, could not match him in strength. Phew. Exhaling slowly, Nicholas stood up straight. The innate talent brought by racial bloodlines is indeed terrifying. But the warm-up is over now. The real battle begins. Nicholas admitted straightforwardly that he was not Whitebeard's match in terms of strength. After all, he could train hard to make his physique stronger, but Whitebeard had also undergone rigorous training. So, be careful next. With a serious expression and eyes narrowed, Nicholas's face was extremely solemn. Swish. As soon as he finished speaking, a blue arc flashed on the blade, followed by a blue light that almost instantly crossed the distance between the two and appeared in front of Whitebeard. Whitebeard, tilting his head, glanced at the cut on his cheek and said in a deep voice. Combining the rumble rumble fruit ability with swordsmanship, huh? It's quite unexpected. If it weren't for observation hockey, Nicholas's attack just now wouldn't have been as simple as cutting a slash on his face. Chapter 163 Swish A flash of blue light suddenly illuminated in front of Nicholas, exceptionally glaring. Faced with the erupting light, even the mighty Whitebeard couldn't help but squint. And in that split second of squinting, Nicholas had vanished before his eyes. Hmm. As Whitebeard reopened his eyes, Nicholas's figure was already gone, prompting a puzzled expression from Whitebeard. He then activated his observation hockey to quickly locate his opponent. ZZT. The sound of electricity crackling and cutting through the air erupted from behind, causing Whitebeard's entire body to tense up suddenly. Thunder, the most powerful force in nature, demanded his utmost attention. Although he was among the most formidable individuals on the seas, his body remained vulnerable to fatal injuries. And Nicholas's formidable lightning and exceptional strength posed a considerable threat to him. One hundred million volts, swarm of bees. A hand wreathed in lightning appeared not far behind Whitebeard, then blue-purple electric currents swiftly converged, forming a massive beam that thundered towards Whitebeard. Simultaneously, the massive beam began to disperse into smaller beams, all converging on Whitebeard like a swarm of bees. From a distance, it seemed impossible to dodge lightning at such close range and such speed. Even with observation hockey, his body might not react in time. But in the next moment, a fist enveloped in a white spherical energy punched towards the swarm. Whitebeard's massive figure, which had been facing away, had turned around, now directly confronting the attack. As the fist swung, the air seemed to shatter, and the dense swarm of bees appeared to be swallowed by the sudden appearance of black cracks in the air. For a moment, it appeared as if the lightning beam and the cracks in the air were at a stalemate. It wasn't until a moment later that the spectators in the distance heard the booming sound of the air, indicating that the clash between the two had exceeded the speed of sound. With their attacks neutralizing each other, Whitebeard grasped his massive halberd and raised it high above his head, while simultaneously covering the blade with his black armament hockey. Well done, kid. Whitebeard's deep voice resonated as if accompanied by the sound of a base cannon. Then, swinging his halberd towards Nicholas, Whitebeard exclaimed, Be careful kid. Clang. Once again, the two weapons clashed. Lightning surged around Nicholas's sword, but the expected transfer of lightning along Whitebeard's weapon, melting it and conducting the electricity into Whitebeard's body, did not occur. Instead, as the lightning tangled around his weapon, it seemed to encounter a thick membrane, resisting all attempts to penetrate it. And the lightning's ability to melt metal seemed ineffective against it. Indeed, any sword worthy of being called the ultimate blade was not simple. Then, a pale white fluctuation appeared on the halberd, and the massive weapon was once again lifted high and swung towards Nicholas. 
Go ahead, thunderous kid. You're doing great, already surprising me. And your weapon is quite peculiar, indeed. But it's okay enjoy the fight to your heart's content. Whitebeard laughed heartily. Then let's enjoy the fight. It could be said that the person before him was the strongest opponent he had encountered so far, surpassing the pressure faced when dealing with Charlotte Lin Lin and Kaido. Even if Blackbeard had a devil fruit ability to counter him, facing Whitebeard and his crew during the Summit War wouldn't have been as simple as just being buried underground. Truly, Whitebeard at his peak was a monster in his own right. Taking a deep breath, Nicholas slowly opened his eyes. As he did, the world before him transformed. Within this range, Nicholas was like a god, or rather, he had already established himself as invincible. His battle with Whitebeard was, by far, the most elite and challenging he had faced to date. He would have to utilize all of his strength to confront this formidable adversary. Swish. Electricity raced, covering his entire body in an instant, even spreading to the ground around Nicholas, shattering the earth beneath his feet. His hair stood on end from the unseen force stimulating him. Chapter 164 The second round begins. The faint voice had barely dissipated in the air when Nicholas stomped fiercely on the ground. Crackly. Accompanied by the shattering of the earth beneath his feet, lightning surged towards Whitebeard in an instant, sounding like the cries of thousands of birds. In the blink of an eye, Nicholas appeared in front of Whitebeard. Thunderbird style. Nicholas's voice was icy as he spoke, and lightning once again surged wildly around him, spreading out in all directions. Facing Nicholas's approach, Whitebeard didn't want to make direct contact easily. He could feel that the lightning around Nicholas had become even more ferocious, with immense energy contained within it. If he were touched by Nicholas, although he wouldn't be injured, his movements would definitely be affected. This was the instinctive influence of lightning on living beings, something that couldn't be easily changed. Even with armament hockey defense, he would still be affected. So, Whitebeard chose to defend directly. With observation hockey activated, even Nicholas's lightning-like speed couldn't hit him. Seeing that he couldn't paralyze Whitebeard with lightning, Nicholas decisively switched to offense. After all, the battle between strong opponents depended on who could control the rhythm of the battle. Now was his time to attack he couldn't afford to miss the opportunity. Thunder Dragon Thunder Rhino Thunderbird Swarm of Bees Thunder Zeal Five billion volts, electric discharge. With each command from Nicholas, lightning manifested and surged forth, thundering through the air. Thunder dragons roared, thunderbirds cried, thunder zeal surged, and the scent of burning filled the air as lightning streaked towards Whitebeard. Ho ho ho, kid, you're quite impressive. Whitebeard, forced to continuously defend against Nicholas's attacks, couldn't help but chuckle. High speed movement made him break a sweat. As for evasion, it was out of the question. He was Whitebeard after all. It's time to wrap this up. Three thousand thunders, heavenly thunder net. Nicholas calmly spoke, his fingers moving as if manipulating an invisible giant net. In the next moment, the massive electrically charged ions, previously dispersed due to the large-scale lightning attacks, collided at Nicholas's command, generating even more intense and widespread lightning. Crackle in the blink of an eye, lightning crackled in the air, forming a colossal net spanning the sky, enveloping the area for kilometers around Whitebeard. It exuded a dense aura of destruction. Is this? Whitebeard's eyes revealed a hint of interest. It seemed that the powerful attacks just now were merely feints, and the true lethal move was only now being revealed. The colossal electric net, encompassing kilometers around, seemed to entangle Whitebeard, leaving him nowhere to hide. Gururara, quite a remarkable move. But. Whitebeard laughed heartily, I am Whitebeard after all. With that, he raised his colossal supreme grade Naginata, readying for a powerful strike. Accompanied by a thunderous roar, a colossal slash flew out from Whitebeard's position, crashing into the distance and finally landing on the sea. With a deafening explosion, a massive crater appeared on the sea's surface, and the water surged violently, with waves dozens of meters high crashing in all directions. Aha, what an exhilarating battle! 
Atop the turbulent sea, Roger sat cross-legged on the figurehead of the Oro Jackson, gazing at the battlefield on the island, unable to contain his excitement. And on the island, the fierce battle erupted once again. Whitebeard, having absorbed the blow from Nicholas's heavenly thunder net, didn't look as relaxed as it seemed. His clothes were torn and tattered, revealing his muscular physique, and there were marks of lightning strikes on his body. It's been a while since I've had such a good fight. Whitebeard, holding his great Naginata, once again dashed forward at high speed, leaping into the air and raising his Naginata high towards Nicholas. At this moment, Whitebeard was completely immersed in the battle. Nicholas, on the other hand, remained calm. Facing Whitebeard's powerful downward strike, he raised his right hand abruptly. Crackle. The air emitted a creaking sound under the tremendous pressure as the two clashed. Surprisingly, Whitebeard's great Naginata did not come into contact with Nicholas's hand. Gururara, no armament hockey entanglement this time. Is this your ability, little guy? Whitebeard asked. Amem. Nicholas admitted openly. Then, he raised his empty left hand abruptly. In harmony with the natural order, I channel the might of the heavens. Thunder, heed my call. In the sky, thunderclouds roared, lightning flashed, and thunder rumbled deafeningly, shaking the heavens. As Nicholas gestured with his left hand, a colossal lightning pillar spewed forth from the thunderclouds, crashing towards Whitebeard, who was still locked in combat with him. Crackle. The lightning surged, and a massive bolt of lightning materialized in the air, striking down towards Whitebeard. The intense heat and dense electric arcs caused the ground to blacken and smoke. This scene exceeded everyone's expectations. Whitebeard was actually hit head-on by such a powerful attack. This sight immediately drew exclamations from the crew of the Moby Dick, their faces turning pale. Dad! Marco, quickly! With a tense atmosphere, the crew of the Whitebeard pirates immediately wanted to go ashore to assist Whitebeard. Stop everyone! With a thunderous shout from Marco, everyone halted. As the first division commander of the Whitebeard pirates, Marco was in charge of the ship in Whitebeard's absence. That's Dad's battle. We have no reason to intervene. What we need to do is to trust Dad. Meanwhile, on the tattered and seemingly silent warship, Vice Admiral John Giant and others remained serious, watching the battlefield on the island. They were well aware that this kind of battle was no longer something they had the right to interfere in. In Vice Admiral John Giant's hands, there was a den den mushy used for monitoring, and it was diligently recording every scene on the island. At the same time, in a large conference room of the Marines, Sangoku, Tsuru, and several other Vice Admirals were watching the scenes transmitted by the monitoring den den mushy. The lightning continued to crackle as the scene unfolded, gradually revealing a towering and sturdy figure amidst the dissipating lightning. Chapter 165 Within the thunderous glare, the burly figure, holding the Naginata inserted into the ground, was surrounded by electric light. His face appeared vaguely ferocious, showing signs of pain. Meanwhile, he seemed to have noticed Nicholas in the distance, and the burly figure within the thunder let out a low growl. Buzz! In an instant, the air trembled, and the ground began to shake. Rip. It sounded like the tearing of cloth, and Nicholas squinted as he felt the vibrations around him. Amidst the thunder, Whitebeard took step by step forward, wielding his naginata. His blonde hair stood on end, ruffled by the intense electrical stimulation, even his iconic white beard appeared charred and dried. On the surface of his body, black streaks appeared from being struck by lightning. It was clear that Whitebeard had taken considerable damage from Nicholas' previous attack. Despite his injuries, Whitebeard appeared unaffected, both in his movements and his demeanor. Bang! 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 The burly figure ran forward, his heavy footsteps sounding like an ancient behemoth trampling the earth. Seeing the looming figure charging towards him like a demonic deity, Nicholas' eyes brimmed with determination. Powerful! Whitebeard, at this moment, was unimaginably powerful, like a mountain looming before one's eyes, emitting an oppressive and despairing aura. One could never know his limits. Nicholas' previous attack could be considered formidable, something most ordinary individuals wouldn't survive. 
yet Whitebeard had taken it all and still appeared vigorous. However, this time, Whitebeard remained silent, his speed increasing as he closed the distance between them, reaching Nicholas' front in an instant, and swung his Naginata fiercely downward. Facing the impending strike from Newgate's Naginata, Nicholas remained composed. Bring it on! His right hand extended, and a long sword quickly appeared, emitting a strange glow. If it were an ordinary opponent, Nicholas might have used his lightning to conjure a weapon to defend. But facing Whitebeard, he knew it wouldn't be enough. Constructing a weapon out of lightning against him would likely mean a swift demise. Blocking Whitebeard's strike with his sword, Nicholas' figure slowly dissipated into lightning, entering an elemental state. Boom! 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 As Whitebeard's Naginata came crashing down, a terrifying explosion surged from the island, carrying an aura of destruction. Like using an eraser to wipe away a portion, the mark extended from the island, reaching into the sea. On the seafloor, cracks appeared alongside Whitebeard's attack. The earth shook, and magma erupted from the seabed. The waves on the surface rose tens of meters high, as if a terrifying monster lurked beneath, wreaking havoc. On the Moby Dick, many of the crew who joined recently widened their eyes. Watching the roaring island and the tumultuous sea, they couldn't help but feel suffocated when imagining themselves facing such an attack. It wasn't just the newcomers even Marco stared fixedly in the direction of the island, realizing for the first time what true monsters were on the high seas. These two, what kind of monsters are they? This level of battle is just the beginning. Watching the battle on the island, Teach's voice trembled slightly, feeling excited about such power. Yes, strictly speaking, Whitebeard and Nicholas had only been fighting for less than ten minutes the battle had just begun. But in these short minutes, the display of power by these two was unimaginably mighty, beyond what many could conceive. The howling wind and raging waves caused Vice Admiral John Giant's warship to shake violently. Seeing the creaking ship, Vice Admiral John Giant had no choice but to order the ship to continue retreating to a safe area. He then boarded a lifeboat with the Den Den Mushy to continue broadcasting the battle on the island. Clearly, obtaining first-hand information about these heavyweight pirates was crucial for the Marines. Vice Admiral. Sir Vice Admiral. My condition is better. Let me go instead. The people on the warship tried to dissuade Vice Admiral John Giant, knowing he was severely injured by Roger in the past and that the surrounding sea was particularly dangerous due to the battle on the island. Any mishap would mean near certain death. This is an order. With that, Vice Admiral John Giant was about to board the ship. After all, being the one leading the surveillance on Roger's pirate crew, he couldn't be seen as weak. Vice Admiral, Admiral Sengoku is calling. Apparently, the situation on this end was also being monitored by the higher-ups through the Den Den Mushi. Understood. After hanging up the Den Den Mushi, Vice Admiral John Giant boarded the lifeboat and watched the warship leave. Chapter 166 On the desolate island, as a fierce gust of wind swept in, the massive dust cloud was blown away, revealing two figures standing at a distance, facing each other. Whitebeard, do you really have to go this far? I just wanted to ask a few questions it's not like I'm trying to take her down. Nicholas sounded a bit exasperated. Although he felt he had made some progress in his battle with Whitebeard, his main goal was still the information about Toki that he had heard about. Guru Rara, Thunder Brat, nobody can force my family to do something they don't want to do. Whitebeard laughed heartily but with a touch of seriousness in his voice. I mean, Newgate. Isn't there any room for negotiation? Nicholas looked at Whitebeard in the distance, speaking earnestly. At this moment, Whitebeard was truly as formidable as a monster. The side effects of his Gura Gura no Mi Devil Fruit could be completely absorbed by his robust physique, and he could almost recklessly wield the power of the fruit at his peak. There's no room for negotiation. If anyone tries to force my family, they'll have to step over my dead body. Whitebeard stared into Nicholas' eyes, his voice firm. Who? Fine have it your way. Exhaling slowly, Nicholas' eyes became sharp. It seemed impossible to obtain the information about Toki from Whitebeard now. In that case, he would just have to witness firsthand how powerful Whitebeard was at his peak. 
The battle had only just begun, and it was evident that both sides would not back down any time soon. Nicholas didn't know how far he could go, but he would certainly give his all in fighting Whitebeard. A flash of lightning, and Nicholas' body was once again enveloped in more intense electric light. Under this burst of thunderous light, Nicholas' hair completely elementalized, floating in the air like lightning. Thunder patterns representing electricity began to appear on his face, making him look like a deity walking on earth. Domain expansion, eternal thunder empire, demigod fusion. Different from the complete elementalization of the giant lightning bodhisattva, the demigod form was Nicholas entering a semi-elementalized state. In this state, the electrical stimulation made his muscles, cells, and even blood flow incredibly active, enhancing his body's reaction speed and strength. To a certain extent, it even stimulated his brain to operate more rapidly, making him more rational in battle. So basically he is simulating Sengoku's fruit but in small size factor. In this state, Nicholas seamlessly fused the power of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara with his physical strength. With his lightning-filled eyes slightly raised, Nicholas fixed his gaze on Whitebeard, then his figure disappeared in an instant. In a flash of lightning, he appeared in front of Whitebeard, wielding his long sword with dense electric light, slashing towards Whitebeard. Instant thousand strikes. Nicholas' figure became too fast to be caught by the naked eye. To the spectators, all they could see was a streak of lightning swiftly moving around Whitebeard, forming a web of electric light due to its speed. Clang! Clang! The crisp sound of metal clashing continuously echoed, and Whitebeard's body was covered in armament hockey. With each clash, sparks flew from various parts of his body. Amidst the sound of collision, several attacks hit Whitebeard's body, causing him to sway continuously, and blood splattered from some of the wounds. Gururara, quite impressive, Nicholas. Standing on the ground, Whitebeard laughed heartily, as if the increasing wounds on his body were nothing. Moreover, this was the first time he didn't call Nicholas brat. With a horizontal swing of his naginata, Whitebeard's body continued to sway despite the continuous bleeding, but he remained in high spirits. Whoosh! As the naginata swung, Nicholas' attack was interrupted, and he quickly evaded to the side. A massive slash flew horizontally, cutting trees and rocks along its path. The ground seemed to be stirred by an unseen force, surging with a roar. The huge slash continued towards the sea, creating towering splashes. As lightning flashed, when Nicholas was about to reappear, his pupils suddenly contracted. From his perspective, he saw Whitebeard when he appeared, and Whitebeard was already by his side. Then, Whitebeard swung his naginata, and Nicholas was sent flying by a single strike. Although he wouldn't be killed, he would undoubtedly be severely injured by the blow. Amidst the sparks of lightning, Nicholas also saw several other scenarios. What a dangerous guy! Nicholas murmured, his eyes gleaming with danger. Then, as Nicholas distanced himself, a thunder dragon formed in his palm and pounced towards Whitebeard. Facing the intimidating thunder dragon, Whitebeard didn't hesitate. He simply intercepted it with a single strike covered in armament hockey, splitting the thunderous beast in half. Bang! 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 With a series of heavy footsteps, Whitebeard's figure quickly shot out from the tail of the thunder dragon. Behind him, the thunder dragon's body was split in two and slowly dissipated in the air. Facing Whitebeard's monstrous strength and physique, Nicholas chose to engage in a hit-and-run strategy. He knew that in a direct confrontation, he would be the first to run out of stamina. With his long sword pointed forward, lightning thundered down from the sky, relentlessly slashing towards Whitebeard as he charged forward. Chapter 167 Suddenly, bolts of lightning flew from Nicholas's godlike figure toward the thunderclouds above, beginning to connect with the thunderclouds in the sky. Beast Horde With a raise of his right hand, followed by a fierce swing toward Whitebeard in front of him, the thunderclouds in the sky lit up, and then from within the thunderclouds, it seemed as if the roar of a beast was emanating. The charges roaming in the thunderclouds quickly converged, forming thunder beasts in the blink of an eye as the potential difference between positive and negative charges formed, and thunder quickly generated. Then, quickly outlined, in an instant, they formed into thunder beasts, creatures emanating lightning, 
charging toward Whitebeard on the ground. Roar! Boom boom! A series of deep roars, accompanied by thunderous rumblings, echoed in the sky above the island. At this moment, Whitebeard also stopped in his tracks, standing still and looking up at the thunderous sky filled with thunder beasts, his gaze solemn. Without a doubt, while these thunder beasts were not formidable individually, now with thousands upon thousands of them, they posed a considerable threat even to him. With high destructive power lightning, if only for a short time, he could easily withstand the attacks. But as someone who had fought long battles on the open sea like Whitebeard, his combat instincts were sharp. He could clearly sense that, in this state, after Nicholas established a connection with the thunderclouds in the sky, the thunder attacks he emitted did not consume much of his stamina. His only task was to guide the massive thunder stored in the clouds to manifest as a horde of thunder beasts charging toward him. Once the thunder beast horde formed, unless all the thunder in the clouds was exhausted or Nicholas was dealt with, it wouldn't stop. Roar! At this moment, one thunder beast after another moved, roaring towards Whitebeard. Clang! With lightning flashing, the thunder beasts were already in front of Whitebeard, viciously attacking. But Whitebeard's movements were equally swift. At his peak, his strength was terrifying. With a sweep of his naginata, he directly cut down dozens of thunder beasts. However, after cutting down ten, there were twenty more thunder beasts rushing forward, and it seemed they were coming relentlessly. Boom boom. Accompanied by the thunderous charge of the thunder beast horde from above, the thunder echoed deafeningly above the island, and lightning flickered on the island, illuminating the surroundings. Some sea creatures that hadn't had time to leave this area appeared on the sea surface, belly up. Phew! After punching a thunder elephant, Whitebeard's eyes flashed with a touch of anger. At this moment, he had already lost his shirt and his pants were also a bit tattered, all destroyed by the thunder beasts just now. Boom boom. Soon, under the continuous assault of the thunder beast horde, Whitebeard was injured. One or two thunder beasts didn't matter, but when dozens, even hundreds of thunder beasts attacks arrived, there were inevitably gaps in his defenses. After all, those thunder beasts he had dispersed had already formed a small area of intense electric field around him. Although he couldn't be said to be completely paralyzed, but due to the stimulation of lightning, his movements had undoubtedly slowed down. With lightning flashing, every thunder strike from the thunderclouds above made the island shine brightly. Even Whitebeard, a flesh and blood being, when continuously bombarded by such high intensity lightning, would still get hurt. Dad! The people on Whitebeard's pirate crew suddenly panicked. When had they ever seen Whitebeard in such a sorry state? Wow, ha ha ha, what an amazing battle! Gabon, quickly pull up that octopus over there, I want to have sashimi tonight. With his terminal illness alleviated, Roger's mentality had obviously improved a lot, pointing to the octopus floating on the sea surface similar in size to Oro Jackson and shouting loudly to Gabon. Tsuru, what do you think? In the marine headquarters, Zephyr looked at the scene of the beast horde charging towards Whitebeard and asked Tsuru beside him in a deep voice. I can only say that the abilities of the top-notch devil fruit users in the Logia series are like moving disasters. Let's have Garp focus on cultivating that young man called Kazan whom Garp found. I'll communicate with the fleet admiral later. Those two devil fruits sent by the world government should also strengthen the reserve strength of the marines now that the situation in the sea is turbulent. Putting on his glasses, Zephyr said. The devil fruits sent by the world government should have been given to the young talents in the marines a long time ago, but because of the influence of Dragon, it was delayed until now. Now, with the turbulent situation in the sea, the marines indeed need reinforcement. In the jungle, Nicholas watched as Whitebeard was submerged in the horde of thunder beasts. At this moment, Whitebeard, enveloped in lightning, suddenly looked towards Nicholas through the thunderclouds. Then, he directly inserted the halberd into the ground. His sturdy arm reached out, and with a tug like that of a tiger's claw, the space in front of him suddenly shattered, cracks appearing and spreading toward the distance. Nicholas widened his eyes in shock, looking at the shattered space in front of him. It seemed as if it had split apart, and Whitebeard had directly torn apart the space. Nicholas's heart was filled with horror, and at the same time, he quickly retreated. 
he didn't want to try the sharpness of the cracks in the space with his body. Phew phew. After a while, the shattered space gradually restored, and Whitebeard's heavy panting also came from afar, evidently the move just now had taken its toll on him. Wow ha ha ha, what a delightful battle. Nicholas. Even after being repeatedly injured by Nicholas, Whitebeard still laughed heartily. Because, besides Roger, Garp, Zephyr, Sangoku, and a few others, he now had another opponent with whom he could engage in such exhilarating battles. Boom boom boom. The thunder resounded from the sky, and Whitebeard's towering figure was already in front of Nicholas, the Naginata swinging down heavily. Nicholas, let's enjoy the battle. Whitebeard roared like thunder, shaking Nicholas's ears with pain. At the same time, the Naginata, carrying terrifying vibrational force, came crashing down. Nicholas's expression changed, and he reached out with both palms towards his head, seemingly intending to directly catch the blade with his bare hands. As the Naginata descended, there was a loud explosion between the two of them. Instantly, a vast force erupted, spreading to the entire island. Chapter 168 Gururara As a top-tier powerhouse, Whitebeard naturally had no fear of battle, especially the kind that made his blood boil. He laughed heartily as he closed in on Nicholas with incredible speed, then swung his blade. The already damaged ground erupted once again as Nicholas, transformed into lightning, dodged the attack. A massive crater appeared where he had stood moments before. When Nicholas reappeared in the air, he waved his hands, and lightning bolts once again surged towards Whitebeard. Whitebeard swung his cloud splitter, enveloped in armament hockey, easily dispersing the lightning bolts. He stood on the ground, staring at Nicholas in the air. Are you planning for a battle of attrition? I'm curious, Nicholas, just how strong are you now? With these words, Whitebeard leaped towards Nicholas. It was evident that while Whitebeard excelled in offense, defense, and endurance, his aerial combat abilities were lacking. Although he could briefly hover, he couldn't fully engage in combat while airborne. Seeing Whitebeard charging towards him, Nicholas took a deep breath, his expression growing more serious. He could sense Whitebeard's already formidable aura surging even further, brimming with excitement and battle fervor. Blue electrical arcs shimmered around Nicholas once more as he summoned lightning to strike Whitebeard's direction. Swoosh! Almost instantly, Whitebeard arrived at Nicholas's head, his terrifying speed causing air bursts with every step. In the blink of an eye, he was upon him, laughing heartily as he swung his blade down. The air shattered, and Whitebeard's blade, wrapped in vibration waves, shook the space, creating ripples of danger around him. Nicholas's eyes blazed red as lightning surged around him. He disappeared into elemental form, but just as quickly, a vibrating force from Whitebeard's fist disrupted his elemental state, sending him flying in spitting blood. The vibrational force invaded his body, causing him to tremble continuously. Coupled with the punch, he was left bleeding profusely. Elementalization isn't invincible, huh? You're too reliant on devil fruit powers, Nicholas. Whitebeard remarked, seemingly unconcerned about delivering a finishing blow as Nicholas flew backward. In mid-air, Nicholas adjusted his body, spreading his fingers and reaching towards the air in front of him. Accompanied by the crackling of lightning, he slid through the air for a while before forcefully stopping. Then, he raised both hands into the air. As soon as his hands spread open, electric particles scattered in the air seemed to respond to his call, converging from all directions at an incredible speed. During their battle moments ago, the lightning particles Nicholas released responded to him in an instant. Above the island, lightning bolts danced wildly, forming a continuous pattern. With a deafening roar, the thunder rumbled and the sky was covered in a blanket of white. Whitebeard looked up at the lightning above Nicholas's head, his expression slightly changed, feeling amazed. How many tricks do you still have left, Nicholas? Whitebeard murmured as he stared at the lightning-covered sky. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning shot down, aimed directly at Whitebeard. Subsequently, as if in a chain reaction, thunderous roars echoed across the island sky. The lightning, covering two-thirds of the island's surface, struck relentlessly, leaving no part untouched. The once lush forest was replaced by burning trees, and electric arcs flickered on the ground. Island 
The island is destroyed. Is that the power of the monsters on the high seas? It's terrifying. On the Moby Dick, many people were nervous, their foreheads sweating as they stared at the island, completely engulfed in lightning, swallowing their saliva anxiously. Amidst the thunderous chaos, Whitebeard's heavy breathing could be heard. His face was serious as he firmly planted his Murakumajiri into the ground, then clenched his fists, bending forward slowly. Next, it's time for you to see my attack. His imposing voice echoed, causing Nicholas's eyes to widen in anticipation. Chapter 169 Watching Whitebeard's movements, Nicholas's pupils contracted, and his heart seemed to stop for a moment. Driven by instinct, his elemental transformation began, and lightning crackled around him. Then, a dangerously intense aura approached, causing Nicholas's observation hockey to see nothing but white. Too fast. It was too fast. Almost as soon as Whitebeard threw his punch, cracks appeared in the space around Nicholas like shattered glass. The force of Whitebeard's attack was unparalleled, causing the cracks in space to spread at an unbelievable speed, almost instantly reaching Nicholas. Buzz. In Nicholas's eyes, everything trembled, and all things vibrated. A surging force pressed in from all sides, making his lightning-transformed hair dance wildly. Crack. The space shattered, and from Nicholas's perspective, the world seemed to break like glass. Even Whitebeard and the ships on the distant ocean, including the Moby Dick and the Oro Jackson, shattered like reflections in a broken mirror. Then, with Whitebeard's powerful attack, the space seemed to shatter like glass, shaking the earth, and a resounding impact ensued as the attack struck Nicholas. Faced with the attack that sealed off any escape, Nicholas couldn't evade. He couldn't evade this strike. In an instant, Nicholas's consciousness blanked out as if everything had been shattered. He took Whitebeard's hit head on. As Whitebeard's strike shattered the space, the ground trembled, and fissures spread rapidly, splitting the island apart. The outer regions of the island began to crumble and sink into the sea, while massive cracks divided the island, allowing seawater to surge out. The island is breaking apart. The power required to shatter such a large island was truly awe-inspiring. Hey, Captain, do you think Nicholas is done for? Gabon wiped the sweat from his forehead, staring nervously in the direction of the island. He couldn't imagine enduring such a terrifying blow from Whitebeard. Even Nicholas, who had taken the full force of Whitebeard's terrifying blow, was likely on the verge of death. It's not that easy to take him down. If nature-type abilities were so easy to defeat, nature-type ability users wouldn't be known as the hardest enemies to kill on the sea. Rayleigh spoke calmly. Sigh. As Rayleigh and Gabon conversed, Roger sighed, attracting curious glances from Gabon and Rayleigh. If I knew it would be this interesting, I would have joined in earlier. Roger looked at the shattered island with regret. Meanwhile, Rayleigh and Gabon, hearing their captain's words, turned their heads back to continue observing the battlefield. Whitebeard strike stirred up gusts of wind. When the dust settled and the smoke dispersed, the scene on the island entered Whitebeard's view. Cough, cough, cough. Suddenly, a violent coughing sound reached Whitebeard's ears, making him focus. You actually held on. Whitebeard said in surprise. Nicholas was still alive, but his condition was extremely poor. At this moment, he had fallen to the ground, kneeling with one knee on the ground and his hand propping himself up. He coughed up blood heavily, and blood flowers fell to the ground like blooming plum blossoms, stunning yet poignant. His complexion was pale, with many parts of his body blurred, and even some places where the bone was visible, terrifying wounds caused by the cracks generated by Whitebeard's strike. Who, who? Nicholas gasped heavily, the scent of rust and heat filling his nostrils. Whitebeard's strike was the most severe injury he had ever suffered. Suddenly, Nicholas stood up, his eyes opening to reveal dazzling lightning, and a vast and imposing aura radiated from him. Sharp and violent lightning surged around him, enveloping his entire body. This is Conqueror's Hockey. Rayleigh and Gabon exchanged surprised glances. Clearly, the overwhelming pressure emanating from Nicholas could only be produced by Conqueror's Hockey. This Conqueror's Hockey with such a range isn't something you can handle. Quickly, keep the ship moving away. 
Marco watched as many crew members on the ship collapsed with rolling eyes, loudly instructing. No, that's not Conqueror's hockey. Roger stared intently at the direction of the island, his expression serious. As the owner of the top-tier Conqueror's hockey on the sea, he could easily discern that the aura spreading from the island towards all directions wasn't Conqueror's hockey. That's something even more terrifying. Roger's expression was grave because in his perception, Nicholas's aura seemed to have completely changed, even transforming into a different aura altogether. Meanwhile, on the island, Whitebeard witnessed Nicholas's state firsthand, noticing the rapid change in him, which filled him with shock. Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. Amidst the crackling lightning, Nicholas's figure was enveloped in dazzling purple lightning, and his clothing quickly transformed into a mythological robe woven from lightning. Ribbons fluttered, swiftly outlining mysterious runes inscribed on it. At the same time, intricate lightning patterns appeared all over Nicholas's body, and the horrifying wounds on his body quickly healed. Soon, like the god of thunder, Nicholas hovered in front of Whitebeard, causing him to widen his eyes in astonishment. Looks like you can still stand up, kid. Trying to knock me down with this level of attack. You still have a long way to go. One tall, one short, they stared at each other, their breaths heavy and deep. The clash of two forces, lightning and vibration, that were never supposed to intersect collided at this moment. Zap! Moments later, Nicholas's body once again shimmered with dazzling light, blue electric arcs crackling around him, swirling around his body. Newgate! Don't disappoint me! Nicholas's voice, filled with blazing battle intent, resounded, making Whitebeard's gaze sharpen. He, too, responded without hesitation. Kid, you're definitely going down first. Whitebeard swung his naginata, and dust rose from the ground as he did so. Along with Nicholas's surging battle intent, his own battle intent also grew stronger. Be careful, Newgate. After saying this, Nicholas closed his eyes, his previous injuries and intense battle leaving him somewhat languid. However, his spirit and will had reached their peak at this moment. Chapter 170 Behind him, a circular halo formed by lightning floated above Nicholas's head, with bursts of lightning shooting out from it and nine thunder drums surrounding it. At his feet, a purple-black thunder dragon roared continuously, coiling around Nicholas and emanating a chilling aura. At this moment, Nicholas was even more powerful than in his previous semi-divine state. Moreover, as the halo of lightning behind him shimmered, a strange ripple spread outwards, attracting ions from the air to gather around it. As Nicholas appeared like a deity, violent changes were also occurring in the sky above. The dark clouds, previously dispersed by Whitebeard, reassembled, and the surrounding celestial phenomena rapidly changed, with the coverage of dark clouds expanding visibly to the naked eye. It was as if a storm was brewing over the sea. This power. Watching the changes on the distant island, John Giant, who was still broadcasting diligently on the small boat despite the fluctuating waves, was dumbfounded. Then he heard a voice from afar. Vice Admiral John Giant. We received orders from headquarters to evacuate from this area. What's coming next is beyond our intervention. Another dilapidated warship appeared, and the creaking hull and the mast wrapped in iron made one wonder if the ship would sink in the next moment. Facing the voices of his subordinates, John Giant wasted no time and immediately stepped back onto the warship, then ordered everyone to sail away from this dangerous area. On the desolate island. Sizzle. Amidst the flashing lightning, Nicholas stepped on the thunder dragon, overlooking Whitebeard on the ground. At this moment, Nicholas's imposing aura was terrifying, as if he had completely transformed into someone else. At this moment, he seemed to be the master of thunder. Facing Whitebeard below, Nicholas extended his palm, and a ripple appeared. Sizzle. With a piercing sound, countless metal particles flew out from the island below. It seemed as if an invisible hand was controlling them. Soon, dense metal particles floated around Nicholas like a river, swirling around him. Thunder metallurgy. Electricity surged along the metal river, colliding between the metal particles. Under high temperature, the metal particles quickly changed shape and merged together. In the blink of an eye, a giant sword hundreds of meters long floated in front of Nicholas. 
Nicholas reached out his hand as if grasping the giant sword in front of him, his eyes cold as he looked down at Whitebeard, lofty and aloof, like a deity. In the next moment, Nicholas swung the hundred-meter-long giant sword fiercely towards Whitebeard. Although I don't know what's happening, kid, your current appearance really annoys me. With a loud roar, Whitebeard raised his halberd, and almost instantly, a halo formed on the blade due to the vibration force. The next moment, the two weapons clashed fiercely. Blinding light flashed, and immense power collided, shattering the air between them. The ground under Whitebeard's feet shattered with a rumble, making the already dilapidated island even more devastated. This was a power far beyond ordinary, turning the already broken island into a mess. Ha! Huh. With a loud shout, Whitebeard swung his halberd, and the vibrational force, along with the sharpness of the weapon and Whitebeard's terrifying strength, actually cut Nicholas's giant sword directly in half. With a sound of breaking through the air, the severed half of the giant sword rotated in the air and plunged into the ground in the distance. Facing the broken weapon, Nicholas's eyes were cold. Then, with the replenishment of the surrounding metal particles, the giant sword in his hand was restored. Nicholas raised his hand again, controlling the giant sword towards Whitebeard. The hundred-meter-long giant sword swung down, splitting a huge crack of several kilometers on the shattered island. Rocks and soil flew everywhere, and a small mountain in the distance collapsed with a rumble. However, after this sword strike, it seemed to have struck empty space. Whitebeard also realized that something was amiss. He dodged to the side when Nicholas attacked. Nicholas. Whitebeard roared at Nicholas, but received no response. At the same time, another metal particle gathered in Nicholas's other hand, forming a metal ball the size of a walnut. Grasped between Nicholas's thumb and forefinger. Sizzle. Lightning flashed on his arm, appearing around the metal ball and then, at the same time, the metal ball was instantly ejected. Hum. In an instant, the void trembled, and as the metal ball flew rapidly through the air, it left a trace. Railgun. At this moment, as the metal ball flew out, a huge airflow with a diameter of several meters appeared in the air, demonstrating the formidable power of this strike. What is this? Whitebeard's pupils shrank as he sensed the danger. With lightning flashing, the swift attack crossed space and appeared in front of him. The tremendous power of the attack could be roughly sensed, capable of easily shattering a mountain. Faced with this speed of attack, Whitebeard had no time to react. Subconsciously, he raised his fist and quickly enveloped it with armament hockey and his tremor tremor fruit ability, then collided fiercely with the attack. In an instant, a terrifying explosion erupted, surging airflow spreading in all directions like radiation. Whitebeard's massive body also grunted, flying backward. After a moment, Whitebeard stood up, but at this moment, his arm looked particularly terrifying, with his five fingers showing a strange curvature, and even some of the flesh on his hand was missing. Gurarara, this is truly terrifying. Saying so, Whitebeard raised his halberd and stepped forward, charging towards Nicholas once again. Nicholas remained expressionless, unleashing bolts of lightning towards Whitebeard. Rayleigh, something's not right. Get the ship further away. After saying this, Roger leaped from the bow of the ship towards the direction of the island. Hey, Marco, there's movement with Roger's pirate group over there. Jozu, watching Roger's sudden action, quickly shouted to Marco. Marco, I'll go help Whitey. With the light of Enma and Aim no Habakiri in his hands, Marco spoke up, apparently knowing the horror of the opponent he had faced before. Although he wasn't a match for him, helping Whitebeard relieve some pressure wouldn't hurt. But before they could act, Oro Jackson stood in front of them. Rayleigh, what do you mean by this? Marco asked with a dark expression, clearly having witnessed the scene where Whitebeard was severely hit by Nicholas's railgun earlier. It's nothing, just a warning for you to take the ship further away. The battle over there is beyond your interference. Getting involved in that level of combat will only drag Whitebeard down. Also, the kid should show some respect for his elders. After saying this, Oro Jackson changed course and sailed away. As Marco hesitated, the sound of Whitebeard's voice came from the island. Marco. Marco responded loudly to Whitebeard. 
Now, as captain, I order you to take the members of the Whitebeard Pirates and leave this place. Then, another loud rumble came from the island. After hearing this, Marco gritted his teeth and ordered everyone to move away from the area. At this moment, on the island, with Roger joining in, the battle had become frenzied. Facing Nicholas, both Whitebeard and Roger seemed a bit bewildered. Despite their joint efforts, they could only barely suppress Nicholas. Unbeknownst to them, time was quickly passing by, but the three of them had lost all sense of time. In the blink of an eye, from day to night. The spectators on the sea were already numb, watching the flashes of lightning, slashes, and vibrations on the island, making the area incredibly bright. Is that guy a monster? Even Dad and Roger teaming up can't suppress him. This is insane. The members of the Whitebeard Pirates were dumbfounded, while Toki, holding a baby, looked at the constant thunderous sounds without revealing her thoughts. As the night faded and the first rays of sunlight rose from the distant sea, the battle on the island continued. The original island was now barely visible, with only large rocks on the sea serving as the footholds for Whitebeard and Roger, while Nicholas remained suspended in the air. Huff Roger, are you still holding up? Holding ace, Roger looked at Whitebeard on a boulder a hundred meters away and asked loudly. I'm fine. Is that guy still Nicholas? Roger couldn't help but curse as he dispersed the lightning that shot towards them. It could be said that after fighting for so long, Nicholas hadn't said a word, and his whole demeanor was like a perpetual motion machine, showing no signs of exhaustion. Roger had tried to attack Nicholas's will with his conqueror's hockey, but when he and Whitebeard simultaneously attacked with their conqueror's hockey, they found that Nicholas's will was like a deity. Pure, pristine and utterly majestic, not at all like a human at all, and even his own conqueror's hockey was shattered by the majestic aura emanating from him. Chapter 171 Trouble Ahead, Whitebeard Roger couldn't help but say in a deep voice as he looked at Nicholas hovering in the air. At this point, Nicholas could be said to no longer be Nicholas. If one must describe it, it would be a thunder entity with Nicholas's appearance. No emotions, no consciousness, solely relying on Nicholas's instinct to fight, yet incredibly powerful. If previously Nicholas had utilized the full power of the Thunder Thunder Fruit, now he was pushing its abilities to 150%. In the battle between Roger and Whitebeard, Nicholas had actually been observing from a third-person perspective. For him, this state could be considered his first time entering it. Unlike the semi-divine mode, which he could fully control and decide when to exit or enter, this state was beyond his control. In other words, it was like hiring a substitute player the account was still yours, but someone else was controlling it. To regain control, one would either have to kick out the substitute and take over themselves or wait for the substitute to disconnect. Nicholas was also constantly pondering this situation. Under this state, he found himself unable to control his own body, and his will seemed to be squeezed into the corner of his body. Fortunately, the substitute currently lacked consciousness and acted more on instinct. Although he lacked the skill and combat awareness compared to his former self, he explosively unleashed the power of the Thunder Thunder Fruit far beyond his previous limits. It was like unleashing many ultimate moves Nicholas needed to establish a connection with the thunderclouds in the sky in advance for most of his attacks, but now he could summon them at will. That's why, facing the combined force of Whitebeard and Roger, he could persist until now. It seemed like he was acting according to instinct, and that instinct was the instinct of lightning. Although it sounded unbelievable, it was Nicholas's most immediate feeling at the moment. According to the most widely circulated theory on the sea, devil fruit awakenings only occurred in the Zoan and Paramecia types. One of the effects of awakening a Paramecia fruit was the ability to influence the surroundings, transforming them into substances corresponding to the ability. Awakening simply required fully developing the ability to its extreme. On the other hand, awakening a Zoan fruit was more dangerous because a slight mishap could turn one into the animal represented by the ability, much like the jailer beasts in Impel Down. However, if successful, it would grant incredibly enhanced physical abilities and resilience. It could even be said that Zoan devil fruits were a shortcut to rapidly increasing the strength of ordinary people. 
by consuming a Zoan devil fruit, even a regular person, as long as they kept training and enduring beatings, could quickly integrate the power of the devil fruit within them through continuous combat and hardships. As for the Logia type, Nicholas could probably guess why there was no mention of awakening. Because the so-called awakening of the Logia type was likely the process of merging one's will with the natural elements represented by the devil fruit ability. However, one's will would not only have to face the elemental power represented by the devil fruit but also the will of the entire world. Individual wills were too insignificant compared to the will of the world, and the most likely outcome was assimilation and loss. The fate of those assimilated was to return to nature, becoming part of the natural elements. Of course, very few people could achieve this. Awakening of the Zoan type allows one to voluntarily transform into the animal represented by the fruit, making the ability even more powerful. Awakening of the Logia type, on the other hand, is probably about aligning oneself more closely with the elements themselves. One slight mishap, and you're completely back to nature. While a Zoan awakening turns you into an animal at worst, a Logia awakening would just scatter your ashes into the wind. Logia types seem to have it rougher than the Paramecia ones, don't they? Nicholas was already feeling too tired to make sarcastic remarks. Meanwhile, the divine-like Nicholas outside was sent flying by the combined force of Whitebeard and Roger, crashing into the sea with a thunderous roar. A massive amount of mist rose from the sea, plowing a deep trench in the water. It was evident that the two intended to use the seawater to restrain Nicholas. Whitebeard, I'll hold him off. You seize the opportunity and use Seaquake. Roger shouted at Whitebeard, then rushed forward, chasing after Nicholas on the sea surface. He had realized that the current Nicholas was using a substitute. A genuine Nicholas wouldn't possess such power. This mode consumed immense energy every moment, which ordinary humans couldn't withstand, let alone hold on for so long after fighting alongside Whitebeard. Considering Nicholas's age, even exaggerating, he wouldn't be able to maintain this state for such a long time. Even he felt like he was reaching his limit. Heaven's punishment. With the wind howling in his ears, Roger exerted his full strength as he arrived in front of Nicholas, slashing down with his sword. The purple thunder dragon under Nicholas bit down on Roger's sword, then dissipated in just a moment under Roger's blade. Then, Nicholas's chest twisted abruptly, a terrifying gash extending from his left shoulder to his right abdomen, almost severing him in half. The entire lightning-formed body buzzed, and in his emotionless eyes, a hint of confusion seemed to appear. The surroundings shook again as an invisible shockwave spread out with a deafening roar, causing numerous fragmented islands to be sent flying into the air. This island, after the Battle of the Three, finally found its liberation. Seaquake with Whitebeard's furious roar amidst the rumbling, seawater surged towards all directions. In the blink of an eye, a huge depression several tens of miles in radius formed on the sea surface beneath the feet of the three, revealing the submerged lower half of the island, soaked in seawater for countless years. You bastard, if you can survive this time, I'll treat you to a damn good drink. Roger swung ace, slashing towards Nicholas relentlessly. Armament hockey, conqueror's hockey, all released, pressing down on Nicholas, momentarily suppressing him. Slash. Although suppressed, the lightning robe on Nicholas's body and the mysterious lightning runes on it continued to flicker. After avoiding Roger's slashes, Nicholas raised his hand, unleashing arcs of electricity directly towards Roger. At the same time, Nicholas turned into lightning, charging towards Roger. In the blink of an eye, amidst the flashes of lightning, the two collided fiercely hundreds of times in the air. Lightning was split open by Roger, and attacks were effortlessly deflected by Nicholas. Suddenly, the Nicholas, who hadn't spoken a word or made any sound throughout, let out a roar. It wasn't a sound that a human could make rather, it was a thunderous roar echoing through the sky, a roar belonging to nature itself. Accompanying the roar, a gale swept through, visible shockwaves appearing in the air, making Roger's expression serious as he stood with his sword in front of him. Roger, it's coming, stop him. Just then, Whitebeard's voice suddenly came, and at this moment, he was already in the air with his Najinata in hand. His previously almost crippled fingers had also been straightened out. With Whitebeard's words, a rumbling sound came from afar, 
followed by waves as high as hundreds of meters rushing towards the position where the three were. The battle was about to end. However Nicholas in an instant compressed 90% of the surrounding lightning and released it in an instant. Ugh. Because they were caught off guard, both Roger and Whitebeard were swatted away hundreds of meters, their bodies started turning stiff. This is bad. Roger's face turned ashen. Nicholas looked at both of them with his indifferent eyes, next he split the giant hundred-meter sword into thousands of regular swords and enhanced them with lightning. Both Roger and Whitebeard could sense their impending end. Dad Noo. Captain. Railk. Just as the both were about to meet their demise, a swooshing sound came from the north with a horrendous amount of pressure. King of Hell, Three Sword Serpent, 103 Mercies Deity Damnation. Instantly appearing in front of Nicholas, a swordsman with one sword in his mouth and one in each of his hands, sliced Nicholas instantly. Everyone who was watching this was surprised, even Roger and Whitebeard were stunned. Nevertheless, they both met eyes and responded right away. In a flash Whitebeard held Murakumajiri like a baseball bat and threw Roger who was squatting on Murakumajiri towards Nicholas. Roger instantly appearing above Nicholas swung ace with all his might towards Nicholas. Gura. Meanwhile Whitebeard grabbed the air like a cloth and using all his might swung towards Nicholas. Boom. Accompanied by billions of tons of seawater crashing down from above, the figures of Nicholas and Roger were simultaneously plunged into the depths of the sea. As the fluctuating seawater subsided, occasional flashes of bright light could be seen in the deep sea. Whoosh! After a long time, accompanied by the sound of the water breaking open, a figure leaped out from beneath the surface, and it was Roger. And on his shoulder was the tightly closed-eyed Nicholas. Woo, that was close, if it weren't for that guy. Remembering the swordsman, both looked at him. Chapter 172 Who are you? Whitebeard asked to ease the tension after he and Roger had both watched the enigmatic swordsman for a considerable amount of time. Turning back, the swordsman finally showed his face. He had a distinctive appearance. He was a tall and muscular man with spiky green hair that obscured his eyes. He wore a bandana or a tied-up headband around his forehead, along with three gold earrings in each ear, one of his eye was closed with a scar on the eyelid and a slash scar across his chest. Additionally, he carried three swords, two of which were usually strapped to his waist, while the third was slung over his right shoulder in a crossed position. His overall appearance reflected his strong and serious demeanor, befitting his role as a formidable swordsman. The name is Rorino Zoro, nice to meet you. Sheathing his sword Zoro replied in a calm voice. So you are telling us that you were helping a group called Akatsuki or whatever to fight a 1000 feet monster fox but you got lost mid-fight and somehow got here? Whitebeard inquired. Could it be a mythical fruit user? Roger nudged Whitebeard. They were both lost in thought. After some time being bored Zoro looked at them and asked. You guys have any booze? Whitebeard nonchalantly took out three gourds tied to his waist and threw one to Roger and the other one to Zoro. Let's celebrate since you pulled a clutch at the right moment. Guru Rara if it weren't for you we would have. Cheers. The trio clinked their gourds and drank all the booze. You look familiar, especially that crescent beard, and you too. You guys have we met somewhere? Zoro inquired while drinking his booze as he glanced at Roger and Whitebeard. I don't think so, this is my first time seeing you. Roger replied giving Zoro a big smile. Hmm. That sword looks familiar. As Whitebeard glanced at the purple sword, he was puzzled. He swore he saw it somewhere. After their chatting Zoro stood up about to leave. By the way do you guys know which direction Kanoha village is? I got to finish that monster before I find my captain. Looking at Zoro, Whitebeard shook his head meanwhile Roger was extremely excited. Please join my crew, Zoro. Roger wanted to have Zoro in his crew no matter what. Sorry, I have a captain. Looking at Roger, Zoro was reminded of Luffy. Slowly Luffy and Roger's image gradually overlapped. Zoro was a bit emotional. Sigh, what a bummer. Roger was disappointed but Zoro's next words made him awaken from his disappointment. 
I can't join your crew but we can fight sometimes. Roger was excited and proposed to battle right there but Zoro declined looking their condition. Would you mind lending me your Viva card so I can locate you guys for a match? And give me that guy's Viva card too. Zoro demanded as he looked the duo and Nicholas lying down. Both of them tore a piece of their Viva card and passed them to Zoro. Remembering the Viva card Nicholas gave him, Roger tore a piece of it and gave it to Zoro. Taking all three pieces of the Viva card Zoro thanked them and turned to leave. The nearest island of here is in the south, you can ask them about Kanoha. Whitebeard pointed toward south as he took a gulp from his gourd. Thank you, I hope I see you guys again. Saying that Zoro left in the opposite direction. Hey that's the wrong direction. Roger tried to warn Zoro but he had already swam far away. Both Roger and Whitebeard looked at each other, they had nothing to say. Due to Whitebeard's tsunami, there was thick fog on the sea so the visibility was very poor. On Moby Dick Enma vibrated briefly on Odin's hip as he sensed a familiar aura while trying to glimpse Whitebeard aboard the ship through the fog. Hmm. Isn't this Enma? No the aura is stronger than my Enma, but why is there another Enma? After a few seconds Enma stopped vibrating, Odin was confused but he couldn't do anything since Whitebeard forbade him not to leave the ship. Soon as the warm rays of the sun hit the fog on the ocean, it slowly started dissipating. When everything finally settled down, this stretch of sea also returned to its former state, but the only difference was that the countless years old islands in this area were nowhere to be seen. Turn the helm, dad is over there. Hurry. Soon, the silhouette of the Moby Dick appeared, and it spotted Whitebeard resting on a reef with his legs crossed. Marco also leaped from the ship's railing, transforming into a phoenix and swiftly flying towards Whitebeard. As they approached Whitebeard and landed beside him, Marco, with a cautious look around, noticed that there was only Whitebeard there. Immediately, he asked with concern, Dad, are you okay? Ha, huh, I'm Whitebeard, of course I'm fine. Whitebeard laughed heartily at Marco's anxious expression, then looked into the distance, where the Oro Jackson had just departed. Buggy kept jumping, trying to peek through the crowd in front to see Nicholas in the center. Buggy, come over here. Shanks, who was moving a huge barrel from the side, reached out to beckon Buggy over. Buggy didn't hesitate and directly took a running start, jumping onto the barrel, causing it to sway wildly. Finally, after a lot of effort, he managed to stabilize himself and Shanks on the barrel. Upon seeing the situation inside, Buggy was stunned. Because it was completely different from what he had expected. He thought that after such an intense battle, Nicholas would at least be covered in blood with torn flesh, broken bones, and hanging by a thread of life. But Nicholas didn't have any of those injuries he had imagined he looked as if he were just asleep. It was Captain Roger who had quite a few wounds on his body, sitting beside Nicholas, receiving treatment from Dr. Crocus. Soon, Roger's wounds were mostly treated. Roger then looked over at Nicholas, realizing the trouble this guy had caused him and Whitebeard. Crocus, what's the situation with this guy? Roger asked Crocus, who was examining Nicholas's internal condition. All his organs are functioning normally, and his muscles, which were previously overloaded due to the battle, are recovering. Crocus continued, in other words, this guy's body is perfectly fine, he just needs to wake up. But that's also the most troublesome part because you never know when he'll wake up. Forget it, let's put him in the infirmary for now and see when he wakes up. So, to celebrate, let's have a feast. As Roger's voice fell, the Oro Jackson erupted into cheers. On the other hand, on the Moby Dick, Whitebeard grabbed Marco's leg and crossed onto the deck, then with a loud thud, he sat down. The pirates were worried. Ha ha ha. Whitebeard laughed heartily. I'm fine, it's just a few minor injuries. Then, two nurses wearing leopard print leggings brought various medical equipment to clean and suture his wounds. Hey, Shanks, do you think that guy will wake up? Buggy, who was peeking in front of the medical room, asked Shanks, who was also secretly observing Nicholas in the medical room. Who knows? Uncle Crocus said it depends on him when he wakes up. In the dark space, there was no trace of light. And in the very center, Nicholas was sitting there, emitting a faint glow that dispelled the surrounding darkness. 
At this moment, Nicholas was trapped here, and when he went online, he could sense the outside world's battles through his consciousness. He saw how his other self in the outside world unleashed such terrifying power, even able to contend with the combined might of Whitebeard and Roger. The speed and destructive power of lightning were maximized, and at that moment, he was thunder, and thunder was him. In that state, the power of thunder was amplified and expanded countless times, forming attacks that surpassed even those he could use. This was what thunder looked like when pushed to the extreme. Relying solely on the power of thunder, he could stand against the two most powerful beings on the sea. From the beginning to the end of the battle, Nicholas watched it all. With each collision, his understanding of lightning became deeper. Until the end, he was finally completely engulfed by the warm white light. Suddenly, Nicholas, lying on the bed, opened his eyes. The bright sunlight outside the porthole was dazzling, making him squint. Then, a figure appeared in his eyes. Crocus. Looking at the ship's doctor of the Roger Pirates, Nicholas realized that he was currently on board the Oro Jackson. Awake, huh, kid. Crocus smiled at Nicholas. Soon, Roger and others came to visit. One day later, Nicholas's complexion had improved a lot, and he could walk on the ground. Certainly, this battle had made Nicholas's body even stronger. Undoubtedly, when Nicholas fully digested the insights from this battle, he would become even more powerful. Wow, Nicholas. Do you know that you really scared me with your appearance back then? Sitting at the bow of the Oro Jackson, Roger looked at the distant sea and couldn't help but say. But you nearly killed Whitebeard and me, if it weren't for that guy. Roger wanted to say something but he stopped. Nicholas picked up a wine cup and took a sip, indicating that it was time to relax after such a battle, he didn't remember the mysterious swordsman. Chapter 173 By the way, I made an agreement with Whitebeard. Not long from now, Kazuki Odin and that woman, Toki, will come aboard my ship. As they drank their fill, Roger suddenly spoke up. Oh. Nicholas responded simply. You weren't like this before, were you? You're not trying to make us let our guard down and then strike, are you? Roger, full of gossip, continued, could it be that you really like her? She's already the mother of two children. As he spoke, Roger seemed to suddenly realize his discovery, incredulously saying, could it be that you have a mommy kink? Ha, you're the one with mommy kink. Do you think I'm some pirate who lacked motherly love since childhood? Nicholas spat directly at Roger. But truth be told, in the world of pirates, many seek companions who radiate maternal warmth, perhaps to make up for past regrets. Don't worry. It's best to know about that kind of news if you can, but it doesn't matter if you don't. After all, they're just a bunch of failures. Nicholas said nonchalantly. He was indeed interested in the information about 800 years ago that Toki held. But it was clear from Toki's demonstrated strength that she couldn't have been a central participant in the events of 800 years ago, and her knowledge was limited. And the reason she insisted on constantly traversing time and space to Wano was probably to wait for the next person inheriting the wills of Nika and Joy Boy, and to convey certain information. In other words, she was just a flesh trumpet. Where are you going next? I'll probably go visit some friends I haven't seen in a while. What? On the Moby Dick, upon hearing Whitebeard's words, members of the core crew, including Marco, Jozu, Thatch, and others, all made incredulous sounds, while Toki, who was nearby, covered her mouth lightly with her hand. Old man, why did you suddenly make this decision, and why do Toki and the others have to go to Roger's ship? Marco asked incredulously. Marco, calm down. Kazuki Odin first put his hand on Marco's shoulder, then looked at Whitebeard seriously and said, Whitey-chan, can you tell me why? I believe you wouldn't make this decision without reason. Marco, Jozu, you two go out. Odin and Toki, stay. Whitebeard said to Marco and Jozu. Soon, under the gaze of Nekamamushi and Inurashi, Marco and the others walked out of the captain's cabin, but they didn't see Odin and Toki's figures until the door was closed. Marco? What happened inside? Seeing Marco's somewhat heavy expression, Aizo quickly asked. Nothing, it's just that dad has something to discuss with Toki. 
Until the result of their discussion comes out, Marco won't say much more. In the captain's cabin of the Moby Dick, Whitebeard looked at Odin and Toki in front of him. He slowly said, ultimately, it depends on your decision, Odin. If you're unwilling, no one can force you. After meditating for a while, looking up at Whitebeard, Odin said seriously, Whitey Chan, I've decided to go to Roger's ship. I want to see what really happened 800 years ago that the world government wants to hide, why Wayno closed its borders, and why the official history books contain the things passed down through the Kazuki family for generations. There's too much I want to know. Isn't this the purpose of my setting sail? Then I'll contact Roger and them in a few days. Whitebeard said nonchalantly. The warm sunlight spilled onto the streets of Loke Town. After a stormy night, the town now exuded a refreshing aroma of earth. Looking at the sea from the window of the room, and the mark next to the window, Nicholas smiled, then quickly washed up and headed towards the street. During his stay in Logue Town, he discovered a breakfast shop. The food there was quite good, so he planned to eat there a few more times. Otherwise, after leaving in a few days, he didn't know when he'd be able to come back. Sir, the usual. The owner of the breakfast shop greeted Nicholas warmly. As usual, but today bring me two servings. Thanks. Nicholas smiled and said. The owner nodded and quickly turned to busy himself. Soon, he brought two servings of breakfast and placed them on the table in front of Nicholas. Nicholas ate leisurely, and when he had barely taken a few bites, a figure wearing a dark green cloak sat directly across from him. Seeing that Nicholas didn't speak and glanced at the breakfast in front of him, the person sat down silently and started eating. After quickly finishing the food in front of him, Nicholas looked up at the person in front of him. You're quick to react, Dragon. The person was none other than Dragon, who had almost defected from the Navy. It's been a long time since I had such a delicious breakfast. I really miss it. After Dragon swallowed the last bite of food on his plate, he said to Nicholas. Heh, you deserve it. You left the position of vice-admiral and became a rebel. I heard your father got implicated by you. If you weren't strong enough and didn't have enough connections in the navy, you might have been secretly executed. Nicholas gloated. What's the matter? Speak up. I'm busy these days. Dragon's expression changed when Nicholas mentioned Garp. Then he spoke up. Nothing, just passing by here. I happen to notice traces of your activities, so I tried to contact you for breakfast. Hearing Nicholas's words, Dragon looked at Nicholas's sincere eyes and realized that the other party seemed to really just want to have breakfast with him. By the way, I have something to ask you. Did you cause the storm that blocked Roger when Gold Lion intercepted him a while ago? This time Dragon's calm expression disappeared, replaced by surprise. How did you know? He blurted out. Damn, it was really you who did it. Seeing Dragon's reaction, Nicholas was baffled. Yeah, it was me. We're still weak I need someone to help us attract the attention of the world government. After all, whether if it's the deeply rooted world government or the marines who cover the four seas and the first half of the Grand Line. We're not strong enough to contend with them yet. Dragon's purpose was also simple. As someone who had once been in the navy, he knew how much the world government cared about the truth of 800 years ago, and Roger's goal was bound to attract the attention of the world government. So he was willing to help Roger attract firepower while they developed in secret and built up their strength. Just as Nicholas was about to continue asking questions, a figure approached and slowly sat down beside Nicholas and Dragon. Boss, please give me your signature dish. The person's tone was calm, with a hint of aloofness. Nicholas glanced up and was taken aback. Sitting there was a teenager, around 16 or 17 years old, with sharp eyes reminiscent of a hawk's gaze. There was an aura of sharpness typical of a swordsman emanating from him. Dracul my hawk? Nicholas asked tentatively. Who are you? A cold voice suddenly came from the young man's mouth. Apparently, Nicholas's altered appearance due to sacrificing his life made it difficult for Myhawk to recognize him. You're a swordsman. Instead of answering, Nicholas smiled and asked back. I've been training with my master for over a decade, and I've only recently started my journey. Myhawk nodded. 
For him, he would start slashing from the east blue, slashing through the four blues, then slashing through the grand line until he reached the new world, aiming to become the world's greatest swordsman. The title of the greatest swordsman wasn't given by anyone it was earned through each and every slash. Chapter 174 Oh, just starting out and already wielding the strength of a swordsman, and it seems you've already found your own path in swordsmanship. The newcomers on the sea are becoming more and more remarkable. Watching Myhawk, Nicholas couldn't help but remark, and this also made Dragon glance at Myhawk a couple of times. After all, achieving the level of a swordsman at such a young age meant that with a little more training and honing over the years, he would undoubtedly become a great swordsman. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, Myhawk instinctively tightened his grip on the long sword beside him, and his eyes suddenly became sharper. Throughout his journey, he had encountered quite a few people with decent strength, but rarely did he meet someone who could confidently state his level. Calm down, don't be so nervous. If we had any hostility towards you, with your current level of skill, you'd probably be fish food at the harbor of Logetown. Nicholas waved his hand dismissively. This wasn't just boasting with him and Dragon teaming up, even someone like Hawkeye, who would be considered the greatest swordsman, would end up fish food, let alone someone who had just started out. Who exactly are you? Although Nicholas said this, Myhawk remained vigilant, especially since it concerned his swordsmanship. If his conviction wavered, it would be like a cultivator's Tao heart being shattered. Unless he could recover, it would be over. I'm just a passing masked knight. Nicholas said with feigned solemnity. My hawk? Since you've chosen to set sail, you must have done your homework. Dragon took out a stack of wanted posters from his pocket and, after rummaging through them for a while, handed Myhawk Nicholas's wanted poster. Holding the bounty poster in his hand, Myhawk first looked down and then looked up again, not understanding how the handsome young man in the poster had become so disfigured in just a few years. Don't be surprised. That's him, but he just changed his facial muscles using techniques from the marines. Apparently, Dragon was willing to explain patiently because he had taken a liking to Myhawk. After all, having a future great swordsman on their side would undoubtedly greatly enhance their strength. At present, Dragon could be said to have few subordinates who could fight. If they couldn't put out enough level of fighters in terms of martial strength, they would just be playing around. Hey, Dragon, what are you trying to do? Seeing Dragon calmly putting away the wanted posters, Nicholas couldn't help but ask in amazement. This guy's actions didn't seem like those of a good person. However, Dragon remained quite candid, without any intention of concealing his motives. Oh, this? You know, we've just started, so we don't have much money, people, or weapons. Our expenses are huge, so this is just a way to earn some extra cash. Hearing Dragon's explanation, Nicholas fell silent. I hope to challenge you. I want to know how far I am from the pinnacle of the world. With firmness in his voice and an unwavering determination, Hawkeye exuded an aura as sharp as an unsheathed blade. Looking at Hawkeye's serious demeanor, Nicholas couldn't help but feel surprised. Even someone as calm as him felt a surge of excitement and anticipation. What exactly do you want to achieve? Nicholas shook his head in resignation and smiled, while slowly standing up. Seeing Nicholas's movements, Hawkeye's eyes brightened, evidently interpreting it as an agreement. Just as Hawkeye was about to get up, he was stopped by Nicholas's outstretched hand. Don't waste food. I'll be waiting outside for you. After saying that, Nicholas walked towards the exit. At this moment, Hawkeye's eyes widened, his pupils dilated. He couldn't even notice Nicholas's movements clearly. Nevertheless, he silently picked up his chopsticks and finished his food, even helping Dragon and Nicholas settle the bill before leaving. If that's the case, tell me your name, young swordsman. Nicholas said in a deep voice by the seaside of Logetown. Standing not far away, Hawkeye's eyes suddenly lit up, his face showing a hint of excitement and anticipation. I am Dracul, my hawk. Then, with determination in his eyes, he drew his sword from his waist. Hey, where's your sword? Hawkeye, eager for a peak showdown, urged Nicholas as he looked at him standing there. Nicholas smiled faintly and slowly drew out. A toothpick from his mouth. What's the meaning of this? 
Seeing Nicholas holding a toothpick, even the usually calm Myhawk felt a surge of anger about to burst forth. This kind of childish action was simply an insult to the solemnity of a swordsman's duel. I am no beast that goes all out when hunting rabbits unfortunately, I don't carry anything smaller than this. Nicholas said to Myhawk with a tone that implied, it's not that I don't want to draw my sword, but you're not worthy of it. Then, let's begin. Myhawk fell silent, then gripped the hilt of his sword with both hands and spoke in a deep voice. His expression became somewhat serious. When facing the world's top experts, even if their swordsmanship wasn't their most proficient attack method, one had to give their all in response because death was a real possibility. As Nicholas looked at Myhawk, he was taken aback. What the heck, this guy isn't playing by the rules. Shouldn't he be shouting something like, damn you, how dare you underestimate me. I'll make sure you die a miserable death. And then charge forward with his sword. Chapter 175 I'm coming. Myhawk tightened his grip on the long sword in his hand, his eyes narrowing like a hawk's, locking onto Nicholas with a sharp gaze. A chilling aura emanated from him, turning him into a hunting hawk ready to strike, his edge gleaming. It seemed like he had mobilized all his energy to the highest level. Myhawk lunged towards Nicholas, the tip of his blade colliding with the air, as if slicing through it, creating a vacuum in its wake. Watching from the sidelines, Dragon couldn't help but squint. Undoubtedly, the basic proficiency of the opponent in swordsmanship was formidable. To execute a basic thrust to such a degree was rare. If this guy becomes an instructor for the Revolutionary Army's swordsmanship, he could train a group of formidable swordsmen. Dragon couldn't help but think. In Nicholas's eyes, the glint of Myhawk's blade grew brighter and brighter, to the point where he could only see Myhawk in his world, blocking out everything else. Nicholas squinted as he faced the unified force of man and sword embodied by Myhawk. With his toothpick in hand, Nicholas tightened his grip slightly, and then swiftly covered it with hockey. Though Nicholas had advanced further in swordsmanship, using toothpick to block a blade wasn't something he could do casually. In Dragon's view, the formidable attack of Myhawk was effortlessly blocked by Nicholas, the sharp edge of the sword and the hockey-covered toothpick colliding, creating a shockwave in the air. At that moment, Myhawk suddenly heard the sound of wind. Hoo hoo hoo. The once quiet world suddenly became windy, and the sound of the wind grew louder. In Myhawk's perception, a gust of wind seemed to emerge from Nicholas's stance, growing stronger and louder until it roared throughout the sky and earth. Of course, this was only a faint sensation in his spiritual world, perceived by those with extremely high swordsmanship. Myhawk felt a powerful and fierce wind rushing towards him, making him tremble slightly. How did he do it? How could he block my attack with that fragile toothpick? Impossible. Though still stunned, his body instinctively switched from thrusting to slashing. It was an instinct developed over a decade of immersion in swordsmanship. In other words, his mind told him he had lost. But his body told his mind, don't you dare underestimate me. Watch me show off. It's the instinct of a swordsman, huh? No wonder he became the world's greatest swordsman and cultivated his own black blade, Nicholas remarked, while his toothpick, covered in armament hockey, inserted into Myhawk's chest. As Myhawk felt the unfamiliar sensation in his chest, he lowered his head in disbelief, gazing at the hockey-covered toothpick piercing his body and the blood soaking his clothes. Why didn't you step back or dodge? Myhawk thought, but he couldn't answer his own question. Are you that competitive? You're the first swordsman I've encountered like this. I acknowledge you, Myhawk. Nicholas said earnestly. Myhawk. Is this guy really one of the world's top experts? So much for playing around. I'll remember you as one of the rare strong opponents I've encountered. I'll treat you with the courtesy of a swordsman and end your life with my strongest companion. With Nicholas's words, he flung the toothpick into the rocks, then a sword gradually appeared in his hand. Then let me see how strong your resolve truly is. With Nicholas's action, Dragon, his fists clenched inside his emerald cloak, tensed up. He had developed a fondness for Myhawk if it came to a crisis, he would try to save him. As Nicholas drew his sword, Myhawk's aura, previously somewhat dim, surged once again, even stronger than before. 
Along with his increased strength, there was also a hint of ferocity in his aura. Come at me, Nicholas. With a roar, the two rushed towards each other. Swoosh! As they passed each other, Nicholas stood firm, his long sword disappearing. Meanwhile, Myhawk, still standing in place, suddenly smiled. In that moment, he saw a more dazzling world. Simultaneously, blood sprayed from his chest, a gash extending from his left shoulder to his right abdomen. Then, he collapsed backwards. Nicholas, after a moment of silence, quickly dashed to Myhawk's side, his face filled with concern. Hey, please don't die. Watching Myhawk's life force weaken, Nicholas started to panic. Honestly, he didn't intend to kill Myhawk, but his good buddy decided to take it seriously, adding a little extra oomph to his attack, making Myhawk look like he was about to kick the bucket when he should have just been severely injured. Hey, dragon, what are you still doing there? Hurry up and come help. Nicholas shouted loudly at Dragon, who stood at a distance in an odd pose. Do you have a stronghold here? Nicholas stimulated Myhawk's body with lightning to keep his vital functions from shutting down, while speaking to Dragon. Yes. After saying that, a gust of wind swept through, and the three figures disappeared without a trace, leaving only a pool of blood on the ground as evidence of the battle that had taken place. Where is this? When Myhawk woke up again, he found himself in an unfamiliar place, his body wrapped in bandages, and the air filled with the scent of disinfectant alcohol. You're awake, Myhawk. This is our secret base. We've put in quite a bit of effort to save you. What about Nicholas? Ignoring the chatter from the person beside him, Myhawk asked about Nicholas. Nicholas left after your condition stabilized. He said if you ever go to the New World, you can find him in Wayno country. Also, he asked me to apologize to you. Dragon entered from outside and spoke to Myhawk. Glancing at Myhawk, who seemed lost in thought, Dragon could tell that the future great swordsman was contemplating something, probably having gained some insights from his battle with Nicholas. Until we meet again, I won't lose to you next time, Nicholas. Myhawk muttered. Though Myhawk's voice was soft, Dragon still heard him. So he said to Myhawk, if you meet him again, it'll probably be hard to win. After all, he fought on par with Whitebeard and Roger combined not long ago. Lastly, Dragon added, as if remembering something. That guy is really strong, really really strong. Chapter 176 In a certain area of the New World, a large three-masted ship with a bow resembling a whale was anchored on the calm sea. If there were outsiders present, they would surely recognize the origin of this large three-masted ship, it was none other than the Moby Dick, under the command of Whitebeard Edward Newgate, the Emperor of the Sea. Is that crazy woman, Charlotte Lin Lin, starting to claim territory again? On the deck of the Moby Dick, a man with a pompadour hairstyle leaned against the railing, reading the latest newspaper. He was the captain of the 4th Division of the Whitebeard Pirates, known as Thatch. Although he was the head chef in charge of all the cooks on Whitebeard's ship, he enjoyed reading newspapers, keeping himself updated with the latest information. Around the deck, members of the Whitebeard pirates sat or stood casually, without any formalities. They all seemed very relaxed. In front of them on the deck, there was an array of fine wine and food. Obviously, they were having a banquet on the deck, a customary activity for pirates after a major haul. No need for tables and chairs. As long as there was wine and meat, it was good enough. Thatch, while everyone else is drinking and feasting, you're here reading the newspaper. Another Whitebeard pirate, the captain of the 6th Division, Blamenko, approached Thatch with a bowl of wine in hand, looking at him as if he were a fool. What's the matter, is there no barbecue or wine left? If not, just have the little guys below deck prepare some more. Thatch continued to read the newspaper without lifting his head. You, buddy, you're making me sad by sitting here all alone reading the newspaper like this, Blomenko said, with a look of disappointment. Helplessly, Thatch folded the newspaper and looked at Blomenko. It seemed that Blomenko's approach was the only way to get him to stop. How about we have a drink together then? Thatch said reluctantly. Upon hearing Thatch's words, Blomenko smiled and then took out food and wine from the two pockets on his chin, 
quickly filling the space in front of them on the deck. After the two of them had drunk their fill, Blamenko glanced at the newspaper that Thatch had placed on the deck. Mariah of the Moonlight? Is it news about that guy again? Seeing the name highlighted in bold on the front page, Blamenko raised an eyebrow. Thatch nodded. Yes. Blamenko picked up the newspaper and glanced at the headlines casually, scratching his head. There are more and more troublesome guys on the sea these days. Yeah, Thatch agreed, unable to help but sigh. It could be said that in the past two years, many troublesome figures had emerged, and some of them were even formidable opponents for captains like themselves. It won't be long before these troublesome guys enter the new world, Blamenko said thoughtfully. Yeah, they're gaining so much momentum. I wonder which faction they'll join or challenge when they enter the new world, Thatch added. But those things have nothing to do with us. After all, our old man is Whitebeard. Blamenko declared proudly. Thatch and Blamenko nodded in agreement. Meanwhile, in the North Blue, near the Barugia Kingdom, a ship resembling a flamingo was constantly attacking the military ship chasing closely behind it. Da Flamingo. What should we do next? That guy has been biting onto us and won't let go. A disgusting man wrapped in a blanket, with mucus dripping from his nose, asked anxiously. Change course, continue heading north. I don't believe that bastard will follow me to the Arctic. Da Flamingo stared at the blind man with a sword cane on the deck of the pursuing warship, speaking fiercely. He had thought that the pressure would ease after Hawk left the North Blue, but it turned out to be even more difficult than before. If he hadn't received word that the devil fruit might appear in the Arctic, he would have gone to the New World a long time ago. Vice Admiral, the opponent has changed course and seems to be heading towards the Arctic. Should we continue to pursue? A rear admiral asked with reverence, seeing the true meaning of justice in front of him. How are our supplies? Food and fresh water are sufficient, and there are no problems with weapons and equipment. However, the cold-resistant supplies on the ship are severely inadequate, making it difficult for us to sustain prolonged activity in the polar region. Okay, then drive them into the polar region, and then we'll turn back. By the way, how's the latest information gathering on Germa 66? The Vice Admiral, with only the whites of his eyes visible, gazed at the ship in the distance and spoke calmly. Chapter 177 In a weapons shop in the Sabaeity Archipelago a tall, skinny man in a leather jacket walked in. He he he, no wonder it's the Sabaeity Archipelago, truly eye-opening. The man who entered first smiled at his companion behind him. Mariah Sama, we should hurry up and resupply. This place is too close to Marine Headquarters, it's really dangerous. The man behind spoke earnestly. I say, Absalom, are you being overly nervous? Who do you think I am? I am Gekko Moria, the Moonlight. What's the difference between the shadow of an admiral and that of anyone else? He he he. The one who arrived was none other than Mariah, the super rookie who's been making waves on the seas this year. The reason he came here was due to the intelligence on this weapons trading shop in the area, known for its excellent products and some contraband. After all, they were about to enter the new world, where other things might be scarce but weapons and ammunition absolutely couldn't be lacking. If they didn't have enough supplies, they could go plunder elsewhere, but without ample weaponry, surviving the harsh maritime environment of the new world would be difficult. Kid, get your boss out here for me, tell him there's a big deal to discuss. Absalom walked up to the counter attendant arrogantly. For pirates like them, who roamed the seas lawlessly, getting them to respect others was even harder than killing them. Please wait, I'll go find the boss. The attendant glanced at Absalom and his menacing pirates behind him without losing his cool and said calmly. After all, for him, the monthly salary and commission were enough to overlook these things. Moreover, these pirates might just end up dead soon after entering the new world, making it even more unnecessary to get angry at a dead man. Mariah didn't stop Absalom's actions. After all, he knew he wasn't suited for procuring supplies, so he entrusted the task of purchasing supplies for their pirate crew to the smoother Absalom. Giant Bear Ralph, Gun God Woodrow, Jack the Ripper, Fear Spreader March. Mariah stood near the wall not far from the counter, 
looking at the wanted posters pinned to it with knives. Undoubtedly, these wanted posters, with faces stabbed through by knives, represented those whose bounties had been resolved, either captured or dead. He he he, trying to show off, huh? Mariah said with a laugh. It could be said that it wasn't common for ordinary merchants to display wanted posters like this, as it indicated some level of involvement with the fates of these individuals. What's this thing that dares to cost one million berry per shot? Aren't these bullets too expensive even if they're made of diamonds? Mariah raised his eyebrows as he looked at the bullets placed in a box. Indeed, this price was somewhat outrageous. What kind of bullet dared to be priced at one million berry per shot? Facing the spitting Absalom, Bedeck, now evolved from a slave trader to an arms dealer, smiled and said, This guest, did you see it clearly? These are sea prism stone bullets, crafted through intricate polishing. You see, besides seawater, only sea prism stone can greatly weaken the abilities of devil fruit users. Bedeck then picked up a cup of hot tea and drank it, smiling at Absalom, awaiting his choice. Absalom's reaction was somewhat exaggerated. If this thing was really made of sea prism stone, then once they entered the new world, it would undoubtedly become their secret weapon. Soon after taking the sea prism stone bullet into his hand, Absalom stumbled. If he hadn't braced himself with his hands on the counter in time, he would have fallen to the ground. It could be said that sea prism stone was a devil fruit user's bane, capable of not only nullifying their abilities but also draining their physical strength, rendering them completely powerless. He he he, Absalom, your reaction seems a bit exaggerated, doesn't it? Mariah said with a cold look, give us a hundred C prism stone bullets, and do you have any other good stuff here? Bring it out, don't worry about us not being able to afford it. For Mariah, a hundred shots at one million each, totaling a hundred million berry, was peanuts, considering the vast wealth they had acquired from plundering and raiding royal tombs. As the world's treasure hunter, Mariah had no shortage of money. Hey, we're buying so much stuff, aren't you going to give us a discount? Absalom looked at Bedeck, who was sipping tea and having his subordinates calculate the prices, and said. Small business, no discounts. Bedeck smiled. Do you think I don't know how much profit you arms dealers make? Bedeck listened, then pretended to be pitiful, where's the big profit when I have to pay so much in wages and shop rent every month? Not to mention, after deducting the profits given to the marines, the world government, and the big pirates of the new world, all I earn is hard-earned money. Is that my concern? Absalom crossed his arms, sneering, but let me remind you. At this point, Absalom leaned in close to Bedeck's face, lowering his voice threateningly, this time, our boss Mariah Sama won't be as polite as I am. Hearing Absalom's words, Bedeck was stunned for a moment, then glanced at Mariah standing there, and then looked at the row of den den mushy hidden under the counter with some suspicion of life. Was this guy so bold? Didn't my bad reputation spread far enough? When he first opened the shop, there were indeed some people who had improper thoughts. After all, sea prism stone weapons, the nemesis of devil fruit users, were in high demand, but those who dared to act ended up with bad endings, either sold into the slave market or sent to impel down to spend their old age. All right, Absalom, hurry up and settle the bill. We need to hurry and get the ship coded. Hearing Mariah's urging, Absalom reluctantly finished the transaction and caught up. It looks like this guy is about to enter the new world. This intelligence should fetch some good tea leaves. And Miss Katie seems to be having her birthday soon. What gift should I give her this year? It's really troubling. Bedeck shook his head slightly, turned around, and walked back into the shop. But this kind of life is really not bad at all. Chapter 178 In an unfamiliar sea area, a navy warship docked, and Nicholas followed the majority of the troops out of the cabin, with a batch of prisoners trailing behind, looking dispirited. These prisoners had their heads wrapped in sacks, their hands and feet in shackles, and the surrounding navy personnel were all on high alert, indicating their particular attention to this batch of prisoners. However, unlike typical prisoners captured by the Navy, these prisoners were well-dressed, and it seemed they were well-fed. At least, they all appeared to be in good physical condition. I am Vice Admiral Kamel, dispatched by headquarters for this escort operation. 
There are a total of 452 prisoners, including 350 males and 102 females. They were transported without any incidents. Please proceed with the signing. In the Navy camp, the vice admiral in charge of this escort operation exchanged documents with the suited men who came to meet them. After confirming everything is in order, the suited man signed the receiving documents. Soon after, the Navy personnel responsible for escorting the prisoners completed the handover with the suited men who came to meet them. Once the ship bearing the world government flag separated from the Navy warship, a sea island came into view. The island was full of trees, resembling an uninhabited deserted island. However, through the gaps in the trees, one could vaguely see several watchtowers on the island. There were no less than a dozen watchtowers visible, not to mention the concealed sentries lurking in the shadows. Moreover, through observation hockey, one could clearly sense the presence of numerous cannons hidden in the forests along the coastline. While the island appeared ordinary, once any unidentified ship approached, the overwhelming firepower on the island would sink it immediately. After confirming the information, the ship began to slowly approach the shore, eventually coming to a stop near the beach. Subsequently, everyone on board, including a group of prisoners, disembarked onto the beach. The surrounding beach seemed deserted, but in fact, there were hundreds of fully armed Navy soldiers hiding nearby, ready to soundly defeat or destroy any unauthorized individuals or ships approaching the island. Upon entering the forest, Nicholas, through elementalization, easily avoided the surveillance of the Den Den Mushi and entered the laboratory. Inside the laboratory, several cultivation tanks and a laboratory table several meters long were visible. A man about six meters tall lay on the laboratory table, his entire body naked, and his head already opened. Another person, wearing a microscope and manipulating precision instruments inside the man's open skull, was busy with something. Vegapunk, long time no see, Nicholas said with a smile, looking at Vegapunk. Hearing Nicholas' voice, Vegapunk's expression soured slightly. Shut up, it's almost done. There are some snacks and hot tea over there. Go sit first. Nicholas could openly speak to Vegapunk like this because he knew Vegapunk was completely absorbed in his experiments and wouldn't pay him any mind. Nicholas, long time no see. How did you find your way here? Vegapunk asked, walking over to Nicholas after finishing the final step of the experiment and removing his gloves. Sitting down, Vegapunk glanced at Nicholas up and down, then suddenly asked, Have you ever entered that state we speculated about? Mmm, -hmm, Nicholas nodded, a bit surprised how Vegapunk could tell. In that case, you're lucky to be alive and able to see me. By the way, there are some things we didn't finish discussing last time. Nuclear-powered engines, antimatter cannons, Galra field, at field, wormhole generator, interstellar warriors, human transmutation, human completion plan. Otherwise, I'm afraid you won't know when you'll end up playing yourself to death. I suspect you're cursing me to die, Nicholas said, looking at Vegapunk, before proceeding to tell him about the concept of alchemy he observed from Full Metal Alchemist. After all, he was only responsible for explaining whether it could be achieved was not his concern. And Vegapunk listened with great interest. No sacrifice, no gain. To obtain something, something of equal value must be lost. That's the law of equivalent exchange in alchemy. So you could say that alchemy is humanity's exploration of nature through the body. Equivalent exchange, it's indeed straightforward, Vegapunk mused. And as Nicholas watched Vegapunk, who was earnestly taking notes, a scene suddenly flashed in his mind, Vegapunk piloting an Emperor-class Titan. Chapter 179 Punk Hazard This was originally a beautiful scenic island, known for its mild climate, with spring-like weather year-round, rarely experiencing extreme cold or heat. Several years ago, the world government and the navy secretly stationed themselves on this island. Due to the peaceful climate conditions and vast forests on the island, the top brass of the world government decided to turn it into a secret experimental base for researching various secret technologies, as well as indirectly gaining control over Vegapunk. So, humans can really become that powerful. Vegapunk couldn't help but widen his eyes upon hearing Nicholas' description. After all, things like subspace travel and ships that can launch black holes sounded like something out of a science fiction novel. Yeah, I think so, Nicholas said, 
stroking his chin. By the way, didn't I tell you before that the world government has noticed you? How come you ended up with those two, Caesar and Vinsmoke Judge? Nicholas looked at Vegapunk and spoke. It turned out that several years ago, after meeting Nicholas in Karakuri, Vegapunk, immersed in research, learned that the world government had their eyes on him. In order not to involve the innocent populace of Karakuri, Vegapunk quietly left the island and found another island to continue his secret research. During this process, he coincidentally met Judge, who was seeking more powerful scientific forces to revive the Germa Empire's rule over the Grand Line, and Caesar, who was obsessed with chemical weapons. Originally, Vegapunk looked down on these two, as they were both of average intelligence. But after learning about Vegapunk's research, they stuck to him like glue and volunteered to help him complete his research on the life paper and bloodline factors. Vegapunk was bored at the time, as only Nicholas could barely communicate with him. Everyone else seemed incapable of understanding him, and likewise, Vegapunk seemed like a mad scientist to them. So Vegapunk accepted these two fellows who could barely comprehend his research. But soon after, the world government caught wind of them. Caesar and Judge each took away a portion of the research results and fled, leaving Vegapunk to be captured by world government agents. However, the main target of the world government was Vegapunk. As for Caesar and Judge, they were not considered necessary to capture. So, those two fellows betrayed you. Nicholas looked at Vegapunk and said with a smile. Vegapunk's expression was somewhat gloomy at being ridiculed by Nicholas, as losing his freedom was indeed regrettable. Do you want to leave with me? Nicholas asked seriously, seeing Vegapunk's expression. Forget it. I've just started to get in touch with the things you mentioned about the Celestial Dragons hiding, leaving now would be a waste. And do you know why the Celestial Dragons only recognize identity chips and not people? Vegapunk looked at Nicholas and asked, seemingly pleased to see Nicholas flustered. Why? I won't tell you, Vegapunk chuckled, apparently happy to see Nicholas at a loss. Oh, Nicholas said calmly after taking a sip of tea from the cup on the table. By the way, when I was coming here, I saw a guy who seemed to have a problem with you. Nicholas couldn't help but ask about Caesar when he thought of seeing him at the entrance to the experimental base. That guy? He's a lunatic, Vegapunk said disdainfully, apparently contemptuous of Caesar. Regarding M. Caesar Clown, Nicholas knew a little bit about him, as he could be considered an important figure in the punk hazard arc. At that time, he caused a huge experimental accident on Punk Hazard Island, causing a large amount of poison gas to spread on the island, resulting in numerous casualties among the experimental prisoners and the navy stationed on the island. Only a small number survived, but some of them suffered nerve damage from the gas, leaving them paralyzed from the waist down. This scandal was immediately covered up by the world government, and Caesar was arrested. However, Caesar Clown was indeed a talented scientist, especially in the field of gas bomb research. In order to obtain more results from gas bomb research, the world government decided to publicly announce that M. Caesar Clown had been imprisoned, but in reality, they placed him under house arrest and continued his research on gas bombs. Later, Caesar escaped with his gas gas fruit ability, disappearing from the world government's radar. But now, Caesar was not the same person who would later manipulate both Kaido and Big Mom and leave them bewildered. Now he was just a foil for Vegapunk, who didn't want to study some things himself. In other words, he was Vegapunk's special trash can. How did that guy offend you? He didn't. Although Caesar is very smart, most of the things he researches are a mess. Last time, one of his experiments directly caused the death of 300 experimental subjects, and almost destroyed an entire experimental area. Regarding Caesar, Vegapunk was indeed somewhat helpless. If it weren't for Caesar's significant influence with the world government, Vegapunk even considered whether to apply to the world government and send Caesar to his own laboratory. Oh, by the way, how's your research on Kaido going? Nicholas couldn't help but ask, thinking of Kaido, who had been captured multiple times by the Navy before. Well, it's almost done. That guy is basically like a monster that combines the advantages of countless creatures. I even suspect that even if he hadn't eaten the mythical Zoan fish fish fruit model dragon, but instead another mythical Zoan, he could still quickly enter an awakened state. 
I even suspect that even ancient Zoans, even if awakened, wouldn't match Kaido's physical qualities without awakening the devil fruit. He he he, and I've obtained some essence of Kaido. As long as I find suitable egg cells, I can mass-produce guys with terrifying bodies like Kaido. With that, Vegapunk let out the typical laugh of a mad scientist. Chapter 180 Near the coast of Wano Hey, Odin, what exactly is the existence of Wano? Not only do you preserve intact historical texts, but you also know how to interpret them. At the bow of the Oro Jackson, Rayleigh leaned against the rail, watching the seabirds flying overhead as he asked. I'm not sure. Every generation of shogun must receive this education when they are young. As my old man used to say, the significance of the continuation of the Kazuki family lineage is to wait for someone to appear and tell them what is engraved on those red stones. In a daze, Odin seemed to recall the scene of Kazuki Sukiyaki teaching him this obscure script when he was young. He admitted that if it weren't for Sukiyaki teaching him at the tender age of two or three, he probably wouldn't have bothered to learn. What about Mamonosuke and Hayori? It seems like you haven't taught them the method of interpreting historical texts. Rayleigh was puzzled. According to Odin, the method of interpreting historical texts was tied to the bloodline of the Wano shogun, and as the future inheritor of the Wano general, Mamonosuke, this method had not been passed on to him by Odin. Ah, that. Odin looked into the distance at the endless sea, paused for a moment, then continued, Mamonosuke shouldn't bear this responsibility. I'll put an end to it. After all, once we reach there, we'll get all the answers. Obviously, Odin believed that since meeting Roger, he had already sensed that they were the missing piece in completing Roger's journey around the world, and that there, too, lay the answers he sought. Lord Odin. Lord Odin. Something's wrong, something's wrong. Just as Odin was gazing at the endless sea, reminiscing about all the unfamiliar things he had seen along the way with Whitebeard and Roger, the anxious voices of Inurashi and Nekamamushi came from the deck. What's wrong? Seeing the anxious looks of the cat and dog, Odin couldn't help but ask anxiously. Lady Toki suddenly fainted, meow. Nekamamushi said anxiously. Earlier, they had been in the Odin household's cabin, playing games with Mamonosuke and Hayori, when Lady Toki, who had been busy there, suddenly collapsed and fainted. What? Upon hearing this, Odin became frantic and rushed towards the cabin, with Rayleigh following closely behind. As the vice-captain, it was his duty to check on Lady Toki, even though she hadn't joined them, she was still Odin's family member. When Rayleigh entered the cabin, he saw Crocus was already there, and Lady Toki was lying on the bed, covered in sweat, her face pale. Two children, a boy and a girl, as well as Odin, were all looking at her anxiously. Crocus, how is she? Rayleigh asked Crocus, looking at the situation. It's not a big problem, just exhaustion. After all, it's quite remarkable that she's held up this long on a long voyage with her physical condition. And since her original destination was Wano, now that we're nearing it, the tension she's been holding onto has finally snapped. She can't continue sailing, or else if her condition worsens, it'll be troublesome. Crocus's words were not only directed at Rayleigh but also at Odin. For him, his medical skills were quite advanced, and he had even prolonged Roger's life for a considerable amount of time using potions, despite Roger being terminally ill. However, there were many diseases that Crocus couldn't cure, such as chronic exhaustion, for which he could only offer treatment. Odin. Rayleigh was about to speak, but ultimately didn't say what he wanted to. After all, if Lady Toki disembarked, then Odin might also disembark, and they knew Odin's identity as the heir to the Wano Shogun, making him one of the most respected individuals in Wano. But at the same time, only Odin could interpret the historical texts. If he disembarked, the completion of Roger's final voyage was uncertain, and there was no guarantee it would even be completed. After all, the pure gold only delayed Roger's illness it didn't mean he was completely cured. Rayleigh, let's wait until Toki wakes up to discuss. Mamonosuke, Hayori, don't cry. Your mother is just sleeping everything will be fine. Odin smiled and comforted his children. Lord Odin, Kinnaman and others still don't know about Lady Toki in the young master's situation, so we should both stay. 
Inurashi and Nekamamushi said to Odin, apparently noticing Odin's distress and deciding to help him. Of course, I'll stay too. Upon hearing Inurashi and Nekamamushi's words, Odin immediately agreed. Though he felt reluctant to give up the adventure, Lady Toki's condition made him choose to fulfill the responsibilities of a husband. As Lady Toki lay on the bed, hearing Odin's decision to stay, she suddenly sat up in shock. This startled Nekamamushi, Inurashi, and Odin, causing all three to jump. Toki, don't move, lie back down. Odin quickly moved forward to help Lady Toki lie back down. You continue the voyage, Odin. If you choose to stop because of this, then I will sever ties with you. Huffing and puffing, Lady Toki's weak voice seemed to have exhausted all her strength. In the Wano Itachi port, the place where Odin set sail with Whitebeard, a new large ship appeared. The moment the Oro Jackson appeared, a signal flare shot up into the sky. Then, all the Kazuki retainers working in various directions in Wano stopped their work and headed towards the Itachi port. Has another unfamiliar ship docked at Itachi port? Seeing the Kazuki retainers rushing towards the port, many ordinary citizens of Wano became uneasy. For them, this newly arrived unfamiliar ship seemed to carry a glimmer of hope. After all, following the upheaval many years ago after the Kurazumi, Wano was basically divided into four factions, the Shimatsuki and Ringo and Hakamai, the Yuzuki, and the Fujetsu. Who occupied Kibi in Udon, and the Kazuki who occupied Flower Capital, and the Onigashima on the sea, and the countless ordinary Wano citizens who wanted to sneak into the legendary paradise, Hakamai. Finally, there were the nine red scabbards who staunchly defended Wano alongside the ordinary citizens of Kuri. At this time, Nicholas, who was vacationing at the world government's top secret research base, also received intelligence from Hakamai. After hanging up the Den Den Mushi, Nicholas continued to follow Vegapunk to tour his technological achievements. As for being discovered, it could be said that without his permission, even vice admirals and high ranking world government officials were not allowed to enter at will. What's going on? Curious, Vegapunk asked. Nothing much, just a fool suddenly returned to his homeland. By the way, what should we eat this afternoon? Let me think. I believe today's meal should be Northern Sea Palace cuisine, right? It's a dish only eligible for the Northern Sea royal family to eat. Nicholas. Chapter 181. As Kazuki Odin returned to Wano country once again, a rarely visited island located in the latter part of the Grand Line, the New World, welcomed an unexpected group of visitors. A massive pirate ship, resembling a mobile fortress, slowly docked at the shore of the deserted island. Fluttering atop the mast of the ship was the terrifying flag of the beast pirates, striking fear into the hearts of all who saw it. If there were outsiders present, they would surely wonder why the beast pirates suddenly visited such a desolate and uninhabited island. Because even in the New World, this island was one of those difficult-to-survive places. Besides various ferocious beasts, there was almost nothing else of value on the island. Moreover, being off the main sea routes, it lacked the conditions to serve as a stronghold or a transit station. For the beast pirates, who were supposed to be heavily involved in production and construction in Wano country, sending a ship like a floating fortress to such a place was already quite strange. What was even stranger was. Kaido, the captain of the beast pirates, was also on board, standing next to him was King, who had black wings and flames burning behind his neck, wearing a mask. At the same time, there was another person beside them, overweight with a thick neck and a small head, wearing sunglasses and holding a cigar in his mouth. Are you sure there are traces of Joy Boy here? Kaido stood tall at the bow of the ship, expressionless as he surveyed the environment on the island. If anyone was present at the moment, they would see giant-sized plants growing on the island, ancient creatures flying in the air, and faintly hear the roars of many fierce beasts. Queen, holding a cigar, stood beside Kaido. Based on the coordinates analyzed from the previous intelligence, it should be here. As for whether there are traces of Joy Boy, I'm not sure. After all, he was a figure from 800 years ago. It's already remarkable enough to find something rare under the sweep of the world government. For Queen, he joined Kaido because he was impressed by Kaido's strength and his entrepreneurial spirit. With his intelligence and the ancient Zoan devil fruit ability, 
he could surely secure a stable position in the Beast Pirates. However, after joining, he thought Kaido would assign him tasks such as conquering islands or proving himself. Instead, Kaido handed him a bunch of books, instructing him to research Joy Boy, a character now only found in some small stories. The main reason for his regret was that the second in command of the pirate group, the guy who always wore a mask behind Kaido, believed that Kaido was Joy Boy himself, which made Queen doubt his decision. But with their strengths, one crazier than the other, there was no running away. Moreover, he had annoyed Vegapunk a bit, and he heard that guy now had some influence in the world government. If he acted recklessly, what if an admiral came after him? So, he might as well stick with Kaido, hoping to find Joy Boy together. Although, to be honest, it's quite rare to find an island like this, still harboring many ancient species, even in the Grand Line, Queen said, his tone full of emotion. Kaido turned his head to look at Queen, saying indifferently, that's why I came here personally. You didn't lie to me, did you, Queen? Huh? Um, no, everything I said before was true. Vegapunk did indeed discover a big secret, even the world government mobilized the CP department to capture him. Under Kaido's oppressive gaze, Queen forced a smile, feeling quite uneasy, with cold sweat dripping down his back. Human modification was his forte, and he had some understanding of Vegapunk's research on genetic factors. However, Vegapunk's idea about the artificial devil fruits related to genetic factors was theoretically feasible, but practically implementing it was as difficult as surpassing Vegapunk. This difficulty was a bit too much, considering that he and Judge were just two lackeys. They had made significant progress in their respective fields with Vegapunk's guidance in a short period. And that was just a casual hint from Vegapunk. Even the core technology they currently possessed was hastily snatched from Vegapunk's laboratory. Unfortunately, Vegapunk's research on the genetic factors related to artificial devil fruits was his sole endeavor, and Queen had no idea about the experimental data or the specific experimental content. Not to mention the success rate. He didn't even have confidence in extracting the genetic factors from an animal's body. Or maybe. He was just painting a big picture for Kaido. Thinking of this, Queen wished he could tear his mouth apart. Although dismantling and reassembling his mouth wasn't too difficult for him. But for Queen, there was a way to remedy the situation. After all, he had taken quite a bit of good stuff from Vegapunk's data. When the time came, he could pull it out to deal with Kaido. Queen also regretted a bit. If he had known earlier, he should have communicated more with Vegapunk about the technology related to genetic factors. Although he would be ridiculed as someone slightly smarter than a slime, it would be better than the current situation where he had no clue. But now, he could only bite the bullet. Cough, this island is home to various creatures, and the population is quite large. This can greatly help us quickly find the genetic factors of a certain species. Once extracted, we can combine them with fruit trees using a special method. When the fruits ripen, there's a chance to produce devil fruits with the characteristics of that species. Although the chance of success is quite small, and the effect may be slightly inferior to naturally formed devil fruits. There may be some side effects, but it can definitely enhance the strength of the person who eats this artificial devil fruit. Queen gently adjusted his sunglasses and recalled what Vegapunk had said before, continuing, so, successfully extracting the genetic factors of a certain species is just the first step in theory. Afterwards, we need to figure out a way to turn these genetic factors into SAD, and use them to nurture plants to complete their growth cycle. SAD. Growth cycle. King looked at Queen with eyes that seemed to see through everything, feeling that this guy seemed a bit unreliable, and anything related to a growth cycle meant it would require a lot of time for verification. Queen also subconsciously looked at the giant plants on the riverbank, preparing to speak. Queen, what you should be concerned about now is how to ensure that we can manufacture artificial devil fruits, which is crucial to Big Brother Kaido's dream. Ah, uh, right. Queen could only reluctantly agree with King's statement. Chapter 182 When Odin and the others disembarked, all of the retainers of the Kazuki family Kinemon, Kanjuro, Reizo, Kiku, Kawamatsu, and Denjiro were dressed in the attire they wore when they accompanied Odin to Flower Capital to pay respects to Lord Sukiyaki's grave however. 
They no longer exuded the same vigor as before, and their clothing was patched up and stitched, bearing no resemblance to the attire of esteemed retainers. Lord Odin, it's been a long time. We risked our lives to come here to greet you. The situation in Wano now. Kinemon began excitedly upon seeing the silhouette of Kazuki Odin, believing that with Odin's return, the bloodline of the Kazuki family and the loyal samurai lurking in the shadows could still save Wano. Wait. Just as Kinemon was about to inform Odin about the current situation in Wano, Toki who was stricken with a severe illness, stood up and interrupted, preventing Kinemon from continuing. Seeing Toki suddenly appear, Kinemon and the others showed expressions of confusion, wondering who she was. If you truly care for Odin, please. We'll leave after a brief rest, without lingering any longer, Odin interjected coldly before Toki could finish speaking. Without waiting for Toki to finish, Odin spoke indifferently. Then, he disappeared, intending to leave immediately after obtaining the historical text. Lord Odin. Watching Odin's demeanor, Kinemon and the others looked both sad and resentful. After obtaining a copy of the historical text, the Roger pirates set sail again, leaving behind the grieving Kinemon and the others. So, currently, Odin can only control Kuri. Inside Odin Castle, Toki frowned as she looked at Kinemon and the others kneeling below her. After listening to Kinemon and the others' report, she realized that letting Odin leave like that might have been a mistake, as the situation in Wano seemed beyond crisis. Yes, and even the people of Kuri are becoming restless. The wealthy and powerful have all moved to Flower Capital, and there are daily attempts by ordinary Kuri residents to sneak into Hakamai. If not for Ashura Doji and his men guarding the key passages between Kuri and the outside world, the number of people attempting to leave would be even higher. Kawamatsu responded, discreetly casting glances at Kazuki Mamanosuke sitting next to Toki as he reported. If Hakamai is a rebellious area, why do those people still want to go there? Toki couldn't help but ask, though seeing the silence of the others, she already had an answer in her heart. In that case, I entrust it to you all. Let us guard Kuri together until Odin returns. Toki bowed slightly, prompting Kinemon and the others to nod in agreement. The North Blue, one of the four blues, can be considered a region where the world government exerts considerable control. However, in reality, the North Blue is the most dangerous of all the seas. Compared to the West Blue, which is also close to the New World, the North Blue is more chaotic. After all, the countries in the West Blue have relatively high military strength, with countries like Flower Capital even having prominent figures like Chinjo to effectively protect themselves. In contrast, the North Blue is characterized by chaos, with pirate and underworld forces predominating over national power. However, it is precisely this environment that has produced a group of strong individuals in the North Blue. Among the high-ranking officials of the Marine, two of the three admirals, Akainu and Kazaru, hail from the North Blue, as does Vice Admiral Tsuru. Ben Beckman of the Red-Haired Pirates is also from the North Blue. The evil Emperor Germa 66, who is pursued throughout his life and currently freezes in the Antarctic, is also from the North Blue. Supernovas like Hawkins, Law, and Drake are also from the North Blue. At this moment, a passenger ship is sailing in the waters of the North Blue. Nicholas, who had already left Punk Hazard, stood on the deck, looking uninterestedly at the turbulent sea. Originally, he was supposed to return to Wano after meeting with Vegapunk, but Vegapunk insisted that Nicholas make a trip to the North Blue. You guys can be the evil Germa 66, and I'll be the hero of the seas, Sora. As Nicholas pondered how to fulfill Vegapunk's request, he suddenly heard the voices of a few children on the deck. I don't want to be Germa 66, I want to be the hero of the seas, Sora. Obviously, these kids were arguing over their roles in a game of make-believe. But Sora is just one person. How about you guys be the Great Ocean Rangers and the Sea Supermen? Okay. Although the Great Ocean Rangers and the Sea Supermen didn't sound as prestigious as the hero Sora, at least they were on the side of justice. Who is this Sora you're talking about? Curious about the children playing on the deck, Nicholas asked. Seeing Nicholas's surprised expression, a man explained. Sorry, sir. Those are just children's stories. If I recall correctly, 
Sora and Jerma 66 are characters from a famous comic in the North Blue, right? Yes, sir. I was also a fan of that comic when I was a child. I even dreamed of fighting against the evil Jerma 66 alongside Sora. Nicholas. Is this supposed to be a hereditary thing? It seems like a shared interest in some significant events can easily create common ground between men. Although the hero Sora doesn't exist, the Jerma kingdom is real. Recently, after several hundred years of dormancy, they've resurfaced. Apparently, the current Jerma is different from before. They're now a mercenary kingdom, known as the War House, specializing in undertaking wars as their main business. I've heard that they have no territory and rely entirely on giant snails for mobility. Now, several North Blue countries are considering whether to unite again and expel Jerma from the North Blue. After all, although they only ruled the North Blue for 66 days in the past, those 66 days cast a huge shadow over the entire North Blue. From the man's explanation, Nicholas also obtained important information Germa 66 had undertaken commissions from the four countries of the North Blue and was now staging a drama where they fought against themselves. This time, all four North Blue countries had hired Germa, and Germa had sent its troops directly to each of the four countries, staging a spectacle of fighting against themselves. Chapter 183 The war among the four nations in the North Sea, now with the involvement of Germa, has become widely known throughout the North Sea. If it were just a simple war among the four nations, it might attract some attention but not to the extent of capturing the entire North Sea's interest. After all, the North Sea is teeming with islands, and among them are countless kingdoms, some even claiming kingship with just a few thousand people. However, when the war among the four nations intersects with the infamous black forces known throughout the North Sea, namely Germa, the nature of the war involving all four countries naturally changes. All the powerful factions in the North Sea are paying close attention to the war's developments, eager to see if the resurgence of Germa will resemble the Germa of centuries past, which once unified the North Sea through force for 66 days. If they harbor the same ambitions of ruling the North Sea, the North Sea nations wouldn't mind eliminating Germa, the enemy of the hero Sora. Although referred to as four nations, these four countries are not independent islands. They are situated on a large island, and strictly speaking, the four kings ruling them are brothers. They split into four nations only after the death of the old king, each aspiring to conquer the others and achieve ultimate unity, thus sparking the war. As per Nicholas's current knowledge, after Germa Kingdom joined the war as mercenaries, they dispatched their own troops to each of the four nations, engaging in fierce combat with both their own people and the forces of the four nations. The island is now a chaotic mess, and anyone with the means has already left, seeking refuge in other countries. Boom boom boom. Suddenly, distant cannon fire echoed, and soon huge splashes of water erupted around the passenger ship. Many onboard faces turned pale hearing gunfire at sea was never good news, especially when the cannonballs were landing dangerously close to the ship. Everyone, stay calm. Suddenly, a steady voice cut through the tension, and all eyes turned to the calm captain standing on the deck. Upon hearing the captain's words, the passengers quieted down. After all, in the vast sea, encountering pirates meant a fight to the death, and with their ship's capabilities, there was no escaping. Seeing the passengers calm down, the captain continued, All able-bodied men, arm yourselves. Our lookout has been monitoring the enemy's movements. If they're just after plunder, we'll give up some goods. If they get too aggressive, you all know what to do. Nicholas was taken aback by the steely resolve of the North Sea folk. Was this typical of their demeanor? This is a warship of Germa 66. With a shout from the lookout, the passengers who were eager to resist suddenly changed their expressions. It seemed that the passengers were resigned to their fate, as encountering pirates meant inevitable chaos, where men could be killed, and women's fates wouldn't be much better. But Germa was different. Although these troops often acted as mercenaries, they occasionally played the role of pirates. However, they didn't always flaunt the pirate label. These soldiers typically left once you surrendered your valuables, and sometimes, they'd simply ignore you. That was close. The man who had spoken to Nicholas earlier sighed in relief, only to realize that Nicholas had disappeared. 
Meanwhile, Nicholas had once again boarded a snail ship, approaching the main battlefield of the Four Kings' War. The closer he got, the louder the sounds of battle became. From afar, he could see the battlefield engulfed in smoke, with four huge fortresses facing each other. The scene was chaotic, soldiers in the uniforms of the four nations engaged in continuous skirmishes. The alliances shifted constantly, with allies turning on each other in the blink of an eye. It was as if everyone had lost their minds. A particular group stood out amidst the chaos. They all wore the same uniform, and though their numbers weren't many, they were elite fighters. With them present, even if the other three kings united their forces, they could be held at bay. They were like war machines. Although they varied in height and build, upon closer inspection, their features were eerily similar, almost like siblings of the same parents. So, these are the Clone Warriors project that Vegapunk helped Judge complete. Knowledge really is power, Nicholas muttered to himself. The war family of Vince Smoke was essentially created by Vegapunk, benefiting from technologies such as cloning, biological modification, and a series of insane tech trees. Soon, aboard a supply ship, Nicholas saw a group of soldiers standing on a slightly elevated platform formed by snail ships. Before them were three chairs, occupied by a man, a pregnant woman on the left chair, and a young girl resembling the pregnant woman on the right. In the middle sat a man with golden hair, nearly three meters tall, dressed casually. He leaned on his chin with one hand, watching the fiery battlefield with keen interest. Bang! A bullet shot from nearby, aimed straight at the man in the middle. Just as the bullet was about to hit its mark, the soldiers behind him suddenly formed a human shield, taking the hit. One of them was struck, blood splattering, and then collapsed to the ground. The remaining soldiers, expressionless, kicked the fallen soldier aside, covering the gap once again. It was as if they were simply discarding a worthless object that had lost its utility. Chapter 184 Father, let me handle them. These guys are too slow. The pink-haired little girl impatiently clamored. The golden-haired man in the middle blinked slightly at her words, casting a glance at his eager daughter. His expression seemed to suggest he was appraising a masterpiece, showing a hint of satisfaction. He smiled and extended his hand, beckoning. A soldier behind him approached, carrying a map. After glancing at the map, the man, named Judge, continued, Our purpose in this war is not to help these guys resolve their conflicts. Our goal is to bring all four countries on this island under the rule of Germa, turning this prosperous island into our base for re-establishing Germa's dominance over the North Sea. Father means that we wait until they have suffered heavy casualties, then swiftly crush their remaining forces to achieve a glorious coup, right? The pink-haired girl exclaimed excitedly, her childish face showing a fervent zeal that didn't quite match her age. Indeed, my daughter. You're absolutely right, Judge replied, looking very pleased. She could be considered his first perfect creation since acquiring research data from Vegapunk. With her unparalleled strength, speed, and enhanced abilities, the three-year-old girl could easily outmatch batches of Germa soldiers. Once she reached adulthood, she would undoubtedly become a formidable warrior. The only regret was that she was a daughter, and the ambition to revive Germa belonged to a girl who couldn't bear it alone. But it was close. As Judge looked at the pregnant woman beside him, a flame of ambition, written as, ambition, ignited in his eyes. With a daughter like Reju setting an example, his future children would become increasingly perfect. As the golden-haired woman beside him watched the battlefield filled with smoke and corpses, she seemed somewhat weary. Judge, I'm not feeling well. I'm going back. Standing up, she reached out to the pink-haired little girl. Reju, come with mommy. Reju, with a mixture of confusion and unease in her eyes, complied. Yes, mother. Then, as Judge's attention turned back to the battlefield, a voice suddenly rang out from the sky. Excuse me, are you the Vinsmoke family? Judge, taken aback by the sudden intrusion, looked up to see a figure standing in the sky. With white hair swaying without wind, towering close to two meters tall, and a muscular physique barely concealed by the clothing, the figure exuded a sense of awe, with only one eye visible beneath a swirling mask, seeming to contain lightning. Are you with the Marines or the world government? 
Judge muttered to himself, puzzled. Who are you? Judge demanded, his tone becoming more forceful. Do you know this is Germa 66's fortress in the sea? If you don't want to die, leave now. The pink-haired girl, annoyed, looked up at the figure and spoke disdainfully. Seeing the hostile reaction, the figure chuckled. Looks like this is your handiwork, Judge. Who are you? Judge's anger flared. If you don't reveal your identity, I'll kill you. Oh, how scary, the figure responded casually. I guess you're the infamous Vinsmoke family, ruling over the North Sea. By the way, a long-lost friend of yours asked me to pass on a greeting, Judge, eat shit. He also told me to tell you that you better not fall into his hands, or he'll turn you into the most evil cyborg. As the figure spoke, Judge's expression changed dramatically. It's him. He also asked me to collect some interest first. Don't hate me, I have no choice. You should understand his personality after following him for a while. Don't make it difficult for me, the figure said, sending a greeting from a certain mad scientist. As Judge's expression turned from surprise to anger, the figure suddenly moved. As everyone looked up, the figure, floating in the air, charged directly towards Judge. Judge's face darkened, gritting his teeth. You! However, except for Judge, Reju, and the pregnant blonde woman, the other members of Germa 66 remained expressionless. They knew neither fear nor shock, stripped of almost all emotions since birth. They didn't experience joy, sadness, or fear. Even their reactions were limited to some extent, preserved only in certain defective specimens. The Vinsmoke family, once the top warlords in the North Sea, even single-handedly ruled the entire North Sea for 66 days. To say they were weak was impossible. Especially now, with Judge's advanced studies, the Vinsmoke family's technological prowess had reached unprecedented levels. With soldiers who didn't fear death and were utterly loyal, equipped with the latest technology, Judge was very confident. Using the genetic factors discovered by Vegapunk, he had transformed his children into superhuman beings with indestructible exoskeletons. With the power of the transformation device, they were the perfect warriors. Facing the attack from the figure, Judge's feet suddenly erupted with a burst of air, propelling his body rapidly upward toward the airborne figure. Electromagnetic Thrust The golden electrical current on the spear tip intensified, and Judge thrust the spear directly at the figure. However, to his astonishment, the spear pierced through the figure's chest without resistance. Then, his expression changed, and he instinctively moved his hand to retract the thrust. But before he could react, the figure, now known as Nicholas, had appeared in front of him. With the lingering resentment of Vegapunk's experiment, Nicholas's punch, Friendship Breaker, landed squarely on Judge's face. With a loud explosion, Judge was sent flying back into the fortress. A moment later, Judge flew out again, wiping the blood from the corner of his mouth. He turned to the blonde pregnant woman beside him and said, Sora, take Reju and find shelter. This guy is no ordinary opponent. As he watched Sora, Reju, and the farting judge, Nicholas couldn't help but show a, expression. Your relationship is a bit confusing. To think the fact that the great hero Sora is the wife of the evil Germa 66s leader and gave birth to a child with the evil judge. I wonder if those children I met before would cry in the toilet if they knew the truth. Chapter 185 And just as Nicholas, with a, expression, was pondering, Judge, who had been floating in the air with his puff-puff shoes, suddenly flashed a gleam in his eyes. Then, the four great warriors of Germa, of various heights and builds, who had been standing beside him, immediately soared into the air and surrounded Nicholas in the center. Wanna ambush me, huh? Nicholas didn't even finish his sentence before he saw the skin of the four great warriors surrounding him begin to wriggle, as if something was about to emerge, and he could clearly sense the immense energy contained within each of them. These changes occurred almost instantaneously, accompanied by four nearly simultaneous explosions that engulfed the sky in a massive blaze. Seeing this scene, Judge's mouth curved into a mocking smile. He dared to let Germa reclaim its dominance in the North Sea precisely because he had a trump card these fearless clone warriors were his sharpest spear and sturdiest shield. The self-explosion just now was just a minor matter if he wished, 
the clone warriors of Jermat 66 within the castle would charge into battle fearlessly at his command. However, Judge's smile soon faded, because as the smoke from the explosion dissipated, a figure emerged from the air once again, and its immaculate clothes seemed to suggest that the explosion just now was hardly a breeze. Mere pawns dare to. Before Nicholas could finish speaking, he saw another four warriors surrounding him begin to wriggle. Before Nicholas could react, a figure quickly descended from the smoke, striking him with a punch. Nicholas extended his palm to block the blow, but the tremendous force was nothing to him. The figure swiftly retreated like a startled rabbit, landing lightly on the castle wall just before reaching the ground. This force. Nicholas hadn't had time to ponder when he saw Judge's figure darting towards him in the air, his spear aimed directly at Nicholas's chest. Judge tightened his grip on the spear, while golden electricity surged along its length, enhancing its power. But just as the spear was about to strike its target, the figure glanced at Judge, the mockery evident even through the mask. Then, with a swift movement, the figure stomped on the spear, while another foot, like an axe, struck Judge's arm. Accompanied by a crisp sound of bone fracturing, Judge grunted as his body was sent flying backwards, coming to a stop dozens of meters away. His injured arm hung limp, and his face darkened as he looked back. Despite the extent of his body modifications, the fractured bone would soon repair itself, but damn, this force wasn't right. When Raju charged earlier, the opponent clearly didn't treat her the same way. And most importantly, he was wearing his battle suit now, which made him the strongest he had ever been. Yet he couldn't even withstand the opponent's strength. This reminded him of those monsters that roamed the new world. Reiju, transform. Show this marine what the power of the Vinsmoke family is. Although still not yet an adult, as Germa's masterpiece, coupled with her battle suit, she was already a formidable force. With Judge's command, the pink-haired Loli sighed and produced a cylindrical canister from somewhere behind her. Stranger, don't hate me for this. A cloud of smoke enveloped the pink-haired Loli. As the smoke cleared, her childlike clothing disappeared, replaced by a pink battle suit with a purple cape draped over her shoulders, resembling butterfly wings, with a large, zero, symbol on it. Although not a magical girl, who could resist a cute Loli? Maybe Monkey D. Luffy? Nicholas glanced around, then turned his gaze nonchalantly towards the pink-haired Loli, and then back elsewhere. Fortunately, he didn't bother pretending anymore and just looked straight at her. Seemingly sensing the gaze, Raju frowned, while Sora, who stood beside her, looked at Nicholas with deep vigilance. As a mother, she knew the temperament change that came with entering battle, especially for her daughter, who had undergone the bloodline surgery. Once born, her child was destined to be different from ordinary children. Hearing Reju's words, Nicholas scratched his head, and at the same time, reached out and snatched a long knife from one of the Germa 66 soldiers on the ground. Swinging the knife lightly, Nicholas glanced at the pink-haired Loli. Then, he slashed towards the Germa 66 clone soldiers gathering on the ground, unleashing a blue slash hundreds of meters long that cleaved through everything in its path, including the buildings and soldiers. With a deafening roar, even the war snail ship of Germa, which had served as the castle, was cleaved in half, slowly sinking into the sea, with many lucky survivors and corpses floating in the water. Are you sure you want to fight me? Nicholas tilted his head, looking at the pink-haired Loli in the distance. This question left Raja stunned, and she looked at the devastation on the sea's surface, her eyes widening in disbelief. And if Judge's face was just dark before, it was now completely black. The opponent's sword strike had undoubtedly revealed his identity as a master swordsman, and combined with the strange ability to evade his attacks earlier, there was even the possibility of being a devil fruit user. Most importantly, the opponent's mention of Vegapunk's affair indicated that Germa 66 had plunged into its greatest crisis since returning to the North Sea. Chapter 186 It seems you won't recognize the difference between us unless I show some real skills, Nicholas said, reaching up to the sky with a heavy grip. Subconsciously, everyone looked up, including Judge and Reiju, their eyes widening. However, despite staring for so long, their eyes began to feel strained, and nothing seemed to be happening. Just when they thought Nicholas was bluffing, a sudden roar echoed from the sky. This kind of power. Murmured Sora, 
looking up, beads of sweat forming on her forehead. With the roar from above, the air around Germa 66s war fortress seemed to grow heavy, even the sunlight was obscured, and a massive shadow gradually engulfed the fortress. From the perspective of the genetically modified Reju, she saw a colossal object, composed of various minerals. Enveloped in flames comparable in size to Germa's largest warship, hurtling towards their fortress from the sky, leaving visible shockwaves in its wake. With the descent of the massive meteorite, Judge finally saw it clearly a celestial body formed from the aggregation of various minerals. Even after friction with the atmosphere, the impact of its fall had the potential to destroy the entirety of Germa 66. Taking care of you first. Judge exclaimed. To deal with an ability user, the best method was to eliminate them using hockey. Judge jetted forward on a stream of air, wielding his technologically advanced spear, rapidly advancing towards Nicholas. The spear began to charge with electromagnetic energy as he prepared to strike. Electromagnetic Assault Crimson Secret Technique, 100 Machine Maneuvers, Nicholas calmly responded. With Nicholas's words, many of Germa 66's clone soldiers suddenly froze, their movements momentarily paralyzed, then. Whoosh! 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 Figures shot up from the ground, transforming into streaks of light, soaring towards Judge in the air. You bastards! Daring to attack your creator! Judge roared, infuriated, but realizing it was not the time to dwell on this, seeing the clone soldiers all aiming for him. Die! Blade burst. Judge's spear attack, Reju's poisoned arrow from behind, and the venom-infused claws of the pink-haired girl converged on Nicholas in a synchronized assault. Got him! Judge exclaimed confidently, as he saw their combined attacks hitting their mark. Judge lifted his head, but his confident smile froze as he saw the mysterious figure they had struck dissolve into an illusion. Cow and e, came a faint voice from afar. This statement caused Judge to freeze, then stiffly turn his neck to look into the distance, where Nicholas's figure emerged again. That was a frightening attack. If I hadn't dodged quickly, I might have been done for, Nicholas said, somewhat surprised, but looking like he deserved a good beating. But are you sure you're not going to deal with that thing? Nicholas pointed to the meteorite hurtling down from the sky, which was getting closer to Germa's headquarters by the second. Judge's strong voice boomed as he arrogantly shouted, It's just something falling from the sky. We just need to smash it. Meanwhile, Reju, lost in thought, watched as Judge launched another round of attacks against Nicholas. On the sidelines, she watched as the boastful Judge fell into silence. It could be said that, as someone with emotions, she wasn't as indifferent to death as she appeared. In fact, she had been hiding a secret of her own rich emotions all along. According to Judge's theory, children who underwent genetic modification were not supposed to have their own emotions they were meant to be perfect weapons. Judge's methods of dealing with failed clone soldiers also left Reju feeling cold, but she couldn't disobey Judge's orders. Lost in her thoughts, Reju saw Judge once again engaging with Nicholas. Boom! 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 Germa soldiers continuously acted as cannon fodder, aiding Judge in blocking the attacks. Finally, Judge realized that he couldn't defeat Nicholas with his own strength alone. Electromagnetic shatter, bursting jet kick. With a combination of two strikes and utilizing Nicholas's momentum, Judge swiftly flew towards the distance. His cape transformed into wings, jetting him forward. As he flew, Judge commanded Reju without looking back, Reju, intercept him. Yes, father. Despite knowing she stood no chance against Nicholas, Reju bravely charged towards him. Watching Judge swiftly retreat with jet-powered wings behind his plip-plop shoes, Nicholas paused for a moment. Is his retreat speed matching up with the speed of a sparkling devil fruit user and my thunderous fruit ability? He wondered. Could this be the hidden cast-off mode from the Cayman Rider legend? Chapter 187 As Judge evacuated, he also issued a second command, all Germa soldiers, hold that guy down. Germa 66 soldiers suddenly rushed from all directions at incredible speed. Upon their arrival, the soldiers surrounded Nicholas, forming a massive human wall around him, effectively trapping him. Meteorites from the sky were descending rapidly, 
yet the Germa clones seemed oblivious, continuing to converge towards the scene. It seemed they intended to detain Nicholas and meet their end together. As the meteorites drew closer, Nicholas moved forward, grabbing Reju around the waist and instantly teleporting away. With a deafening roar, the meteorite struck the sea surface a kilometer away from the Germa fortress, causing a tsunami tens of meters high. Indeed, such long-range strikes required powerful observation hockey to assist. Unable to resist commenting, Nicholas muttered to himself, quite amusing. Pulling meteorites from the sky might seem impressive, but the time it takes to capture and direct them to their intended target is considerable. Unless the opponent remains stationary, such attacks can only rely on locking onto their trajectory with powerful observation hockey, predicting their position when the meteorite arrives. Observing the approaching tsunami, Reju, held by Nicholas, couldn't help but look up at the masked man. Oh, Judge isn't around, and you dropped the act. Nicholas looked at the petite girl in his arms, his expression playful yet meaningful. What are you talking about? I don't understand, Reju responded instinctively, keeping her secret hidden. Heh, I have a better relationship with Vegapunk than Judge does with him. He told me before I came here. If Judge had followed his research results directly, the creations would retain their emotions and inherit the immense power of the lineage factor. Of course, in Judge's eyes, such emotional beings are failures. If I'm not mistaken, Judge has probably realized your secret. But being his first creation and his biological daughter, he probably won't resort to inhumane methods against you. The difference between Judge and Vegapunk is vast for good reason. Before coming to the North Sea, Nicholas and Vegapunk had discussed Judge's lineage factor experiments. According to Vegapunk, only those who inherit human emotions and the lineage factor have unlimited potential. The lineage factor is just a key the height one can reach depends on the user. As for those emotionless beings, they may initially display powerful strength, but their limits are predetermined. So, emotions aren't my flaw. The pink-haired girl looked at Nicholas expectantly, recalling similar words from her mother. Well, strictly speaking, you should be a perfect creation. But judges' technical skills are just too poor. Your potential is almost predetermined. If Vegapunk had been in charge, you might have become one of the monsters of the Grand Line. So, I'm not a failure. But father said a strong physique, a ruthless mind, and immense power are the true path to the future. Nicholas looked at the pink-haired girl and rubbed his chin under the mask. Do you think those lacking emotions have a future? Power can be obtained through technology, but what about emotions? Take you or your upcoming siblings, for example. Perhaps now you represent the pinnacle of lineage factor technology, but what about 10, 20, or 30 years from now? Technology can progress continuously, but lost hearts cannot be regained. So, while Judge may be called a fool, there's a reason behind it. Nicholas's words plunged the pink-haired girl into deep thought, her eyes gradually lighting up. While Nicholas was brainwashing or rather, chatting with the pink-haired girl, Judge had arrived at the Germa refuge ship previously used by Vinsmoke Sora. Judge, where's Reju? Vinsmoke Sora, seeing only Judge, almost stumbled, yet still looked at Judge with the last glimmer of hope. Reju stayed behind to hold them off, Judge replied, then fell silent. Clearly, even he felt a bit embarrassed about sending his young daughter to the rear guard. However, the sight of the meteorite falling from the sky left an indelible impression on Judge. He self-deprecatingly said, it's ridiculous. I aim to rule the entire North Sea, revive Germa's glory, and become the king of the North Sea, yet I felt fear. But soon, Judge convinced himself, I am Vinsmoke's king, the ruler of Germa 66, the hope for the revival of the Vinsmoke family, and the unique king of the North Sea. I, Vinsmoke Judge, am destined by the heavens. Originally, he intended to use the North Sea Four Nations War to continuously provoke them, escalating their conflicts until they were desperate. He knew the impact of war on ordinary people, how dire their situation would become. It could be said that once the beast of war was unleashed, almost no one could stop it, but Vinsmoke Judge could. Because he had a soldier who would unquestionably obey him. He planned to let the Four Nations War continue until it became unbearable for the people, then join the fray, utterly defeating the Four Nations' armies. 
By then, with the surging public opinion, even if he killed the kings of the four nations, it would have little impact. Perhaps, he might even gain the support of the common people from the four nations, as he would have ended the war. With that, Germa 66 would have a territory capable of providing vast resources and funds. What about military resources? Sorry, Judge, with his mastery of clone technology, didn't care. He only wanted resources and funds. This was the foundation of his reassertion of dominance in the North Sea. But unexpectedly, all his plans had fallen apart today. Under such a scale of meteorite impact, Germa 66's foundation was destroyed. Reporting to the King naval warships are spotted ahead. As Judge kept reassuring himself, a Germa soldier suddenly came to report. Naval warships? Sink them. Judge, feeling frustrated and distracted, gave the order directly. Clearly, he needed to vent his anger now. Although as long as he was around, even if Germa's fortress of war was destroyed, he could rebuild it and raise a new clone army. But it would still require funds, resources, and time. It could be said that his years of effort had gone to waste, and the grand project of Germa's revival would be postponed for several years. A ship suspected to be Germa 66's vessel spotted ahead, report to Admiral Fujitora immediately. As the naval vessel spotted Germa 66's ship, chaos ensued aboard the ship. Chapter 188 Just in the heat of battle, the Navy discovered the situation of the soldiers of Germa 66. Their movements were uniform, and the attack formation they formed completely surpassed the elite Navy trained for years. Moreover, the most important thing was that they were completely fearless of death. Even relying on their fearless fighting style, they managed to suppress the Navy. You see, these Navy soldiers who plowed through the sea to eradicate pirates in the North Sea could all be considered elite. What's going on with these guys? Could they really be the emotionless battle machines created by the legendary Germa 66? Don't get distracted. Stay vigilant in groups of three and be careful of their suicide attacks. Watching the Navy on the deck being gradually suppressed, Isho also slowly placed his hand on his cane sword. Navy? Do you really think just anyone can bully my Germa? Not far away, Judge watched the Navy being driven back in defeat and couldn't help feeling triumphant. So he taunted, you're unlucky to meet me. I'll show you what cruelty means. Germa's clone warriors are invincible. Cloning people, huh? Isho slowly drew his cane sword, and as it was drawn out, the gravity in the air seemed to increase instantly. Isho swung the sword while saying slowly, cloning people are indeed an evil practice. Clearly, they are a form of life, yet they are cruelly deprived of everything and can only become tools. How tragic. With Isho's words, the air around the clone warriors seemed to be subjected to gravity, directly pressing them onto the deck. Even though they desperately tried to get up and continue fighting, they couldn't even move a finger under the powerful gravity. What have you done? Seeing the clone warriors pressed down by invisible gravity, Judge couldn't help but roar in anger. Clearly, his proud Germa 66 high-tech arsenal had been repeatedly hit today, and his emotions were getting the better of him. I advise you to stop resisting, Your Excellency. The more you resist, the more painful it will be. Isho gripped his cane sword, and with only the whites of his eyes visible, he looked at Judge who was trying to resist the gravity. This move, Naraku, could be considered an upgraded version of gravity suppression. By applying gravity to the air, a single swing of the sword would increase the gravity around the target, making the surrounding air heavy and immobilizing the body under the increased weight. It made one feel trapped in an inescapable hell. You, as the king of Germa, the future ruler of the North Sea, how can you submit to the mere navy? Facing the increasing gravity, Judge gritted his teeth and roared to himself. But in the face of absolute strength, any resistance was futile, and eventually, Judge was overwhelmed by the increasing gravity and pressed onto the deck. Just as the navy was about to move forward to capture the commander of Germa, a voice suddenly came from the mast. Sasuga. Isho Sama. All the navy on the ship raised their heads to see a figure standing on the mast at this moment, wearing a swirling mask with only one eye visible. And under his arm was a pink-haired little girl, who didn't look like a good person at all. Who are you? 
All the sailors on the warship raised their guns and looked at the figure that suddenly appeared on the mast with vigilance, but no one attacked recklessly because it seemed that this mysterious person knew Admiral Isho. Long time no see. Isho also raised his head and showed a smile. Hey, someone's coming from the sea. Just then, a sailor on the deck suddenly shouted, and Nicholas, Isho, and Judge, who was pressed onto the deck, all looked in the direction indicated. On the sea surface, there was a figure walking leisurely with an umbrella. His calm demeanor was like that of a nobleman. Chapter 189 Above the sea, as the figure of the man walking leisurely approached, the people on the ship also got a clear look at his appearance. He was tall and slender, with fiery red hair braided into two plates hanging over his shoulders. His eyebrows were also red, and he wore a crimson shirt and blood-red trousers, with black shoes adorned with golden edges on his feet. He draped a wide blood-red cloak over his shoulders, with a checkered pattern inside. A blue rose adorned his neck, and he held a slender bat-shaped handle umbrella in his hand. Seeing the warship ahead and the refuge ship of Germa 66, a wicked smile curled up at the corner of his mouth. In the next moment, with a flicker, he seemed to teleport, instantly closing the distance between the two sides by a hundred meters. With a few more blinks, his figure appeared on the side of the navy warship, and like a gentleman, he nodded slightly before saying. Just now, I saw a big meteorite falling on the sea, so I was curious and came over. I didn't expect to see such an interesting scene. Facing the sudden appearance of the person, Isho and Nicholas did not speak, but the vice admiral beside Isho looked at the sudden appearance of the person nervously and questioned, Redfield, why are you here? As a vice admiral of the navy, he was naturally familiar with the monsters at sea, especially powerful ones like Redfield, which required them to do their homework. I have never claimed to be a pirate, so I go wherever I want. Your navy seems to have a broad jurisdiction. No wonder many people seeking freedom on the sea despise you. And don't worry, I'm not interested in the lives of you small fry. Put away those thoughts in your mind. Redfield shook his head and then turned his gaze to Isho and Nicholas standing on the deck. Two strong men of the sea, since we meet, it seems we are destined. I wonder if you two are interested in sparring with me. Although Redfield's words were addressed to Isho and Nicholas, it was obvious that Nicholas was the main target, and Isho was just an addition. After all, Isho might become the famous Admiral Fujitora in the future, but for now, his strength only surpassed that of an ordinary rear admiral, perhaps more accurately described as a vice admiral candidate. Why engage in meaningless battles with you? And hasn't anyone told you that using observation hockey to peek into others' hearts is very impolite? Nicholas, on the mast, looked down at Redfield below and said. Vice Admiral Isho, that's the notorious Redfield, the Grand Red of the Sea. Isho's Vice Admiral confirmed. Should we contact headquarters and have them send someone quickly to the North Sea? Apparently, the actions of someone like Redfield had caught the attention of the Navy. After all, someone of his level of strength could only be stopped by someone of equal strength, otherwise, it would be impossible to stop him from causing trouble. Upon hearing the words of the captain, Redfield spoke up, Are you planning to sacrifice the entire crew of this ship to keep me here, then have people like Sengoku and Garp go after me? That's quite a good idea. As he spoke, before the captain could continue, Redfield nodded again and continued, Since I guessed the plan, such a dangerous guy absolutely cannot be left alone in the sea, but Vice Admiral Isho may not be a match for that guy. If Vice Admiral Isho could team up with that masked man, maybe they could hold him back. What? The captain's eyes widened. This guy actually saw through his thoughts. Just thinking about it made him feel terrified. Redfield, you're not ruthless enough. Seeing the ugly faces of the world but only becoming reclusive, you see that brother standing there. He's self-blinded because of the darkness of the human world. Nicholas pointed to Isho standing on the deck and said with a smile. Oh, is that so? That's an interesting guy. Redfield mobilized all his energy and looked at Nicholas and Isho, saying, So, would you two like to have a match with me? It was obvious that Redfield was inviting the two to a fight. At this moment, Redfield was not yet the Red Baron of later years, who sought to find eternal life and restore his youth. Right now, he was Redfield, 
the Grand Red, arrogant and solitary. Otherwise, with Redfield's later personality, he would not have fought an admiral like Kazan and kept fighting until he was exhausted and locked in the propulsion city. I refuse. Goodbye. Nicholas refused directly. His whereabouts this time were quite secretive, and it would be easy to expose himself if he fought against someone of Redfield's strength. That won't do. Redfield smiled at him, I really want to test your strength now. Whoosh! As he spoke, he suddenly appeared in front of Nicholas on the mast, and the bat-shaped umbrella in his hand stabbed directly at Nicholas. In Redfield's view, this place had already become a grand stage, and he and those two interesting guys would be the protagonists of this performance. Now was the moment for his grand entrance. Just as Redfield's umbrella tip was about to pierce Nicholas, a terrifying roar sounded. Then a tremendous pressure suddenly enveloped Redfield completely, and the sudden enormous pressure directly pressed Redfield down from the air. As Redfield landed back on the deck, Isho's cane sword also returned to its sheath. After delivering the pink-haired girl to her mother, Nicholas appeared in front of Redfield again, his face darkening. Hey, you, do you really want to die? Chapter 190 The peculiar fruit abilities are becoming more and more interesting. Redfield did not respond to Nicholas's words, but instead looked at Isho, who was silent, apparently attracted by the ability he had just displayed. Be careful next, I'm getting serious. With these words, Redfield's umbrella quickly covered itself with a layer of dark armored color, then directly rushed towards Isho, colliding with the black staff sword in Isho's hand, creating a clang of metal on metal. Then, they engaged in a struggle, the umbrella and the sword clashing with clack clack sounds. Suddenly, he moved his hand upward, causing the bad umbrella to leave the blade of the staff sword. With a flick of his wrist, the bad umbrella spun in his palm, then directly blocked a black sword strike coming from behind. Extreme Shadow Slash With Redfield's words, the bad umbrella in his hand swiftly struck forward, so fast that even shadows couldn't keep up. Clang! 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 The black sword in Nicholas's hand swiftly blocked, and then clashed again with Redfield's bad umbrella. I can't let you guys make a mess anymore, gravity sword, sky travel. A cold voice rang out from behind Redfield. As the words fell, the deck beneath their feet creaked, and then a large section of the deck detached from the warship. Carrying Nicholas, Redfield, Isho, and Judge, who was lying on the ground unable to move, flying towards an island in the distance. It really is an interesting ability. Flying in the air, Redfield also saw Isho's intention to change the battlefield but didn't stop him. In a moment, you won't find it interesting anymore. After Nicholas finished speaking, the long sword in his hand, covered in armored color, turned into black light, slashing towards Redfield relentlessly. Facing the onslaught, Redfield smiled slightly, and his bat umbrella also swung fiercely, engaging in combat with Nicholas. Watching the warship gradually recede and the two individuals who didn't seem like serious swordsmen wielding ordinary long swords and bad umbrellas, Judge felt both hopeless and resentful as he looked at Isho. Why did this guy bring him along? Accompanied by a loud bang, the giant deck crashed onto the ground of the island. As the deck landed, the three figures around it disappeared in a flash, only to reappear on the ground moments later, standing in a triangular formation. Looking at Nicholas and Isho, Redfield commended, not bad, you two are worthy of being supporting roles in this grand performance. However, Nicholas and Isho did not respond red glints flashed in their eyes. Nicholas sheathed his sword and stood still, then extended his hand towards the sky, gritting his teeth, take this, heavenly obstacle tremor star. Isho silently drew his staff sword from its sheath, and as he did so, a wave of gravity surged towards the sky. With their actions, Redfield also stood still, looking towards the sky. The previously clear sky suddenly darkened, and a massive shadow covered the land. With a roar, a gigantic meteor, engulfed in flames, hurtled down, surrounded by several smaller meteorites similar in size to the warship, all crashing towards Redfield. What a spectacular attack! Redfield looked up, but trying to deal with me with this won't work. Then, he clenched the bad umbrella, swung it upward heavily, and a long, semicircular crimson ripple emanated from the umbrella, sweeping towards the massive meteor. 
Meanwhile, as Redfield launched his attack, Nicholas and Isho charged towards him because they knew that such a massive attack would inevitably leave him vulnerable. Under the forceful strike, the massive meteor shattered into pieces, with rocks flying everywhere. Amidst the explosion, the meteor broke apart, and under the immense shockwave, it plummeted towards the island like a meteor shower. On the ground, Redfield used the bat umbrella to block Nicholas's strike while simultaneously unleashing a powerful kick covered in armored color towards Isho. Facing Redfield's actions, Isho pointed his sword towards the ground, generating tremendous gravity in an instant. Then, he swung the accumulated gravity with his sword, releasing a massive lateral force. Even in the attack, a colossal tiger head, roaring fiercely, formed along the trajectory, biting towards Redfield. Gravity Sword, Fierce Tiger Facing Isho's attack, Redfield countered directly with a foot strike. At the same time, Nicholas's attack arrived. The bat umbrella clashed with Nicholas's long sword, and with a crisp sound, Nicholas's sword was directly cut in half by the bat umbrella. However, the broken sword's momentum remained and continued towards Redfield. Facing the broken sword, Nicholas's eyes showed a hint of a smile. While evading the bat umbrella strike, the broken sword, which had been flying in the air, suddenly flew straight towards Redfield's face. With a tremendous roar, Isho's and Redfield's attacks collided, causing a massive cloud of dust to envelop Redfield. After a moment, in the smoke, Redfield's figure slowly emerged. His blood-red cloak fluttered in the wind, and a bloodstain appeared on his face, indicating that he had narrowly avoided a fatal blow at the last moment. Truly interesting. Redfield lightly traced his finger over the wound, then tasted the blood on his finger. Then the three of them engaged in combat once again. Nicholas, Redfield, and Isho continued to wield their weapons. If there were others present, they would barely be able to see the attacks between the three, only witnessing shockwaves exploding in their midst. Bang! After another collision, the three of them retreated, sliding several meters on the ground before stopping. At this point it was evident that there was a difference in strength among the three. Redfield only retreated 5 meters, Nicholas retreated 7 meters, while Isho retreated 10 meters. It was clear that Isho wouldn't stand a chance against Redfield without teaming up with Nicholas. Oh! Such power, when did the Marines have such strong individuals? Redfield glanced at his torn sleeve, revealing a gap in his blood-red cloak. Meanwhile, Judge, lying on the island, looked utterly bewildered. From his perspective, the three guys had been standing still the whole time, looking like three wooden stakes. As Judge puzzled over the situation, the three men made their moves again. First, the Marine captain frowned, then he saw the mysterious person and Redfield make their moves one after another. These are truly remarkable individuals, interesting. After saying this, Redfield laughed and left, seeming satisfied with the answer he received. The masked man, on the other hand, looked at Redfield's departing figure and fell into contemplation. Only the marine captain muttered to himself, his words faintly audible, something about observation hockey. Battle. Chapter 191. At this moment, a warship was slowly sailing on the sea. It's amazing, isn't it? It's actually a land, formed by dozens of giant ships combined together. Fujitora exclaimed in amazement as he glanced at the fortress of Germa 66. Germa 66 doesn't have fixed territory. It's a sea kingdom completely composed of ships. It can be considered a unique spectacle in the world, right, Judge? Nicholas nodded and then turned to Judge, who was beside him. Facing Nicholas's inquiry, although Judge felt somewhat annoyed, he still showed a proud expression. After all, the mobile maritime kingdom of Germa was indeed a magnificent sight on the sea. Mainly, the fact that the base, which was thought to have been destroyed, was intact was good news for him. As the warship approached, a gangway was lowered between the warship and the castle of Germa. Nicholas stepped onto the gangway and walked onto Germa's territory. Judge, with his golden mane resembling that of a lion, accompanied Sora and the pink-haired girl. Your Majesty! As Judge appeared, someone stepped forward and bowed respectfully. Judge surveyed the surroundings and then said to Nicholas and Fujitora, it's windy outside. Why don't we discuss matters indoors? 
then he led the way towards the castle. Along the way, elite soldiers of the Germa kingdom stood on both sides of the road, emanating a ferocious aura that overshadowed even the naval forces behind Fujitora. It's not that Fujitora's navy was inferior to these elite Germa soldiers, but rather that these emotionless soldiers of Germa hardly made any unnecessary movements. As they walked deeper into the castle, they could see machine gun towers and artillery fortifications everywhere, making it resemble a war machine. Once activated, it could even annihilate entire nations. Seeing the surprise and nervousness on the faces of many sailors, Judge wore a proud expression. Indeed, Germa 66, which could amaze even the strongest violent organization on the sea, was truly formidable. Vice Admiral Fujitora, how do you find the military strength of our Germa kingdom? It's impressive, enough to be considered powerful. But such disregard for life ultimately falls under the category of unorthodox methods. Fujitora said calmly. If it weren't for Judge pulling out a trump card and becoming a member of the world government, Fujitora would probably have kept Judge locked in the ship's cabin reading newspapers by now. Soon they arrived at a magnificent hall adorned with portraits and paintings of various battles, depicting the rulers of the Vinsmoke family throughout history and some classic battles caused by the Vinsmoke family. After seeing so much, it's time to discuss the real matters. After putting down his teacup, Fujitora said, Your Excellency Judge, you should know the purpose of my visit this time. It's to arrest you and bring you to justice. But now you claim to have reached a cooperation agreement with the world government and become a member country. So, I request you to provide evidence. Although Judge's expression changed upon hearing Fujitora's words, it seemed he also understood that if he couldn't provide evidence, he might as well go soak in the castle's pool. So he instructed someone nearby to fetch a document. Soon, an attendant approached with a document. Taking it from the attendant, Judge squinted his eyes slightly, apparently surprised by its contents. Indeed, becoming a member of the world government was not Judge's preference. After all, joining the world government would not be beneficial for the development of the Vinsmoke family given their current situation. However, considering the influence of the world government and the current predicament of the Vinsmoke family, Judge ultimately chose to join. Unexpectedly, this decision inadvertently saved himself today. After checking the document, Fujitora's aide whispered a few words to him discreetly, and then stood beside him with a strange expression. It seems, Your Excellency Judge, that you are indeed the king of a member country of the world government, Fujitora said with a touch of emotion. Then he turned to Judge and said, May I request King Judge to have Germa 66 refrain from interfering in the wars of other nations? Fujitora, are you joking? Judge's eyes narrowed slightly. Our Germa 66's mercenary business has been sanctioned by the world government. It doesn't seem like it's something a mere vice admiral like you can decide, right? In that case, let's drop it. Nicholas interjected with a gentle smile. After all, it's not a good livelihood anyway. The atmosphere in the hall suddenly became tense, filled with a palpable sense of hostility, as if a great battle was about to break out at any moment. Ha ha ha. To ease the tension, Judge suddenly burst into laughter. You two are truly witty and humorous. Of course, the main reason was that Judge couldn't beat these two guys. Although becoming a king of a member country of the world government could restrain the navy, there was no such constraint on this mysterious individual. Moreover, it seemed that the other party knew this vice admiral, and if they teamed up to deal with him, Judge would be in big trouble. After that, they could easily come up with an excuse to fool him. Who would he go to reason with then? Judge had seen too many such maneuvers, so he had to be cautious. Your Excellencies, Germa 66 was able to join the world government because the world government valued our war capabilities. After all, they need a powerful war organization independent of the world government and the navy to deal with those kingdoms unwilling to join the world government. Upon hearing Judge's words, Fujitora couldn't help but fall into silence. Apparently, Judge's words were similar to what his aide had told him earlier. The fact that Germa 66, a war family without fixed territory, could join the world government as one of its member countries indicated that the world government had agreed to some conditions. And those conditions were probably as Judge had said. 
joining the world government wouldn't bring wealth and resources to the world government like it did for other member countries. What Germa 66 could bring to the world government was its fierce and fearless disposable combat soldiers with formidable combat capabilities. In other words, the reason why Germa 66 could join the world government and become one of its member countries was because the world government needed a weapon that could help them do some dirty work. Although the CP organization also helped the world government with some unspeakable tasks, their focus was different. In that case, I'll take my leave. Realizing that he couldn't change anything now, Fujitora chose to leave directly. After all, considering the time, that guy should be returning from the pole soon. Sometimes, people need to vent their emotions. Suppressing them all the time is not good. Chapter 192 Standing on the castle and watching the departing warship, Judge's smile faded. He had just sent away a troublesome individual, but there was still someone more challenging here. Speak, what exactly do you want from me? Judge looked at the man sitting opposite him with a serious expression, feeling particularly wary, not only because of the man's strength but also because he mentioned Vegapunk. Before we discuss anything, I need to make sure if you're even qualified. After all, in Vegapunk's eyes, you're categorized with those who lack intelligence, Nicholas said, lifting his head to look at Judge, completely ignoring his increasingly unpleasant expression. Heh, I wonder what qualifications you're talking about. Judge replied with a smirk. I'm very curious to know how far you've developed the technological prowess you acquired from Vegapunk after leaving. Do you mind if I take a look? Nicholas inquired. In that case, why don't you come with me? Judge said, smiling thinly, before getting up and leading the way towards a heavily guarded section of the castle. Soon they arrived at a large research facility equipped with various sophisticated instruments. This is the electromagnetic railgun I designed. In theory, its firing speed can reach five times that of conventional cannons, with a range of hundreds of nautical miles. Making it a powerful weapon with high lethality and long-range striking capability, Judge enthusiastically introduced his design. In theory? Nicholas questioned, puzzled. Ahem, developing such a powerful weapon is quite challenging, and many key technologies require high levels of research capabilities. Although it hasn't demonstrated its combat effectiveness yet, it will succeed sooner or later, Judge explained, somewhat nervously. Nicholas couldn't help but twitch his lips slightly upon hearing Judge's boastful words. It seemed that with Judge's abilities, he might never be able to achieve it in his lifetime. Ignoring Judge's self-praise, Nicholas followed Judge to a heavily guarded laboratory filled with numerous incubation pods. This is my most outstanding research achievement, the production line for the elite warriors of Germa 66. Judge proudly introduced. Watching the Germa soldiers in each incubation pod, Nicholas fell into silence. Although cloning had its taboos, its performance in warfare couldn't be denied. Judge boasted about how the cloning technology he possessed could grow a batch of powerful warriors in five years. Nicholas couldn't help but admit the efficiency of such a method compared to traditional military training. How about it? Do I have the qualifications now? Judge looked at Nicholas proudly. Listening to Judge's words, Nicholas was rendered speechless. It seemed that Judge was much like what Vegapunk had described a person lacking intelligence. Despite acquiring advanced technology from Vegapunk, Judge seemed to have made no progress at all. Judge, can you tell me what you've been doing these past few years? What's the difference between your cloning technology and the bloodline factor research done by Vegapunk? Nicholas asked. Judge's expression faltered upon hearing Nicholas's question. Vegapunk. Vegapunk. Besides proposing some technical theories and research, what else can that nerd do? What research of his has been realized by himself? Judge retorted. Uh, so you mean your cloning technology and bloodline factor technology aren't just copies of Vegapunk's? Nicholas raised an eyebrow, his voice tinged with sarcasm. Judge. Realizing he had been caught, Judge's facade crumbled. All right, you win, Judge said dejectedly. He dared not gamble on whether Nicholas possessed that thing. After all, as Nicholas had said, Vegapunk was a maker of miracles. In that case, welcome to my secret lab. 
In the end, the Oro Jackson arrived at a certain harbor village in the final sea. Cough. Captain, are you alright? I'm fine, no big deal. By the way, do you know the location? Yeah, I do. When are we setting sail? Of course, it's now. Roger looked at the crew in the cabin, speaking decisively. This was the moment they had been waiting for, right? Since they had locked in the coordinates, as long as they set foot there, they would mark the perfect end to their journey. The other crew members on board, apart from Roger, were also filled with anticipation. Because not only were they witnessing the birth of a legend, but they would also become legends themselves. However, what puzzled them was that at this moment, the captain actually ordered the pirate ship to stop. The pirate ship stopped moving, despite being very close to their destination. They were only a stone's throw away, yet they halted. But the crew didn't say anything, just looking at Roger, waiting for the captain's next command. Chapter 193 Everyone, are you prepared? After taking this step, there may be no turning back for us. Roger's gaze swept over each familiar face of the crew members. Silver's Rayleigh, Scopper Gabon, Kazuki Odin, Crocus, Sunbell, Toro. Hey hey, Roger, are you not awake yet? Or are you afraid we'll snatch the title of Pirate King from you? Rayleigh directly grabbed Roger's neck with his arm, laughing. Ha ha ha, that's right, the Pirate King is me, Scopper Gabon. Gabon laughed beside him. My journey all this way has been for today. It's impossible for me to let you leave me behind, Roger. Kazuki Odin said seriously, bearing too much for this day. Ahahahaha, I can give you guys anything else, but this, I cannot. Now that everyone is prepared, our target is Raftel. Roger pulled out his sword, pointing it forward, and shouting loudly with a powerful and confident tone. And as the Oro Jackson set sail again. In an instant, the calm sea became turbulent, the air filled with fierce winds, and the sails fluttered in the howling wind. It seemed that even the spirits of nature around were celebrating the birth of a legend to come. Rayleigh, the title of Pirate King is the highest honor for a pirate, symbolizing strength, status, fame, and wealth. But when I'm about to become the Pirate King, my heart feels somewhat empty. Roger placed his hand on the ship's rail, speaking to Rayleigh. Rayleigh's movement stiffened, his face serious as he looked at Roger. What do you mean? In fact, with Roger's crew's journey along the way, witnessing every historical relic, hidden within history, Roger could already discern the unusual nature of the final destination. The scattered historical texts, decipherable only with the special characters passed down from Wayno, seemed to narrate vanished truths from the river of time, guiding people to search for something. Perhaps what existed on Raftel was not treasure, but answers hidden within history. Arriving there, I don't know what we'll see. Perhaps it will make our journey a joke. Roger looked into the distance and spoke. Rayleigh's pupils contracted, staring closely at Roger. Don't look at me like that, Rayleigh. We haven't even stepped foot on that island yet. Who knows what's up there? Roger laughed at Rayleigh, appearing particularly carefree. Throughout our journey, the things written in history texts already gave me a rough idea. Eight hundred years ago or even longer, there was an unprecedented upheaval in this sea. Afterward, someone wanted to reveal the truth to the world, but there were also those who tried every means to cover it up. Clearly, now, the side that wanted the truth of history to be known by all has been erased. They can only rely on the last remaining historical texts to let future generations search for the vanished truth and reveal it to the world. Roger said softly. So, that's why I ask if you all are prepared, because we're about to face the entire world. Rayleigh's pupils contracted, his expression changing. Obviously, Roger's words had already given him a similar answer. That guy really did it. On the sea surface, a fleet emerged from the midst of a fierce storm. Among them, the flagship with a golden lion figurehead signified the identity of this fleet. The Flying Pirates After suffering significant losses, the Flying Pirates quickly recovered their strength with the prestige of the Golden Lion. Just as the Golden Lion was planning to find Roger to reclaim his reputation, he received this information. But as the Golden Lion looked sternly, the atmosphere on the entire ship was heavy. 
Since being pierced in the head by the helm during the battle with Roger's crew, the golden lion had become like an angry lion, unpredictable, and many who lacked foresight had been torn into pieces by him. The entire flying fleet's dozens of ships were silent. Standing at the bow of the ship, facing the sea breeze, the golden lion looked at the distant sea, silent at this moment. The golden lion thought about many things, recalling every battle with Roger, with Whitebeard. It seemed that their era, after Roger completed his final voyage, was coming to an end. Roger. Mumbling, he looked up at the rolling sea ahead, muttering. No one knew what he was thinking at this moment, nor did they know the emotions in his heart at this time. Pirate King, Roger. Don't think everything is over. I will personally defeat you. The golden lion roared loudly, looking at the distant sea. The surrounding pirates were thrown into confusion upon hearing the golden lion's words. The turbulent sea, which had been calm for so long, was about to witness the arrival of its pirate king. But it was foreseeable that many ambitious figures would set their sights on the pirate king, and the battles on the sea would become even more intense. Men. Head to water seven. The golden lion gave orders to his fleet. For the golden lion, who lacked historical texts, he had no idea about the coordinates of Raftel, so he chose to go to Water 7 to wait for Roger's return. There, he would settle the score with Roger. I never expected that, Roger would really go. In the office of the Admiral at Marineford, looking at the latest intelligence, Admiral Sengoku couldn't help but pinch his temples. Although he didn't know what was on Raftel, it was clear that the secret hidden by the world government for 800 years was definitely a significant one. With the revelation of this secret, the seas would surely become even more chaotic. And the four seas, which had become stable after many plowing and sweeping, were likely to plunge back into turmoil. Admiral Sengoku, Fleet Admiral Kong has called for an emergency meeting. Please go to the conference room immediately. As Sengoku pondered how the Marines should respond to the upcoming chaos, a messenger knocked on the door and spoke to him. Understood, I'll be there right away. Chapter 194 Wow ha ha ha, so that's how it is, it's really interesting. Upon the island, Roger looked at the thing in front of him and let out a hearty laugh. Joy Boy left behind something amazing, huh? I really wish I could have lived in the same era as that guy. Captain Roger, there's another discovery. Just then, another shout from a crew member could be heard in the distance. Meanwhile, as Roger's pirate crew was exploring the final island, the waters around Water 7 Island, the island closest to the final island, were also becoming turbulent. Captain. We've spotted a large number of pirate crews ahead. And they're all famous pirate crews from the New World. Golden Lion sat cross-legged at the bow of the ship, his robe billowing in the sea breeze, his golden and hair dancing in the wind. His appearance, despite the helm inserted into his head, was not only not ridiculous but rather exuded a unique majesty. At that moment, an anxious pirate approached and whispered quickly into Golden Lion's ear. Tell them to scram, this is the final battle between me and Roger. If they refuse to leave, send them all to the bottom of the sea. Golden Lion's eyes flashed with a cold and fierce light as his voice emanated with menace. It could be said that Roger was his obsession now, and anyone standing in his way would be torn apart. Yes. The pirate hesitated for a moment, then immediately understood, they turned around and left. If it were the old Golden Lion, he might have tried to advise against it, cautioning him not to make too many enemies. But now, ever since the helm was driven into his head, Golden Lion had become somewhat abnormal. It's hard to communicate with a madman, especially a powerful one. Soon, the Golden Lion pirates began friendly negotiations with the multitude of ships ahead. Though termed as friendly negotiations, it was more like direct coercion through force. Upon entering this maritime area, the Golden Lion pirates, led by Golden Lion, began clearing out the area. Faced with the top-tier pirate crew in the world, most of the famous pirate crews from the New World chose to retreat. Just then, a distant pirate ship suddenly exploded with a huge blast, engulfing the entire vessel in flames. Enemy Attack Heart-wrenching cries echoed across the sea surface. Instantly, all the gazes of the pirates in the area turned towards the distant sea. Navy. 
It's the Navy. As black dots rapidly emerged from the sea surface, becoming clearer and clearer, the pirates couldn't help but widen their eyes in disbelief. In the territory that belonged to pirates, the New World, the Navy dared to come in such large numbers, and not only that, they launched an attack without a word. Were they not afraid of the Navy suffering the same fate as before in the New World? Accompanied by the whistling sound of cannonballs piercing the air, amidst the dazzling flashes of fire. The appearance of numerous navy warships and the determined white figures standing on them truly brought unparalleled shock to the pirates at that moment. Golden Lion stood at the bow, gazing at the navy fleet, his expression becoming grave. Because among the navy fleet, he saw familiar figures. Undoubtedly, he still harbored great fear towards the navy. Although the New World was known as the Pirate's Paradise, ordinary Navy personnel wouldn't dare to step foot so easily. But when facing a Navy force that had almost emptied its nest, no pirate dared to utter such words, unless all the powerful pirate crews in the New World united to confront or even suppress the Navy. Now, with the Navy recklessly invading the New World, what was their purpose? Could it also be for Roger? Boom! 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 One after another, ship cannons unleashed their firepower, raining down onto the direction where the pirates were. Gradually, the number of warships on the sea surface increased, reaching over 300 ships, forming a formation that gave an incomparable sense of shock. Left wing is hit. Put out the fire. Counterattack. Change course, quickly maneuver around to the Golden Lion pirates' rear and let them withstand the Navy's pressure. Caught off guard, the pirates panicked cries of distress echoing everywhere. Even though many powerful pirates could easily destroy cannonballs, they still struggled to withstand such a barrage of attacks. Pirate ships swayed under the bombardment of cannonballs, on the verge of collapsing. Meanwhile, aboard the warships. Garp, in this battle, don't hold back. We must not let the seas fall into turmoil again. Admiral Sengoku spoke solemnly. I know. Garp nodded, his arms crossed as he gazed ahead. Based on the intelligence we've received, Roger has already headed to the final island. As long as we can hold him off here, stop him, or eliminate him, this world won't plunge into chaos. In response to Sengoku's advice, Garp remained silent, just watching the pirate ships ahead. He was no rookie he knew very well why the world government was determined to stop Roger. The main reason was the truth that couldn't be revealed to the world. The Pirate King held an extraordinary significance for pirates. Once Roger obtained the title of Pirate King, he could quickly amass a massive army capable of confronting the world government. And with the Pirate King, the seas would become even more chaotic. The world government, the navy, would never allow such a thing to happen. Kuzan, Sakazuki, Borsalino, your primary objective in a while is to destroy as much of the living forces among the pirates as possible. Admiral Sengoku issued orders, with three young navy officers behind him nodding solemnly, their faces grave. Then Sengoku surveyed the battlefield around him. In this war, the navy's mobilization of troops and warships could be said to be unprecedentedly massive. The headquarters, as well as several branches in the New World, dispatched hundreds of the most advanced warships, along with most of the elite navy forces. Once this war failed, the navy would fall into an unprecedented period of weakness. Continue the bombardment, prepare for close combat. Brothers, attack. Battle cries from navy troops resounded everywhere. The deafening sound of cannon bombardment filled the air, followed by the pungent smell of blood. The war had begun. Soon, a figure leaped down from a warship, landing with his right hand pressed against the sea. Ice Age. An extremely cold aura surged forth centered around Kazan, instantly freezing the sea, covering the hulls of the pirate ships ahead with a layer of frost. In just a moment, a battlefield suitable for footholds was formed. Magma Fist On the other side, a figure dripping with magma appeared. With fiery lava erupting with every punch, a pirate ship was hit, instantly engulfed in flames, along with the pirates on board. It's Sakazuki. The pirates were once again in an uproar, indicating that the reputation of this navy supernova had spread widely among pirates. Don't be afraid, we have Golden Lion on our side. 
As soon as the pirate finished speaking, a sudden sound broke through the air, and he instinctively turned his head. Then, he saw the figure composed of slowly forming golden and dots beside him. Have you ever been kicked at the speed of light? The body, gradually appearing as golden and light, moved its mouth slightly, then raised a long leg and kicked directly. The pirate who hadn't reacted yet was kicked, and the whole person flew towards a distant pirate ship. Then, the entire ship exploded with a thunderous blast, erupting into flames. Speed is power. A faint voice echoed as the figure transformed into a beam of light, continuously traversing the battlefield. That's Borsellino. The navy is really going all out. Golden Lion watched the intense battlefield, his gaze chilling. He noticed that the younger generation in the navy had already shown considerable potential. The power of the Logia-type devil fruits was being fully utilized in this war. At the same time, these three navy supernovas reminded Golden Lion of a certain annoying individual. Chapter 195 The booming sound of cannon fire echoed continuously, and the sea ahead turned into ice, spreading a chilling aura rapidly in the surroundings. The powerful control effect of the ice fruit was extremely evident at this moment, directly transforming the sea area into land. The pirate ships were all bound on the surface of the sea, while the navy's warships could freely move in the ocean outside the icy surface. It could be said that once ships lost their mobility at sea, they became easy targets. In just a few minutes since the start of the battle, a large number of pirate ships had been destroyed because they couldn't move, burning continuously on the icy surface. The pirates on these ships could only abandon ship and move on the ice. Kill a large number of marines leaped off their ships, roaring as they charged towards the pirates on the ice. With the three Logia users clearing the way, the immobile pirate ships ahead were completely defenseless, becoming easy targets. One by one, they were destroyed, with the firepower support from the navy's warships, making the navy's charge seem unstoppable. At the beginning of the war, the pirates were already somewhat bewildered. The power of the Logia fruits was being fully demonstrated at this moment, wreaking havoc wherever the three men went, with astonishing destructive power. Even though there were powerful pirate veterans intending to intercept the three, they simply didn't engage with them much, using their elemental powers combined with wide-ranging attack skills. Eight-foot graceful hook. As Borsellino made his move, golden and light flickered across the sky. Then, dazzling golden and rays rained down like a storm towards the pirates on the ice. Ah! Faced with this barrage of intense attacks, the pirates' terrified screams were heard one after another. Countless pirates vanished under the piercing golden and light, with blood holes pierced through their bodies. Wow, they're all big shot pirates from the New World. After a volley of light bullets, there were very few pirates left standing on the ice but almost every one of them was a renowned figure in the new world. As Borsellino's voice rang out, a dazzling golden and light shone from him. Following that, accompanied by a sharp whistling sound, a severely wounded pirate was directly terminated. At this moment, Borsellino was not the ambiguous justice advocate Yellow Monkey yet. As the fastest among the navy supernovas, he had transformed into a reaper, constantly harvesting the lives of pirates. Speed is power, and hardly anyone could catch him at the speed of light. Coupled with his precise kicking techniques empowered by the glint glint fruit speed, no one could resist his sudden strikes. With every flash of light, either a pirate ship exploded into a massive blast or a new world pirate was taken out. In this war, Borsellino demonstrated his power. Likewise, Kazan at this moment was not the later Kazan. He was quite hot-blooded, freezing any pirate he encountered without giving them a chance to resist, directly reaping them with his ice saber. His methods were indeed very tough, embodying zero tolerance for pirates in his passionate sense of justice. On the other hand, Sakazuki seemed to be the most normal among the three. Following the plan laid out by the warlord, his main goal was to sink pirate ships, cutting off their retreat. Unless someone came to stop him, destroying pirate ships was his primary objective. In a short time, twenty pirate ships had already turned to ashes, about to sink into the ice melted by the flames. It could be said that the future admirals of the navy were showing their prowess at this moment. They truly live up to the name of navy monsters. 
Nicholas, who had just arrived, observed the situation on the battlefield calmly. The combat power displayed by the three Navy supernovas at this moment was enough to garner Nicholas's attention. It could be said that the Navy's reserves were outrageous. There had hardly been any disruptions in top-level combat power, with a new admiral stepping up immediately when one fell. Then, Tsuru and Sengoku quickly filled the void left by the admirals, and there was even Garp, who was essentially a vice-admiral but no different from an admiral in the navy. After Dragon left the navy, they quickly recruited Borsalino, Sakazuki, and Kazan. If following the original historical trajectory, even after Kazan left the navy, they strengthened by bringing in Fujitora and Raikujiu, two monsters. Those three guys must be stopped. We can't let them wreak havoc recklessly the impact of the Logia types on the battlefield is too significant. And those navy guys are trying to destroy our ships. Once our ships are destroyed, with the ice underfoot being destroyed by Borsalino and Sakazuki, we'll have nowhere to escape. Many pirates looked grave, realizing this. At the same time, when many of them looked towards the direction of the navy's warships, their eyes held a hint of fear and dread. They saw three straight figures standing on the bow of a massive flagship. Admiral Buddha Sengoku, the navy hero known as the strongest navy, Iron Fist Garp, and Navy Chief of Staff Tsuru. It could be said that any one of these three was a nightmare for these pirates, let alone all three appearing together. If someone hadn't messed with Zephyr's mindset, there might have been another figure standing there now. Although the three figures on the warship had no intention of making a move, the invisible pressure made many pirates nervous. Many of the pirates unconsciously swallowed saliva, feeling the immense pressure. At the same time, their gaze turned towards the direction of the flying pirates' fleet. Now, only Golden Lion had the ability to confront the Navy's admirals. Kuzan, Sakazuki, and Borsalino continued to advance into the pirate camp, with the elites of the Navy following them. Led by the three, it could be said that they were unstoppable, encountering almost no decent resistance. Even if there was any, they would be taken down by the three in a short time. After all, the three natural types were quite formidable in terms of attack capabilities. Borsalino was responsible for interference, Kazan for control, and Sakazuki for main output. In less than half a minute, the navy had arrived at the forefront of Golden Lion's fleet under the leadership of the three. Captain. The navy is attacking. Even the executives of the Golden Lion pirates were somewhat nervous in the face of such a formidable navy. After all, Golden Lion was alone, but among the enemy, there were Garp, Sengoku, and Tsuru, Golden Lion's ship's helm had a significant dependence on his strength. As the cold air surged, the ship where Golden Lion was covered in frost, and the three figures on the frozen sea had already rushed towards them. Kill. The morale of the navy was high, roaring like a descending tiger, extremely intimidating. Golden Lion stood at the bow of the ship, staring at the three figures for a long time before finally roaring angrily at Sengoku in the distance. Are you looking down on me? Sengoku. Chapter 196. Amidst the furious roar of the Golden Lion, there was no expression on Sengoku's face. He wouldn't be called the strategist Sengoku if he acted rashly just because of the opponent's words. His incredibly calm mind was swiftly analyzing the battlefield situation. Garp, be ready to act at any moment. Although this old man Golden Lion's power has declined, he's not someone that Borsalino and the other two young ones can easily handle. If the situation allows, we can directly kill him. As for Golden Lion's abilities, let the world government deal with that headache. Sengoku spoke solemnly. Meanwhile, facing Golden Lion, Sakazuki, Borsalino, and Kazan decisively took action after a brief confrontation. The three of them swiftly rushed towards Golden Lion's location almost simultaneously. Captain. On the pirate ship, many pirates shouted in fear as they watched the three powerful admirals charging towards them. Looking down from above, Golden Lion narrowed his eyes. Suddenly, several sword lights flew out from Golden Lion's position, covering the area where the marines were located. Lion Thousand Slashes Almost as soon as Golden Lion made his move, Sengoku acted. His body suddenly radiated golden light, transforming into a massive golden Buddha figure. Then, with a gentle step, 
he leaped into the air. The massive weight of his body even caused the rear of the warships to rise, and then he fell heavily. Buddha Impact The giant golden Buddha leaped high into the air, simultaneously making a striking motion with its shining golden body. The enormous shockwave formed almost instantly in his hand, amplified by his devil fruit ability in his own strength, making this strike incredibly powerful. As the air surged with waves of energy, the unstoppable shockwave dispersed several sword lights unleashed by Golden Lion and directly smashed a nearby pirate ship not far from Golden Lion's flagship into splinters. In the air, Sengoku's back against the sunlight was awe-inspiring, instilling no sense of resistance in anyone who beheld him. Looking at Sengoku, Golden Lion sneered, Sengoku, have you finally decided to make a move? No. Sengoku replied, looking at Golden Lion. You're not my opponent. With that, Sengoku changed direction and began attacking other pirate crews on the ice. As the highest fighting force of the Marine headquarters, he slaughtered the other pirates mercilessly, knowing full well that this battle was not a show, and he was the MVP of this battlefield. Now is not the time to be distracted. Have you ever been kicked at the speed of light? As he spoke, a kick came from behind Golden Lion's angle, aimed at the helm. If this kick landed, Golden Lion would undoubtedly be seriously injured. Hmm. Just as Borsellino launched his light speed kick, a huge mast, as thick as several people's embrace, came crashing towards Borsellino's position from the side. Helplessly, Borsellino had to turn into light and disappear to dodge the attack. Ha, huh, it really makes one furious. Who do you think I am? I am Golden Lion Shiki. Floating in the air, Golden Lion's expression became fierce. As the battle intensified and Sengoku was ignored, he unleashed the full spirit and ferocity of a great pirate. Despite facing most of the Navy's forces and feeling that he might not survive the day, Golden Lion had no intention of fleeing. This was his final battle with Roger, and no one could stop it, not even Garp, Sengoku, Tsuru, and the elite marines along with the three supernovas. Roar! Take them down! Kill! With Golden Lion's arrogance, the Golden Lion pirates roared like they had been buffed. Figures leaped from the bow of the ship onto the ice, swiftly advancing towards the marines. Seeing this, other pirate crews around them also converged, realizing that scattering would only make them easy pickings. Only by uniting did they stand a chance. On the Navy side, there was no fear in their hearts as they saw the pirates gathering to charge. They only roared loudly to boost their morale. Before coming here, they already knew what they had to do. Almost every Navy member here had made their peace. The atmosphere on the battlefield became increasingly intense. There was no exhilarating music here, only the sounds of pain, screams, and battle. It was only after completely defeating the enemy that they could vent their emotions. In the blink of an eye, the two sides collided. The cannons roared, and massive explosions rang out instantly. The clash of swords, the sound of guns firing, and the cries of battle filled the air almost instantly. Meanwhile, Nicholas, who was silently observing from a distance, felt none of the battlefield's excitement. As an observer, his experience was vastly different from those immersed in it. Here, there was no thrilling, adrenaline-pumping music. There were only painful moans, screams, and the sounds of combat. It was only after thoroughly defeating the enemy that they could vent their emotions. In the chaos of the battlefield, a marine might have just slashed the neck of a pirate with his sword when, before he could withdraw his blade, he was shot in the head by a pirate with a gun from afar. And before that pirate could turn his gun around, he was punched through the chest by a powerful marine. It could be said that in this chaotic battlefield, unless you were one of the handful of people at the top of the sea, you could die at any moment. As the clash continued, both sides began to rapidly deplete their forces. However, the pirates were falling much faster than the marines. Even though many pirates were stronger than the marines, the presence of Sengoku, who had transformed into a giant Buddha, made the battlefield a meat grinder. Every shockwave took away large numbers of pirates. Even the captains of the flying pirates were taken out with just a few moves. Unlike the top war, where the navy's lineup was aimed at wiping out the Whitebeard pirates, with Garp, 
Sengoku, the three admirals, and tens of thousands of elite marines, the Whitebeard Pirates had no chance. The reason why the Whitebeard Pirates were not completely wiped out was most likely due to Monkey D. Luffy's sudden interference. One could say that Monkey D. Luffy alone distracted more than half of the Navy's top forces, leaving only Sengoku, Garp, Kizaru, and Akiji to handle the advancing round. Sinful act, I will not tolerate it. Scorching River Eruption With Sakazuki's voice, a massive lava fist formed from molten rock flew towards Golden Lion in the sky. You are truly arrogant, little brat. Lion's majesty, lion's pride. With Golden Lion's words, he reached out and grasped the ice below, causing a tremor. Suddenly, the ice around Sakazuki surged, and five lions, each tens of meters tall and made of ice, pounced toward Sakazuki. The massive lava fist collided with the ice lions, instantly forming a large cloud of steam that enveloped Sakazuki's figure, obscuring his situation. Just as Golden Lion was about to turn around, a more chilling coldness suddenly swept over, accompanied by the high temperature water vapor in the surroundings. Golden Lion's eyes narrowed, and his body suddenly turned, preparing to leap away. At that moment, a deep voice echoed from within the steam. Ice Age. Crack. Crack. The water vapor enveloping Golden Lion was instantly frozen into ice, and Golden Lion himself was encased in ice. Almost simultaneously, as Kazan exerted his control, a hellhound made of lava broke through the ice from below and lunged toward Sakazuki to bite him. At the same time, Borsalino in the air also assumed an attacking stance. Just then, Kazan's brow furrowed. Lion's Majesty, Sovereign Earthly Conquest. Crack. Crack. With a single grasp of the hand, the ice encasing Golden Lion shattered, and the broken ice swiftly converged around him, forming a massive lion. Its head shook violently, swallowing up the bugs before it. Seeing the unfavorable situation, Borsalino swiftly shifted sideways, moving out of the attack range. Meanwhile, as Sakazuki charged forward, he was instantly swallowed by the massive ice lion, crashing heavily onto the ice. The gigantic ice surface began to crack and split, with seawater faintly seeping out from the crevices. The tremendous shockwave from the attack also sent Kazan flying, rolling tens of meters across the ice surface before finally steadying himself. Upon landing, Kuzan immediately activated his ability once again, resealing the shattered ice surface. Chapter 197 Shiki, I'll be your opponent. Just as the Golden Lion was about to pursue his advantage, Garp stepped forward from the warship, leaping into the air and striding through the empty space. His figure turned into a blur, and with each step, there was a burst of air explosions. Boom! Boom! Accompanied by the sound of air explosions beneath his feet, any pirates attempting to stop his advance were punched away, showcasing Garp's formidable strength. He was on par with Whitebeard, the Golden Lion, and Roger, and had even forced Roger into desperate situations several times on the open sea. Behind Garp, Sengoku, shining with golden light all over, followed closely. His hands gleamed with golden light as shockwaves emanated, knocking away groups of pirates. With the capture of the Golden Lion, victory in this war would be assured. Once Roger returned from Raftel, he would face the formidable lineup of the Marines. However, all of this hinged on capturing the Golden Lion before Roger's return, otherwise, once Roger and the Golden Lion joined forces, the course of the war would be beyond the Marines' control. Oh, Garp and Sengoku are moving together. It seems the Marines are determined to win this battle. Nicholas looked towards the forefront of the battlefield, where Garp had reached the central battlefield, closing in on the Golden Lion. Nicholas could almost foresee Shiki's fate. Currently, Garp and Sengoku's primary objective regarding the Golden Lion wasn't capture but rather elimination. Nicholas had no intention of intervening to save Shiki. Shiki's character meant he couldn't be swayed or even considered a pawn since the moment from the moment the rudder of the helm penetrated his head. Shiki. Garp roared loudly. His feet suddenly bent, firmly stomping on the ice. Crack. Instantly, the hard ice surface sank, fracturing into a spider-web-like shape. 
Simultaneously, with a powerful thrust, he soared into the air, swiftly arriving before the golden lion. Iron Fist, Meteor A dark hockey covered his fist as he struck fiercely towards the golden lion. Garp The golden lion roared as Odo and Kagarashi, his twin blades, crossed in front of him, attempting to block Garp's punch. Garp's punch was heavy and powerful, unmatched in strength. The two sides only held for a moment before Odo trembled, and the entire person was slammed onto the ice from midair. A deafening impact echoed out as the ice surface instantly cracked and split, the force smashing it into fragments, revealing seawater tens of meters below. The golden lion stood on the shattered ice, gripping his twin blades. The blades emitted a buzzing sound as if dispelling the force of Garp's punch. Sakazuki, Borsalino, go support other battlefields. We'll handle the golden lion. And Kazan, use your abilities to stabilize the battlefield. Sengoku marched forward, his voice heavy. Then, his right hand moved to his chest, energy swirling around it as it gleamed with golden light. Impact wave. After a few steps, the colossal figure, like a god, had reached the golden lion on the ice surface, slamming down with a palm. The space trembled as the golden lion once again used his twin blades to block Sengoku's attack. Sengoku. With a slight step, the golden lion evaded Sengoku's shockwave, his expression grave facing both Sengoku and Garp, he lacked the confidence to emerge unscathed. But just as he retreated, his expression suddenly changed because a dark fist was viciously smashing towards his side. In a rush, Shiki was sent flying by a punch. He flew hundreds of meters in the air before coming to a stop. Wiping the blood from the corner of his mouth, Shiki looked at Sengoku and Garp standing side by side. Garp took a deep breath, his gaze serious as he looked at Shiki. Shiki, surrender. Your fate is sealed today. Ha ha ha, surrender. Rather than being imprisoned in the depths of impel down, I prefer to die gloriously in battle. The golden lion laughed loudly, his feet suddenly stepping forward, and the power of the devil fruit erupted instantly. He reached out with one hand, then clenched it into a fist towards the void. Lion's Majesty, Earth Roll. The ice surface beneath his feet trembled, as if lifted up. Countless ice blocks gradually dispersed and gathered, forming several colossal lion-shaped mountains that obscured the sky. The tremors were like the angry roar of lions, roaring at Garp and Sengoku. In the presence of these lion mountains, even Sengoku, who had transformed into a giant Buddha, seemed as tiny as ants. However, in the eyes of the ants, these massive ice lions seemed to have no presence at all. Buzz. The air quivered as golden light shone on Sengoku's palms, energy rippling around them. Then, virtual shockwaves flew towards the ice lions. A series of explosions rang out as the massive ice lions were shattered into powder, scattering in the air. But soon, under the influence of the devil fruit ability, these powders were formed into lions and pounced towards the two. What a tricky ability. Before Sengoku could finish his sentence, Garp's figure shot out like a cannonball. Iron Fist With a thunderous sound, Garp's fist struck out heavily, black hockey enveloping his right arm, concentrating the force. In an instant, it pierced through the massive ice lion and smashed towards Shiki. Garp The golden lion roared, his aura bursting forth. In an instant, the two engaged in a fierce collision, fists and blades continuously clashing, ferocious energy splashing out, whipping up a violent wind. Those near the battlefield almost immediately stopped and quickly retreated to a safe distance. In this clash of titans, even the aftershocks were unbearable for them. After a round of fighting, the two stood facing each other from a hundred meters apart, then almost simultaneously, they moved again, their figures charging towards each other once more. Wave Slash Armament, Gatling Gun One swung his sword, cutting through the air with hockey blades, while the other continuously threw punches, his speed terrifying, unleashing a barrage of firepower like a Gatling gun. Bang! 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 In an instant, their attacks fiercely collided, violent energy surging out, spreading towards the surroundings. The two stood in mid-air, continuously striking with their swords and fists, sending shockwaves rippling out. 
Ha! Garp threw out a punch, gathering all his strength like a meteor crashing down, fiercely smashing out. The golden lion once again raised his blades, blocking in front of him. But then, behind him, a dazzling golden light suddenly appeared, and a dangerous aura quickly descended. Impact wave. Finally seizing the fleeting opportunity, Sengoku delivered a decisive blow under the golden lion's guard. With Sengoku's loud shout, his powerful right hand pushed heavily against the golden lion's back. The sound of metal clashing rang out abruptly as the golden lion's body suddenly paused, then was heavily slammed downwards. The ice shattered, and the golden lion was knocked down onto the ice surface. Within the fractured ice, the golden lion lay on his back, blood spraying from his mouth. His expression was grim, his breathing slightly labored, as he stared at the two figures in the distance, his expression unusually solemn. Even as a world-renowned pirate, facing two opponents alone still proved to be extremely challenging for him. If it weren't for his timely use of armament hockey for defense just now, he estimated that he would have been done for under Sengoku's strike. Shiki. Today, you won't have any chance. Sengoku's voice echoed solemnly. The flying pirate crew's fate was sealed. Chapter 198 Shiaha. Lying in the pit, the golden lion suddenly threw his head back and laughed uproariously, but soon, his eyes turned icy cold. But to let me, the golden lion, be captured like this. The golden lion paused, then his expression turned fierce, and an angry roar erupted from his mouth. That's impossible. I am the golden lion. A violent haushiku haki burst forth, forming a substantial whirlwind that lifted the scattered ice blocks around him high into the air. The ice surface beneath his feet seemed to ripple with invisible force, extending hundreds of meters away. At the same time, the ice surface under the golden lion's body swelled and surged, and with a roar, a massive ice lion rose from the ground. The golden lion stood atop the ice lion's head, his golden hair fluttering in the wind, his face filled with endless coldness. Anger filled the golden lion's chest at this moment. He might die, but he would not die here. He couldn't die without settling things with Roger. How could he die so easily? Ha! With a roar, accompanied by the golden lion's ability, large chunks of ice and wreckage of surrounding ships were incorporated into the colossal beast he summoned. In the blink of an eye, the ice lion had grown to over 500 meters tall, resembling a mountain range, exuding a majestic aura. This gigantic ice lion drew the attention of everyone on the battlefield. Its lion claws swung, accompanied by the sound of exploding air, as if nothing could withstand its overwhelming force. Impact Wave Sengoku's body surged with golden light as he raised his right palm, gathering power, and unleashed a shockwave towards the ice lion's head. But soon, the shockwave erupted, spreading immense power, causing the ice lion's claws to shatter. At the same time, the massive golden Buddha was sent flying out, tumbling across the ice surface for hundreds of meters before coming to a stop. The shattered ice claws quickly began to regenerate. Galaxy Impact With a loud shout, Garp leaped high from the ice surface and punched the lion's head. But the lion's hardness exceeded Garp's expectations. This punch only left it full of cracks, albeit looking miserable, but it did not shatter. Then, the giant lion's mouth opened wide, swallowing Garp whole. Gah! Garp held the lion's mouth shut with both hands, preventing it from closing. Just then, Sengoku flew forward again and launched another shockwave at the lion's head, causing it to recoil, and in the motion, Garp was flung out. In the blink of an eye, the two found themselves in another tough battle against the ice lion conjured by the golden lion. They exchanged a glance, then took a deep breath and charged once again, but this time their target was not the giant ice lion, but Shiki atop it. Their combined efforts to deal with Shiki were certainly not a problem, but the only issue was the duration of the battle. Far away, on the sea surface, Nicholas watched everything with a calm expression. The Navy's deployment, it had to be said, was perfect. If nothing unexpected happened in this battle, the Golden Lion would probably meet his downfall here. Unless he was willing to abandon his dignity as a strongman and simply use his devil fruit ability to escape. The Flutter Flutter fruit granted the Golden Lion the agility to escape from the Navy's encirclement, 
and the navy only had Kizaru who could pursue him in short distances, but would the Golden Lion fear a navy junior like him? Are you planning, Golden Lion? Nicholas noticed the Golden Lion's movements and glanced over. Golden Lion, what are you trying to do? Seeing the Golden Lion's actions and hearing his words, Sengoku couldn't help but feel incredulous. I am the Golden Lion. With a roar, the Golden Lion reached up and violently pulled out the ship's wheel embedded in his head. A large amount of blood spurted out, dyeing his originally golden hair blood red. As he held the severed ship's wheel, still dripping with dark red blood, the Golden Lion's face twisted into a grim smile. Then, he simply threw it to the ground. Watching the bloody and ferocious scene unfolding in the field, everyone was stunned and shocked. The once golden lion had now become the bloody lion, ready to unleash his final roar. Chapter 199 Wow, what a terrifying guy! Borsellino pointed to a dead pirate with his finger and muttered as he looked at the ferocious figure. Well, just a desperate beast, nothing to worry about. With that said, Sakazuki swung his fist, transformed into magma, towards the surrounding pirates without even looking back. It could be said that with every pirate he eliminated, there was one less scum on the sea. Lord Garp is so handsome. Kuzan exclaimed with excitement as he continued to manipulate his abilities to reinforce the battlefield terrain. The aura of this lion looks completely different now. Said Sengoku solemnly. We're going to have to fight with all we've got next. Garp clenched his creaking fist in his hand, watching the golden lion that looked like a demon from hell. The pirates in the surrounding waters looked at the blood-stained, arrogant laughter of the Golden Lion with a look of shock and confusion on their faces. What is the Golden Lion boss doing? Self-harm. We couldn't beat Garp and Sengoku together in the first place, and now it seems even less likely. Meanwhile, Nicholas, observing from afar, changed his casual demeanor and spoke solemnly, I take back what I said before. Truly, he is a hero of the seas. Although he will eventually perish, it's better to shine brightly now than to be defeated later like a joke by some little devil. Shiki, why do you bother? Sengoku looked at the Golden Lion and spoke, apparently trying to influence the Golden Lion's mindset through words. After all, gaining the greatest outcome with the smallest cost was always advantageous. Sengoku, what kind of person do you think I am? Do I need someone like you to judge? The Golden Lion laughed wildly his dominant and domineering aura rising to the sky. Golden Lion, you're not qualified to say such things. Sengoku retorted, his own dominant aura clashing with the Golden Lion's. If the Golden Lion's hockey was like a reckless and arrogant lion, then Sengoku's hockey was meant to make justice reign over the seas. The two auras intertwined and clashed, causing the surrounding ice to shatter. In an instant, two destructive storms clashed like heaven and earth, with the atmosphere between the two constantly groaning. Crack. The firmament was disturbed, with dark clouds pressing down, and terrifying black and red thunderbolts accompanying the compression of the atmosphere, as the dominant wills collided, creating a storm of unprecedented proportions. Then, it rose into the sky, stirring up the endless clouds. The entire sky split open at some point, revealing a massive vortex in the middle, surrounded by swirling black clouds and thunder. The surrounding sea churned, waves crashing endlessly, and the entire battlefield began to tremble. Two. Too terrifying. Is this what it's like when hockey clashes? Many pirates at this moment looked at the apocalyptic scene in the center, where dense black and red thunderbolts were splitting the sky, and their hearts felt as if they were being squeezed, almost suffocating them. A two-meter-thick black and red thunderbolt struck down, almost simultaneously, dazzling golden Buddha light rose like the sun. Sengoku transformed into a formidable Buddha, a huge golden palm enveloped in armament hockey rising up. The golden lion grasped the Oto and Kagarashi, two famous swords, as armament hockey enveloped them, and conqueror's hockey surged as well. Shiki. Sengoku. In that instant, the two collided like a comet hitting the earth, and the vortex in the sky, formed by the collision of their auras, split in two. The central long sword clashed with the Buddha's palm, leaving a huge gap in the middle, and the surrounding atmosphere shattered and spread with dense black and red thunder. Giant cracks appeared in the ice, tearing the battlefield apart. 
This collision could be described as earth-shattering. Watching the two figures in the center of the field, sweeping through the surroundings with their dominating auras, a figure, whose figure was enveloped in armament hockey, revealing eyes full of envy. Although those two guys might not necessarily be stronger than him, the flashy spectacle they presented was so damn cool. Indeed, this kind of aura is what men fighting Roger and Whitebeard on the sea should have, Nicholas said, unable to help but admire the Golden Lion, who fought more fiercely under the combined efforts of Sengoku and Garp. The Golden Lion, wielding two swords, moved through the air like a graceful swallow. At that moment, the agility of the floating fruit maximized the elusive nature of the dual swordsmanship. Between the swings of his blades, there was a continuous onslaught of strikes, resembling thunder. As for Garp, his iron fists combined strength and explosive power, destroying everything in their path with ease. Meanwhile, Sengoku remained calm on the sidelines, constantly causing trouble for the Golden Lion and expanding their advantage. The speed of the three had surpassed what the naked eye could capture. To onlookers, there were only vague shadows of the three figures colliding fiercely. In just a few breaths, the ice surface was already marked with crisscrossing gullies, and the shockwaves, sword winds, and fist strikes dispersed, forcing many pirate marines to hastily take cover. Watching the golden lion become increasingly ferocious, Garp landed a punch and remarked, It seems, golden hair, you've made your choice. Garp knew well that the golden lion's current state wasn't as good as he pretended. Pulling out all the stops would jeopardize his life, not just an empty threat. Though the Golden Lion appeared full of vigor, it didn't mean he could recklessly squander his power. One could liken him to a pot of boiling oil. If the Golden Lion were to retreat now, with careful nurturing, he might eliminate all threats and return to his peak within half a year. But the truth was, the Golden Lion didn't choose to flee instead, he pushed his hockey and swordsmanship to the extreme. For him, death was already close. Never needed any choices, just keep winning, that's all there is to it, sure ha ha ha. The golden lion laughed heartily and charged at Garp once more. His right hand sword aimed for Garp's head, while the left hand Odo stabbed towards Garp's chest. In the face of the golden lion's words, Garp remained silent, merely using his armored fist to block the golden lion's attacks. As time passed, the golden lion clearly felt his state declining. Sengoku and Garp, both top-tier fighters, also noticed this and intensified their assault. Sure ha ha ha. This is truly exhilarating. Let's settle this once and for all. Laughing uproariously, the Golden Lion disregarded his injuries. Although he regretted not ending things with Roger, defeating Sengoku and Garp would, to some extent, surpass that fellow Roger. Then, with a roar, he poured all his life-burning power into this final strike. Facing the dazzling blow, Sengoku and Garp also exerted all their strength. Unlike the previous clashes, this time, there was no sound accompanying the collision of their attacks. It was as if watching a silent film, prompting many to instinctively tap their ears. In fact, it was because the medium for sound transmission had been completely shattered where their attacks collided, creating a complete vacuum. The powerful fluctuations even distorted the surrounding light. An indescribable sense of awe surged in the hearts of onlookers. What kind of battle could reach such a level? But in the end, who won? I think Garp and Sengoku did, after all, it was two against one. More importantly, if Garp and Sengoku did win, how are we going to survive? As some pirates looked around at the dense sea of marines, they shouted in despair. At this moment, with the dissipation of energy, the answer was finally revealed. The Golden Lion had disappeared, leaving only the two swords, Oto and Kagarashi, standing alone on the ice. On the hilts, there was a tattered yellow cape fluttering in the wind. In the distance, Sengoku had reverted from his Buddha form, revealing his true form, while Garp stood beside him. Both of them were not in good shape, with traces of blood trickling from the corners of their mouths, evidently wounded by the Golden Lion's final desperate blow. The Golden Lion has fallen. The entire battlefield fell silent for a moment, and then erupted into chaos once more. Chapter 200 The final defiant laughter of the Golden Lion seemed to echo continuously in the wind over the ice. The gale intensified, the waves grew larger, and amidst the howling wind, 
other sounds were mixed in. Crash. Faintly, a sound rang out, echoing in the ears of the crowd, carrying a heavy atmosphere. It's a tsunami. Suddenly, the marines turned towards the direction of the sound and saw in the distance a vast white line surging towards them. Although it didn't look large from a distance, as seasoned sailors, they knew well that what appeared to be a mere white line was. In fact, a colossal tidal wave, towering over a hundred meters high, capable of crushing everything in its path when it drew near. Buzz. 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 Accompanying the white line, everything in the air seemed to vibrate incessantly, buzzing. It's the Whitebeard Pirates. Someone who had once participated in chasing Whitebeard exclaimed as they heard the buzzing, their face changing dramatically, then immediately shouted loudly. With this shout, the jubilant marines, who were celebrating the defeat of the Golden Lion, also had their expressions changed. The Whitebeard pirates are here. We're saved. Whitebeard. Thank you so much. If I were a woman, I'd let Whitebeard fire a couple of shots. Hee <laughs> hee, marines, your trouble is here. Unlike the tension among the marines, upon hearing the news of the Whitebeard pirates' arrival, the pirates exclaimed in awe, and many of them showed expressions of joy as if they had survived a calamity. Though they usually dreamed of taking down Whitebeard's head at sea to become famous overnight, at this moment, Whitebeard's arrival filled them with excitement, making their emotions complex. Some even began to consider whether to acknowledge Whitebeard as their dad. Meanwhile, Garp and Sengoku turned to look into the distance, where they saw the Whitebeard pirates and over twenty other pirate crews allied with Whitebeard, all standing on the bow of their ships, gazing solemnly at the battlefield. On the largest ship, the Moby Dick, Whitebeard, draped in a white cloak, stood with his Murakumajiri raised, exuding a presence as massive as a mountain. The arrival of Whitebeard weighed heavily on the marines. Like the Golden Lion pirates, the Whitebeard pirates were also one of the top pirate crews in the New World. Comprising mostly elites, Whitebeard's personal charm and the lenient rules of his crew attracted a large number of New World pirates to join them, including many mid-tier powerhouses. This was an extremely formidable pirate crew. Especially since the Marines had just finished a battle with the Golden Lion and several other pirate crews, without even having time to recover. If they were to continue fighting against the Whitebeard pirates, they would face tremendous pressure. In the distance, the furious tidal wave, which was over a hundred meters high, was already emitting a deafening roar as it surged forward. If not stopped effectively, this gigantic tidal wave would annihilate 90% of the Marines' combat capability in an instant. This wasn't an exaggeration. On a battlefield composed of ice, a tidal wave of this magnitude could directly sweep over it. Faced with such a massive tidal wave, aside from a few powerhouses, everyone else could only rely on luck. As the pirates, who had initially felt relieved at surviving, watched the monstrous waves approaching, their expressions turned numb. Tired, let it all be destroyed. Just then, a figure leaped high from the ice, landing in the sky above the marine's rear. Ice Age. A low voice sounded, reverberating on the ice. Following that, an incomparably icy breath burst forth, and everyone felt the temperature plummeting as bone-chilling cold swept over them, causing involuntary shivers. Simultaneously, a streak of ice extended towards the approaching tidal wave almost in the blink of an eye, the hundred-meter-high wave began to freeze the moment it came into contact with the ice beam. The speed at which the ice spread was astonishing. In the blink of an eye, before everyone's eyes, a wall of ice stretching over hundreds of kilometers and several hundred meters high appeared, like a ferocious beast frozen in mid-attack, emitting a silent roar. The cold wind blew, scattering ice chips, which spun and disappeared into the air. Kazan slowly descended, standing on the ice, exhaling a white breath, surrounded by a piercing cold aura. This scene left countless pirates wide-eyed, feeling incredibly shocked. The power of the Logia-type devil fruit was demonstrated to its fullest extent at this moment. Even the pirates under the Whitebeard pirate's flag hadn't reacted yet. They didn't expect the tidal wave triggered by Whitebeard to be easily neutralized by the marines. Sengoku narrowed his eyes, looking at the ice wall above. There, on the Moby Dick, Whitebeard stood on the bow, overlooking the entire battlefield from a high vantage point. 
Gururara, many formidable youngsters have emerged in the Marines in recent years, ha, uh, Sengoku, Garp. Whitebeard scanned Kazan with a glance. Whitebeard, what are you trying to do? Squeezing the head of a pirate with his magma hand and melting it, Sakazuki, with molten lava still flowing from his neck, threw the headless corpse aside and looked at Whitebeard, asking. Gururara. Whitebeard laughed heartily, then paused, his gaze becoming incredibly solemn. Magma brat, are you asking me? I'm sorry about that. This is the new world, not a place where you marines can run wild. And today is our pirate celebration. It's your fault for disturbing us. Whitebeard's words were powerful and threatening, causing the entire marine force to be stunned. Is Whitebeard's crew declaring war on us, the marines? Sengoku looked at Whitebeard seriously and asked. Guru Arara, you can interpret it that way if you want. His gaze shifted, then settled on the lonely Oto and Kagarashi stuck in the ice below, his tone icy. As Whitebeard's words fell, on the Moby Dick and the other pirate ships on both sides, all the pirates drew their weapons, smiling grimly down at the battlefield below. It seemed that as soon as Whitebeard gave the order, they would launch their attack without hesitation. This was an outright coercion. If Sengoku and the Marines still wanted to fight, undoubtedly, the Whitebeard pirates would join the battle. As the sound of weapons being drawn echoed on the ice, the tense atmosphere instantly pervaded. Silent, the Marines fell into silence. Newgate. Do you think you can make us leave like this? Just your pirate crew alone isn't enough. Sengoku's resolute words echoed on the ice, and the expressions of the pirates froze instantly. The Marines didn't retreat, nor would they choose to retreat. The Golden Lion pirates had already been completely dismantled by the Marines, and their leader, Shiki the Golden Lion, had been killed. Even though Garp and Sengoku were injured, if they were to face only Whitebeard alone, the Marines held an absolute advantage. However, facing Whitebeard's whole crew was different. Is this your choice, Sengoku? With Whitebeard gripping his halberd, he suddenly pointed towards the deck. A faint sound rang out, followed by vibrations from beneath the Moby Dick, and then cracks appeared, causing the ice wall created by the tidal wave to instantly collapse. As the Moby Dick also followed the disintegration of the ice blocks, it flowed downstream, heading towards the battlefield. The strongest man in the world is coming. Golden light surged around Sengoku's body, his expression extremely serious. Although they had just slain the Golden Lion, a renowned pirate on par with Whitebeard and Roger, Sengoku didn't doubt Whitebeard's combat prowess. Compared to the unexpected decrease in strength encountered when facing the Golden Lion, Whitebeard, currently at his peak, possessed terrifying power that could overturn the entire ocean once unleashed. War was about to erupt again. The marines, who had fought against the Golden Lion, were about to engage in battle once more. And this time, they would face Whitebeard. Chapter 201 The cold wind continued to howl, and the dark clouds in the sky pressed downward. Ice debris swept across the battlefield, and several large ships, led by the Moby Dick, surged forward on waves of ice towards the icy surface below. On the ice, the marines were stationed, ready for battle. Tension, solemnity, and a stifling atmosphere pervaded the entire battlefield. As the Moby Dick slid down the icy slope, numerous members of the Whitebeard pirates descended from the ship, brandishing weapons and roaring ferociously as they charged towards the marines. Teach these marines a lesson. Marines. The new world is not a place where you can act recklessly. Today is the day I, Biden, make a name for myself. Accompanied by various shouts, the morale of the Whitebeard pirates soared. Whitebeard himself showed no intention of moving, but his imposing figure stood at the bow of the Moby Dick, impossible for anyone to easily ignore. The marines tightened their grip on their weapons, their faces contorted as they charged towards the pirates. They would not fear any enemy, not even the legendary Whitebeard pirates, and nothing would make them retreat. For justice. Annihilate these parasites and scum on the sea. The cries echoed one after another as the marines, with heightened emotions, heard the command from Sengoku and momentarily froze, halting their advance. Suddenly, a thunderous explosion rang out from the sky, 
followed by thousands of lightning bolts descending from above, striking the ground between the two sides. Faced with this sudden turn of events, both the marines and the pirates involuntarily stopped in their tracks, for the lightning storm before them was insurmountable. Meanwhile, within the marine camp, including Garp, Suru, Sengoku, and Borsalino, all turned their gaze towards the center of the lightning storm. Their expressions darkening simultaneously, as the situation seemed to have exceeded their expectations. Meanwhile, Whitebeard smiled. My boys, pay attention, retreat. We have friends coming. Though Whitebeard spoke with a smile, the seriousness in his eyes was clear to everyone around him. In an instant, the rhythm of the entire battlefield came to a halt. All marines, prepare for defense. As the marines advanced towards the pirates with high spirits, upon hearing Sengoku's command, they were instantly stunned and stopped in their tracks. Amidst the flickering lightning, a figure appeared in the center of the battlefield. Nicholas, what are you doing here? Sengoku's voice was stern, for while he was confident in facing only the Whitebeard pirates, the addition of Nicholas meant that if he allied with Whitebeard, the two sides would be evenly matched in terms of top-tier strength. And if they waited for Roger to appear, with the addition of Oro Jackson's remaining forces, the Marines would be in real danger. Fleet Admiral Sengoku, give me some face. This battle ends here. If anyone wishes to continue, I will be their opponent. Turning around, Nicholas faced Sengoku from a distance, his seriousness evident in his gaze. Sengoku took a deep breath, clenched his fists, and stared at Nicholas. He truly didn't want to miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to kill the Golden Lion, cripple the Whitebeard pirates, and then capture Roger upon his return from Raftel. It would instantly deal an unprecedented blow to the pirates of the New World, and with this opportunity, the Marines might even be able to enter the New World. Meanwhile, on a Marine communication ship responsible for monitoring the surrounding area, a Marine observing through binoculars saw black dots appearing on the distant sea surface. As the binoculars moved, the dots gradually became clear. It was a fleet of pirate ships, and among them, on the uniquely designed flagship, stood a tall figure. Her aura was ferocious and terrifying, her eyes burning with fury. Where are those marines? Where are they? I'll tear them apart. And that thief Roger. The title of Pirate King should have been mine. If I can't become the Pirate Queen, I'm going to be the Pirate King's woman. The oppressive, violent roars echoed on the ship, making every pirate on board tremble. M.O.M., this time we'll definitely kill a lot of marines. Yes, we'll avenge that battle. The pirates spoke ingratiatingly, their voices trembling as they spoke. At this moment, Big Mom's rage was at its peak. Upon learning of Roger's journey to become the Pirate King at Raftel, Big Mom rushed over without hesitation. This time, she was determined to wash away the shame of being robbed by Roger last time, and to give a memorable lesson to any Marines daring to enter the New World. In another direction, a blue dragon was winding its way through the clouds above, heading towards the battlefield. Perched on the dragon's head were two tall figures. King, are we almost there? The dragon's roar resounded, its furious aura causing the surrounding air to stagnate. Kaido-sama, we're almost there. According to the intelligence, the marines are ahead. They plan to ambush Roger returning from Raftel. And according to the intelligence, the marines should be currently engaged in a battle with the Golden Lion pirates. Moreover, we've been monitoring the Whitebeard pirates heading in that direction as well. Roar. How can such a grand battle be without me? Kaido roared angrily, and then his speed surged once again, causing Queen to tightly grip the large dragon horn beside him. After all, for him, the sky was still too dangerous. If he wasn't afraid of spitting on Kaido and being killed, he would have already vomited. Back on the battlefield, upon hearing Nicholas's words, Whitebeard's eyes instantly sharpened. A hint of doubt flashed in his eyes, and he tightened his grip on his Najinata, seemingly hesitating whether to give this guy some face. But after a few breaths, Whitebeard released his halberd and looked at Nicholas with a smile. Gururara, I'd like to know. Whitebeard stared sharply at Nicholas. What happens if I don't give you face? Nothing. What? Whitebeard was taken aback. Roger. 
Are you prepared? Just as Whitebeard was dumbfounded, a strangely shaped ship appeared on the outskirts of the battlefield, and Big Mom's furious voice echoed across the entire battlefield. Upon nearing the battlefield, Nicholas spotted Big Mom. As one of the future four emperors, currently at the peak of her strength, Big Mom, together with Whitebeard at his peak, regardless of how much the two pirate crews usually didn't see eye to eye, now faced a common enemy, the Marines. If both sides were to ally, the Marines would be in big trouble, not to mention the pirate crews rushing to the scene from all over the New World after receiving news. If they waited for Roger to appear, then even Nicholas couldn't predict the subsequent situation. So Nicholas chose to intervene and stop this war because he needed balance. If either the pirate or the marine forces suffered too many losses, the balance of the sea would be disrupted. If Big Mom's appearance made Sengoku's face even darker, then the distant roar of the dragon made Sengoku's face almost as dark as the abyss. Fleet Admiral Sengoku, haven't you made a decision yet? Nicholas smiled as he looked at the gloomy-faced Sengoku. Sengoku's expression was grave, his gaze swept over Nicholas, the Whitebeard pirates, the Big Mom pirates, and the dragon silhouette appearing in the distant sky. After hesitating for a moment, he quickly made a decision. He took another deep breath and then shouted loudly. All Marines, obey orders, retreat. Nicholas, we will meet again. Sengoku glanced deeply at Nicholas before turning and leaving. With the command issued, the Marines acted swiftly, immediately converging towards the location of their ships. Chapter 202 The sound of footsteps echoed incessantly as a large number of Marines converged towards the Marine warships from all directions. Officers were shouting loudly, rallying their troops. Such a large-scale Marine retreat should have been a huge undertaking, but due to their strong discipline, everything proceeded smoothly. They even had the opportunity to take away the bodies of fallen comrades. Meanwhile, Sengoku, Garp, and others, under the escort of Borsalino and others, were moving against the current, marching quickly. Sengoku's expression was solemn, constantly monitoring the movements of Nicholas, the Whitebeard pirates, the Big Mom pirates, and the Blue Dragon flying towards them from afar. Nicholas, Whitebeard, Big Mom, and Kaido these four forces, if they came alone, would be easy prey for the Marines. But once they united, it would create immense pressure on the Marines. If all of them launched an attack against the Marines, even if they fought separately, with the current strength of the Marines on this battlefield, they couldn't resist such powerful pirate forces. If a war broke out, the Marines would suffer heavy losses today. Mom, both Whitebeard and Nicholas are here now. What should we do? On the bow of the Queen Mama Chanter, Perispero licked a huge candy with his unbelievable long tongue, speaking to Charlotte Lin Lin. Even in her enraged state, Charlotte Lin Lin was unusually clear-headed in the face of this situation. On the battlefield, Nicholas could clearly hear what Perispero said to Big Mom. He could even perceive Perispero's subtle movements. The combination of the Goro Goro no Mi and Kenbunchiku Haki produced astonishing effects. It allowed Nicholas to make qualitative changes in his Kenbunchiku Haki. Soon, all Marines boarded their warships. Sengoku, Garp, Tsuru, and other Marine high-ranking officials also arrived. The Marine retreat and gathering were very swift. Sengoku, issue the order, accelerate the retreat and leave here as soon as possible. Tsuru said to Sengoku, clearly seeing how dangerous the current situation was for the Marines. Sengoku nodded, his expression unusually serious at this moment. Why the sudden retreat? What is General Sengoku thinking? Kuzan was puzzled. Although there were many strong pirates on the other side, the marines were not inferior. With Garp and Sengoku able to handle Whitebeard and Charlotte Lin Lin, and any two of Sakazuki, Kuzan. And Borsalino capable of restraining Charlotte Lin Lin, dealing with Kaido and Nicholas and a group of marine commanders shouldn't be a big problem. Nearby, a figure wearing a yellow striped suit was leaning against the ship's rail, dozing off it was Borsalino. On the other side, Sakazuki, exuding a scorching aura, had a somewhat unwilling expression on his face. General Sengoku? Why the sudden retreat? The Marines have a huge advantage, even with Whitebeard and Big Mom here. We still have a chance of winning. 
he couldn't understand why the marines, who had prepared so long for this, suddenly decided to retreat. Sakazuki, calm down. What do you mean calm down? This opportunity is so rare. Sakazuki said angrily. At this moment, Sengoku didn't answer. He raised his head and looked calmly at Sakazuki's angry face. As a mythical Zoan-type devil fruit user, Buddha form, he possessed extraordinary calmness and wisdom. Sakazuki, mind your tone in front of your superiors. It's simple. Facing Whitebeard's pirates, Big Mom's pirates, and Kaido and Nicholas, if a battle breaks out, the marines will be at a significant disadvantage. Even if we can cause massive damage to them, our losses will be equally heavy. This is the new world, and once we're entangled by those guys, the marines are doomed to suffer heavy losses. Personal bravery is important, Sakazuki, but being a qualified leader requires more than just bravery. Tsuru said calmly. Upon hearing Tsuru's words, Sakazuki fell silent. Tsuru might not be the strongest in the entire marine system, but her prestige was high enough. In the cold wind, with the marines leaving, the towering figure of Whitebeard approached Nicholas. Newgate, you shouldn't have come. Nicholas said bluntly. Thunder Kid, who are you to tell me whether I should come or not? Newgate looked down at Nicholas. After saying this, he smiled. It seems like you also came for Roger, right? Roger, to some extent, but more so for Gold Lion. After all, he's one of the top powerhouses on the sea. How can his end go unwitnessed? Of course, when your career comes to an end, I might also go and witness it. Nicholas looked up at Whitebeard and said with a smile. Ha, huh, Thunder Kid, you might end earlier than me. Saying this, Whitebeard and Nicholas walked towards the direction of Odo and Kagarashi. Then, Whitebeard poured the clear wine from his waist onto the ice, a tribute to the former old friend. Whitebeard, I'm taking these two swords. Is that okay? Nicholas looked at Whitebeard and asked. Huh, no problem. But I hope you find a worthy owner for these two swords and don't tarnish the lion's reputation. Whitebeard smiled. For pirates, besides their own comrades, other pirates might form bonds due to various reasons, but that's about it. Don't worry, and by the way, no need to wait for Roger. He won't leave from here. After putting away the two swords, Nicholas suddenly said to Whitebeard. Why? Because they have learned a lot and need to digest it. And if I'm not mistaken, Roger would come to us on his own initiative. Chapter 203 the Roger Pirates have done it. Pirate Roger has finally achieved the unprecedented feat of circumnavigating the world. The ruler of the seas has finally been born. Roger. With the undulating sea as a backdrop, Nicholas sat cross-legged at the bow of the Moby Dick, reading the latest newspaper. The newspaper devoted an entire page to reporting on Roger's achievement, and in addition to the news of Roger becoming the Pirate King, there was also a wanted poster for Roger. Gold Roger, Bounty 5,564,800,000 Barry, dead or alive. In a certain port village, a large ship predominantly red in color was quietly docked. If anyone were there, they would immediately recognize it as the flagship of the newly crowned pirate king, Gold Roger. Rayleigh, you guys go resupply. I need to talk to Shanks alone, said Roger with a determined look, holding the straw hat he had given Shanks. When Roger and Shanks appeared again, though it was unclear what they had discussed, Shanks clearly had shed a few tears. Fame, wealth, power this man has it all. Gold Roger, the Pirate King. Recited Rayleigh with a smile as he read the newspaper. Roger couldn't help but scoff, they even omitted the D in my name. Seems like they fear the D clan more than anything. Afraid that revealing my full name would attract all the remaining D clan members to my side. He then chuckled and pinched his beard, but Pirate King isn't a bad title either. Wahahaha. Beside him, Buggy also laughed, I never thought becoming the Pirate King would cause the world government to withhold even his name. But now we know why. It seems our captain has quite the remarkable background. Hahaha, ha, they know nothing. But with this name, everyone in the world will be coming after us, Roger. Indeed. Kill Roger, seize the treasure. 
find Roger and claim the greatest treasure in the world. I'll take down the Pirate King's head. Almost as soon as the news of Roger becoming the Pirate King spread throughout the world, pirates everywhere, thinking highly of themselves, began their actions. Some countries even secretly funded pirate crews to search for Roger's whereabouts. Roger really did it. Beside Nicholas, Whitebeard couldn't help but sigh. However, he felt no jealousy towards Roger for becoming the Pirate King. He knew that achieving the feat of circumnavigating the world was Roger's dream. Now that Roger had fulfilled it, Whitebeard couldn't be happier for him. Whitebeard looked at Marco, Jozu, Thatch, and the others discussing Roger's achievement on the deck and smiled. In a sense, he had also fulfilled his dream. Yeah, after this, Roger will probably disband his crew, Nicholas said without lifting his head. Whitebeard was momentarily stunned by Nicholas's statement. He knew that for people like them, the crew members were not just comrades, but friends and family after their long journey together. Disbanding the crew was akin to betrayal. Roger, why do you suddenly want to disband the crew? Asked Whitebeard. Ha ha ha, I thought you'd ask me during the day, Roger chuckled. You first. It's simple. Now that we've reached Raftel and learned everything, we're destined to become the world government's number one target. And according to the information left by Joy Boy, you should also know that we're no match for the world government as we are now. So laying low for a while is the best option. Roger said solemnly. Yeah, we. Came too early, didn't we? I wonder who will find the unique treasure now. Probably my son. After all, I'm the Pirate King. Surely my son can surpass me, right? Roger said confidently. Where did you get a son from? Just go have one, ha ha ha. Why does Shanks seem different after talking to you? And what about you and Shanks? Really, you're like a woman sometimes. Some things are secrets between men. After the crew disbands, where will you go? Probably to see Nicholas. I have a feeling that he knows things that may be even more than us. And judging by his actions, he seems to be preparing for something. Are you joking? That guy hasn't even been to Raftel. How could he know all that? Rayleigh was amazed. He and his crew had been to Raftel and seen the remnants left behind, learning everything. He found it surprising that Roger believed Nicholas could know as much as they did, if not more. Why did Nicholas want Whitebeard to hand over the Pongliff, and why did he have to go to Wayno during the time of the full moon? Remember, on Raftel, there may be little information about Wayno, but undoubtedly, Toki's family and Kazuki were among Joy Boy's closest companions over 800 years ago. As Nicholas lay on the hammock on the Moby Dick's deck, gazing at the starry sky, he murmured to himself. Most of Nicholas's understanding of Roger came from memories. The man sitting on the execution platform, facing two executioner's blades with a smile. Looking down at the countless dreamers below, he shouted the words that ignited an era. Do you want my treasure? I'll give it all to you. Go find it. I left everything at that place. Simple words, spoken with a carefree smile. He had ignited the era of pirates, leading more people to choose to set sail on the vast sea. Did you do everything to prepare for the next era, Roger? Nicholas muttered to himself. Having arrived too early, he couldn't obtain the great treasure himself, so did he choose to pave the way for future generations with his own life? Chapter 204 What do you want to do, you bastard? When Marco spoke these words, his voice carried a hint of gloom, implying something beyond the surface. But Nicholas, without even glancing at Marco perched on the nearby mast, simply spoke, Little Birdie, do you know how ridiculous you sound trying to be profound? You! Marco's voice brimmed with anger, unsure why this guy hitched a ride on their ship, and even more baffled that their captain approved it. But Marco had always felt that Nicholas was dangerous. Nicholas seemed oblivious to Marco's words, continuing, What do I want to do? It's none of your business. He turned his head to give Marco a disdainful glance. You're too weak. You're saying I'm weak. Marco pointed to himself incredulously. He was among the top three since Odin left Whitebeard's ship. Even on the open sea, he was a formidable force, if not a contender, at least a strong player. 
Yet, Nicholas dismissed him as weak. Yes, Nicholas nodded, unabashed. Seeing Nicholas' demeanor, Marco's initial anger subsided, as he recalled being overpowered by Rayleigh in the battle between Whitebeard and Roger's pirate crews. This man single-handedly held his own against his dad and Roger, nearly tipping the scales in a battle of titans. Indeed, Marco had to admit, he was indeed too weak. What do you want to do? But whatever it is, I don't want you dragging Whitebeard's crew into it, Marco's voice dropped lower, a pressure that would make a lesser pirate cower. But for Nicholas, it had no effect. In the coming turmoil, no one can easily stand alone. You don't want Whitebeard's crew involved, but perhaps when the time comes, without Whitebeard, you might not even have the qualification to get involved. Nicholas paused, then continued, what makes you think Whitebeard's crew can dominate the new world? You don't think it's because of you weaklings, do you? If it weren't for you, Whitebeard might have been the pirate king, not Roger. As Nicholas spoke, Marco's expression darkened. During their discussions during the day, they lamented that Whitebeard, not Roger, should have been the pirate king. Yet, Nicholas' words hit home, stirring doubts in their hearts. You. Do you know what you're saying? Marco barely uttered before several figures appeared on the mast. Thatch, Josu, Atmos, Blenheim, what are you all doing? Marco asked with a frown, not wanting his comrades to get entangled with this dangerous man. You. You. And you. And you. Are all too weak, even to pique my interest, Nicholas pointed at each of Whitebeard's captains in turn, his smile unchanged. You. Thatch, reaching for his kitchen knife, was stopped by Blenheim. Calm down, Thatch. Blenheim urged, realizing the gravity of the situation. He knew how terrifying this man could be. Relax, Thatch. Let him be, Whitebeard's hearty laughter interrupted. They're all my beloved sons. Like father, like son. Whitebeard, you still intend to shelter these guys forever. Nicholas quipped. As his comrades left, leaving only Nicholas and Whitebeard, Nicholas spoke again, if you keep sheltering them like this, they'll never become true warriors. And if something were to happen to you, would they even be able to avenge you? You're quite candid. But if even I can be taken down, I don't want these guys avenging me, Whitebeard chuckled. Marco, what's wrong? In the kitchen, Thatch was busy preparing for the feast, but Marco's usual lively presence had turned silent. Ah, uh, nothing. Are we almost ready? If so, I'll go wake up those sleepyheads. It's almost ready. If you're done, then go wake up the others. Guru Arara, I believe in my beloved sons. But, Nicholas, don't you owe me a favor for last time you got beaten up? Nicholas retorted, knowing that without Roger and Whitebeard teaming up to snap him out of that state, he wouldn't be himself. Guru Arara, forget about the favor. I enjoyed that beating last time. Let's just have the banquet now. And don't hold back on the sake, Thunder Lord. My drinking capacity surpasses your imagination, Nicholas replied defiantly. The tense moment passed, and the conversation shifted. Whitebeard, you still plan to shelter these guys forever. Meanwhile, Marco, walking through the corridor, reflected on Nicholas' words, his eyes growing resolute. Are we too weak, dragging down Dad's legacy? Marco's thoughts churned, his gaze firm as he traversed the ship's halls. Chapter 205 After informing the other members of the Whitebeard Pirates, Marco also made his way to the deck. Just before stepping onto the deck, Marco paused and lightly tapped his own face with his hand, forcing a smile to appear. Hey, Pops, Thatch and the others have already prepared the ingredients and fine wine for the banquet. We can start the feast any time. Guru Arara, Marco, inform Thatch and the others to begin, replied Whitebeard, chuckling. Even though Nicholas was mentally prepared, he hadn't expected the banquet to last for three days and nights once it began. Guru Arara, splendid. I didn't expect your drinking capacity to improve so much after not seeing you for a while, Whitebeard remarked as Nicholas took a hearty gulp of his drink. Burp. Nicholas hiccuped, slamming his emptied cup on the deck heavily. Even with his exceptional physique, the smell of alcohol lingered in his breath. 
Oh, by the way, Nicholas, I heard from Roger that you're capable of concocting special beverages that unlock one's latent potential. Can you sell me a few? Whitebeard inquired, showing genuine interest after Nicholas's earlier comments had made an impression on him. He was concerned about the future of the crew once he grew old or weakened. No problem, Nicholas replied, burping again. Marco, come over and toast Mr. Nicholas, Whitebeard called out to Marco nearby. At that moment, two lookouts stationed on the crow's nest observed the horizon while enjoying roasted meat. Their relaxed demeanor shifted when they spotted a ship in the distance. Ship. A ship is appearing ahead of the port side. One lookout exclaimed. Where? The other lookout asked, immediately picking up a spyglass to confirm the sighting. It's one of those small boats again. The lookout's heart skipped a beat as he recognized the tiny vessel, a harbinger of trouble in the treacherous waters of the New World. On board, there was one man who posed a significant threat, and his presence alone commanded respect, Roger. Roger is coming. One crew member exclaimed in shock. Yes, Pops, Roger is here, but it's just him. The Roger pirates aren't with him, another crew member reported nervously, feeling the weight of Roger's reputation. Guru Arara, call him on our deck Whitebeard declared, his eyes gleaming with anticipation. Is it safe for you to drink so much, Roger, considering your condition? Whitebeard teased, observing Roger's hearty drinking. Burp. Don't forget, Whitebeard, I have the treasure Nicholas brought me. Drinking like this won't kill me, Roger joked, showcasing a conspicuous gold ring on his hand. Speaking of which, thank you, Nicholas, Roger said, acknowledging Nicholas's contribution to his prolonged revelry. No need to thank me, it's a small matter, Nicholas replied, hiccuping again. Nicholas, do you believe in fate? Roger suddenly asked, catching Nicholas off guard. Fate? Nicholas looked puzzled. Never mind. This isn't the place for such discussions. There's a nearby island let's talk there. Roger suggested, pointing in a direction away from the ship. The Moby Dick set sail towards the island, and soon, three figures leaped onto the shore and ventured into the jungle. Eventually, they arrived at a spot beneath a waterfall, surrounded by a grove of cherry blossoms in full bloom. Guru Arara, Joy Boy truly was an extraordinary figure, Whitebeard remarked, deeply moved by their conversation. So, I'm entrusting Fishman Island to you, Whitebeard, to incorporate it into your sphere of influence. We'll need the unparalleled power of the Sea Kings in the future. Roger declared solemnly. Regarding Fishman Island, let me handle it. Besides, I made a pact with Neptune I'm to be the godfather of that child, Nicholas interjected, unwilling to relinquish control over the power of the Sea Kings. Upon hearing this, Roger regarded Nicholas with a serious expression before saying, it seems you know quite a bit. I know only a little, Nicholas replied calmly, meeting Roger's friendly demeanor with his own stoicism. Nicholas, may I ask you a question? Roger's smile was warm and inviting. Of course. Chapter 206 Do you think you will become the next Joy Boy? Roger asked Nicholas, looking at him intently. I won't be Joy Boy. I'll only be Nicholas. Besides, why would I want to be the next failure like Joy Boy? Nicholas replied, tilting his head and posing a counter-question. Strictly speaking, Joy Boy was considered a failure from 800 years ago. Only Kaido, who had partial knowledge of Joy Boy, dreamed of becoming him. Wow, what an interesting response. It's truly you, Nicholas. Roger exclaimed, tears almost welling up in his eyes from laughter. Do you have the confidence to change the world? Roger asked seriously, regarding Nicholas. Changing the world isn't about what you say, but what you do, Roger, Nicholas replied, shaking his head. Wow ha ha ha, you're really something, Nicholas, Roger laughed heartily, his eyes showing a hint of regret. Despite being hailed as the Pirate King, Roger knew deep down that he wasn't truly the Pirate King. That's why he named the final island Laugh Tail. The conversation between the two, although brief, had a harmonious atmosphere. Meanwhile, Whitebeard drank quietly to himself. For others, the topics discussed by Roger and Nicholas were enough to shock anyone in the world. However, 
Whitebeard didn't seem to be concerned about such matters. He had already achieved his dream during his journey on the seas. As for concepts like the world, the pirate king, or joy boy, they held no significance for him. A gentle breeze blew, scattering cherry blossoms around the trio. Their conversation paused momentarily, both sides sensing something and adjusting their demeanor slightly. Roger, Nicholas suddenly called out. Hmm. Roger looked at Nicholas, curious. I want to know, with your spirit, why would you acknowledge something as laughable as fate? Have you trampled your pride underfoot? Nicholas asked solemnly and seriously. Roger's strength undoubtedly stood at the pinnacle of the sea. Even if he didn't unleash his full power, he was still unmatched. However, despite his formidable strength and will, he chose to disband his crew after visiting Laugh Tale and eventually surrendered his life to Usher in the Great Pirate Era. Having spent a considerable amount of time in this world, Nicholas gradually discovered that these powerful figures on the seas each had their own strengths and thoughts. They were real individuals, not mere characters in a manga. Nicholas, perhaps if I didn't know everything, would have unhesitatingly overturned everything with my sword. But the more I know, the more I realize my own powerlessness and insignificance, Roger said, reflecting on his experiences. His voice contained a smile, but his expression had become serious. So, are you afraid? Nicholas looked into Roger's eyes and asked. A smile crept onto Roger's lips. Afraid? How could I be? But after seeing you today, I feel relieved. At least I'm not alone in my beliefs. I just don't know which of us will succeed. What did he feel relieved about? What exactly were Roger and Nicholas planning? Their conversation seemed to indicate that they were undertaking something capable of influencing the world. The conversation between Roger and Nicholas left Whitebeard puzzled. He had known Roger for a long time, and he thought he understood him well. However, today's scene made him doubt how well he truly knew his old friend. And then there was Nicholas, who seemed to harbor significant secrets. Nicholas stared deeply at Roger, his emotions fluctuating. As the Pirate King, Roger's determination undoubtedly shook Nicholas. Roger's words indicated that he had made a decision, perhaps even intended to sacrifice his life to bring about a certain event. Moreover, dissolving the Roger pirates was likely a measure to protect his crew from being involved in that event. Standing in silence beneath the cherry blossom tree, Roger bid farewell to Nicholas and Whitebeard with a smile, his demeanor as carefree as ever. Accompanied by falling cherry blossom petals, Roger strode forward and soon disappeared into the cherry blossom forest. Nicholas stood in place, gazing at the direction where Roger had departed, as did Whitebeard. They remained silent for a long time, only retracting their gaze after Roger's figure had completely vanished. After a while, Nicholas finally spoke. I should go, Whitebeard. I'll have someone send what I promised you. Very well, let's part ways here. Whitebeard nodded, speaking solemnly. It was evident that he had been prepared for Nicholas's departure after all, Nicholas had only boarded his ship to wait for Roger, and now that Roger had come and gone, it was time for Nicholas to leave. Nicholas took a step forward, blue arcs of electricity flickering beneath his feet. Accompanied by a crackling sound, he vanished into the cherry blossom forest. In the quiet woods, only Whitebeard remained. Surrounded by cherry blossoms, his towering figure seemed out of place, and his expression was unusually complex. After a long while, Whitebeard let out a sigh. Roger, what exactly are you planning to do? From the conversation between Nicholas and Roger, he had learned that Roger seemed to have made a decision and was willing to sacrifice his life to advance a certain cause. Even the dissolution of the Roger pirates was likely related to this decision, as Roger didn't want his crew to be involved. Nicholas, on the other hand, seemed to have similar intentions to Roger's, but with one key difference, while Roger aimed to be a catalyst, Nicholas aimed to be a first-hand witness. Whitebeard felt perplexed. First, the death of Gold Lion Shiki, and now Roger's newfound determination, signaled the end of an era. As familiar figures departed one by one, he sensed that their era was gradually slipping away. As he stood amidst the falling cherry blossom petals, Whitebeard sighed once more. Roger, what do you truly want to accomplish? And with that, 
Whitebeard made his way towards the shore, leaving behind the quiet cherry blossom forest. Chapter 207 In the year 1498 of the Sea Calendar, one month had passed since Roger became the Pirate King. During this month, the world was in turmoil. Across the Four Blues and the Grand Line, messenger seagulls soared high, carrying new messages to the people. At this moment, Roger's name resounded throughout the vast sea. This man who had become the Pirate King would leave a significant mark on history. Countless factions across the seas were actively searching for information on Roger's pirate crew. Even capturing just one member of Roger's crew could provide a ticket to reach Laugh Tale, the final island. Some sensed that a new era was on the horizon. The emergence of the Pirate King meant that the world government would face significant challenges. For centuries, the world government had controlled the Four Blues and the first half of the Grand Line. However, the New World had always been a place beyond their reach. A person who could circumnavigate the world and nearly conquer the entire sea held immense significance for the world. With a single call, countless ambitious individuals, dreamers, and opportunists would heed, spreading like a virus across the seas. After Roger became the Pirate King, the world government was furious. Rumors even spread that the five apex figures in Pangaea Castle held an emergency meeting overnight. The leaders of various branches of the world government attended. Soon after the meeting, the Navy headquarters initiated unprecedented frequent mobilizations. The CP and other clandestine departments under the world government also became active, vigorously searching for Roger and his crew. The world government's actions created an atmosphere of impending storm throughout the world. All keen observers on the seas could sense that with Roger becoming the Pirate King, a massive storm that would affect the entire world was imminent. Across the nations, naval bases on the seas were on high alert. Especially in East Blue, Roger's hometown, the Navy tightened security. If Roger were to appear in East Blue, he would immediately face the destructive might of the world government and the Navy. Surprisingly, at the pinnacle of achieving the highest status as the Pirate King, the man who should have reached a new peak disappeared before everyone's eyes. Even the members of Roger's pirate crew seemed to vanish entirely, thwarting the spies the world government had embedded in West Blue, Fishman Island, Reverse Mountain, and the Grand Line. With the disappearance of Roger's crew, the world government's vigilant stance and the heightened readiness of the navy across the seas became futile efforts. What does he want to do? Inside Pangaea Castle, the five elders observed the first-hand intelligence gathered from across the seas, pondering. If Roger truly reached Laugh Tale, he should know many of the world's truths. But why hasn't he made any moves? It's quite puzzling, remarked an elderly man with a flat hat and a scar on his left cheek. Perhaps he has a bigger plan, said another elder with a long beard. Regardless, we must prepare to eradicate Roger's pirate crew. Declared a bald man in a white kimono, holding a long sword indifferently. It seemed as if wiping out Roger's crew was just a routine task for them. At the Navy headquarters in the Naval Academy, Zephyr furrowed his brows as he read the newspaper, contemplating Roger's whereabouts. Undoubtedly, Roger's disappearance, along with his crew, was a matter of concern for everyone on the seas. After reaching Laugh Tale, the legendary pirate who had been crowned as the Pirate King vanished without a trace, without revealing what he had discovered on the final island. The only thing known was the world government's claim that Roger had gained wealth, fame, and power. Zephyr, you're as boring as Sengoku. What can you discern from reading the newspaper? Maybe Roger is busy having a child. He might show up on his own after some time, Garp lamented as he entered Zephyr's office and lounged on the sofa, munching on Senbei. He has become the pirate king, the highest honor a pirate can achieve. He shouldn't be so low-key now, Zephyr continued to ponder the question. Garp felt helpless. Despite Zephyr's withdrawal from active service due to his unstable mental state after the incident, he was still deeply concerned about the events on the seas. If it weren't for Zephyr's encounter with that incident, Garp wouldn't have bothered to come see him. Fortunately, Zephyr quickly changed the subject. By the way, is there still no news about Dragon? Upon hearing Dragon's name, Garp paused for a moment while stuffing Senbei into his mouth. But he quickly resumed eating. That brat dragon has gone wild somewhere. If I catch him, 
I'll make him taste my loving fist, Dragon crunched loudly on the Senbei, indicating that Dragon's actions were almost indistinguishable from desertion from the Navy. If not for Garp's extensive connections, Dragon might have already been on a wanted list. Dragon has always been independent since he was young. If he's just disappointed with the Navy, it's better. I'm afraid he might make the wrong choices. Remember, the world government represents more than just high status and immense symbolic significance, it was a friend's warning, but it made Garp sit up straight. I'll keep an eye on him. He he he, this is really interesting. After Roger became the Pirate King, he chose to disappear. Is he scared stiff? Or is he brewing a world-shaking event? And the famous Golden Lion also disappeared. During our time in the Antarctic, the world has changed a lot. This era is becoming more and more interesting, he he he. On the pirate ship of the Don Quixote family, Da Flamingo, who had just emerged from the Antarctic, looked at the newspaper and burst into strange laughter. He he he, I say, Da Flamingo, we found a marine warship in the distance. What should we do? Treble's voice came with concern, instantly halting Da Flamingo's laughter. Taking the binoculars handed over by Treble and looking at the distant warship with the sail bearing the words Marine, and the figure standing at the bow with a cane sword, Da Flamingo's veins bulged, and he even crushed the binoculars. Attention everyone! Head to the New World! I don't believe he can chase me there! Da Flamingo said fiercely, clearly annoyed by the relentless pursuit by the Marine Vice Admiral. His various plans would not proceed smoothly if he continued to be chased. All hands on deck. Da Flamingo's order spread throughout the ship. It was evident that being pursued by someone like the Marine Admiral was disrupting all of his plans. Chapter 208 The Sabaidi Archipelago is an archipelago composed of mangrove branches, and it is not a complete piece itself. However, as the end point of the first half of the Grand Line, it can be said to be quite prosperous. Attracting visitors from all over the world almost every day with a variety of delicacies, beautiful women, and treasures that can be found here. At the same time, here you can see high-ranking nobles, wealthy merchants, powerful masters, and various other professionals. Nicholas still wore a black cloak and a whirlpool mask. This attire didn't attract much attention in the Sabaidi Archipelago, a gathering place for people from all over the world, as everyone was accustomed to the diverse appearances. Upon arriving at Sabaity, Nicholas chose to go to the hot springs first. After all, after a long sea voyage, it was a good idea to relax a bit. In the hot springs, the perfect temperature relaxed every muscle in Nicholas's body, and with the help of the beautiful women beside him providing massages, he felt a bit drowsy. Just as Nicholas was about to take a peeled grape handed to him by one of the beautiful women, the door of the hot springs suddenly opened. Then, a figure waved his hand to stop his followers behind him and respectfully approached Nicholas. Lord Nicholas. The man knelt by the edge of the hot spring and said respectfully. Oh, it's Bedeck. Do you want to join me in the hot spring? Nicholas looked at Bedeck, who was kneeling there respectfully, and spoke. It would be my honor, Lord Nicholas. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, Bedeck's face showed a flattering smile. Since pledging allegiance to Nicholas, Bedeck's life had been getting better and better. Although his status and position had greatly improved, Bedeck did not become arrogant. He knew that his current status was entirely due to Nicholas's favor. With just a word from Nicholas, he could fall from the clouds back into the mud. Therefore, in Bedeck's view, as long as he managed Nicholas well, he could deal with others as he pleased. Seeing Bedeck's appearance, the several beautiful women beside Nicholas in the hot spring couldn't help but be stunned. Their work had some elements of color, and naturally, they were familiar with Bedeck, the newly risen big shot of the underground forces in the Sabaidi archipelago. They didn't expect this big shot to be so respectful to the young man in front of them. Indeed, Nicholas looked like a sixteen-year-old, not to mention, if the female celestial dragons knew about the effect of pure gold, they would probably go crazy. After all, the ability of pure gold to maintain eternal youth was fatally attractive to those elderly female celestial dragons. It could be said that in the Sabaidi archipelago, you could see male celestial dragons who looked like old men, but you would definitely not see female celestial dragons who looked like old ladies. 
Aging made them unwilling to show their faces and instead hid in the sacred land of Mariehua, indulging in various pathological and depraved behaviors to satisfy their twisted hearts. Oh, Bedeck, how's the matter I asked you to pay attention to last time? Nicholas leaned against the edge of the hot spring, enjoying the meticulous care, and asked Bedeck, who had just entered the hot spring. Lord Nicholas, that matter has some progress. Recently, a batch of good goods did arrive at Human Shop, but we were a step too late. The slave you wanted had already been bought by the celestial dragons. Oh. Nicholas turned his head to look at Bedeck. Seeing Nicholas's gaze, Bedeck immediately explained, but rest assured, Lord Nicholas, I am currently working on a solution. As you know, there is a custom among the celestial dragons to exchange slaves. I promise to bring that slave to you soon. Although Bedeck didn't know why Nicholas singled out that slave, he didn't ask much. After years of wandering in the grey area, he knew very well that sometimes it was safer to know less. Well, I hope to see the person when I leave the Sabaeity archipelago. Rest assured, Lord Nicholas, I will definitely bring the person to you. After soaking in the hot spring, Nicholas parted ways with Bedeck. He still had some things to do, while Bedeck expressed that he would immediately work on bringing the person Nicholas needed to him as soon as possible. On his way to the Bamboo Grove Bar, Nicholas passed by a square, where he saw a large crowd gathered around and continuously talking about something in the center. And in the center of the crowd, an old man with white hair, wearing glasses and a scholar's hat, was passionately giving a speech to the people. Interestingly, although the old man's speech was passionate and fluctuating, the people around him seemed uninterested. Their expressions were more like watching a monkey's performance in a circus. Have you carefully studied the history of this world? As long as it has been traversed by predecessors, it is destined to leave traces. And these predecessors, in the process of exploring the world, have left us countless valuable treasures. Culture, knowledge, great geographical discoveries, and even the islands continuously discovered in the sea all of these are the precious treasures left to us by history. And what I have been pursuing is the history that belongs to us in the river of time, to represent history to the world is the meaning of my existence. The old man was very solemn, as if he was showing his belief to the crowd. Nicholas originally planned to leave, as the old man's speech didn't seem interesting to him, but when he heard the sensitive word history, he stopped. People, I want to tell you that according to my years of research, the current history is incomplete. It lacks a considerable part. Although many people may have heard that we have a hundred years of spare history. But I want to tell you, what we lack is not just that hundred years of history, but includes that hundred years and even thousands or tens of thousands of years of history. According to the current historical documents, even if we add that hundred years of blank period, our history is still less than a thousand years. But is this reasonable? It is clearly unreasonable. Based on the traces I found in historical documents and historical relics, there was once a magnificent civilization on this sea before the world government, an incomparably magnificent civilization. The old man's words caused the crowd to become more noisy. Some people were dumbfounded, some showed interest, and a few others suddenly changed their expressions and quietly retreated from the crowd and then left quietly. Obviously, among these people, there were some clever ones. As long as they had a certain level of cultural knowledge and studied history a little, they would find the role the world government played in the hundred years of blank period. Now this old guy was obviously jumping around on the edge of death, only fools would continue to wait for death here. Similarly, Nicholas narrowed his eyes and looked at the old man in the center. This old guy is too bold. Nicholas stood among the crowd, listening silently. He did not step forward to stop it. The identity of this old man was not yet determined. Anyone who dared to study the hundred years of blank history of the world so boldly was definitely not simple. Who knows if this old guy is fishing? After all, the world government has done this kind of thing more than once or twice. Although there are clever people in this world, there are obviously more foolish people who like to join in the fun. Gradually, more and more people gathered around here, and as the old man's speech continued, they showed more interest. After all, gossip was very interesting to them, and joining in the fun was also one of the human habits. What exactly happened in that hundred years? 
Why does the world government erase that hundred years of history? Could it be because the world government played some shady role during that hundred years of blank period? Why can the world noble celestial dragons enjoy such privileges above the common people? Is it really just because their ancestors, the twenty kings, made great contributions to the world? The old man's voice became louder, and the emotions of the crowd were also stirred up. What happened in that hundred years? Tell us. Could it be that something extraordinary happened during that hundred years of blank period? Chapter 209 Just as the old man was about to continue speaking, Nicholas quickly stepped forward, pushing through the crowded crowd. In the astonished eyes of the onlookers, he grabbed the arm of the old man, who was looking somewhat puzzled. Come with me. What are you doing? The old man asked, clearly bewildered. But Nicholas didn't say a word. He simply used his immense strength to drag the old man away. During this process, the old man did try to resist, but his resistance was futile in the face of absolute power. Shortly after the two left, a large group of men dressed in black suits with black hats rushed to the scene. As soon as they arrived, they efficiently sealed off the area, controlling everyone who had been surrounding the old man earlier. Do you know who I am? Let me go, my uncle is a rear admiral in the navy. I am the sixteenth prince of the Brulia kingdom, you offend me and my father will kill you all. I am the noble son of a chieftain in the South Sea. Be wise and offer your wives and daughters to me, and I'll make you my prime minister. Sir officer, we were just passing by, please let us go. Watching the men in black suits, expressionless as they surrounded the crowd, and even shooting those who resisted on the spot, many people began to feel uneasy. Even the foolish ones realized that they might have gotten involved in something dangerous. Soon, a man dressed in a black suit, wearing a white coat with long wavy hair, appeared under the protection of the men in black suits. Hmm. Where's the man? Seeing that the old man had disappeared, Spandine's expression immediately soured. Their orders were to eliminate the old man and everyone who had heard what he said in the square. Now that the most important person was missing, how were they going to report back? Meanwhile, Nicholas and the old man were seated face to face in a bar in the lawless zone. The Sabaeidi archipelago was one of the few areas not under the control of the navy and the world government. As for taking the old man to Shaki, Nicholas wasn't that foolish. His relationship with the old man wasn't that good, and he knew that Shaki wouldn't appreciate him bringing such trouble along. Besides, if he did, he might not get the same generous deals on information in the future. Nicholas ordered two drinks for them and remained silent for a moment before speaking. What you were talking about earlier, it's too dangerous. Dangerous? What's dangerous about it? I'm just telling people the truth about history, giving them the right to know what they should. The old man snorted, looking quite dissatisfied with Nicholas's words. Then he continued, Do you know how hard I've worked for the truth of those hundred years of blank history? Do you know how much I've sacrificed? I sold my house, I lost my wife and children. Do you think it's easy? I just want to tell the world what happened during those hundred years. What's wrong with that? After saying this, the old man picked up the glass on the table and downed it in one gulp. According to my research, all signs pointed to the final island, but I couldn't reach it with my abilities. I had hoped that Roger, who became the pirate king after reaching the final island, would reveal the truth to the world when he returned, but that guy disappeared without a trace after coming back from the final island. That guy selfishly took the wealth that should have belonged to all humanity and disappeared. So, I decided to tell the world what I know and let everyone know that they've been deceived by the world government. After hearing the old man's words, Nicholas asked calmly, So, have you discovered the truth of those hundred years of blank history? The old man scratched his head awkwardly. Not yet, but I can confirm that there's a gap in history for a hundred years, and that gap was erased by the world government. The fact that the world government was willing to go to such lengths to erase a hundred years of history indicates that something significant must have happened. Are you saying that you're not sure what happened during those hundred years of blank history? Nicholas said with a sigh. We'll soon find out the truth about those hundred years of blank history, I'm sure of it. The old man emphasized. You guys. Nicholas shook his head, not knowing what else to say. 
Everyone has the right to know the truth. Revealing the truth of history, restoring history to its original state, that's what we scholars should do. It's our belief. The old man said proudly. Have you ever thought that if the world government has the power to erase a hundred years of history, would they tolerate you revealing the truth of what happened during that time? The old man was taken aback by Nicholas's words. Then his expression changed rapidly, and he looked at Nicholas with shock in his eyes. Could it be? Though he didn't finish his sentence, Nicholas understood what he meant. That's right. Nicholas nodded. The old man looked at Nicholas with a complicated expression, feeling somewhat defeated. I never thought that after all my efforts, I would end up accomplishing nothing. Just then, the bartender approached Nicholas and whispered, Sir, our boss wanted me to tell you that the world government has sealed off the square and is eliminating everyone inside. The government's hounds are searching the island for anyone who managed to escape. After speaking, the bartender glanced at the despondent old man sitting at the table. What's wrong? When the bartender left, the Sukuli couldn't help but ask, apparently noticing the glance the bartender gave him earlier. Just now, the world government conducted a cleaning operation in the square. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, the Sukuli's body trembled, indicating he understood what Nicholas meant by cleaning. How dare they? How dare they? The Sukuli's eyes reddened. Why wouldn't they dare? What makes you think you have the power to intimidate them? With your laughable hundred-year history? They've erased eight hundred years of history. Do you think they'd fear such a threat? Moreover, you don't even know what happened during those hundred years of blank history. Do you have the right to threaten their rule? Nicholas said coldly. The Sukuli fell silent. He had considered the danger of his actions, but conducting a mass elimination was terrifying. After all, there were at least a thousand people in the square just now. You may not fear death, but that doesn't mean the innocent do not fear death. Perhaps you seek truth for your own sake, but those innocents may have just been curious. Yet, they might lose their lives for it. Maybe those who were eliminated had parents waiting for their sons, wives waiting for their husbands, children waiting for their parents, or families just out for a stroll, listening to your speech, and then being wiped out. Nicholas continued. This statement shattered the Sukuli's resolve, causing him to clench his fists, but soon he let go, feeling powerless. The truth was, he was on the brink of discovering the truth, but he was too weak to pursue it. Worse, his actions had implicated countless innocent people. You've probably attracted attention. Leave the Sabaeity Island as soon as possible. As a final reminder, Nicholas watched as the Sukuli's expression changed. As Nicholas stood up to leave, the Sukuli also stood up. If I can't reveal the truth, then what's the point of my existence? Besides, if I die, it might prevent many innocent people from being sacrificed. After saying this, the Sukuli straightened his clothes and appearance before calmly walking out of the lawless zone. Watching the Sukuli, who walked out as if he were a martyr, Nicholas couldn't help but feel helpless. In this world where power ruled, the weak were truly powerless. Bang! 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 Accompanied by a series of gunshots, Nicholas walked toward the other end of the lawless zone. Chapter 210 13th Region of the Sabaeity Archipelago, the name of the bar is also quite interesting, it's called Shaki's Shakedown Bar. It really hasn't changed much. Nicholas smiled and then stepped in without hesitation. Inside the bar at this time, there were not many people, to be precise, there wasn't even a bartender, just the owner lazily smoking behind the bar. Hey, boss, you won't get any business like this. Nicholas, you dare to tease me like this? With the smoke, a teasing voice with a hint of joy sounded. Why did you suddenly come to the Sabaeity Archipelago? Can't I come to see Sister Shaki? Nicholas glanced at Shaki, who was leaning on the bar with her arms, then smiled. Just as Nicholas finished speaking, he could clearly feel a faint murderous intent. Then he saw a man holding a broom walking out from the room behind the bar, and what's more interesting is that Nicholas recognized this man. With silver hair, wearing glasses, and a scar over his eye, he can be said to be quite famous in the new world. Oh. Rayleigh, what are you doing here? The bar was quiet, and after a while, 
before Rayleigh could speak, Nicholas, rather than Rayleigh, was the first to speak, as if Rayleigh shouldn't be here. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, Rayleigh first tightened his grip on the broom, then put it aside, sat on the stool next to Nicholas, and took a sip from the jug. Nicholas, how did you know I was here? I'm not here to find you, I'm here to find Sister Shaki, so don't flatter yourself. All right, try my newly brewed wine. As she spoke, Shaki placed a glass of wine as brilliant as the sunset in front of Nicholas. Thank you, Sister Shaki. Nicholas smiled, emphasizing the word, Sister. Shaki, I want to drink too. Seeing Nicholas picking up the glass, Rayleigh also called out to Shaki behind the bar. And Shaki didn't refuse, just reached out her hand to Rayleigh, smiling. Thank you for your patronage, that will be three million berries. Cough cough. Upon hearing Shaki's words, Rayleigh choked on his drink, three million berries for a glass of wine, this is simply extortion. I must say, you have quite the courage to come to the Sabaeity Archipelago, aren't you afraid that the world government will send the marines from the Marineford side to hunt you down? Or are you confident that the marines won't come after you? Nicholas smiled as he looked at Rayleigh. Hearing Nicholas's words, Rayleigh's eyes under his glasses seemed to shimmer, and he had a smile on his face. Well, I have no choice. After drifting at sea for so many years, I didn't save much money in the end, and now I still have to work for others to make money, it's really unlucky. Rayleigh poured out his grievances to Nicholas, not mentioning anything about what Nicholas said. But Nicholas didn't believe a word of what Rayleigh said. Let me guess, is it because Roger and the Marines once reached a certain agreement? Nicholas looked at Rayleigh and said. Ah, uh, you could say that. Rayleigh thought for a moment, then admitted directly. In fact, when Roger told him about the future arrangements for the Roger Pirates, he was quite surprised too. He didn't expect that the condition Roger agreed upon with the Marines when he invited them to join forces against rocks was that the Marines would turn a blind eye to the members of the Roger Pirates after the dissolution of the crew. As for whether the Marines would renege on the agreement, they weren't worried, because if the Marines did, they would spread the evidence of the Marines inviting Roger to join forces against rocks to the entire sea. By then, the image of the Marines would be dealt a devastating blow, and their reputation would be severely damaged. I thought you were really retired. Nicholas smiled and asked. Upon hearing this, Rayleigh was stunned for a moment, then realized what Nicholas meant by retired, became somewhat silent, and his mood seemed to become low. Yeah, I'm no longer a pirate. After taking a few sips of wine, Rayleigh shook his head and smiled bitterly, it's really sudden to have nothing to do. But slowly, I'll get used to it. Huh, interesting, but I'm not an old man. Upon hearing this, Rayleigh burst into laughter. So the two sat together, drinking and chatting, not about the final island or the actions of the marines, but about some experiences on the sea. Even Shaki, who was wiping glasses behind the bar, couldn't help but be drawn in. It's amazing how the fountain of youth can prolong one's life by taking the lives of others, and what about the tears of a mermaid? can they also be used by humans? The sea is truly amazing. Rayleigh said with emotion. Nicholas smiled, raised his glass, the two clinked, and then drank it all. After a while, Nicholas spoke up. Rayleigh, can I ask you a question? Go ahead, if I can, I don't mind telling you. Rayleigh smiled. Where are the other members of the Roger Pirates, and where is the Oro Jackson now? The Roger pirates have disbanded, but what about them? Nicholas asked solemnly. This question, not only was he curious, but people all over the world were curious as well. Of course, others were curious about where Roger went, but he was curious about where the other members of the Roger pirates went. After all, he knew where Roger went, and now it seems that they have matched up. It also explains why Crocus, as a crew member of the Pirate King, can still retire in Twin Capes and why there were no specific actions from the marines or the world government after Rayleigh intervened to save the straw hat crew in the Sabaeity archipelago. Ah, I thought you would ask about Roger. Rayleigh took a sip of wine and smiled. I've seen that guy already. Seen him. Rayleigh was stunned for a moment, then fell silent. A simple sentence seemed to tell him a lot of information. Before the Roger pirates disbanded, 
Roger told Rayleigh many things, and some of them could even be said to be things only Rayleigh knew besides Roger. Ah, that's it, then I'll tell you, those guys, after sending Odin back to the country, they should have gone to an absolutely safe place. As for the place, I can't say. But according to what Roger told me, it will take as little as a year and as long as two or three years for him to give everyone the opportunity to return to their hometowns and the sea. That guy, he's really a fool. Rayleigh said in the end. Yeah, that guy is indeed a fool. Shaki, do you have any rooms available? There are only two, you and Rayleigh can share. Forget it, let Nicholas sleep, I'll go out and deal with it for a few days. To be honest, Rayleigh was scared. When he first started his business with Roger, the experience of two grown men sharing one cabin on a ship can be said to be a nightmare that he will have to live with for the rest of his life. Chapter 211 Early the next morning, while Nicholas and Shaki were having breakfast prepared by Rayleigh, a group of men in black suits entered the bar. These men had cold, well-trained eyes, and it was evident from the bulges under their suits that they were armed, clearly professionals. However, neither Nicholas, Shaki or Rayleigh paid much attention to these men. Sir. One of the men, obviously the leader, approached Nicholas obsequiously. Sir, Mr. Bedeck would like you to come over. The matter you instructed has encountered some trouble. Approaching Nicholas, the man in black whispered. Oh. Trouble. Nicholas calmly asked as he picked up a piece of fried egg with his chopsticks. Yes, trouble. Mr. Bedeck had almost finished negotiating, but suddenly the other party requested to see you. Mr. Bedeck is now being detained by them. The man seemed to ponder for a moment before speaking earnestly. Nicholas raised an eyebrow, a hint of a mysterious smile playing on his lips. In the Sabaeidi archipelago, given Bedeck's status, whoever managed to detain him must be quite formidable. All right, lead the way. I want to see who dares to detain my subordinate. Without much hesitation, Nicholas declared. He exchanged a few words with Shaki before heading out. Shaki simply glanced up before returning to her breakfast. Rayleigh's cooking skills had noticeably improved, especially his egg-frying technique. As for Nicholas's safety, Shaki wasn't worried. In the Sabaeidi archipelago, there was no one who could be his match. As one of the top forces on the sea, he was basically fearless. Silently, the men led Nicholas to a bustling area of Sabaeidi, where they stopped in front of a magnificent clubhouse. It was a five-story lavish building exuding the scent of money from inside out. Even the line of elegantly dressed hostesses at the entrance was enough to deter those with less than ample pockets. Next to the clubhouse flew a flag bearing a family crest, further dispelling any inappropriate thoughts. Sir, Mr. Bedeck is inside. Please come in. Led by the lead man in black, Nicholas soon arrived at the end of a corridor. The man in black pushed open the door and gestured for Nicholas to enter. Stepping inside, Nicholas couldn't help but marvel at the dazzling lights that greeted him. The brightness was comparable to daylight outside. Soon, Nicholas took in his surroundings. The space was vast, with an indoor swimming pool resembling a small beach. A dozen or so women frolicked in swimsuits. On the beach, two men sat on chairs. One of them was Bedeck, while the other surprised Nicholas. Sitting on a high-end custom-made beach chair was a man with an air of arrogance, disdain, and condescension in his eyes. With a bubble on his head and wearing a protective suit resembling a spacesuit, his identity was clear. A celestial dragon. Hello, the boss behind Mr. Bedeck, welcome. A mild but prideful voice emanated from the celestial dragon. Nicholas remained silent, squinting his eyes, clearly curious about why the celestial dragon wanted to see him. As a favor, I allow you to sit in front of me. The celestial dragon's attitude was lofty, as if allowing someone to sit in front of him was a great favor. As soon as he finished speaking, a man in black suits approached, leading a beautiful woman with golden hair. At the end of the iron chain was a key to control an explosive collar around her neck. Once brought to Nicholas's side, the woman kneeled on the ground, hands supporting her, becoming a makeshift chair. Nicholas didn't hesitate to sit down. To celestial dragons, many people were not considered individuals but tools. 
once they lost their usefulness, they were not far from being scrapped. Speak up, why did you summon me? Nicholas glanced at Bedeck before turning to the celestial dragon, asking directly. Despite mentioning Nicholas's name, the celestial dragon's face lit up with a smile, as if everything was within his grasp. Although Nicholas's name was mentioned, he remained silent, waiting patiently. I am here to propose a cooperation with you. Despite his inner displeasure, the celestial dragon suppressed it for the sake of the goal. However, his impression of Nicholas was quite negative. Cooperation. Yes, I am interested in your weapons business. As far as I know, C. Prism Stone, which seems to be produced only in Wayno, is involved in large-scale arms trading between Kaido and the world government. And according to my investigation, you are not Kaido's partner. So it seems that only another powerful pirate occupying the seas of Wayno has such strength. Am I right, Mr. Nicholas? After mentioning Nicholas's name, the celestial dragon smiled, as if everything was under his control. Although Nicholas's name was mentioned, he remained silent, waiting patiently. I have no interest. Nicholas replied directly, not interested in being like Doflamingo, who wanted to become the king of the underworld. Do you know what you're refusing, Nicholas? The celestial dragon's anger flared. Nicholas's refusal angered him greatly. I've said it before, I'm not interested. Say one more word of nonsense, and I'll kill you on the spot. And make sure the person I want is sent to me. Understand? Nicholas's tone became icy. A chilling aura swept through the room, causing everyone to freeze. The men in black surrounding the celestial dragon immediately tensed up, quickly standing in front of him. Facing Nicholas's unabashed killing intent, the celestial dragon's teeth chattered, clearly frightened. But soon, realizing what was happening, the celestial dragon's eyes turned red with anger. He abruptly stood up, about to explode in rage, but seeing Nicholas's cold gaze, he sat back down dejectedly. Understood, I can have the person you want sent to you now. Then, the celestial dragon instructed his men, and soon a beautiful woman with flowing golden hair, along with the key to control the explosive collar, was handed over to Bedeck. Once Nicholas and his group left, and the guards were dismissed, the celestial dragon could no longer suppress his anger. He violently smashed the glass headgear representing his celestial dragon status onto the ground. The force was so great that it even cracked the specially made headgear. Despite our noble lineage, we're still treated like caged pigs. Claiming to be descendants of the creators, yet unable to wield power. Wait and see, you, whoever you are, I will one day pull you down from your throne and make you kneel beneath me. After venting his frustration, the celestial dragon picked up the headgear from the ground and put it back on. Then, he glanced in the direction of Mary Geos and left silently. Chapter 212 Bidek was walking with a beautiful woman behind Nicholas, just shortly after leaving the club, when they were stopped by a strange-looking man. The man stopping them was dressed in a high-collar long coat, wearing a mask with round lenses covering his face. His hair stood up like a hedgehog, and there were wounds sewn shut on each side of his eyes. His clothes were adorned with gears and other metal decorations, giving off a steampunk vibe. Arms King, Bidek. The man inquired. Who are you? Bidek asked irritably. While he couldn't stand up to Nicholas in front of Celestials, he was one of the notorious kings of the underground, especially in Sabaeity Island. I am Gladius, the man replied, you may not know me, but you must know my young master, as he's quite interested in you and the person behind you. He wishes to meet you. Who's your young master? Bidek asked. My young master is Don Quixote da Flamingo, Gladius answered, with a hint of pride. Bidek gave Gladius a deep look. He had heard of Doflamingo, not as the leader of the Doflamingo family in the North Sea as Gladius thought, but because of Doflamingo's former affiliation with the Celestial Dragons. To Bidek, the Doflamingo family in the North Sea was nothing more than a small fry. They couldn't match his wealth or the number of his men. Bidek mostly dealt with monarchs from various countries or great pirates of the Grand Line. What did the Doflamingo family amount to? Before Bidek could dismiss the fool, Nicholas spoke up, Bidek, go meet with that young lord from the North Sea. 
Though Bedeck didn't understand why Nicholas wanted to meet Da Flamingo, he quickly made a decision. Lead the way. I want to see what this famous firebird from the North Sea wants with me. Surprisingly, Gladius didn't take Bedeck and Nicholas to a bar or restaurant but to a construction site. There, Da Flamingo, the future joker of the underground world and warlord of the sea, was standing. Da Flamingo was nearly three meters tall, with golden short hair contrasting against his pink feather-weaved coat. Underneath the coat, he wore an unbuttoned white shirt, revealing his muscular upper body, paired with cropped pants and pointed shoes without socks. Just by appearance, one could say Da Flamingo looked like a rogue. No wonder he was called the Heavenly Demon. Da Flamingo stood in the center of the construction site, manipulating his fingers like puppet strings. Not far in front of him, several decently dressed individuals were wielding hammers, shovels, and trowels, engaged in a fierce struggle. Some begged for mercy while others fought with the tools in their hands. Around them, many workers watched, their faces showing a mix of fear and satisfaction. Shovels hit heads, trowels slashed bodies, hammers smashed knees, eliciting cries of pain. Instead of sympathy, these actions only brought joy to Da Flamingo, who laughed happily. He didn't even turn around but knew Gladius had brought people over. He flicked his fingers, and the heads of the two surviving decently dressed people flew into the air. Their headless bodies took a few steps forward before collapsing to the ground, blood gushing from their necks. Senator, make sure to pay the workers' wages and let them continue construction. And tell Diamante to go round up the families of those guys and bring them here to accompany them, Da Flamingo ordered, then turned to Bedeck with a smile. Arms King, Bedeck, I've heard of your name in the North Sea and wanted to meet you. Finally, we have the chance to talk. What do you want to talk to me about? Bidek asked calmly. His boss was standing right behind him even if a mere newcomer from the North Sea showed up, Bidek would dare to challenge him. This isn't the place to discuss business. Follow me, Da Flamingo said, turning and walking away, motioning for Bidek to follow. Bidek followed Da Flamingo around a corner and found a sunny spot on the other side of the construction site, with several loungers, parasols, and boxes of wine nearby. A barbecue grill was also set up nearby. At that moment, several members of the Da Flamingo family were sunbathing. Da Flamingo lay back on his lounger and said to Bedeck, What I want to talk about, of course, is business, big business. I love dealing with smart and interesting people. I'll be here for a while. If your boss behind you comes to the Sabaeity Archipelago, remember to tell him about this. Adjusting the angle of the parasol, Da Flamingo suddenly turned to Bedeck with a furrowed brow and said, All right, if there's nothing else, you can leave. Bedeck was instantly displeased upon hearing this. Who did this guy think he was? It could be said that Da Flamingo's actions had left a very bad first impression on Bedeck. Why aren't you leaving yet? Da Flamingo frowned at Bedeck, who was still standing there. In his eyes, Bedeck, who seemed so glorious to outsiders in the underground world, was just a puppet put on display by some big shot. After all, he had done a detailed background check. This guy used to be just a slave catcher captain. Later, he ended up in his current position due to various coincidences and the support of his current behind-the-scenes boss. What do you want to talk to me about? As Nicholas took the chain from Bedeck's hand and walked over to a lounger to sit down comfortably, he asked Da Flamingo. Seeing this scene, Da Flamingo burst into exaggerated laughter. Ha ha ha, I never expected someone like you, a big shot, to appear under the noses of those guys. I wonder if they'll be able to sleep peacefully once they find out about this news. Seeing Nicholas's indifferent attitude, Da Flamingo, after laughing, also spoke seriously to him. I have a plan. I wonder if you're interested. What plan? Nicholas asked, showing some interest. Da Flamingo pointed to the woman standing next to Nicholas with a somewhat vacant expression. Do you want to partner with me to monopolize the slave trade? Nicholas seemed uninterested. He really wasn't interested in human trafficking. Ignoring Nicholas's attitude, Da Flamingo's face showed a strange smile as he pointed to the construction site behind him. When that place is completed, it will be the largest auction house in the Sabaeity Archipelago, and even in the entire Grand Line. 
all slave auctions in the Sabaidi archipelago will take place there. I was originally thinking of finding other people to cooperate with, but if I can cooperate with you, I won't need to find anyone else. Da Flamingo reached out his right hand and clenched it towards the sky. Your arms trade, combined with my human trafficking in the various channels I control, along with your powerful force, can be the bond that connects us. By working together, we can monopolize all the underground business in the first half of the Grand Line. With his upper body propped up, Da Flamingo looked at Nicholas, who was also looking over, with ambition in his eyes. By then, all the underground transactions in the first half of the Grand Line, and even in the New World, will be under our control. We can even establish a force that can rival the world government and the Marines. By then, this sea area will be ours. Well, it's a good idea. I'll have Bedeck talk to you about the details. Also, honestly, your strength seems a bit weak. I hope to see you with awakened abilities next time. After saying this, Nicholas picked up some grilled meat offered by Diamante and left with Bedeck. Leaving Da Flamingo standing there in confusion. Diamante, am I really that weak? Da Flamingo's forehead veins bulged as he looked at Diamante, who was holding an empty plate, and asked. Da Flamingo. Never mind. Without waiting for Diamante to reply, Da Flamingo waved his hand, then lay back on the lounger, and no one knew what he was thinking behind those glasses. Chapter 213 Wayno Country, Hakamai At the port of Habu Harbor, a ship was slowly approaching. At this moment, if one were to look down from high above, they would see a sea of pink. Originally, there weren't so many cherry blossom trees in all of Hakamai, but because the lady of the island liked cherry blossoms. Hakamai had imported a large number of cherry blossom trees from places like Kuri and Ringo through grain exports in a short period of time. With cherry blossoms forming forests, Hakamai boasted a unique scenery. It's a very beautiful island. Standing on the bow of the ship, Nicholas said with a smile. This island is indeed very beautiful, but sir, why did you go to such lengths to get me out of the celestial dragon's hands? Stella looked at Nicholas curiously. The reason she hadn't used her powers to escape was because she knew that if someone could demand her release from the celestial dragons, they must have had a bigger purpose. It's just a trivial investment, really. Of course, it would be even better if there's a return. If not, then consider it rescuing an innocent girl. Nicholas nodded, openly admitting. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, although Stella still had some doubts in her heart, she felt considerably reassured. After all, compared to being in the hands of the celestial dragons, the person in front of her, who demanded her release and removed the explosive collar from her neck, seemed decent enough. Half an hour later, the ship docked at the port of Habu Harbor. The samurai guarding the port were excited and elated, bustling around to receive Nicholas, ensuring that everything was arranged properly. After disembarking, walking on the clean, tidy bluestone road, especially with the samurai and ordinary people along the way expressing heartfelt gratitude, Nicholas nodded inwardly. It was clear that Hakamai had been managed quite well by now. Stella, too, was curious. Throughout the journey, whether it was the unpredictable weather of the new world or the strange creatures encountered, it had all been eye-opening for her. And for the place she was about to live in long term, Stella was equally curious, looking around everywhere. From the port where they were, it could be seen that the port had been recently expanded. The houses and roads along the way were all brand new. Entering the streets through the port, there were rows of shops, bustling with pedestrians and the constant sound of vendors calling out their wares. However, when they saw their carriage, all these people voluntarily made way, but unlike the fear they showed to the celestial dragons, the eyes of these people were filled more with gratitude and reverence. Simon, you've done well. Simon, who came to welcome Nicholas, smiled and replied, We've all followed the guidelines you set as captain to establish regulations, doing our utmost to maintain fairness and justice. But actually, what really makes these people genuinely grateful is the wealth we've brought them. Although there was some resistance at the beginning when we forcefully opened the port for trade with the outside world, as prosperity from maritime trade grew, those voices of opposition gradually diminished. Even now, if anyone dares to oppose maritime trade, without us having to intervene, 
the common people of Hakamai would tear them apart themselves. After all, the prosperity brought by maritime trade has greatly benefited ordinary people. The living standards of the common people in Hakamai have completely surpassed what they used to be. Even a while ago, a group wanting to make contact with the conservative forces in Kuri to return Hakamai under the control of the generals didn't even take any action and were subdued by the vigilantes and ordinary people who came upon hearing the news. Hakamai can be said to be a paradise in all of Wano country now. Every day, a large number of refugees from Wano sneak in through various means. Talking about the changes in Hakamai, Simon was also proud, as they were all established by their own hands. For Nicholas, he was mentally prepared for the changes in Hakamai. To put it plainly, it might be easy to incite the common people, but there was a prerequisite, and that was they had nothing to lose. Like the Hakamai of the past, during the uprising, it could be said that the phrase one call and a hundred respond was an apt description because at that time, the lives of those people were already miserable enough there was nowhere worse they could go. But now, if you dared to rebel in Hakamai, you were probably going to be beaten to death on the spot and then exposed on the street. It used to be poverty, but now it's warmth, family, and prosperity with land and food at home. Even a fool would know what to do. As for the official system of Hakamai, Nicholas followed the same approach as the magistrate, where those capable rise, and those incapable fall. As for the system of his previous life's family, to be honest, it was better not to mention it. After all, in the previous life, he didn't even know what a county magistrate was, let alone the specifics of its operation. Oh, what's that over there? Suddenly, Nicholas pointed to a clearly artificially constructed mountain in the distance and asked. Following Nicholas's direction, Simon spoke up, that's where the graves of the martyrs since the uprising are, as well as the location of Hakamai's schools. Looking at it for a while, Nicholas nodded. It could be said that once the people had cohesion, there was almost nothing that could shake them. Ten minutes later, Nicholas and Simon arrived at the cemetery. Already waiting there were many former leaders of the rebels, the current leaders of Hakamai, among others. They stood on either side, their expressions solemn. The atmosphere was heavy, and as Nicholas walked through the crowd, he too remained silent. In front of this cemetery, erect a stone monument. Nicholas whispered to the person beside him. Yes, sir. On the monument, engrave the names of all the brave warriors who died for the people of Hakamai. Each and every one of them is a hero, at least in the hearts of the people of Hakamai who are now enjoying prosperity. They should be remembered forever. And as for this monument, let's call it the Monument of Heroes. The night was cool as water. The gauze curtain at the head of the bed fluttered gently in the sea breeze. The gradually cooling temperature woke June up drowsily, and she got up to close the window tightly, then curled back into the warm and soft bed. She was about to fall back asleep when she suddenly opened her eyes and looked at the chair in the corner of the bed. On the chair, a blurry figure emerged in the darkness, and the moonlight outside the window was partially blocked by the wall. Making it difficult for June to see the upper body of the figure hidden in the shadows, only the crossed legs raised in the moonlight were visible. Without panic, but calmly, she turned on the bedside lamp, illuminating the entire room and dispelling the darkness in the corner, revealing the face she had longed for. After a deep and meaningful conversation, June lay blushing on Nicholas's chest, tracing circles on his chest with her fingers. Nicholas, let's have a child. Chapter 214 Wayno Country Since returning from Onigashima, there have been multiple conflicts between Kaido, the Beast Pirates, and Kazuki Odin. However, because Kaido occupied Kibi, Udon, and Ringo, he had considerable strength. Although Odin was individually strong, there was a significant gap in basic military power between them and the alliance of Kaido and Orochi. War wasn't just about soldier strength and morale but also about logistics. Originally, after Kazuki Odin returned to Kuri, the head of the Kazuki clan, Denjiro, attempted to sneak into Ringo to contact several daimyos to form an alliance and attack Kaido and Oroki's alliance from the rear. However, she was outright rejected. The reason for the rejection was simple, the entire Ringo region couldn't provide enough resources to form an army. Although forcibly collecting resources from the Ringo commoners was possible, 
despite the rift between Hakamai and Ringo, markets had been established where people from both sides interacted. Many Ringo residents even migrated to the nearby areas because of this trade zone. While looting this area or forcibly collecting food from the commoners could gather resources, it would tarnish the reputation of the Kazuki family in Ringo. If their cooperation with Odin to fight Kaido failed, the angry Ringo residents might even desecrate their ancestral graves. Although Ringo couldn't mobilize large-scale troops, the daimyos, including Odin, stated they could declare war on Kaido and Orochi as a promise of loyalty to the Kazuki family's ancestors. Without the large forces from Ringo, Odin's strength alone wasn't enough to completely defeat the alliance between Orochi and the Beast Pirates. For a while, the situation in Ueno country became precarious. Moreover, the main reason was the dramatic changes in Hakamai, making the situation in Ueno country even more unpredictable. The alliance formed by the new classes in Hakamai, led by Vista, mixed everything up. Both Odin and Kuri and Kaido in Onigashima were reluctant to engage fully because they feared that if they both ended up weakened, someone else would take advantage of the situation. So, except for a few clashes between Odin and Kaido after Odin's return, including directly attacking the shogun's residence in Flower Capital, the two sides entered a ceasefire. It was said that when Odin left the shogun's residence, people around went to see the battle scars left behind. It was almost half destroyed, and there were many bodies on the battlefield. Most of these bodies were frostbitten and had faces like demons. Even those who were still alive had frost covering their bodies like demons, and eventually, they were all slaughtered by Odin's guards. Denjiro, is the antidote not ready yet? In the mansion of the daimyo of Kuri, Kazuki Odin looked at Denjiro with a solemn expression. Among Odin's retainers, Denjiro was undoubtedly the most charismatic leader. Lord Odin, Based on the samples and descriptions you brought back, it seems that Kaido and Orochi are in possession of a highly contagious plague. This plague turns the infected into mindless monsters, and once bitten or scratched by these monsters, one becomes infected. Although we know it's a plague, unfortunately, Lord Odin, with our current medical capabilities, we are unable to produce a potion to counteract it. Perhaps there might be a cure outside of Ueno country. Denjiro knelt on the ground, speaking earnestly. Although Odin was mentally prepared, Denjiro's words still made his expression somewhat unpleasant. Having experienced great adventures, he knew the level of medical care in Ueno country. If someone got sick, they either had to gather some herbs or ask a shrine priest for some amulets. Even in the vast Ueno country, not even a simple surgery could be performed. No, perhaps Hakamai could, as according to the intelligence he had received, it wasn't much different from the other maritime islands he had visited. Is there really no way? Odin was still unwilling to give up. Um, Lord Odin, the situation you described seems to ring a bell. According to the scrolls of the shinobi, a similar virus once broke out somewhere a long time ago. Someone used a special product called, Shining Jewel, to turn all the people on an island into mindless monsters who only knew how to kill. Moreover, if the user of this elixir is powerful enough, they might even gain even greater power, comparable to demons. Shining Jewel Is there any record of how to make an antidote? Odin hurriedly asked, while Denjiro, Kinemon, and Kikunajo all looked towards Reizo, wanting to know if the scrolls of the shinobi contained any information about the antidote to the Shining Jewel. Even if it wasn't the same plague, there might still be valuable references for an antidote, perhaps even one that could counteract the plague that turned people into frost demons. Um, no. Seeing the expectant eyes of everyone, Rezo shrugged helplessly. Instantly, everyone felt immensely disappointed. Lord Odin, with our current strength, it seems difficult to defeat the alliance of Kaido and Orochi and reclaim flower capital. It might be better to seek help from the Roger Pirates and Whitebeard Pirates. At this moment, Inurashi suddenly spoke up, apparently realizing that the situation in Ueno country couldn't be solved by Odin alone. Not to mention the monster entrenched in flower capital, just Kaido alone was not someone they could easily deal with. Meow, that's right, Lord Odin, you helped Roger so much, he definitely won't refuse. Moreover, with Lord Odin being on Whitebeard's ship, once Whitebeard hears about the current situation in Ueno, he'll definitely come with the Whitebeard pirates to drive away Kaido. Nekamamushi also chimed in. 
Hearing Nekamamushi and Inurashi's words, Kiniman and Reizo, as well as Kikunajo, all looked curiously at Odin. They had also heard from Nekamamushi and Inurashi about the strength of the Whitebeard pirates, and they had even witnessed it firsthand. Anyone who could easily defeat Odin must be able to defeat Kaido. Although they didn't know how strong the Roger pirates were, being compared to the mighty Whitebeard indicated that they weren't simple. If they could invite those two powerful pirate crews, they would surely be able to solve the current crisis facing the Kazuki family. Listening to Nekamamushi and Inurashi, Kenjuro's expression, full of acting skills, couldn't help but change slightly. After all, unlike the closed-off Kuri, he had obtained a lot of information from Kaido, and it wasn't just becoming the pirate king like Roger just the Whitebeard pirates alone weren't opponents that Kaido and Orochi could resist. At the same time, Kanjuro also looked towards Odin, wanting to see if he could get some information from his expression. I'll consider this matter. Odin didn't directly agree but frowned. Chapter 215 Wayno, Flower Capital This is the capital of the country of Harmony, and also the most prosperous place in this country. In the center of the city, there is a gigantic bonsai tree, upon which the mansion of the General of Wayno is built. At this moment, on the top floor of the mansion where repairs are underway, a grand banquet is taking place. Mwahahaha! What a splendid victory! Orochi sits on the general's seat, holding fine wine in one hand and embracing several elegantly dressed geishas, laughing strangely as they accompany him in merriment. He appears quite content at the moment, as the threat of Odin has finally been dealt with. At least for the time being, he no longer has to worry about being chopped into minced meat by a madman wielding two large swords while he sleeps. The terror he felt when Odin approached him with two long swords nearly scared him to death. If it weren't for the barrier created by Kurizumi Semimaru that blocked Odin's attack, he would have wet himself in fear. However, Kurizumi Higarashi suddenly spoke up beside him, Orochi, don't get too carried away. Remember, Odin is still alive. If they find a way to cure that plague of his, he will surely come to kill you. Hearing Kurizumi Higarashi's merciless words, the smile gradually faded from Oroki's face. His embrace of the two geishas, which had seemed so soft and indulgent, now seemed somewhat dull. The two beautiful geishas, who had been serving him wine while coquettishly chiding him, wisely withdrew a bit upon seeing the change in Oroki's demeanor. Why doesn't Kaido just take out Odin himself? Orochi raises his wine glass to his lips and drinks, his expression turning sour. He feels as if his heart has been broken, and tears even well up in his eyes. In his eyes, Kaido is the strongest man he has ever seen. In his mind, as long as he cooperates well with Kaido, they can easily eliminate Odin. No, Orochi, the reason Kaido is reluctant to take out Odin is because he's not sure of the outcome. Kurizumi Semimaru, who had been silent until now, suddenly spoke up alongside Kurizumi Higarashi. Not sure of the outcome. Orochi is puzzled. In his view, Kaido is the strongest man he has ever seen. With proper cooperation, they should have no trouble defeating Odin. That's right, Orochi. Don't forget, besides the beast pirates and the remnants of the Kazuki, there's another formidable group in Wano, the rebels of Hakamai. Their leader, Nicholas, alone is capable of holding his own against both Kaido and Odin. Not to mention Kuri also has nine red scabbards. If the beast pirates clash with the Kazuki remnants, even if they manage to crush them, the beast pirates will definitely suffer heavy losses. And if they provoke Hakamai, the beast pirates may not be a match for them. Higarashi is right, and Odin is not as weak as he appears. Once he contacts the Whitebeard or Roger pirates he used to serve with, it will be a devastating blow to the beast pirates. And the mastermind behind Hakamai is no less formidable than Roger or Whitebeard. Kurizumi Higarashi also chimed in, Odin having served on the same ship as Whitebeard in the past, they knew the terrifying power of that man. As for Nicholas, although he was inconspicuous during his time with the Rocks pirates, he should not be underestimated. Not to mention Roger, who became the pirate king. Perhaps Orochi, who has never set foot outside Wano, does not understand the weight of the title pirate king, but Kurizumi Higarashi and Kurizumi Semimaru are well aware of it. But. 
Just as Orochi was about to say something else, the head of the palace guards, Fukuro Kuju, approached and whispered something in his ear. What? In the palace on Onigashima, the top brass of the beast pirates are gathered for a banquet. Yu Yu, damn it. Shiki, you died so miserably. Yu Yu, and Roger, you bastard, since you reached Raftel, you must have become Joy Boy, but why did you disappear again? Do you know how I've been living these days? And you, Nicholas, you villain, you used to bully me in the Rocks Pirates, and now you're still bullying me in Wano, you you. Auburp. Kaido, who was initially normal, suddenly began to cry, looking extremely sad. Tears flowed uncontrollably down his cheeks, dropping in large droplets. He continued to cry as he drank his wine. Here we go again, Kaido. Queen couldn't help but complain. Queen, tell me the truth, is there really no way to cure Kaido's illness? King, looking at Kaido crying and laughing, asked Queen. Since returning from that time, and the news of Roger becoming the Pirate King came out, Kaido has been behaving abnormally, especially in recent times, he seemed to be getting sicker and sicker. Queen looked up at King, wiped his greasy mouth casually. No cure, no hope. Queen stopped himself just before saying goodbye, then looked at King earnestly. King, you know I used to work with Vegapunk in Vegapunk's laboratory. Although I didn't get a license, you have to believe in my professional integrity. King looked at Kaido crying and laughing again, then looked at Queen, chose not to speak, and started eating. For him, no matter what Kaido becomes, he is still his best big brother. Just like the bullfighter never takes off his mask, King never takes off his mask, even when eating. But eating requires opening one's mouth, so King came up with a genius solution. His mouth partially animalized while eating, turning into a long beak, then he picked up food from the table with it and retracted it, then started chewing. In general, people with a low sense of humor really have a hard time holding back, but in general. The members of the Beast Pirates will do their best to hold back, because those who really can't hold back have all been sent to Queen's Laboratory. Chapter 216 Kuri Daimyo Mansion, the home of Kazuki Odin. At this moment, the atmosphere here is very lively. In a spacious hall, a group of people are gathered together celebrating something. Mamanosuk, happy birthday. Father is sorry for coming back so late due to being busy. Here, this is your gift. See if you like it. Speaking is Kazuki Odin himself, holding up a white tiger in front of Mamanosuk. It is evident that this should be something he just found in the mountains of Kuri. Although Kazuki Odin cannot be considered a qualified ruler, he still does quite well in front of his family. Just as Kazuki Odin was preparing to celebrate Mamanosuk's birthday, a figure had quietly entered the Odin castle. Father, thank you. I really like it. Dressed in a kimono, Mamanosuk's face is full of smiles. This little devil is also very happy today because it's his birthday, which means he can receive many gifts. When will the banquet start, father? I'm hungry. Meanwhile, in the arms of Toki, a little girl looks at the sumptuous food on the table with eager eyes. Lord Hayori, the cake is ready and can be served at any time. Kinnaman, standing respectfully on the side, speaks with a serious expression. Obviously, on the solemn occasion of the young master's birthday banquet, he will maintain this solemn demeanor. Lord Mamanosuk, this cake was supervised and made by me from start to finish. I guarantee it will satisfy you. Denjiro laughs foolishly on the side, also very happy for Mamanosuk's birthday. He is happy not only for Mamanosuk but also because everyone can gather together again. Although nominally they are retainers of the Kazuki family, compared to the other guards in the Odin castle, they not only have a slightly higher status but are also, in a sense, considered family to Kazuki Odin. On the side, Kazuki Odin directly lifts Mamanosuk high in the air. Momo, happy birthday. In the air, Mamanosuk can't help giggling incessantly because today is his birthday. Soon, the atmosphere in the room becomes more lively, with Mamanosuk's laughter heard amidst various blessings and compliments. Meanwhile, the figure that infiltrated the daimyo mansion has already reached the ceiling of the hall. Although there were many patrolling samurai along the way, for her who has undergone systematic ninja training, everything is easy. 
So, that's Kazuki Odin, the extraordinary man of the land of Wano, who traveled overseas with the top pirates on the seas and underwent various trials, becoming a man several times stronger than before. He should have become the savior of the land of Wano and received the love of all the people as a wise ruler, but... Thinking of the scene she saw that day, the figure on the ceiling couldn't help but clench her fist. She knew that if it weren't for the despicable acts of Orochi and his people, the people of Flower Capital should have already welcomed liberation by now. Through the cracks in the ceiling, listening to the continuous laughter, it can be seen that the people below are celebrating something. What? Who goes there? Just as Kazuki Odin abruptly grabbed the chopsticks beside him and threw them towards the ceiling. With a bang, the wooden ceiling shattered, and large debris fell from the air. The several people who were celebrating Mamanosuk's birthday were obviously stunned. Kinemon and Kanshur immediately leaped up, blocking the falling debris with their bodies. Meanwhile, Kiku, Hoyori, and Mamanosuk were protected by Reis and the others. Mamanosuk was already stunned by the scene before him, sitting dumbfounded in place. Who are you, intruder? Kinemon shouted angrily, drawing his sword and looking towards the dust splashing up from the broken wooden ceiling. As the dust at the door gradually dispersed, a figure emerged. Seeing the figure that suddenly appeared, none of the people in the hall recognized who it was. Lord Odin. The figure that suddenly appeared kneels on the ground and bows to the direction of Odin. It's you, Shinobu. Kazuki Odin furrowed his brows for a long time before recognizing the person in front of him. Yes, Lord Odin, it's me. I knew Lord Odin would still remember me. Seeing that Kazuki Odin recognized her, Shinobu couldn't help but be excited. I remember you seem to be one of the attendants trained by my father in the past, right? How did you appear here? Lord Odin, the attendants of the Kazuki clan, including Fukuju and others, have betrayed the Kazuki clan and joined Orochi. Anyone unwilling to surrender has been eliminated. Hearing this, Kazuki Odin's pupils suddenly contracted, his face becoming very ugly. It can be imagined the resentment in the hearts of those loyal warriors who died before the Kazuki family. Lord Odin, it's not the time to talk about these things now. I received news from Orochi that they have sent people to negotiate an alliance with the traitors of Hakamai. Shinobu said urgently. What? Is what you said true? Hearing Shinobu's words, the entire hall exploded. It's already difficult for Kuri to resist the alliance of Orochi and Kaido. If they are also enticed by those people from Hakamai, then the Kazuki family might really be done for. What should we do about this? Kinemon paces anxiously. Meanwhile, Kanjur is also lost in thought, his face showing great concern. If what Shinobu said is true, then their troubles will be huge. Ha ha ha. Just when everyone was restless because of this news, Kazuki Odin burst into laughter. Lord Odin, it's already this time. How can you still laugh? Kikuzo looked at Odin, who was laughing out loud, with some reproach. Although he knew that his lord was unreliable, he shouldn't mess up at such a critical moment. When Odin stopped laughing, he said something that puzzled everyone. Don't worry, that guy won't do it. Holding June, Nicholas crumpled up the information sent by the emissary of Orochi and, with lightning surging in his hand, turned the letter into dust that scattered in the wind. Does he really prefer to die rather than seek help from Roger and Whitebeard? You know, if Whitebeard and Roger's pirate crews come here, after receiving the intelligence, the world government will send out the navy and its top forces to wipe out the land of Wano. And even we might have to hand over Hakamai. June rubbed her head against Nicholas' chest to make herself more comfortable. Hee <laughs> hee, the Roger pirates are now nowhere to be found, and as for Whitebeard, he's being closely watched by the marines and the world government. Do you believe that if the Roger pirates or Whitebeard pirates were to come to the land of Wano, the world government, upon receiving the intelligence, would immediately send out the navy and their top forces to wipe out the land of Wano? And even we might have to hand over Hakamai. I mean, that idiot, do you believe he'd rather die than let the world government know that he's here in the land of Wano? Well, well, you're a stupid bird, shitting all over the place again. Nicholas, who was originally discussing state affairs in a relaxed manner, 
was disrupted by a messy pile of fresh bird shit made of grey and white, and he was instantly thrown off track. And Nicholas' appearance naturally caused the beautiful woman in his arms to burst into laughter again. Chapter 217 Yo ho ho ho, Captain, long time no see. Brooke smiled as soon as he saw Nicholas. Brooke, you seem to be in a good mood. Looking at Brooke in front of him, Nicholas could feel the joy emanating from his soul. It can be said that after a person dies, their soul should enter the land of the dead. However, Brooke's soul, having consumed the yomi yomi no mi, is different. In order to exist in the world, Brooke's soul continuously emits powerful energy, making his soul almost indistinguishable from a physical body. This strong energy can even clearly convey Brooke's emotions to others, a resonance between souls. Of course, he can be severely injured indefinitely by Hakeen Seastone. But it can be said that unless there are means to attack the soul, it is almost impossible to eliminate Brooke. Yo ho ho ho, Captain, I had the Master Swordsmith of Wayno help me create a new cane sword. With this sword, I can use soul wrapping strikes to bring the cold air of the underworld into this world. After twirling the cane sword in his hand for a few rounds, Brooke said to Nicholas. Obviously, under Nicholas's guidance, his strength has made a leap. By the way, how is the progress on the development direction I mentioned to you? Nicholas wasn't particularly concerned about Brooke's ability to bring the air of the underworld into the world. Compared to the true potential of the Yomi Yomi Nomi, these were just minor details. Although there has been some progress, it's still difficult. After all, although I can sense it, it seems to be rejecting me. Currently, I can only borrow a little bit of the air of the underworld. As for the level you mentioned, it might take a lifetime. Brooke's upper and lower jawbones clashed continuously, indicating how close to eternal life he was. For Brooke to say such words, it showed how unreasonable Nicholas's demands were. Don't say such discouraged words. Since the Yomi Yomi Nomi chose you, then maybe you can achieve. Nicholas began to encourage Brooke. Simon watched the scene unfolding before him, and it didn't differ much from his own experiences. Nicholas, the devil. At the same time, Simon looked at Brooke, who was treading the same old path, with a look of pity, recalling the days when he himself was being encouraged by Nicholas. Just the bullets he fired alone could fill a mountain. But it had to be said that targeted intense training could indeed greatly increase proficiency. Although Simon had a talent for marksmanship, without that period of intense training, he might have reached his current level of marksmanship, but it would have taken several years longer. And Brooke had consumed the Yomi Yomi no Mi for decades, yet the extent of his fruit's development was not particularly high. Bearing the important role in Nicholas's plan, it was still quite necessary to spend time developing his abilities. Brooke, your development path mainly revolves around the Devil Fruit ability. I'm sure you're aware that the Yomi Yomi no Mi's ability is fundamentally different from other Devil Fruits. Other Devil Fruits rely on physical strength to activate. Once the user's physical strength is exhausted, the Devil Fruit ability becomes almost impossible to use. But the Yomi Yomi no Mi is different. Although I'm not entirely sure what it requires to activate, it obviously doesn't rely on physical strength. Nicholas looked at Brooke and said, after all, he was just a skeleton frame, without muscles or nerves. It was impossible for him to generate physical strength. Yo ho ho ho, it seems so. I am just a bone frame without flesh and blood. Brooke heard Nicholas's words and looked at his own body, emitting his iconic laughter. So I'll have someone prepare a large number of small animals for you to experiment with. Also, Simon, your physical strength, observation hockey, armament hockey, still have room for improvement. So I'll have someone prepare several shooting targets made of sea stone for you. And I'll notify Vista to spar with you to strengthen your martial arts. Simon was surprised at the suggestion, recalling Vista's figure punching a mountain with one punch, and without hesitation said, Captain, I'm just here to support you from behind, and my physical skills are already good. Three minutes later. Simon lay on the ground, his chest heaving violently, gasping for air, his greedy breaths making people worry if he would die the next second. The guards around were dumbfounded. Just now, they witnessed firsthand the whole process of Nicholas overwhelming Simon. It took less than three minutes. 
Without even seriously attacking, Nicholas made Simon collapse in exhaustion. Nicholas looked down at Simon lying on the ground, gasping for breath, and said, I didn't even try seriously, but you couldn't last three minutes. With such stamina, do you think you have enough? Do you know that although snipers have the advantage at long range, once a strong enemy gets close, can you only wait to die? Besides, although your marksmanship is indeed good, what if you run out of bullets? Do you just surrender? It had to be said that although Simon couldn't last three minutes against Nicholas, it was in close combat. Although the distance was negligible in terms of lightning speed, pulling away would make a difference. But he was already a top powerhouse in the sea, and it was quite impressive that Simon could reach this level. Simon looked at Nicholas with a black line on his face, wanting to say something, but in the end, he didn't say anything. Because he knew that with Nicholas's petty nature, if he argued back, the training volume would increase. Cough, you all train well. Also, Katie, although you're a chef, you're not a good chef if you can't fight. Looking at Katie bringing drinks to everyone, Nicholas also directly named her, leaving Katie in a daze. Then he looked at June standing next to Katie, uh, June, you're excused. Everyone was speechless the difference in treatment was too obvious. Time passed. In no time, half a month had passed. During the days and nights of helping small animals achieve enlightenment, Brooke's proficiency in his ability steadily increased. Although he was still far from Nicholas's requirements, there was progress after all. And while Simon and Katie's strength hadn't improved significantly, their stamina had clearly increased. On the sea outside Wayno country. A huge pirate ship was forced to stop on the sea surface by three ships flying the Hakamai's flag and pulled by giant goldfish. On the deck of the pirate ship, there were many pirates lying motionless. And the pirates, who were usually fierce and brutal on the high seas, were now being driven together like livestock to the center of the deck. Captain Clinton, what the hell is going on? On the deck, a pirate holding a weapon looked at the samurai surrounding them and couldn't help but ask. If it were an ordinary enemy, he would have started fighting without saying a word. But the problem now was that he couldn't win. There were over a dozen swordsmen who could cut through iron and use Busashoku hockey wrap swords, not to mention the three flying swordsmen who could use flying slash. Chapter 218 Central Deck Clinton and a group of pirates who got themselves surrounded looked pale as if they had acute appendicitis, cold sweat streaming down their faces. Speak, you bastards. Answer. Curse. Anything will do. Say something already. Even launching an attack directly would be fine. What's with this constant stalemate? Tick tock. The immense pressure caused beads of sweat to continuously appear on Clinton's forehead, sliding down his cheeks and dripping onto the damp deck, splashing into tiny water droplets. On the deck, the other pirates were no better clutching their weapons tightly with their hands, as if it were the only thing giving them a sense of security. The deck suddenly became very quiet. Anxiety permeated the air. But in the senses of Clinton and the other pirates, the few seconds that passed felt like an eternity. A strong will to survive was pushing Clinton to make a move. Move. Attack. Then, just as he finally mustered the courage to make a desperate attempt, he saw the incredibly powerful swordsman charging straight towards him. In almost an instant, he arrived beside Clinton, then swiftly pressed his hand against the sword at his waist. With a silver streak flashing, Clinton's body stiffened, then his pupils contracted sharply. Splurt! Without warning, a fine line of blood appeared on Clinton's neck, followed by a gush of blood spurting out. Eh! Clinton lowered his head, staring in astonishment at the gush of blood from his neck. With deep bewilderment, Clinton's head fell to the ground, and he instantly ceased breathing. Captain Clinton. How could this happen? Captain Clinton had a bounty of fifty million berries, and yet he's taken out with just one blow. We're done for. If Blood Queen Hillary finds out, we're dead. The surrounding pirates looked at the fallen Clinton as if they had lost their souls. We're done for now. Even the captain, who had a bounty of fifty million, was taken out with one move. What chance do we have? Not a single one spared. The leader pronounced the pirate's death sentence coldly, 
then turned away without paying any more attention to their fates. Behind him, his subordinates who had received the order began a one-sided massacre of the remaining pirates. In a moment, the deck was filled with cries of despair and agony. Soon, the massacre was completed, and the survivors began to move the pirate ship's goods onto the deck. With a simple calculation, including gold, silver, jewels, and merchandise, the value was at least tens of millions of berries, and even Clinton's head was not spared, as they had special means to exchange it for money. Soon, the giant goldfish pulled the ships away, leaving only one pirate ship drifting lonely on the sea. Captain, they have returned, and this time they wiped out a pirate crew and found something interesting in the cargo hold of the pirate ship. Simon looked at Nicholas and said. Interesting. What is it? Nicholas was curious. What could be so interesting that Simon described it as such? Yes, they found two mermaids in the cargo hold of this pirate ship. Simon smiled and nodded. Oh. Two mermaids. Not mermen. Nicholas was somewhat surprised. Yes, mermaids, not mermen. Mermaids had always been a valuable commodity in the slave market, and they were always a priority for protection in Ryugu Kingdom. It was unexpected that such a weak pirate crew could capture two mermaids. Moreover, they managed to escape safely from Fishman Island. Do you want to take a look? Simon asked. Yes. Nicholas nodded. He was also curious about how these two mermaids were captured. After all, ordinary mermaids rarely left Fishman Island. The chances of being caught outside Fishman Island were almost non-existent. Then, under Simon's lead, a giant fish tank was brought in from outside. Inside were two young mermaids, huddled together in the corner of the tank, looking despondent. They each wore the iconic slave collars around their necks. Nicholas looked at the two mermaids huddled together, their faces devoid of any light. Apparently, they also knew the bleak fate that awaited them in the hands of humans. Nicholas's gaze lingered on one of the mermaids' faces. There seemed to be a faint impression, but he couldn't recall it, like he had only seen her once but had no interaction with her. Perhaps it was the slight movement or the realization of Nicholas's gaze. One of the mermaids, who appeared older, slowly turned her head. Her eyes, which should have been as bright as gems but were now dull, met Nicholas's gaze. Just one glance. A burst of bright light emanated from the mermaid's eyes, and the gem-like eyes returned. It's you. There was an indescribable excitement in the mermaid's voice, and even her tail was constantly swaying in the water due to excitement. Seeing the mermaid's reaction, Nicholas furrowed his brow slightly and calmly asked, Do you know me? Nicholas's words made the mermaid's face freeze. But she quickly reacted, realizing that she had only seen the other party once and hadn't even spoken to him. At the banquet of Lord Neptune in Ryugu Castle, I served you. She gently reminded, seemingly in a good mood because of her survival. Oh, I remember now. The mermaid's reminder made Nicholas instantly remember the other party's origin. It turned out that she had served him at the banquet in Ryugu Castle. That made sense. What's going on? How were you captured? Was Fishman Island attacked? Fishman Island was indeed attacked. After Roger became the Pirate King, countless pirates poured in from the Grand Line. They attacked Fishman Island, and my sister and I just wanted to go out to buy some jewelry. The mermaid gently reached out and held the hand of the other mermaid, who seemed a little scared, facing Nicholas and recounting the situation. It seemed that recalling the scene at the time still filled her with fear. No need to say any more, I understand. Nicholas interrupted the mermaid's narrative. He could guess what had happened with a little thought. With Roger becoming the pirate king, coupled with various rumors, and the intentional or unintentional manipulation of the world government, everyone thought that Roger had obtained unimaginable wealth. Countless people set sail to find Roger and seize the treasure. As the gateway to the New World, Fishman Island was naturally the first target, and with the influx of countless pirates, the strength of the fishmen was no match for them. Moreover, many of these pirates were after wealth. So while Fishman Island was in chaos, the pirates naturally targeted the most valuable young mermaids on the island. Knowing that even if they couldn't find Roger, 
they could still make a hefty profit by capturing young and beautiful mermaids. Just thinking a little deeper, Nicholas could imagine how chaotic Fishman Island must have been after Roger became the Pirate King. Nicholas stepped forward, and the mermaid also floated up from the water's surface, looking at Nicholas at the edge of the fish tank. Nicholas fell silent for a moment, then reached out and removed the slave collar, which imprisoned their freedom, from the mermaid's neck. Now, you are free. Lord Nicholas. Seeing Nicholas help her remove the collar that imprisoned her freedom, tears welled up in the mermaid's eyes, suppressing a sob, she begged. Lord Nicholas, I know this is presumptuous, but. But. Can you help Fishman Island? Many of our sisters. Chapter 219 In front of him, the mermaid girl actually made such a request after regaining her freedom. It's as if. A drowning person finally grabbed hold of a straw, not knowing if it would help, but seeing it, they would cling to it desperate lie it's her last hope. At this moment. Tears welled up in the mermaid girl's eyes, her face filled with hope as she looked expectantly at the man in front of her, awaiting his answer. Go help Fishman Island. Is there even a need to think about this question? Of course. That night. At the banquet. Nicholas directly announced. Tomorrow morning, everyone will set sail for Fishman Island. What? The people at the dining table were astonished, including the mermaid named Lisa and her sister. Only Simon remained calm, having been prepared for this. However, Nicholas's decision to send everyone to Fishman Island still puzzled Simon. In Simon's opinion, with Vista on that side, a trip there could easily be handled. Captain. Is everyone going together? Vista, holding a huge roasted meat, looked at Nicholas sitting in the main seat with confusion. Others also looked at Nicholas with puzzlement. They didn't understand what was so important on Fishman Island that Nicholas would mobilize the entire crew. Even Stella, who had been with Nicholas and his crew for some time now, had a bit of trouble understanding. Because of her understanding, she knew what it meant for the entire Freedom Pirates crew to mobilize. Nicholas sliced the steak for June while casually saying, I'm the godfather of Neptune's daughter, so it's normal for me to help them if they're in trouble. Upon hearing Nicholas's reason, everyone was dumbfounded. Lisa, feeling a bit embarrassed, said weakly, Lord Nicholas, that King Neptune has only three heirs, not princesses. Seeing Nicholas being teased, his mouth twitched involuntarily, and he said helplessly. If there aren't any, then he will bear one. If he can't, then I'll personally go and chop his D. Seeing Nicholas's seemingly serious tone, both mermaid girls trembled. Looking at the frightened mermaids, Nicholas smiled and said, Haha, I'm just kidding. I'm not that violent. Lisa was speechless, thinking that his previous tone didn't sound like a joke at all. What about Kaido and Orochi? If they know that our main force is leaving, will they attack Ueno? Vista asked. They dare. I don't care about their fights, but if they dare to attack my rear while I'm away, I'll come back and turn their ashes into dust. One week later. Under the sea, 10,000 meters below. Fishman Island, enveloped in a huge bubble, hung quietly above the sea floor. The sunlight transmitted through the roots of the sun tree, even reaching the depths of the sea where Fishman Island was located, providing it with the light of life. However, no matter how warm the sunlight was, it couldn't dispel the gloom shrouding the entire Fishman Island. It could be said that during this period, life was extremely difficult for both the fishmen of Fishman Street and the merfolk of Ryugu Palace. Even some of the more remote Fishman Island residents dared not venture outside. Since Roger became the Pirate King, pirates seemed to have gone mad, rushing from all directions towards Fishman Island like they were seeking death. Coupled with the lack of top-tier experts to defend Fishman Island, and the sheer number of pirates arriving, the security checkpoint set up at the entrance of Fishman Island had completely lost its meaning. After being broken through by pirates three times, it was never rebuilt. And with the security checkpoint at the entrance of Fishman Island being breached, more and more pirates could easily enter Fishman Island without resorting to riskier illegal entry methods. 
The influx of a large number of pirates, as well as the tight military situation of the Fishman Island Kingdom, had made many streets and towns in Fishman Island chaotic, attracting a large number of slave hunting teams. To avoid being hunted by slave hunting teams and pirates, many merfolk directly hid in the depths of the coral apartments. Every day, countless mermaid girls suffered. And their fate, naturally, didn't need much explanation. Fishman Island, Ryugu Palace. This was where the royal family of Fishman Island resided. Located at the top of Fishman Island, where it could receive the best sunlight, was a large, luxurious palace built and decorated with large coral reefs and various other underwater materials. At the top was a majestic dragon perched on a throne. Inside the palace, the king of Fishman Island, wearing a crown and wielding a trident, a sea knight even larger and more muscular than the strongest tiger shark fishman, Neptune, sat on the throne. At the foot of the throne, stood a catfish fishman wearing a hat, a monocle over his left eye, and holding a bullhorn cane in his right hand. He was the left minister of Ryugu Palace. King Neptune. Coral Hill, King Square, and Watermill Town in the southeast have been occupied by a large number of pirates, and a large number of pirates have gathered outside Ryugu Palace. Although we have repelled multiple attacks from the enemy, the losses have been severe. If this continues, what should we do? The left minister bowed his head, his face filled with sorrow, clearly troubled by the current situation of Fishman Island. On the right side of the left minister stood a seahorse fishman holding a crescent moon long knife. He was the right minister of Ryugu Palace. At this moment, his arm was bandaged, and his head was also simply bandaged. It was evident that this right minister had suffered quite a few injuries recently. King Neptune, with our current situation, we can still hold off the attackers for another month. Another month, huh? Neptune furrowed his brow, sighing, but what about after that? With a tight grip on his fists, Neptune's face darkened as he said, in the end, we are too weak. If Fishman Island had powerhouses like Whitebeard or Roger. Just then, a guard hurriedly entered the palace, approaching the throne. All the people in the hall, including Neptune, looked at the guard. The guard's face was grave as he looked up at Neptune sitting on the throne. King Neptune, just now, the spy stationed at the entrance to the corridor saw the flag of the big MOM pirates. Hearing this, Neptune's expression changed. If other pirates were just smelling blood and gathering to feast on Fishman Island, then the big Moem pirates were undoubtedly monstrous creatures capable of swallowing Fishman Island whole. The ministers in the palace, upon hearing this news, also had their expressions changed drastically. Veins bulged on Neptune's forehead. Darn it! Neptune slammed his fist on the armrest of the throne, gritting his teeth, do they all think that Fishman Island is easy to bully? Hearing this, both the left and right ministers remained silent. For humans, Fishman Island might indeed be easy to bully. If it weren't for Fishman Island being located in the deep sea and unsuitable for long-term human habitation, Fishman Island would have been renamed already. Chapter 220 To eliminate the threat from the pirates, it seems that apart from seeking the protection of a major pirate in the New World, there is no other way. As for the marines, ha! Although Fishman Island is located just above the Sabaidi Archipelago, not far from the world government central hub, Mary Geos, and the marine headquarters in Marineford, Neptune knows that humans have quite a prejudice against fishmen. Even though Fishman Island established diplomatic relations with the world government hundreds of years ago, in the eyes of humans, the merfolk and fishmen of Fishman Island are still nothing more than variants of fish, with the only difference being that the previous discrimination was overt, and now it might be somewhat subdued. But that's about it. As a key entry point for pirates into the New World, the Sabaidi Archipelago and Fishman Island status in the eyes of the world government are as different as night and day. Amidst his contemplation, Neptune also began to seriously consider which major pirate in the New World should seek protection from. The Roger pirates were naturally ruled out. If Fishman Island were to fly the Roger Pirates flag now, not only would there be no protection, but it would also bring about a huge crisis for Fishman Island. Not long ago, 
when the Roger Pirates came to Fishman Island to take away that piece of historical text, Neptune also learned about the general situation of the Roger Pirates. Apart from Roger, Whitebeard seemed like a good choice. In terms of strength, Whitebeard was undoubtedly a figure standing at the pinnacle of the seas, and with the strength of the Whitebeard Pirates in the New World, Whitebeard's flag could definitely protect Fishman Island. After all, the pirates coming to Fishman Island were ultimately heading for the New World. And the most important point was that Whitebeard had a good reputation. Even if Fishman Island sought his protection, there would be no need to worry about oppression. So Whitebeard ascended to the top of Neptune's list of candidates. But the problem now was that Fishman Island couldn't contact Whitebeard for the time being. And the members of the Big Mom Pirates had already landed on Fishman Island at this critical juncture, and it seemed that the Big Mom Pirates had come to provide protection to Fishman Island. According to the frontline intelligence, after the ships of the Big Mom Pirates landed on Fishman Island, they headed towards Euro Plaza, and those pirates who occupied Coral Hill. Watermill Town, and scattered throughout Fishman Island are now flocking to Euro Plaza, seemingly receiving orders from the Big Mom Pirates. The guard continued to report the information just received from the informant. Hearing this, Neptune's headache worsened. Originally, if it were just the Big Mom Pirates, Fishman Island still had some bargaining power. Perhaps negotiations could be delayed until contact was made with Whitebeard. But now, with the news that the pirates from Coral Hill and other places were gathering towards Euro Plaza, this hope was almost non-existent. With the high-end combat power of the Big Mom pirates, combined with the pirates on Fishman Island now gathering their strength, they were already enough to directly break through the Ryugu Palace. Indeed, facing the pirate forces gathering at Euro Plaza with the military force of the Ryugu Palace, they couldn't even manage to defend unilaterally. I understand. You may leave. Neptune took a deep breath. Right Minister. After the guard left, Neptune looked at the Right Minister, who was under the throne, and ordered. Immediately send someone to inform the guards of Fishman Island, and try to avoid conflicts with the people of the Big Mom Pirates as much as possible. Also, send someone, or even you personally, to meet with the Big Mom Pirates, invite the person in charge to the Ryugu Palace. Remember, no matter what their intentions are, we must not act aggressively. Yes. Although he knew that this might be a mission with no return, the right minister still agreed and immediately went to arrange it. After the right minister left the palace, the left minister looked up at Neptune, hesitatingly asking, Your Majesty, we were about to prepare for a desperate battle, why did Your Majesty decide to surrender first? Neptune remained silent for a moment, then sighed, Perhaps this is the only way to resolve the crisis. Our strength on Fishman Island is too weak, and I dare not gamble. But the other party is the Big Mom Pirates. The left minister was about to continue speaking, considering that Big Mom's reputation in the New World wasn't too good. I know. Neptune interrupted the left minister. As far as I know, the captain of the Big Mom Pirates, Charlotte Lin Lin, has always intended to establish a utopia in the Totland Sea, and fishmen are undoubtedly able to occupy a place in it. As long as we express our willingness to submit, the people of the Big Mom Pirates shouldn't go too far. And the most important thing is that with Big Mom's power, she has the ability to protect us on Fishman Island. Actually, Fishman Island's strength was still quite strong. Whether it was the mere folk or the fishmen, their racial talents were quite good. An ordinary fishman already had strength tens of times greater than an ordinary human, not to mention the special races among the fishmen. But all of this was compared to ordinary humans. Humans who had undergone continuous training could easily handle fishmen, just like handling ordinary humans. And the pirates who could reach Fishman Island from the Sabaeity Archipelago were naturally not ordinary people, so Fishman Island was in a very awkward situation. And as the king of Fishman Island, due to the strength problem of Fishman Island, Neptune could only watch as the situation became more and more serious and deteriorated. In fact, he was very clear. If the situation couldn't be improved, Fishman Island would eventually reach its end, it was only a matter of time. After all, mermaid girls were good toys, and fishmen were excellent slaves. For the vast population of the world, Fishman Island was indeed very weak. 
And it was precisely because he saw through this that Neptune began to entertain the idea of seeking protection from a pirate crew. After all, in Fishman Island and the New World, the title of a top pirate had more deterrence power than the Marine headquarters. It sounded like a joke from hell, but that was the reality. Suddenly, Neptune furrowed his brow, feeling like the light in the entire palace had dimmed in an instant. You, you. How could you be here? Upon hearing the right minister's startled cry, Neptune and the left minister in the hall immediately tensed up, subconsciously looking towards the direction of the hall door. However, the view was blocked by the door, and they couldn't see what was happening outside. Just as they were wondering what was going on outside, they saw the right minister, with a serious expression, retreat into the hall, gripping his weapon nervously as he looked outside. Neptune realized that something was wrong, stood up suddenly, and grabbed the huge trident placed aside, his gaze serious as he looked towards the direction of the hall door. Right minister, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? The left minister, now also anxious, repeated his words, but much faster this time, with his habit of repeating words still evident. Neptune Majesty. Nicholas has come outside. What? Seeing the right minister struggling to articulate, Neptune's brow furrowed even more tightly, feeling a very ominous premonition. The left minister hurriedly stood protectively in front of Neptune, his expression tense as he looked towards the hall door. This was almost an instinctive action for him, although his strength might not even be enough to withstand a single blow from Neptune's trident, but it didn't affect his loyalty. Chapter 221 At the same time, a voice with high discernibility came from outside the hall. Is this how the Ryugu Palace City treats its guests? No wonder the Four Seas King, who once had a reputation throughout the world, can't even protect Fishman Island. Who? Upon hearing that voice, Neptune's gaze sharpened. He didn't expect to get much feedback from the right minister, who was clearly frightened and unable to articulate properly. Tap tap tap. The person outside didn't answer, but step by step, walked into the hall. Neptune and the left minister stared. The newcomer wore a blue suit, with sharp facial features and a heroic aura between his eyebrows. What was even more outrageous was the cape behind him, bearing the word justice. It seemed that it belonged to at least a rear admiral in rank. Although there was a gentle smile on his face, the powerful aura emanated from him was undeniable. Following him were several individuals who clearly weren't minor characters. You are. With just one glance, Neptune recognized the newcomer's identity, his face suddenly changing drastically as he exclaimed, Nicholas. Why is this man here? Why didn't the perimeter alert of Fishman Island or the soldiers outside the Ryugu Palace City warn us? Seeing Nicholas appear in the Ryugu Palace City without warning, the left minister standing in front of Neptune couldn't help but feel on the verge of madness. Nicholas being able to appear here without any hindrance implied that if he wanted to eliminate the mermaid royal family, it would be a simple task. Before the conjectures could even form, considering some information Neptune and he received, the entire situation made him tremble uncontrollably. Oh, Neptune, how could you forget to notify the godfather of your daughter? I, as her future godfather, feel greatly aggrieved by such a major incident happening in her family. Hearing Nicholas' words, Neptune and the left minister's eyes narrowed. But what followed from the right minister's mouth made both of them feel their blood pressure skyrocket, to the point where if Neptune were a pufferfish merman, he'd probably have exploded by now. Your Majesty Neptune, the guards of the Ryugu Palace City have been killed by these people. The right minister shouted in a mix of grief and indignation. He had intended to carry out Neptune's orders, but just after leaving the hall, he witnessed the arrival of the royal edict from the sky. Before he could react, he saw all the guards of the Ryugu Palace City falling down. Nicholas, how dare you do such a thing? Obviously, the deaths of the Ryugu Palace City guards had provoked Neptune's wrath. Driven by anger, Neptune disregarded the disparity in their strengths and lunged towards Nicholas with his trident in hand. Nicholas first glanced at the right minister, whose strength was comparable to that of a weakling, then calmly looked at Neptune charging towards him. He shook his head slightly. The person in charge of the military force of the Ryugu Palace City can't even tell life from death. 
That's why I said, the Fishman Island these days is really declining. With these words, invisible ripples spread rapidly through the hall, enveloping Neptune and others in an instant, rendering them seemingly trapped in a monochrome world. The Reich Minister, responsible for the military might of the Ryugu Palace City, had his eyes roll back and collapsed to the ground unconscious in the face of the unseen impact. Shortly after, the left minister, with virtually unlimited negative fighting strength, almost simultaneously followed suit, falling unconscious beside the right minister. Neptune trembled and abruptly stopped, his expression extremely grave as he stared at Vista standing beside Nicholas, his voice heavy as he said, Hockey. Conqueror's Hockey. Exactly. Nicholas, with his hands in his pockets, casually replied, So rest assured, those outside are just knocked out. Also, I'm curious about one thing. It seems you harbor great animosity toward my appearance here. Can you tell me what's going on, Neptune? Nicholas came to stand in front of Neptune and asked. He wasn't a fool. Upon arriving at the Ryugu Palace City, he had sensed something was off. The attitudes of Neptune and the left and right ministers further confirmed this. You. Just as Neptune was about to say something, Nicholas glanced at the scene outside the hall. Here come two familiar faces. Sensing the scene outside, with two auras rapidly approaching the palace, clearly startled by the commotion from earlier. What are you here for, Nicholas? With a headscarf, thick curly hair, a broad mouth, a slight stubble on the upper lip, and a few whiskers on his chin, Fisher Tiger. Staring at the somewhat embarrassed whale shark henchman, then stared coldly at Nicholas, seemingly waiting for his answer. As an explorer among the fish men, Tiger naturally knew Nicholas, but even though he was well aware of Nicholas' reputation and strength, he couldn't afford to back down in terms of aura and stance. He knew that once he backed down, he would lose the initiative. I already told you, I came to Fishman Island for the sake of my future goddaughter. I will help you deal with all the pirates on the island, but before that, I want an answer. What do you want to do? Neptune realized something, and veins popped out at the corners of his eyes. It's nothing much, just curious about what information you've got, Neptune, that makes you so hostile toward me. Listening to Nicholas and Neptune's conversation, Fisher Tiger's expression became solemn, and the still-spirited whale shark fishman, after casting a glance at the leader, also put on a serious expression. Chapter 222 this time, upon hearing Nicholas's words, Neptune fell into rare silence. Nicholas saw Neptune's reaction and smiled, then sat cross-legged on the ground and asked, Neptune, although I don't know what you're worried about. If we can't overcome the current crisis in Fishman Island, what's the point of talking about the future? Crisis? What crisis? Hearing about the situation on Fishman Island, the whale shark fishman, though uncertain, gathered his courage and asked about it immediately. The pirate crisis. Nicholas shook his head slightly and then looked at the whale shark young man, who would one day be renowned across the seas for his chivalry. He said seriously, currently, there are around 30,000 pirates on Fishman Island, and these pirates aren't ordinary people. I think you understand what that means, young man. 30,000 pirates. The face of the whale shark fishman displayed a solemn expression, clearly recognizing the destructive power that 30,000 pirates could wield. It could be said that these 30,000 pirates could completely overthrow the entire Fishman Island. Nicholas, according to Shirely's prophecy, you will drag Fishman Island into war, and... Forget it, I won't mention that, so that's why we're wary of you. In the end, Neptune decided to be straightforward with Nicholas. After all, Fishman Island was currently in a major crisis, and as Nicholas had said, if they couldn't even get through this, what future could they hope for? I drag Fishman Island into war. Nicholas pointed at himself somewhat baffled. According to the normal flow of prophecies, shouldn't it be some brat shouting revolutionary slogans who destroys Fishman Island? Why did it become his responsibility to plunge Fishman Island into war? Did he steal the prophet's job? But soon Nicholas realized. Actually, Neptune's perspective wasn't entirely wrong. If he were to confront the world government and the celestial dragons, then the Sea Kings, being a formidable weapon, would definitely be utilized. In that sense, yes, he would indeed drag Fishman Island into war. 
If you don't even have this awareness, Neptune, then you might as well lead the fishman tribe to cower at the bottom of the sea for the rest of your life. Nicholas shook his head slightly and calmly stated. What do you mean by that? Does Fishman Island not have the right to pursue freedom? I believe that as long as the people on the surface feel the sincerity of the people of Fishman Island. One day we fishmen will be able to move freely on the surface, enjoying the sunlight and breathing the air above the sea just like other nations. At that moment, a firm voice echoed from behind the Great Hall, followed by a woman with cascading golden waves of hair, blue eyes, and wearing a robe patterned with fish scales, accompanied by three mermaids, emerged from behind the hall. You are Princess Odoheim. Nicholas furrowed his brow, pondering for a while before uncertainly asking. After all, in the world of pirates, unless someone had a particularly distinctive appearance, identifying individuals could be quite challenging for Nicholas, transitioning from the world of manga to reality had its difficulties. If it weren't for those three clearly distinctive princes, Nicholas wouldn't have been so sure. Would you like to talk about your ideals with the pirates at Giant Court Square? See if there's a chance for Neptune to have another half-human, half-mermaid child. Nicholas looked at the mermaid with a compassionate and merciful tone. Neptune, feels somewhat offended. While Princess Odoheim initially wanted to retort, she was promptly stopped by Neptune, realizing that if she went to Giant Court Square and advocated her ideals, it could very well lead to an unwanted confrontation, or even a scandal. Despite already having three children, Neptune couldn't help but worry about potential affairs. It's impossible. Even if those pirates are unable to communicate, I believe the world government and others can. Princess Odoheim continued, still unwilling to give up. For her, the goal she had fought for her entire life was for the residents of Fishman Island to enjoy the same freedom as those on the surface, basking in sunlight and breathing the air above the sea. Status is earned by the fist, not by seeking pity from others. Pity can bring you respect, but it can also be easily taken away. Just like 800 years ago in Fishman Island, it was not pity from others that granted them their status, but it was earned by the sea kings who roamed the four seas and the mighty warriors who fought with their fists. With each word spoken by Nicholas, Princess Odoheim's complexion grew paler, while Tager, Neptune, and some unknown whale shark youngsters' expressions turned increasingly grim. Unlike Princess Odoheim, who had never interacted with the outside world, they were well aware of how the world viewed fishmen. Moreover, in recent times, due to the large number of pirates infiltrating Fishman Island, young mermaids were being abducted by pirates and human trafficking organizations almost every day. With many fishmen, especially the elderly and female fishmen, being killed or captured by pirates on a daily basis. Compared to beautiful mermaids, the value of fishmen, especially elderly and female fishmen, was significantly lower. At the same time, at the Sabaidi Archipelago base of the Don Quixote family. Treble, Lao Ji, Senor, and Giala stood in front of the slave capturing team, inspecting today's haul. He he he, this time's catch is really good. We've got five mermaids, thirty male fishmen, including a tiger shark fishman, and twenty female fishmen. I think we'll make quite a bit of profit this time. I wonder how long this business can continue. It's said that there are already major pirates eyeing Fishman Island in the New World. Senor spoke nonchalantly, clearly skeptical about the Don Quixote family's slave trade on Fishman Island. We're not worried about that. What we need to do now is help the young master accumulate resources and then head to the New World to help him reclaim what's rightfully his and assist him in taking the throne. Giala nodded as she registered the information, her tone determined. Meanwhile, on a deserted street not far from Giant Court Square, a group of imposing pirates walked confidently down the empty street. Leading them was a woman of exceptional stature and strength. It's quite desolate here. The woman wore a peculiar lady's hat, carried a massive and formidable scythe on her back, and had a mane of blood-red hair swaying wildly behind her. She wore pink boots with floral patterns. This woman was none other than the infamous Blood Lady, Hillary, with a bounty of 132 million berries. Katakuri, the pirates on the island are heading towards Giant Court Square. When should we go? No need to rush right now, it's not us who should be in a hurry. Seated atop a building, 
Katakuri glanced towards the direction of the Ryugu Palace with a calm demeanor. Chapter 223 Upon hearing Katakuri's words, Charlotte Smoothie, who was only in her teens but looked quite mature, was somewhat puzzled. As representatives of the Big Mom pirates sent to handle affairs on Fishman Island, shouldn't they be leveraging the power of those pirates to completely tear apart the island's defenses? Declare Fishman Island under the control of the Big Mom pirates, and hoist the flag of the Big Mom pirates. Fishman Island can be said to be quite close to the influence of the Navy. Relatively speaking, it is also quite far from the influence of major pirate powers in the New World. But due to its unique geographical location, over the past decade, a steady stream of pirates heading from Fishman Island to the New World has brought quite a bit of trouble to Fishman Island. However, it has also brought about vigorous economic development. After all, many pirate crews arriving at Fishman Island are mostly alone, and the strength of a single pirate crew is not enough to threaten Fishman Island. Instead, they fear offending Fishman Island because if Fishman Island sets its sights on them, they could end up at the bottom of the sea. So the pirate crews that come to Fishman Island are quite well behaved. Over time, Fishman Island has gradually grown into a ripe fruit emitting an enticing aroma. Now, with Roger becoming the Pirate King, the influx of a large number of pirates has disrupted this balance. While a single pirate crew may not be able to harm Fishman Island, what about ten or a hundred pirate crews uniting? So, with more and more pirates on Fishman Island, this ripe fruit, which lacks significant defensive capabilities and emits an enticing aroma, has been placed before everyone. When Fishman Island realized what was happening, it was already too late. Even if they tried to close the entrance to Fishman Island, it wouldn't work. Soon after closing it, pirates would forcibly break through. It can be said that Fishman Island has now become a feast for pirates. Even Charlotte Lin Lin, who was far away in the New World, had her eyes on Fishman Island, the furthest but most delicious cake. For this reason, she dispatched her top executives and the most outstanding creation of the Charlotte family, Charlotte Katakuri, along with hundreds of formidable subordinates, to take over this cake. This shows how seriously Charlotte Lin Lin regards this operation. Katakuri, what should we do with those pirates once Fishman Island is under our control? Should we kill them all? Looking at Katakuri, the most reliable among all her brothers, Charlotte Smoothie asked. In several of Charlotte's expeditions, Katakuri had proved his strength and reliability with his actions. No need. Let's wait and see the reaction from Ryugu Castle first. If they don't send anyone to contact us, then we'll send these pirates to put pressure on Ryugu Castle. Afterwards, we'll gather these pirates under our banner. Although they are useless, they still have some value. Katakuri said, shifting his gaze from Ryugu Castle to the direction of Giant Cord Plaza not far away. They were here to claim territory, not to destroy Fishman Island. So if those guys from Fishman Island were sensible, he didn't mind helping Fishman Island solve its problems if they weren't sensible, he didn't mind killing the Fishman Island royal family and finding someone else to rule over Fishman Island. After a moment without a messenger from Ryugu Castle, Katakuri also leaped down from the rooftop and headed towards Giant Court Plaza. Behind him were a group of sailors who didn't look particularly handsome and could even be described as ugly, but they exuded considerable strength. These people were quite noticeable as they walked, clearly not to be trifled with. On a street not far from Ryugu Castle, there was a group of dozens of pirates. They had been roaming near Ryugu Castle, hoping to find a stranded mermaid maiden and help her live a good life with a wealthy master on the surface. But luck was not on their side, as they hadn't come across any lost mermaid maidens. Now they were planning to head towards Giant Court Plaza, hoping to seize the opportunity to curry favor with the Charlotte family. As they passed a junction, they noticed a burly figure and someone carrying a gun emerging from Ryugu Castle in the distance. The leader, a burly pirate with a black eye patch, a red headband, and a cutlass in hand, widened his eyes as soon as he saw Vista. Damn it, is it not just the big mom pirates, but those guys too. They've set their sights on this place too. The old brother almost immediately took a classic sidestep without even saying hello, quickly slipping into an alleyway, his face changing constantly. The other pirates, seeing the old brother's actions before they could react, 
quickly recognized the figure emerging from Ryugu Castle and had a drastic change in expression, quickly slipping into the alleyway as well. That guy just now, he's one of the top executives of the Freedom Pirates. Vista the Solar Blaze. And the one next to him seems to be Simon the Reaper. I remember that guy's bounty, it seems to be over a billion berries. Vista's is 1,230,000,000, and Simon's is 250,000,000. Damn it, they're both opponents we can't afford to provoke. Since even the top executives have been dispatched, those guys must have already considered Fishman Island as theirs. What should we do? Should we still go to the plaza? If you're tired of living, go ahead. Anyway, I'm not planning to get involved in this. Damn it, just look at the lineup on both sides. If we go, we don't even know how we'll die. Are we just going to give up like this? I'm not satisfied. Being dissatisfied won't do anything. That level of confrontation, if we get involved, it's a dead end. Money is a good thing, but it's not worth dying for. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of toilet paper that's too hard to wipe your butt with. Anyway, I'm not planning to get involved. What about you guys? It can be said that they are a small group, and such decisions about whether to go or stay must be put to a vote. The result came quickly, with one abstention and the rest choosing to leave although they were outlaws, they weren't idiots without brains. The pirate who was dissatisfied slammed the wall with his fist, apparently unable to refute his companion's decision. Excuse me, could you please tell me which way Giancord Plaza is? Just as the group was about to leave, a voice suddenly came from the alley entrance. Upon hearing this voice, everyone in the alley stood still, and some even dared not to move their feet. Uh, it's... that way. Finally, someone gave the direction. Oh, thank you. After the voice faded away, the people in the alley dared to move again, but all wore expressions of lingering fear. Apparently, the simple conversation just now was like a brush with death for them. Giant Cord Plaza this was the largest square on the entire Fishman Island and was also one of the most prosperous areas of Fishman Island in the past. The entire Giant Cord Plaza was wide and flat, surrounded by layers of stacked rocks with coral reefs on top, decorating the plaza like a dreamland. In the center of Giant Cord Plaza stood a coral reef towering several meters high. Standing on this coral reef at the moment was the famous Blood Princess of the Blood Pirates, Hillary with a bounty of 132 million berries. Captain, once we capture Ryugu Castle, you'll surely be able to capture enough mermaid maidens for your blood baths. By then, you'll become the most beautiful person on the seas. Ha ha ha, of course. Hillary laughed heartily like a humanoid gorilla. Chapter 224 As time passed, more and more pirates gathered in the square. Among them, some came for the treasures in the Ryugu Castle, some came for the famously beautiful mermaid princesses, and some came for both. As for the fishmen, forget it. What use are those guys besides being able to work as laborers? Ha ha ha, I didn't expect so many people to show up. What a grand scene. We can break into Ryugu Castle this time. The treasures and women will all be ours, ha uh ha. -huh. Just as the pirate finished speaking, he was shot in the head, and as the sudden gunshot echoed, many people in the square looked over with curiosity. The person who fired the gun just blew the smoke from the muzzle and calmly said, Remember, don't be too arrogant without strength. How dare some guy who popped out of nowhere try to compete with us? You should take a look at your reflection on the puddle after peeing. The surrounding pirates of the one who was shot dead didn't say a word, as the shooter behind them was the head of a medium-sized pirate group of hundreds. And the captain's bounty was over a billion, making it impossible for their kind of pirate group to provoke. Soon, this incident was ignored, and most of the pirates in the square were getting restless. In their view, the remnants of the Ryugu Castle army were no longer a threat to them. As long as they could break into Ryugu Castle, even the big pirates wouldn't be able to take all the treasures accumulated in Ryugu Castle for countless years and the mermaids inside. By then, even if they just picked up some leftovers, it would be enough for them to live carefree for a long time. Thinking of this, most of the pirates in the square looked towards the woman standing on the coral reef. She was the famous blood princess of the blood pirates, Hillary, with a bounty of 132 million berries. 
As long as she was there, there was still bargaining power with the sudden arrival of the Charlotte family. So that's the blood Princess Hillary. With a bounty of over 100 million. As for that woman, is she really that strong? Heh, I've seen that woman fight with my own eyes. When she turned into a gorilla, she tore apart two medium-sized pirate groups with her hands. Her whole body was soaked in blood. Otherwise, how do you think she got the nickname Blood Princess? Is it true? Many people have seen it with their own eyes. Could it be fake? And don't attract that woman's attention. Why not? If you attract that woman's attention, you might be taken as a male pet by her. I heard that when that woman is in bed, once she gets a feeling, she turns into a gorilla. So. Upon hearing this, the pirates who were just curious about Hillary quickly looked down at their feet. A ten meter tall, muscular female gorilla would be deadly, especially considering Hillary's size, even if she didn't turn into a gorilla, she would be deadly in close combat. Hey, look over there. Just then, someone suddenly pointed to the entrance of Giancord Plaza and shouted loudly. And with the shout, everyone's gaze turned towards the entrance of the plaza, where Katakuri was leading Smoothie and the Charlotte family's men. So, Katakuri, I'll go now. Egg Baron moved forward in the eyes of everyone, his gaze scanning the pirates on the square. The pirates noticed Egg Baron's movements and looked over. Facing the many eyes, Egg Baron said loudly, Tell me, what do you want on Fishman Island? Do you even need to ask? Of course, it's treasure. And beautiful mermaids. The pirates raised their weapons and responded loudly to Egg Baron's question. Egg Baron said solemnly, Treasure, women, everything you want is in Ryugu Castle. As long as you break into Ryugu Castle, you will get everything you want. And as long as you enter the new world, you have the qualifications to join our Big Mom pirate group. Break into Ryugu Castle. Break into Ryugu Castle. Seize the princess. Seize the princess. Hearing the inciting words, the pirates raised their weapons and shouted excitedly. Just as Egg Baron was looking coldly at the excited pirates, a gunshot suddenly rang out from above the rocky outcrop not far away. A bullet flew downward, cutting through the air, heading straight for Egg Baron. Hee <laughs> hee. Egg Baron was already prepared for such an attack mentally, after all, pirates couldn't be measured by common sense, and there were always one or two fools who would try something stupid. After seeing the trajectory of the bullet clearly, he sneered. If they thought this shot could take him down, it was truly laughable, and incredibly stupid. While expecting to dodge the bullet, Egg Baron simply tilted his head slightly, allowing the bullet to graze his temple. Ha! Huh. What's this? Just as Egg Baron thought he would dodge the bullet, his eyes caught an unbelievable scene as the bullet's trajectory suddenly changed without warning, then directly pierced into his temple. Puff! Egg Baron's body shook suddenly, and a splash of blood sprayed from his head. The impact of the bullet even made his step stagger involuntarily. A bullet that can change direction. Although his body was tilting towards the ground, and his head was in intense pain, Egg Baron's mind kept turning, only to see the bullet's trajectory change without warning, then directly pierce into his temple. Although his body was falling towards the ground and his head was in intense pain, Egg Baron's mind kept pondering over who might be the shooter. Egg Baron's body heavily crashed onto the square, kicking up only a trace of dust. Seeing Egg Baron suddenly shot, the pirates in the square were shocked beyond belief. They couldn't imagine that someone would attack a member of the Big Mom pirate group, and seemingly even shoot him dead with one shot. Immediately after, an even more astonishing scene unfolded. Yes, absolutely correct. The body of Egg Baron, who was already dead, suddenly split open violently, and then a figure leaped out from within. Chirp. Chirp, chirp. At this moment, his facial features transformed into a chick-like appearance, his suit turned into a symbol of chick feathers with a yellow color, and his hands transformed into wings. But the expression on that chick face revealed his extreme terror. The trembling voice and the expression of terror completely exposed Egg Baron's fear in front of the many pirates. What is he saying? Is this it? Is this it? Is this what the Big Mom pirate group is? 
the pirates found it difficult to understand Egg Baron's bizarre reaction. Seeing Egg Baron's expression as if he were frightened by something, only the ten-year-old Charlotte Smoothie frowned, feeling that Egg Baron was behaving somewhat improperly. After all, he represented not himself but the Charlotte family. And when Smoothie looked towards Katakuri beside her, she realized that Katakuri wasn't looking at Egg Baron, but was staring straight at the figure standing on the rocks around Giant Court Plaza. Following Katakuri's gaze, Smoothie also saw two figures standing there. Smoothie, run. Before Smoothie could speak, Katakuri said to her gravely. Katakuri, brother. It could be said that during the time Smoothie spent training with Katakuri, she had never seen Katakuri like this. Even though Katakuri's bounty was over 500 million, he had never shown fear before. Now that these two have appeared, that guy must be here too. What? Hearing the trembling voice of the pirates, many of them were momentarily at a loss for words. The Scorching Sun and the Grim Reaper Simon are here, so Nicholas must have come too. Upon hearing this, the faces of all the pirates, including Hillary, reflexively showed expressions of horror. The square suddenly fell silent. If what the pirate said was true. Then, they could perhaps understand Egg Baron's bizarre reaction. Only monsters like Nicholas from the New World could give Egg Baron such immense pressure, after all, they were just representing Big Mum in coming to Fishman Island, while the other party might have come in person. At the entrance of Giant Cord Plaza, Katakuri and his men behind him all wore grim expressions. Because the name Nicholas left a very bad impression on the Charlotte family. Chapter 225 Inside the Ryugu Palace The ministers who were knocked unconscious by the overwhelming aura were already taken away by someone. Neptune, Queen Odoheim, and the three prince brothers were sitting in their seats. Fisher Tiger and his whale shark fishman subordinates were discreetly guarding the Neptune family, keeping an eye on Nicholas. Nicholas was sitting cross-legged on the ground, seemingly unconcerned about Fisher Tiger's vigilance. From the current display of power in the Ryugu Palace, it was evident that there were too many forces capable of destroying Fishman Island. Damned humans, what do you want to do? Neptune's eldest son, the large shark fishman Fukuboshi Shark, looked at Nicholas sitting there with dissatisfaction. To him, Nicholas was no different from those pirates who plundered and pillaged Fishman Island, just stronger to be able to breach the Ryugu Palace. Reflecting on everything Fishman Island had suffered during this time, and as a royal prince, feeling helpless, Fukuboshi was filled with a sense of indignation and frustration. Various emotions flooded his mind, making him unable to contain his outburst towards Nicholas. In response to the crown prince of the Ryugu Kingdom's question, Nicholas seemed unfazed, paying no attention to Fisher Tiger's cautiousness. His gaze seemed to penetrate the protective barrier of the Ryugu Palace, observing the situation on Giant Court Plaza. He had initially thought that sending Vista and Simon would scare off the pirates gathered in the square. But he hadn't expected that Charlotte's most outstanding creation would also appear in Giant Court Plaza. Pirates who might have retreated were now hesitating, or perhaps waiting for the right moment, intending to take advantage of a conflict between the two sides. Has greed overwhelmed reason? Nicholas narrowed his eyes slightly, sighing, perhaps that's just what pirates are. Having just expressed his sentiment, Nicholas turned his head and smiled at Neptune. Hey hey, Neptune, did you hear that? They're shouting over there about attacking your Ryugu palace and taking the queen. Then he looked at Fukuboshi teasingly, it seems those people really want to give you a little brother or sister, huh? Even without Nicholas's reminder, Neptune and the three prince brothers could see the situation on the square through the den den mushy and hear the piercing shouts. They subconsciously glanced at Queen Odoheim, their faces darkening. The consequences would be unimaginable if the pirates truly breached the Ryugu Palace. Don't look at me like that. I won't let them in. Besides, Neptune, I'm here with friendship. Nicholas turned around, looking at Neptune and his sons with seriousness. All right. With the three prince brothers wide-eyed, Neptune nodded seriously, evidently agreeing with Nicholas's statement. The situation was now clear. To save Fishman Island, they had to rely on Nicholas. After seeing Neptune's subtle movement, Nicholas couldn't help but sweat. He only wanted to be the godfather of the future sea king, not the biological father. 
On the square. On the edge of the rocky outcrop. Simon looked at the silent pirates on the square and smiled, it seems reputation can sometimes be quite useful. The scene of all the pirates on the square staring blankly at the two figures on the rocky outcrop was quite surreal, almost unreal. The fact that the individuals who had inflicted irreparable damage on Fishman Island were fleeing in such a sorry state after just a few words was bewildering. As the dust settled, Vista's towering figure landed several dozen meters in front of Katakuri. With a crack, crack. Accompanied by the collision of two conquerors hockey, black and red lightning appeared in the void, and cracks rapidly spread across the ground between the two, extending towards the distance. The coral-covered rocky layers around them suddenly cracked and split apart, falling to the ground. On the square. The overwhelming conqueror's hockey engulfed the entire area. Pirates who were observing and planning to escape were suddenly struck as if their souls had been sucked away. Without warning, their eyes rolled back, losing consciousness and collapsing to the ground. In a matter of seconds, under the impact of the clash of conqueror's hockey, Nearly 10,000 pirates lost consciousness, lying motionless on the outskirts of the square and even further away. However, a small number of pirates who were confident in their strength managed to withstand the collision of Conqueror's Hockey. This is Conqueror's Hockey. Shaking her head, Smoothie, with blood draining from his face, looked at the two figures standing there with horror. Dragon Palace. A large image snail was quietly waiting beside the palace its eyes projecting light onto the wall, forming a broadcast of the scene on Giant Court Plaza. Neptune, Queen Otoheim, and the three prince brothers stared blankly at the image on the screen, while Fisher Tiger and his whale shark fishman subordinates remained silent, watching the defeated pirates with cold eyes. Humans, indeed, were an enviable race. Chapter 226 The real-time footage broadcasted by the Den Den Mushi was projected inside the Ryugu Palace. Located in the southeast of Fishman Island, hailed as the most prosperous port town of Fishman Island, it now looked like a coral hill that had been swept by war. Although it was in the deep sea, the Fishman Bay, empty of any people, could still see the blue sky and white clouds just like on land. Situated beneath the Fishman Bay, the large coral apartments built along the coral reefs. And the Fishman Street, where fishmen gathered and many illegal groups operated. These places, whether or not there were fishmen or mermaids present, whenever there was a den den mushy, without exception, real-time broadcasts of what was happening at King's Square were projected. Through the real-time broadcast footage projected by the den den mushy. Countless mermaids and fishmen saw the tens of thousands of pirates gathered in the square, exuding overwhelming arrogance. They heard Simon's declaration and saw the scene where countless pirates lost consciousness seconds after colliding with Vista and Katakuri's Haushiku Haki. The entire process from beginning to end. Strictly speaking, it only took a few dozen seconds. So fast and sudden that many residents of Fishman Island were left bewildered, not understanding what had happened. All they could see in the footage were the two figures exuding terrifying arrogance, facing each other. What's going on? Even so, most residents of Fishman Island were still confused. In the Fishman Bay. This used to be the most beautiful sight on Fishman Island, with beautiful mermaids playing and frolicking here almost every moment. But now, because of its location, it had become a gathering place for many foreign pirates. After all, if they were lucky, they might catch beautiful mermaids hiding in the coral apartments under the Fishman Bay. Most of the pirates who used to stay here were mainly slave-catching teams from various shops in the Sabaidi archipelago. Some went to King's Square to make a fortune. But many chose to stay in the Fishman Bay out of curiosity. After all, Big Mom and the like posed no threat to them. Although the various forces they served were reluctant to offend Big Mom's pirate crew, they were not afraid. Then, as they were trying their luck to catch mermaids, they saw the footage projected by the Den Den Mushy and heard Simon's words. For a moment, many people were dumbfounded. Immediately afterwards, they began to take out Den Den Mushies and dial one number after another. If it were other pirate crews talking, they could easily dismiss it as a joke, but now that it was Simon who spoke, they had to take it seriously because this was a sign of strength, or rather, a fear of power. Inside the Ryugu castle, Neptune and the three princes, 
as well as Fisher Tiger and the Whale Shark Brothers, still hadn't recovered. Obviously, this level of collision had exceeded their cognition, or the display of power by both Katakuri and Vista had left them feeling somewhat hopeless. Faced with humans, who continued to produce strong individuals, did Fishman Island really have a chance? The hostility and anger towards humans for everything they had done to mermaids and fishmen had accumulated over countless years. But when they saw the terrifying collision between the top human pirates, it was constantly destroying their hearts. And Nicholas looked at the heavy-faced Neptune and others, and said nothing. The world was so cruel that without strength, one could only endure silently. Princess Otoheim, do you still think Fishman Island has any capital to coexist peacefully with humans? Hearing Nicholas's words, Otoheim fell into silence. And Nicholas looked up at the sky above Fishman Island, his gaze seeming to cross thousands of meters of deep sea, passing through the Sabaeity archipelago, the Red Line, and confronting the figure standing at the top of the world. In his view, the reason why the world government was willing to establish diplomatic relations with Fishman Island 200 years ago was simply because there had been no news of the Sea King appearing at Fishman Island for hundreds of years after wiping out the blank century. And according to records, the Sea King appeared at Fishman Island every few hundred years, summoning a mermaid princess who could call upon Sea Kings, bringing about huge changes to the world. As long as Fishman Island established diplomatic relations with the world government, Fishman Island would be almost within the grasp of the world government. That's also why Emo placed the photos of Luffy, Blackbeard, and Shirahoshi together. It's obvious that by looking at that huge straw hat through him, Luffy has already been associated with Joy Boy, while Blackbeard, with the abilities of both the Dark Dark Fruit and the Tremor Tremor Fruit, possesses a threat as significant as that of someone with the initial D. As for Shirahoshi, being placed in the erased photo implies that Emu has known about her identity as Poseidon, the Sea King, for a long time. Fishman Street Fishmen of various shapes and sizes stared blankly at the broadcast footage. It can be said that due to the special environment of Fishman Street, it is even more difficult to attack than the Ryugu Palace. So, after suffering a few losses, many pirate crews had lost interest in Fishman Street. After all, ugly and barbaric fishmen had far less value than beautiful mermaids. Watching the two figures in the broadcast footage exuding the arrogance of a deity. The fishmen, who harbored deep hatred towards human pirates, felt a seed of fear growing in their hearts. Are those two really humans? They looked at Vista and Katakuri in the broadcast footage, and even though they weren't present at King Square, they could still sense the terrifying oppression through the screen. Perhaps they would never forget this scene in their lives. In a building on Fishman Street. In front of the wall, there was an old sofa. A scar-covered great white shark fishman sat on the sofa, staring coldly at the figures on the screen. This great white shark fishman was Hody Jones, a well-known fishman supremacist on Fishman Street. So, our hard-earned hatred has been resolved like this. Hody Jones looked at the broadcast footage with anger in his eyes, revealing sharp teeth when he gritted them. Beside the sofa, another supporter of Fishman supremacy frowned and said, Dot. We allowed human pirates to do as they pleased on the island to incite hatred against humans among our compatriots, then planned to eliminate these human pirates with the overwhelming support of the islanders. Now, this has completely disrupted our plan. What should we do next? Another fishman asked. Wait. Hody Jones said coldly. Wait? Of course. Hody Jones's eyes were bloodshot, and he said coldly, we can only wait and secretly accumulate strength. Those fools will eventually understand the disdain humans have always had for Fishman Island. Chapter 227 As the conflict on the square was still ongoing, the pirates who had escaped from the King's Square and were knocked unconscious by Haushiku Haki immediately rushed to the port town of Coral Hill on Fishman Island. Upon arriving at Coral Hill, these pirates showed no intention of staying and ran straight towards the docked ships, eager to leave this troubled place as soon as possible. The idea of making a fortune was quickly abandoned when Vista and Simon appeared, and Simon declared Fishman Island's protection. In just a short span of ten minutes or so, Bubbles enveloped the hulls of several ships in the dock as they swiftly headed towards the exit of Fishman Island. Before long, 
dozens of pirate ships had left Fishman Island and ventured into the deep sea. Finally escaped. Thank goodness. Those monsters are truly terrifying. On the decks of each pirate ship, the pirates who had escaped Fishman Island were all filled with relief as they watched the intense battle on King Square in the distance. They had every reason to be grateful. In Nicholas's original plan, any pirate who did not leave Fishman Island within the specified time would meet a grim fate. In the Grand Hall of the Ryugu Palace, upon hearing the news that a large number of pirates were hastily leaving Fishman Island, Neptune couldn't help but feel a bit melancholic. The life and death crisis that Fishman Island had faced was so easily resolved. Even Odoheim, despite advocating for peaceful coexistence with humans, fell into silence. She knew deep down that if the pirates were not expelled from the island, Fishman Island would become a lawless zone, plagued by human traffickers and various underground activities, ultimately leading to its demise. See, sometimes what others see as a grain of sand, to Fishman Island, it's a mountain. This is the tragedy of having no strength, Nicholas remarked with a shake of his head. At this moment, no one would disagree with him. Neptune and his family, along with Fisher Tiger and his whale shark brothers, were digesting the news in Nicholas's words. Buru Buru. Suddenly, in the relatively quiet Grand Hall, the sound of a den den mushy ringing broke the silence. Nicholas opened his eyes and looked toward Stella, whose den den mushy was vibrating slightly, emitting the ringing sound. Neptune and Fisher Tiger also turned their gaze toward Stella. Under their scrutiny, Nicholas took the Den Den Mushy from Stella's hand. The crazy woman's Den Den Mushy. Seeing Nicholas holding the Den Den Mushy, their expressions turned serious. Without hesitation, Nicholas answered the call. Moshi Moshi. As the Den Den Mushy connected, the image of a pair of prominent red lips appeared on the Den Den Mushy screen. The intimidating large eyes perfectly matched the Den Den Mushy's antennae, exuding a pressure that made one feel uneasy just by looking at it. Nicholas held the receiver, waiting for a response, but there was silence from the other end for a long time, furrowing his brow. Moshi Moshi. Nicholas. In the Den Den Mushi's large eyes, bloodshot lines suddenly appeared, glaring at Nicholas like a demon from hell. Hey hey, why are you shouting so loud? You scared me. Be aware, I'll come to Fishman Island later and take you out at the World Noble Auction. Hearing Charlotte Leanlin's voice filled with hatred, Nicholas seemed to become annoyed. Neptune, Otoheim, Fisher Tiger, and the Whale Shark Brothers remained silent, while the Shark Fishman minions were already numb. They knew that the person on the other end was the strongest female pirate in the world. What kind of character would dare to challenge her? Nicholas, is there really no room for negotiation? Are you sure you want to compete with me for Fishman Island? Lin Lin. Nicholas spoke with emphasis, and to those who didn't know, it seemed like their relationship was quite good. Are you going crazy from giving birth? I'm already in Fishman Island, what do you think? You ask such stupid questions. No wonder you can't play with Kaido, Newgate, and Roger. After a moment of silence, the bloodshot lines in the Den Den Mushi's eyes increased, conveying a chilling killing intent, and the Den Den Mushi's teeth continued to grind, indicating the person's worsening mood. And I just spared the most outstanding member of your Charlotte family, and you didn't even say thank you. Instead, you dare to provoke me. Who gave you the courage? Believe me, I'll cut your strongest son into pieces and feed him to the Sea Kings. Nicholas's eyes gleamed with sharpness as he stared into the Den Den Mushi's eyes, speaking coldly. As he spoke, Nicholas's tone was steady, making it clear that he was not joking. This attitude, in the eyes of the Whale Shark Brothers and the Useless Princes, was full of dominance. Mama, Mama. Charlotte Lin Lin heard Nicholas's words and laughed in anger, unable to retort. After all, she wasn't experiencing a craving attack right now and still had some rationality. She knew very well the importance of Katakuri's formidable strength to the Charlotte family. However, the unabashed killing intent conveyed through the Den Den Mushi made her anger even more apparent. All right, I have other matters to attend to. I'm hanging up. With that, Nicholas hung up the Den Den Mushi. In the grand castle of Whole Cake Island in the Totland Sea, Charlotte Lin Lin, 
holding the now silent Den Den Mushi, was initially stunned. Then, a terrifying roar erupted from the castle, spreading throughout Whole Cake Island. After a while, when Charlotte Lin Lin had finished venting her anger, the voice of Perispero came from outside the door, Mother, Kaido of the Hundred Beasts Pirates has sent a secret message. So, Nicholas, what did you mean when you said that Fishman Island used to be incredibly powerful? After Nicholas hung up the Den Den Mushi, Neptune looked at Nicholas, who was sitting on the ground, and asked in a serious tone. Obviously, the disaster that had befallen Fishman Island and the formidable strength displayed by Vista, Katakuri, and others had made the Sea Knight begin to desire power. After all, as Nicholas had said, what others saw as a grain of sand, to Fishman Island, it was a mountain. Perhaps one day, a powerful madman would destroy Fishman Island. What would they do then? Would they just watch, or would they charge towards the enemy like moths to a flame, only to be easily crushed like sea lice underfoot? Neptune hadn't forgotten the prophecy given by Madame Shirely, that Fishman Island would be plunged into a war in the future. Without strength, would they really rely on the mercy of their enemies? Chapter 228 Neptune Otoheim Upon hearing Neptune's words, Princess Otoheim silently reached out and grabbed Neptune's hand, wanting to say something. However, before she could speak, Neptune interrupted her. Seeing Neptune's gently shaking head, she already knew that Neptune had made up his mind. Although Neptune usually listened to her about everything, and even fulfilled her unreasonable requests, when he truly made a decision, she could only give advice but not make decisions for him. Fishman Island is too weak now, or perhaps I am too weak, weak to the point where I can't even protect our people from harm. Neptune looked at the images broadcasted by the Den Den Mushi, filled with self-blame. Although the pirates were leaving in the footage, the dilapidated towns, deserted streets, and the fishmen's bodies lying in ruins all told Neptune that all of this had indeed happened. He couldn't pretend that nothing had happened just because those pirates were leaving. If Nicholas was here now, then what about next time? Moreover, even with Nicholas's protection, what about the future? Did Fishman Island have to constantly bow to the will of others? Upon hearing Neptune's words, Nicholas was initially stunned, then burst into laughter. Clearly, being the leader of a race was no simple role, and certainly not something two fools on an elephant's back could handle. It seems you have made the decision as a king, Neptune. Nicholas paused, then looked at Fisher Tiger and his whale shark Fishman underling standing nearby. Tiger and Jim are trustworthy friends there's no need to keep them out of this. Of course, Neptune understood Nicholas's meaning and directly voiced his agreement. Oh, then there's no problem. According to the records of your Fishman royal family, every few hundred years, a Fishman princess is born. This princess may not have extraordinary strength herself, but she can command all sea kings in the entire ocean. Even the gigantic sea kings would unconditionally obey her summons. Nicholas calmly spoke of the secrets of the Fishman royal family. You really have it all planned out, don't you? Neptune glanced at Nicholas deeply, realizing that Nicholas was not joking but indeed had a plan. When Nicholas first met him, Neptune thought it was just a joke when Nicholas said he wanted to be the godfather of his daughter. After all, at that time, he didn't even have a partner. Although he liked Otoheim, it was more of a one-sided love. However, with Roger's arrival and Shirely's birth, along with the prophecy of the birth of a king, Neptune began to realize that something was amiss. After hearing Nicholas describe the legend of the fishman princess passed down in the royal family, Neptune finally connected all the dots and understood why Fishman Island would be drawn into war in the future. If the world found out about the Fishman Princess's ability to control sea kings, it would be a disaster for Fishman Island. Nearly 90% of the world was covered by the sea. If the Fishman Princess unleashed the sea king's attacks against all humans, the connections between islands would be severed, and the civilizations on each island would be cut off. This would be a heavy blow to humanity. Even worse, if this situation continued for hundreds of years, the entire world's human civilization might regress. Nicholas smiled, clearly aware of the seriousness of the situation that Neptune had now recognized. Are you not afraid I might commit suicide? Neptune suddenly said something shocking, causing Otoheim, Fisher Tiger, 
and the three useless princes to look at Neptune with horror. They could tell from Neptune's tone that he was not joking, but really might choose to do so. I'm not afraid. Nicholas looked at Neptune calmly. The birth of the fishman princess in this era is already set. Even if you die, I can let your three sons or the others their mate with Princess Odoheim. The birth of Poseidon is destined, and the process is not that important. Although Nicholas said that Neptune had the choice, Neptune knew he had no choice. He didn't want a family tragedy to unfold in his home. Fishman Island is willing to submit and accept your protection, Nicholas. Neptune said solemnly. Upon hearing Neptune's words, Nicholas smiled. For Nicholas, the importance of having control over the Sea Kings was self-evident. Once he controlled the Sea Kings, he would control the authority over the entire ocean. With that, Nicholas's plan was once again complete. Good. Nicholas looked at Neptune and accepted the invitation. Thinking about maintaining good relations with Fishman Island, Nicholas suggested, dot. Neptune, to show sincerity, I will use my channels to try to return any merfolk or fishmen being sold back to Fishman Island as much as possible. Additionally, I will provide Fishman Island with some weapons to enhance its defense capabilities. In the world of pirates, weapons were crucial resources. Not only for individuals but also for nations. Adequate weapons were a manifestation of a nation's strong military power, and they were also crucial to winning wars. Many countries in the tumultuous world of pirates often failed in wars because of a lack of weapons, leading to their demise. Or won wars due to an abundance of weapons, just as Doflamingo was able to become the joker of the underworld by selling arms. From this, it could be seen how valuable weapons were in the world of pirates. Nicholas soon picked up the Den Den Mushi and dialed a number. He first called Bedek, although Bedek mainly dealt in weapons trading, he was also quite successful in the Sabaeidi archipelago. However, Nicholas was surprised to find that he couldn't reach Bedek. After waiting for a moment, Nicholas hung up the phone and dialed the number of the flamingo. After all, this flamingo had made his fortune mainly by trafficking people. Upon receiving Nicholas's call, Da Flamingo was not surprised at all. In fact, he even offered to help Nicholas repurchase merfolk and fishmen from others, showing enthusiasm that made Nicholas even suspect if Da Flamingo had some request for him. Chapter 229 After hanging up the phone, Nicholas's face turned grim. He knew that his contact with Bedek usually involved special Den Den Mushy connections. The fact that Bedek didn't answer meant that something was wrong on his end. That shark-faced guy over there. Nicholas pointed at Jim, who looked puzzled, and continued, Yes, you. I've already made arrangements with the Sabaeidi Archipelago. You'll go there and coordinate with the Doflamingo family. They'll do their best to send back any merfolk and fishmen captured from Fishman Island. What's wrong? June noticed that Nicholas was in a bad mood and asked. Bidek is in trouble. After we resolve the situation on Fishman Island, we'll pay a visit to Sabaeidi Archipelago, Nicholas replied, trying to sound casual, but June could sense the underlying tension. Night fell, but Fishman Island was alive with activity. With the threat of pirates and slave traders gone, merfolk returned to the streets, rebuilding their homes. The previously deserted streets came back to life as the merfolk rejoiced in their newfound freedom. At that moment, the image snails placed around Fishman Island began broadcasting. The image of Neptune appeared on screens all over the island. He apologized sincerely as the king of Fishman Island and explained the events of the day. Neptune expressed his gratitude to Nicholas and his pirate crew. In the final moments of the broadcast, Neptune issued a long-awaited recruitment order to the entire Fishman Island. The ordinary citizens of Fishman Island had no idea that this recruitment order was Neptune's first step in changing the island's status quo. To them, it seemed like Neptune was merely expanding the military to strengthen Fishman Island's defenses after the recent pirate invasion. Thus, with Nicholas's intervention, Fishman Island began moving towards a different future. Shortly after the broadcast ended, a shocking event rocked Fishman Island once again. Neptune ordered the guards of Ryugu Palace to personally arrest several fishmen and incarcerate them in the palace's prison tower. 
The speed and forcefulness with which this was carried out exceeded everyone's expectations. Although Ryugu Palace ruled Fishman Island, it was previously perceived as inactive, and its prison tower was more of a symbolic presence. But today, Neptune's decision changed everything. Within a short period, this explosive news spread throughout Fishman Island. King Neptune actually ordered the arrest of Fishmen. I can't even believe this is real. And most importantly, the guards of Ryugu Palace dared to enter Fishman District and make arrests, and Tiger Boss even allowed it. What happened that made Tiger Boss make such a decision? With the spread of this news, Fishman Island, just recovering from the pirate raid, was once again in turmoil. Meanwhile, in a corner of Fishman Island, Hody Jones, who had narrowly escaped danger, was still shaken. Remembering the scene of a saw shark fishman being shot by the guards of Ryugu Palace for resisting, Hody Jones felt a chill down his spine. Now, watching the broadcast on the image snail, Hody Jones clenched his fists. He would reveal the truth to all the residents of Fishman Island and expose the dirty secrets of the royal family. Neptune, you traitor to Fishman Island. And you, Tiger and Jim, you traitors too. Inside the prison tower, watching Neptune, Tiger, and Jim, Hody shouted angrily as he gripped the bars of his cell. Despite being prepared for this, the insult still affected Neptune, Tiger, and Jim. Shut up, Hody Jones. Do you think we don't know about your actions? Who was leading the fishmen to secretly rob passing merchant ships, sink them afterward, and even attack pirate crews at sea? Don't think I don't know that the reason those pirates attacked Fishman Island was because of your instigation. Even the breaches in Fishman Island's defenses can be traced back to you. Anger filled Jim's voice. Some information was difficult to investigate amidst chaos, but once things settled down, many truths could come to light. As Jim spoke, Tiger's expression darkened. Although they knew Hody Jones and his followers were Fishman supremacists, they hadn't expected them to go to such lengths to incite hatred between Fishman Island and humans. Don't deserve to be called the king of Fishman Island, Neptune. Hody turned his head and looked at Neptune outside the prison tower, sneering, Neptune, look at you. Leading the Ryugu kingdom, you're just like a dog begging for stability from those inferior races who can't even breathe underwater. Even your ancestors wanted to join the world government. Two hundred years ago, Fishman Island supported your royal family's decision to join the world government. And then? Did those humans respect Fishman Island? In their eyes, we're still filthy, inferior beings. Oh, but of course, that's only for fishmen. After all, even mermaids are considered beautiful and elegant by humans. Your royal family's incompetence and cowardice have caused great harm to fishmen, and your repeated concessions are an insult to our noble bloodline. We, fishmen, are the rulers of the ocean. Those inferior races that can't even breathe underwater should fear us. Hody raised his arms, his eyes full of malice. We are the children of the sea, the rulers of the underwater world. We should crush those inferior races under our feet. Your royal family is the culprit for all the troubles of Fishman Island, ha ha ha. Knock down one fishman, and thousands of fishmen will rise. Hody laughed loudly. What a lunatic. This guy. Neptune, Tiger, and Jim all had grim expressions. Once again, Nicholas's words had hit the mark. Since you've proven me right, Neptune, let's make a deal, Nicholas said. What do you mean? Neptune's emotions were turbulent. What he witnessed and heard in the prison tower had deeply affected him. Nicholas's expression suddenly became extremely serious. I, Albert Nicholas, will lead you all to the surface one day and ensure that both merfolk and fishmen can walk the world openly and freely. Neptune, Tiger, and even Jim looked incredulous. Because they recalled a certain agreement recorded in Fishman Island's history about a man and a mermaid princess from 800 years ago. Chapter 230 Why? Make such a promise? Listening to Nicholas's words, Neptune couldn't help but raise this question subconsciously. But he didn't ask directly, instead, he looked at Nicholas incredulously. An unfulfilled promise from 800 years ago would be fulfilled by someone in the uncertain future. This was a legend passed down by the royal family of Fishman Island, 
and the apologetic documents and the exaggerated arc Noah placed alongside historical texts told of the grand epic that had once occurred. Now, Nicholas was voluntarily proposing a similar promise, foreshadowing what? Neptune's mind churned with towering waves. It's easy to make a promise, but fulfilling it is incredibly difficult. After all, the one who made the promise with the mermaid princess, Joy Boy, failed despite having many followers, even leaving behind apologetic documents for Fishman Island. Going to the surface. Wasn't that an easy task? Neptune suddenly recalled the countless hardships Fishman Island had experienced from the past to the present. This made him understand that even if Fishman Island became a member of the world government, it wouldn't change the human disdain and discrimination towards the Fishman race. Perhaps some humans harbored goodwill towards the fishmen, but compared to the entire human population, they were negligible. At the same time, it made him realize that if the human disdain and hatred towards the fishmen couldn't be eradicated completely, bringing the fishmen to the surface was an impractical idea. Doing so wouldn't bring happiness to the fishmen, but rather greater disaster. Joy Boy couldn't do it, but I can, Nicholas said calmly. Neptune could only look at Nicholas in astonishment. From Nicholas, all Neptune saw was a deep, ocean-like calm. And a certain confidence that could fulfill the promise. Neptune, one day from now, we will leave Fishman Island for the Sabbaty Archipelago. I hope to see your determination, Nicholas said. Watching Nicholas leave the palace without being able to say a word, Neptune fell into contemplation. Late at night. Fishman Island remained brightly lit, with most people busy restoring their homes. The residents of Fishman Island were shocked by Neptune's strong stance, realizing that Fishman Island faced not only external threats but also internal troublemakers. Fishman Island was facing internal and external troubles, as Neptune's strong stance had shown. At the same time, a guard from the Ryugu Palace came to report that a large number of fishmen from Fishman Street had gathered outside the Ryugu Palace. Despite Fisher Tiger and Jim's attempts to persuade them, the effects were not significant. Those people were all shouting for Neptune to give an explanation. Hearing this, Neptune's expression became even more unpleasant. Without the incident in the prison tower before, perhaps he would still think he had done wrong, but now. Convey my orders, let the guards of the Ryugu Palace prepare for suppression, and closely monitor those who are causing the riots. Neptune said as he walked towards the Ryugu Palace. As the night grew deeper, Fishman Island remained brightly lit. Most people were busy restoring their homes, while others were gathering outside the Ryugu Palace, demanding answers from Neptune. They now understood that Fishman Island faced not only external threats but also internal turmoil. And this obviously had little to do with Nicholas. Nicholas took out a den den mushi and dialed a number. After a moment, the call was answered, and the Den Den Mushy's eyes immediately turned into a blurry sleepy look. Morgans. Nicholas spoke into the receiver. The blurry sleepy eyes of the Den Den Mushy widened instantly, as if shocked awake. Ah. Nicholas. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Morgans's voice, trembling with excitement, came through the Den Den Mushy. Obviously, his excitement wasn't because he was speaking to a big shot from the sea, but because receiving a call from such a big shot at this late hour could mean something significant. Lord Nicholas, is there something important at this time for you to call? Morgans clamped the Den Den Mushy on his shoulder, ready with paper and pen for recording. Not particularly important, just wanted to provide you with some real news material. Go on. I'm prepared. In a few days, I'll be going to the Sabaeity Archipelago. Nicholas got straight to the point. Thud. A sound of something landing came from the Den Den Mushy. What? A cry of disbelief came through the Den Den Mushy, Morgan's clearly astonished. If Nicholas were present, he would see Morgan's eyes almost popping out, as Nicholas going to the Sabaeity Archipelago couldn't possibly be for vacation. This is truly big news. Morgans's excited voice came clearly through the Den Den Mushy, reaching Nicholas's ears. Well, it will indeed be big news when the time comes. Those who mess with me should be prepared to pay the price. As for the specifics, I believe with your abilities, you should easily be able to investigate. With that, 
he hung up the den den mushy. Morgans was now visibly excited. This was indeed big news, almost as soon as the call was disconnected. Morgans woke up all the staff and began quickly gathering information about the Sabaeity archipelago. For Nicholas, there was definitely something he needed to do in the Sabaeity archipelago. After all, regardless of what Bedeck said, he was Nicholas's spokesperson in the Sabaeity archipelago. Now that there was no news, it was almost like someone was slapping his face. If he didn't react, wouldn't anyone dare to challenge him in the future? Moreover, after reaching an agreement with Fishman Island, he also needed to show them his strength. Otherwise, why would anyone believe he could fulfill the agreement? Chapter 231 Daffy, do we really have to follow what that guy Nicholas said, and return the fishmen and merfolk to Fishman Island? Clad in a bright red cloak, Diamante, who was currently playing with a sword in his hand, spoke up. Shortly after Nicholas's call, the Don Quixote family held a brief family meeting. Yeah, Daffy, if we do that, our losses will be significant, and it will also have quite an impact on the reputation of the Don Quixote family. Said Mewa, representing Treble, clearly concerned about the economic losses and the impact on the underworld's perception of their family. Boss, what if we just ignore that guy Nicholas? It's too arrogant for him to order us around with just a phone call, a sharp and thin voice came from a masked individual. But none of the people sitting there found the funny accent amusing, because sitting there was Pika, the highest-ranking officer of the Don Quixote family spade division. Ha ha ha. Facing the discussions of his top officers, Da Flamingo didn't speak but burst into laughter, leaning back in his chair with his hand covering his forehead. Even his subordinates showed puzzled expressions due to his overly confident laughter, not understanding what was going on with Da Flamingo. After all, they didn't understand what was going on with Da Flamingo. A mere few fishmen and merfolk, giving Nicholas some face is no big deal. After all, I don't want to deal with that angry guy. Also, tell our men to be calm recently. Something interesting is going to happen in Sabaeity soon. I really want to see how much trouble that guy Nicholas can cause. As for Fishman Island, it's probably his big move after staying quiet for so long. I really want to see the arrogant guy's faces when facing Nicholas. Da Flamingo suddenly stopped laughing and spoke defiantly to his subordinates. A day later, the news of Fishman Island accepting Nicholas's protection began to spread rapidly across the seas, and at the same time, the prices of merfolk in the black markets around the world began to soar. Everyone knew that after accepting Nicholas's protection, the risk of capturing merfolk from Fishman Island would skyrocket. If capturing merfolk only posed a threat from Fishman Island before, it wasn't much. After all, Fishman Island's strength was there, and any capable pirate or force could go there and cause trouble. But Nicholas's pirate crew was different. They were terrifying monsters roaming the New World, and no one wanted to easily provoke such a powerful figure. South Sea, Batarilla Island Located in a remote area of the South Sea, almost isolated from the world, a two-story cottage sits on a high platform near the sea on this small island. The sea breeze blows, the sky is dotted with white clouds, changing into various strange shapes and slowly drifting away into the distance. The sunlight shines on the sea, shimmering. Under a big tree, a broad figure with his back to the cottage, wearing a straw hat and a towel around his neck, a hoe leaning against the tree beside him, all indicating that the man had just finished a day's work. The man is sitting on a bamboo chair, laughing heartily while looking down at the latest newspaper. It's unexpected. I didn't think your first move would be Fishman Island. It seems you really intend to control the Sea King Poseidon ahead of time. With two rings on his hand, holding the newspaper, his eyes shining brightly, the laughter reveals a domineering aura. But for some reason, such a person is willing to live in seclusion on this island in the South Sea. No mistake, this guy is G.O.L.D. Roger, the pirate king that the marines have been trying to catch. It's been a long time since he became the Pirate King, and the famous Roger Pirates have disappeared. And this Pirate King, who has attracted countless pirates to sea, is now living on this island like an ordinary middle-aged man. Roger looked at the newspaper and suddenly couldn't stop coughing. It's windy outside, be careful not to catch a cold. A gentle voice sounded, a woman wearing a white dress, 
with golden wavy hair draped over her shoulders, wearing a red camellia hairpin. A beautiful face with a few freckles, exuding intelligence and gentleness, stood behind Roger with a hint of blame in her tone. Rouge. Turning around, Roger smiled, his eyes full of love. Looking at the newspaper in Roger's hand and the news about Nicholas on it, Rouge's face showed a hint of worry. As Roger's lover, the two have naturally discussed many figures. Whitebeard, Garp, and Nicholas, these famous figures on the Sea Rouge has naturally heard from Roger's mouth. Unlike other people, Roger's attitude towards these three has always been very complicated. Whitebeard is a friend, and Garp is also a friend and foe, but Nicholas, in Rouge's view, is the only person Roger sees as a kindred spirit. Holding Rouge's delicate hand, Roger embraced her in his arms, now he is not the arrogant and domineering pirate king of the sea, but just an ordinary man immersed in love. I'm pregnant. Sitting in Roger's arms, Rouge looked back at Roger's stubbled face, like a blooming rose, showing the most beautiful smile in the world. Roger was stunned at first, then his hand gently covered Rouge's belly, and when he felt the weak little life, he began to feel at a loss. I'm going to be a dad. Excited, happy, and joyful, Roger, the king of the sea who conquered the Grand Line, now laughed like a child. Yes, you're going to be a dad, and I'm going to be a mom. Lowering her head, Rouge placed her hand on top of Roger's hand touching her belly, her eyes full of happiness. The two nestled together, Roger holding Rouge, looking at the blue sea, wishing this moment could last forever. Let's name the child. Sitting in Roger's arms, Rouge spoke up. If it's a girl, let's name her Anne. If it's a boy, let's name him Ace. And, Ace. Yes, and an Ace. Roger's mood at this moment was more nervous and excited than ever before. In the new world, on the stormy island. At the highest point of the island, a figure shrouded in a deep green cloak was suddenly lifted by a gust of wind. Revealing a man with red square markings on the left side of his face, who had dropped the newspaper from his hand and was gazing at the sky under a fleeting lightning. Has it begun? Chapter 232 Originally, there were no gods in the world until the celestial dragons began to claim themselves as such. What's even more ironic is that the celestial dragons indeed possess a status and power that surpasses countless nations, truly resembling deities among mortals. Moreover, once their dignity and lives are infringed upon, the world government's top secret espionage agency, known as the CP Organization, and the top combat force of the Navy, will mobilize to protect the Celestial Dragon's honor, annihilating anyone who dares to offend them. Based on this, countless pirates on the seas joke in secret that the Navy is a loyal dog raised by the Celestial Dragons. Of course, this is just a way of venting frustrations, as in reality, if faced with an admiral, they would still have to flee. Even the most notorious and audacious pirates on the seas, upon encountering the seemingly worthless celestial dragons, would choose to retreat. This phenomenon was initially incomprehensible to Nicholas. Given the arrogant behavior of the celestial dragons, they must have offended many people, so sooner or later, they would encounter someone willing to risk everything to take revenge. However, such incidents seemed unheard of. No, they did happen, but not against the celestial dragons residing in the Holy Land, but rather against the Don Quixote family, who had abandoned their celestial dragon status. At that time, those individuals were considered quite just and strong, standing on the moral high ground, radiating a dazzling aura. Although the celestial dragons are always surrounded by guards and protected by the CP organization, surely, over the years, some lucky individuals would have gained formidable strength. And judging from the strength demonstrated by the celestial dragon guards, even if they didn't reach the pinnacle of the sea, just having a bounty of over a billion could potentially kill a celestial dragon. After all, those who were determined to kill would not be easily deterred, and the arrogant celestial dragons were unlikely to be vigilant. This was evident from Monkey D. Luffy's encounter with Charlo Saint in the Sabaeti Archipelago. So, are you planning to attack Mary Geos? Shaki was the first to react, giving Nicholas a deep look. She knew Nicholas was serious, but attacking Mary Geos was simply outrageous. You're becoming more and more outrageous. In the future, the seas will probably be turned upside down because of you, little Nicholas. 
Shaki said while absent-mindedly reaching for her cigarette case, only to realize it was empty. Meanwhile, one of the whale shark fellows was in a state of self-doubt, wondering who he was, where he was, and what he had just heard. Because he thought he must have been hallucinating attacking Mary Geos was beyond his comprehension. Nicholas regained his composure and looked around at the reactions of those present. Why are you all so surprised? Celestial dragons are not gods they must die if someone wants them dead. Nicholas, what are you thinking? That's Mary Geos. Is it worth it for the sake of a subordinate? Rayleigh furrowed his brows, looking at Nicholas. Attacking Mary Geos was equivalent to declaring war on the world government. Nicholas looked calmly at Rayleigh. What consequences are you talking about? Are you planning to pin your hopes on some vague future, like Roger did? Even though he aimed to push forward the pirate era to protect that so-called chosen one spoken of by Joy Boy. He retorted and continued, I really look down on you guys sometimes. Perhaps those of you who didn't reach Raftel are the true pirate king and the greatest pirate crew. Those of you who reached Raftel, ultimately made such a foolish decision because of some loser's inexplicable words. Even Roger planned to sacrifice his life to push forward the pirate era, all for that so-called chosen one's sake. It's nauseating. You must have seen Fishman Island's apology letter. Even though a loser said those words, you still take them as truth. I wonder if you'll still be indifferent when Roger is executed. Rayleigh's expression turned serious. You know nothing. How could you understand Roger's greatness? As they argued, everyone in the bar fell silent. While June and the others drank without speaking, knowing they would follow Nicholas's lead no matter what, Shaki smoked contemplatively. One whale shark fish man was still in a state of confusion. Roger's son should be in his mother's womb by now, Nicholas said with a cold smile. With Nicholas's words, June also crushed the glass in her hand. Clearly, the topic of children had struck a nerve with her. Despite knowing it was likely due to the effects of their devil fruit abilities, it was not easy for her to accept. Rayleigh's expression also became grim. Is what you said true? Of course it's true. And if I hadn't given him the gold, he would have turned himself in soon. After all, who could stop someone determined to die? And the arrogant celestial dragons clearly lack any sense of caution. We've seen this from the way Charlo Saint was sent flying by Monkey D. Luffy in the Sabaeity Archipelago. So, you're planning to be the first to attack. Nicholas gestured to Vista. He then walked towards the control panel of the Sea Sovereign. Hearing Nicholas's words, Vista's eyes also lit up. Chapter 233 The Holy Land Mary Geos This city, dominated by European-style buildings such as spires and domes, exudes a prosperous aura due to the gathering of treasures from all over the world. However, it is more accurate to describe it as a city of indifference and rigidity rather than prosperity, as it is filled with an air of coldness and stiffness, earning it the nickname of the magic capital. Contrary to popular belief, the streets are not filled with world nobles, the celestial dragons, wearing luxurious attire. Instead, occasional celestial dragons with slaves can be seen on the streets, while more common sights include members of the CP organization in uniforms and the celestial dragons' guards. Most celestial dragons indulge in luxurious lives within their palaces. Even among the slaves, there is a hierarchy. Some slaves, due to their ability to please the celestial dragons or because they have lived in Mary Geos for a long time, have become mentally akin to celestial dragons. Even among ordinary slaves, their demeanor exudes a superiority, as if when facing other slaves, they are no longer slaves but rather celestial dragons. You lowly people should consider it an honor to enter Mary Geos. Be grateful to the celestial dragons for their mercy. Without the benevolence of the celestial dragons, you would never have the privilege to set foot in this holy land. As a well-dressed celestial dragon slave lectured a newly acquired slave while heading towards the celestial dragon's mansion, a shadow suddenly cast over the street. The sudden shadow, rapidly enlarging, caught the attention of the people, who instinctively looked up to witness an unforgettable scene. On this day, the world would be shaken. The sun was falling from the sky. The oppressive downward trend of the falling sun cast an increasingly large shadow over the ground. 
Due to the speed of the descent, visible shockwaves formed at the bottom and edges of the sun, creating visible rising air currents. The scorching heat emitted by the sun continuously roasted the ground, and the people on the streets and even in the palaces were dumbfounded, as if trapped in a dream. Although the sun was still thousands of meters away from the ground, its oppressive heat gave people a suffocating feeling of breathlessness. Sun. Why? Why would the sun fall from the sky? It's not the sun, the sun is still up there. But no matter what it is, run. Although they knew that this sun was not the same as the one that always hung in the sky, its scorching heat and oppressive aura were undeniable. In just a few seconds, those who reacted scattered in panic. While the descending sun caused turmoil and panic, Nicholas and Brooke were floating in the sky above, watching the scene unfold. Nicholas had a pair of lightning wings extending from his back, assisting him in hovering behind the sun. Beside him, Brooke, using moonwalk, seemed to be more of a decoration with his bones floating in the air, supported by the power of his soul. The two hovered in the sky, looking down at the small sun descending towards Mary Geos. This was almost Vista's full-powered attack, the blood sun of revenge, infused with his most sincere beliefs. Although it was a small sun, its coverage area almost exceeded that of a small town. The destruction caused by its impact was inevitable. Too much commotion. Nicholas crossed his arms and looked down at the powerful auras emanating from all directions, fully aware that the celestial dragons and the world government strong defenders stationed in Mary Geos would detect the situation immediately. It was only natural considering that this was the stronghold of the celestial dragons and the world government. Too bad there won't be many celestial dragons killed. Despite the terrifying power of this attack, Nicholas couldn't help but feel a bit disappointed. It seemed like he had fulfilled his initial promise to Vista. Seeing the descending sun causing chaos and destruction, many people's faces turned pale. At the same time, they watched as the sun was split in half by a straight slash that seemed to cut through butter. The massive sun was split in two, with a smooth cut that even seemed to freeze the flames for a short time. Who is it? Who dares to launch an attack on Mary Geos? Amidst the helpless situation, a straight slash, as swift as lightning, flew from a distance and cut through the sun in midair. Like dragging a hot blade through butter. Immediately. The massive sun was split in half, with an incredibly smooth cut at the point of separation, freezing the flames for a moment. As the defenders and CP members struggled with their dilemma, they all looked in shock at the sun being split in two. Before they could shift their gaze to the person who had acted, a voice, cold and sharp like an icy blade, overwhelmed all other sounds, reaching the ears of everyone present. To think someone could reach this place. It seems the long-standing peace has made you all complacent. At this moment, everyone finally glanced at the person who had acted. Wearing a white robe, adorned with a pair of golden-rimmed glasses, and wielding a mysterious and eerie-looking katana, it was none other than one of the five elders, the bald-headed leader St. Nusturo. Chapter 234 Just when everyone thought the crisis was over, the sun that had been split in half by the five elders did not dissipate into the air as expected. Instead, it began to boil continuously, while a dangerous wave swept outwards in all directions. The members of CP0 present suddenly realized something, their eyes filled with incredulity. Then, accompanied by two loud roars, two terrifying waves of energy began to sweep outwards from the split sun, engulfing the surroundings. If it were an ordinary fireball, it would probably have been annihilated by the terrifying blow of the five elders. However, the sun filled with flames of revenge would not be so easily extinguished. With a deafening roar, brilliant light erupted from the two halves of the split sun. Then, radiant light emanated, shimmering with dazzling colors, beautiful yet deadly. After a sudden shock, shockwaves spread rapidly with explosions, expanding into two massive halos visible to the naked eye, enveloping Mary Geos, causing countless people to look up in fear. Immediately after, everything seemed to fall into silence. Great, this is truly great news. Get closer, get closer. I want the best shooting angle. Looking at the two huge mushroom clouds rising above Mary Geos, Morgan was almost ecstatic. Although he was somewhat prepared for the big news Nicholas mentioned, 
he never expected it to be such an explosive piece of news. According to the intelligence he had gathered, he thought Nicholas' big news might involve teaching a lesson to the celestial dragon who captured Bedeck, the emerging underworld figure. But he didn't expect Nicholas to dare to directly attack Mary Geos. The explosiveness of this news far exceeded the hype when Roger became the Pirate King. Boss, we can't get any closer. If we do, the enraged world government might consider us accomplices. Hearing Morgan's words, his subordinates from the news agency desperately advised against it. After all, Mary Geos had just been attacked. It was conceivable how angry the world government would be. They wouldn't care if you were innocent or not. Moreover, filming the battered side of Mary Geos at this time would be tantamount to slapping the world government's face. If they continued to provoke, who knows if those guys would go crazy. At the human auctioning house in Sabaeti Archipelago. A certain whale shark underling was in the middle of a transaction with the Don Quixote family. Your strength seems impressive. Are you interested in joining our Don Quixote family? Da Flamingo looked at the whale shark standing there, his eyes filled with undisguised admiration. Obviously, the strength displayed by this whale shark had astonished him. After all, being able to easily defeat Torabipo and Diamante's combined efforts on land undoubtedly proved the whale shark's strength. Once he joined, with the sea's bonus for fishmen, the strength of the Don Quixote family would undoubtedly undergo another significant enhancement. Thank you for your kindness, but as a fishman, I'm not interested in joining other factions. The whale shark politely declined the invitation. After all, these people gave him a very bad feeling. That's a shame. As Da Flamingo spoke, his fingers moved slightly, apparently intending to teach some ignorant fellow a lesson and add some fun to his boring day. Boom! Boom! With two loud noises, Da Flamingo suddenly stood up from his seat. Then he looked towards the direction where the explosion came from. Although he was wearing sunglasses, his incredible emotions could still be clearly sensed. Ha 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 ha, what a crazy guy! Da Flamingo covered his face with his hand and burst into laughter, so hearty that even the muscles on his shoulders trembled with his laughter. All right, treble, let's send our guest off. After saying that, he directly flicked the thread out and quickly rushed towards the direction of the explosion. He couldn't wait to see the looks on those people's faces. He wondered if they would still look as arrogant as they did when they rejected Da Flamingo's return. Boom. Boom. The earth-shattering explosion resounded through the air, and incredibly violent air currents surged out, causing a massive mushroom cloud to rise rapidly into the air, as if a giant were standing up. The gale swept in all directions, and those who were outside the explosion range felt a roar in their ears. Many people's faces changed abruptly, raising their hands to block the scorching wind, looking at the mushroom cloud in the sky with trembling hearts. From a distance, the explosion looked terrifying and frightening, making people fearful and unable to imagine what it would be like to be in the midst of it. Under such an explosion, could anyone survive? The explosion was quick, and the strong wind swept down. Everyone's robes fluttered, and they stared at the center of the explosion with widened eyes. At this moment, there were no figures standing in the center of the explosion. Everywhere was rubble, with some charred corpses scattered around. There were even two giant craters on the ground. The further out one went, the more brutal it was. From time to time, one could see broken bodies lying on the ground, some severely burned and still moaning in agony. It was like a hell on earth. Perhaps dying instantly in the center of the explosion was a kind of happiness. The five elders looked at the center of the explosion with ugly expressions. At this moment, their white robes were somewhat tattered, making them look disheveled. Yahoo ho ho At this moment, a voice rang out from the sky. Brooke rotated the cane sword in his hand, standing a hundred meters above the ground, lifting his soul-solid sword and saying seriously, I hope you all have a pleasant day. As Brooke's voice fell, a faint green light emanated from the sword's body, and at the same time, a breath not belonging to this world slowly emanated from him. A dangerous sword and the person holding the sword was equally dangerous. As the wielder of the soul solid, Brooke could keenly sense the aura of kinship emanating from the five elders. The aura on the opponent's body represented the underworld. 
with the sound of the sword returning to its sheath. Yehohoho, Song of the Underworld, Demonic Encounter. Then, Brooke spoke out the name of the technique he had just used. At the same time, the corpses that had been lying on the ground began to sway unsteadily and started to attack the people around them frantically, as if at this moment these undead had briefly returned from the underworld. The power from the underworld was beginning to show its might. And at this moment, a swift slash flew towards Brooke. Yehohoho. Brooke dodged sideways, looking at the five elders who had sheathed their swords on the ground, and said with a smile, You're indeed a powerful swordsman, but I won't be foolish enough to engage you head on. After speaking, Brooke quickly began to retreat using Moonwalk. Apparently, he knew that with his current strength, he was no match for the opponent. He wouldn't give the enemy a chance to catch him. At the same time, Brooke also remembered what Nicholas had once said to him. According to Nicholas, the Yomi Yomi no Mi is a rare ability. Unlike other devil fruits that require the genetic makeup of organisms as hosts, it resides directly within the soul and changes something intangible within it. Now, temporarily leaving the deceased in the mortal world and having them fight for oneself was just one of the abilities of the Yomi Yomi no Mi. Perhaps as the ability deepens, it may even lead to higher levels of spiritual abilities. He looked forward to the awakening of the devil fruit. Although it was very difficult. But as long as it awakens, he can truly be called the king of the underworld. As for the levels mentioned by Nicholas after the awakening, even Brooke at this moment dared not to hope for it. After all, that was too incredible. But he wouldn't give up easily. He would do his best to evolve the mighty power from the underworld to the scene Nicholas had mentioned. Only then could he live up to Nicholas' expectations of him. Chapter 235 At this moment, Nicholas, who had arrived at the Celestial Dragon's residence, also sensed the sharp aura that almost swept through the entire Holy Land when one of the five elders made their move. Lucky me! With his back to the direction where the powerful aura emanated, Nicholas stood on a building in the luxurious courtyard, looking down at St. Samafeld, who was protected by a group of guards. It's. It's you. How can you be here? St. Samafeld's eyes widened in disbelief as he looked at Nicholas standing on top of the courtyard building. Compared to St. Samafeld's extreme reaction, his surrounding guards all looked like they were facing a formidable enemy. As celestial dragon guards, they had encountered many individuals who wanted to harm these nobles. However, most of those individuals chose to ambush celestial dragons outside Mary Geos. Considering the explosion that had just occurred in Mary Geos, it was obvious that this guy was different from those individuals in the past. Moreover, many guards recognized Nicholas's identity. If a guy of this level really wanted to harm Saint Samafeld, they wouldn't be able to stop him. At this moment, as one of Saint Samafeld's lackeys was about to angrily rebuke Nicholas for his insolence, Nicholas made a gesture to silence him by lightly pressing his index finger against his lips. But how could such a gesture silence a loyal dog? Now was the time to show loyalty. You insolent fool! Do you know who is in front of you? How dare you stand higher than? Nicholas naturally understood that some individual's servility was deeply ingrained. Therefore, he directly used a thunderous blast to silence the bickering lackey. With a swift motion, a flying finger gun sliced through the air. Almost as soon as Nicholas made his move, St. Samafeld's guards also began to attack. Even though they knew they were outmatched, they fought desperately. After all, if something happened to St. Samafeld, they wouldn't be able to survive either. Nicholas extended his palm, leaving afterimages in the air as he effortlessly dispersed the flying finger guns aimed at him. Then, he shifted his gaze towards a figure emerging from the shadows of the corridor. It was a person about two meters tall, shrouded in a white robe, wearing a full-face clown mask. CP0, huh? You're quite fast. A hoarse voice emanated from under the mask, with a clear tone of seriousness. A woman? Hearing that hoarse voice, Nicholas showed a curious expression. After all, members of CP0, as the sharp edge of the world government, each had their own specialties. He wondered if this woman was like Rob Lucci or if she had other special abilities. As the upper half of her body flew through the air, Nicholas couldn't help but exclaim in surprise. 
In the eyes of others, it seemed that Nicholas's body had been split in two by a black wall appearing at his waist. Seeing the triumphant smile on the CP0 member's face, her ability seemed almost impossible to counter. Underestimating her could be fatal to anyone. Interesting. Is this your ability? But it seems to have its limitations. With the disappearance of the armament hockey covering her, the wall behind Nicholas crashed heavily onto the ground, while electric currents surged around Nicholas's waist, restoring his body. Nicholas's observation hockey had gone wild the moment he was about to be bisected, so he had preemptively entered his elemental state to avoid the fatal blow. Seeing this scene, the CP0 member's eyes filled with incredulity. However, she quickly raised her leg to kick Nicholas, who was rushing towards her. The indigo slash wave emanating from her leg transformed into hundreds of diamond-shaped slashes in mid-air, sealing off all of Nicholas's attack routes. TSK, CP agents really like to play fancy with their Rokushiki. In Nicholas's eyes, countless indigo dots reflected, and then he directly entered his elemental state, letting these diamond-shaped slashes pierce through his body. In an instant, Nicholas appeared in front of the CP0 member, and at the same time, he extended his armament hockey-covered right hand, grabbing the CP0 member's mask and forcefully pressing her to the ground. Crash! With a loud bang, the ground beneath the CP0 member sunk rapidly, and spider-web-like cracks spread rapidly around her. Crack! Crack! With a series of cracking sounds, the clown mask worn on her face shattered, revealing an ordinary face among the crowd. Feeling the pressure from Nicholas, the woman, pinned to the ground, did not hesitate for a moment. She promptly formed her hand into a blade and covered it with armament hockey, slashing towards Nicholas's neck with the fastest speed. Making small moves in front of me is not a good habit. Thunder wave. As Nicholas spoke, the woman felt a chill pass through her heart. Just as she began to be alert, a powerful electric current, seemingly alive, instantly bound her tightly to the ground. Feeling the electric currents surging through her body, she distinctly felt a tightness below her waist, followed by a warm flow gushing out. Obviously, under the stimulation of the lightning, her body gave the most instinctive reaction. Don't struggle. From the moment you were within my reach, this battle was already over. Nicholas said slowly. You. The CP0 member's face changed, but before she could finish her sentence, she blacked out and fell unconscious. Looking at the unconscious CP0 member, Nicholas didn't immediately kill her. Instead, after dealing with all the guards, he reached into a nearby room and grabbed a plate of fruits, placing it on the CP0 woman's body. Seeing the defenseless CP0 member, Nicholas's body emitted a fluctuation, quickly enveloping the space around her. Then, he directly thrust a thunderous longsword into her chest, and as the fluctuation began to rapidly shrink, Nicholas wondered, will it succeed? Thinking about the feasibility he had discussed with Vegapunk, Nicholas couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation. If it was really feasible, it would be so interesting. While conducting the experiment, Nicholas also summoned a thunderous rope, binding St. Samifeld into a bundle. I wonder how things are going with Brooke. Nicholas muttered to himself. The reason he brought Brooke along this time was because of Brooke's strong survival ability. As long as Brooke didn't act recklessly, there would be no safety issues at all. With the keen observation hockey perception, Nicholas could sense powerful auras converging from a distance. Obviously, the other party had noticed the abnormality here. Let me see. Hmm, that Vegapunk guy is indeed a genius. Ignoring the increasingly urgent footsteps, Nicholas, while observing the burning Mary Geos, smiled. When the photograph was taken, the photographer even carefully checked the camera's lens, as forgetting to open the camera cover and failing to take a picture would mean the end of his commission. Chapter 236 The sound of the shutter clicked. The photographer couldn't resist and pressed the shutter several times in succession. It could be said that at this moment, he wasn't pressing the camera's shutter button, but rather the button of a money printing machine. Nicholas, you are surrounded now, release Samifeld Saint quickly. At this moment, countless CP0 members and celestial dragon guards, dressed in white robes and masks, landed on the tops of surrounding buildings, enclosing Nicholas among them. 
Faced with CP Zero's demand, Nicholas remained silent for a moment, then tightened the lightning rope binding Samafeld even more. Save me. I'm going to die. Feeling the sudden tightening of the lightning, Samafeld hurriedly begged for mercy. Captain, Miss June said it's about time. Just then, Brooke, whose body was completely constructed from the power of souls, floated over to Nicholas and spoke. Nicholas then threw Samafeld, who was bound in his hands, directly towards Brooke. Brooke caught Samafeld that Nicholas threw over, accompanied by a surge of cold air. As soon as Samafeld came into contact with Brooke, he was frozen, and Brooke, carrying the frozen Samafeld, floated in the air, looking at Nicholas with a gaze mixed with questioning. You go back first. I have something to try out. Tell June to retreat, I'll be there in a moment. Understood. Understanding Nicholas's intention to stay behind, Brooke did not hesitate and agreed before flying off with the frozen Samafeld. If using Moon Step with someone could affect both agility and speed, but for Brooke in his spiritual state, there was no such problem. In fact, in his spiritual state, speed was quite remarkable. Ha! Huh. Simon looked at the celestial dragon frozen on the deck, his expression somewhat puzzled. Where's the captain? The captain said he wanted to try something. He told us to retreat and said he would come later. Brooke lowered his head and looked at the tiny Mary Geos below them, speaking. Simon was surprised to hear this and said solemnly, to stay behind alone to face so many enemies, even if it's the captain. Simon, you have to trust the captain. Since the captain said it, he will definitely do it. Vista's tone was full of trust in Nicholas. Anyway, our mission is to leave here as soon as possible, not to worry about the captain here. Besides, don't we still have Miss June as insurance? Thinking of June's terrifying ability, Simon nodded. Below the clouds. Nicholas hovered in the air. Looking around, surveying the enemies leaping up from the ground, it could be said that the response within a few minutes from the start of the attack to the retreat was terrifying. And every one of them knows Moon's step. Seeing the number of enemies using Moon Step, which far exceeded Nicholas's expectations, also indicated the importance of the world government's education from childhood. After all, those with potential or excellence who came out of the homeland would join the CP organization. While those who could not join the CP organization would enter Mary Geos to become guards responsible for the safety of the world government and the celestial dragons. From this, it can be seen that the world government holds a force no weaker than the navy. Perhaps your strength is effective against some ordinary pirates, but if you want to deal with me, it's too naive. Nicholas began to use observation hockey to lock onto one enemy after another coming from all directions. Boom, crackle. The sound of thunder exploded, and suddenly lightning fell from the sky, directly striking the exposed enemies in the open. It can be said that when dealing with ordinary pirates, these merry Geos guards would show off their skills. After all, if they were killed by ordinary gunfire, they wouldn't be qualified to take on the responsibility of guarding Mary Geos. However, when facing Nicholas, who was on another level, they felt helpless. The Mary Geos guards struck by the lightning bolts were like birds hit by bullets, burnt all over, with exploded heads, falling straight from high altitude towards the ground. Seeing one colleague after another being knocked down by Nicholas, the remaining guards did not falter, continuing to use Moon Step to charge towards Nicholas. For them, the education they received from childhood was to protect Mary Geos and the Celestial Dragons, even at the cost of their lives. Bang, bang. As the guards approached Nicholas, they also opened fire to disrupt Nicholas, but without the Haushiku Haki-infused bullets, the damage inflicted on the natural element hockey user was not as great as that of fists. Seeing the brave Mary Geos guards getting closer and closer, Nicholas showed an expression of keen interest rather than retreat. Hey, you guys really aren't afraid of death, huh? With a light exclamation, Nicholas's body turned into a stream of light and appeared a hundred meters away. This dude, what the hell? Seeing that they had suffered heavy casualties, finally managed to close the distance, and then the opponent disappeared like this? This unreasonable operation stunned all the Mary Geos guards and CP members who had come to deal with Nicholas. Under countless gazes, Nicholas landed lightly on the periphery of a building that looked like a church. It seems like you guys are really fearless. 
Nicholas turned his head to look at the terrified celestial dragon inside the building, his eyes squinting slightly. Before his words fell, Nicholas swung his hand, sending a lightning dragon towards the celestial dragon. And just then, a bald old man wielding a demonic sword almost instantly appeared in front of the building where Nicholas and the celestial dragon were. Then, he swung his sword backhand, slashing a strike that split the ferocious lightning dragon into two. As the energy of the lightning dragon dissipated, it stirred up gusts of wind. Inside the building, the celestial dragon, who witnessed everything, seemed to suddenly wake up and collapsed to the ground in terror. Outside the building, Nicholas looked towards the direction of Pangaea Castle. He felt a gaze coming from there. Along with that gaze, there was an unprecedented oppressive feeling. It was a terrifying oppressive feeling that surpassed the concept of life itself. It was even like the fear of encountering a tiger in the wilderness, which was engraved in the depths of one's genes. Of course, it doesn't include certain people who can kill tigers with a swipe, after all, if you can kill a tiger with a swipe, you are no longer human. Chapter 237 Nicholas felt a slight tremor in his heart. The oppressive feeling created solely by a single gaze was terrifying. Even when facing Whitebeard and Roger, Nicholas didn't experience this kind of sensation. Could it be? A solemn expression appeared on Nicholas's face. No wonder Roger had the idea of using his life to usher in the age of pirates. This terrifying power, could it really be possessed by a human? Although Nicholas had some speculation about the strength of those at the pinnacle of the world, facing it directly made him realize just how powerful it truly was. Originally, Nicholas thought Roger had succumbed to fate. But now, it seemed that Roger must have learned about the power of Joy Boy left behind on Laugh Tale, and indirectly understood the terror of the person standing at the pinnacle of the world. Otherwise, with the strength of Roger's pirate crew, they could have easily sought out valuable devil fruits or treasures to cure Roger's illness. In the profound and clear perception of the owner of that gaze, Nicholas's thoughts stirred, and his body swiftly moved. As he moved, Nicholas waved his hand, sending lightning bolts towards the surrounding buildings. Nicholas didn't even glance at the five elders in their white robes. This kind of destruction, the purpose was to create chaos. Because in Nicholas's perception, along with the gaze's attention, several powerful auras were also converging towards their location from different directions in Mary Geos. The white-robed elder with a bald head frowned as he watched Nicholas's actions. Before stopping Nicholas, the white-robed elder bowed slightly towards the direction where the gaze had come from earlier, showing respect. Nicholas wantonly destroyed the buildings within Mary Geos while simultaneously preparing for his escape. In creating chaos, he also made preparations for his retreat. Feeling the killing intent from all around, Nicholas sensed the whereabouts of June and the others. Did they manage to escape successfully? Even smoother than expected. Nicholas couldn't help but smile at the thought. At a time like this, you dare to laugh. The guards exclaimed, feeling like they had been slapped in the face by Nicholas's smile. Their eyes became even colder. Only by shedding this guy's blood could they wash away their shame. I hope you'll like the gift I'm sending you, Nicholas said, as a colorful spore flew past him. The white-robed elder's eyes narrowed. Hmm. As soon as he spoke, a sudden change occurred. The guards surrounding Nicholas began to rapidly change their skin colors to purple, black, green, and red. Some of them even developed ulcers that burst open, splattering foul-smelling toxins onto those nearby, setting off a chain reaction. At the same time, a flower bloomed quietly on the white-robed elder's arm. Sensing the anomaly, the elder immediately cut off the flesh from his arm with a knife and quickly retreated. Nicholas, standing there, disappeared into thin air after a thunderous roar. The sudden turn of events caught many off guard. Did he escape? Just then, several figures landed beside the white-robed elder. They looked towards the source of the commotion and then at the chaotic scene. One of them opened his arms, compressing the air in front of him. Soon, all the guards and spores in the area vanished without a trace. The other locations in Mary Geos should also have been infected. Send out cleanup teams and seal off the information, one of the newcomers ordered. 
have the cipher poll department investigate why the attack on Mary Geos happened suddenly. And have the Marines and cipher poll closely monitor Nicholas's movements. Report immediately if there's any news. After a brief discussion, a series of orders were swiftly issued. Suddenly, a whistle sounded from the sky, and several elders instinctively looked up. Then, a patch of yellow mixed with green, and green mixed with white, accurately landed among them. Looking at the droppings on the ground, several elders who had practiced Qigong arts couldn't help but darken their faces. High in the sky, aboard the Sea Sovereign, Nicholas appeared at the edge of the ship with a roar of thunder. On the deck, everyone smiled at the sight of Nicholas's figure. And lying on the deck was Saint Samafeld, but at this moment, Saint Samafeld no longer had his usual arrogance. After all, these guys actually dared to attack Mary Geos, they might really kill him without hesitation. Just now, Nicholas had used the imprint left on the ship to activate Rygene, allowing him to teleport to the Sea Sovereign's deck in an instant. With Nicholas safely back, the operation against the Celestial Dragons came to an end. Captain, what should we do with this guy? Simon asked, looking at Saint Samafeld lying on the deck, curious, and also looking at Vista, who was wiping his axe on the side. No rush, let's lock him up in the ship's prison for now. Nicholas smiled at Simon before lowering his head to gaze through the clouds at the red soil continent below. Mary Geos was now in complete chaos, with no spare energy to pursue Nicholas and his crew, so Nicholas quickly withdrew his gaze. Is it beneath you to take action? And I can't sense the captain's aura, is he dead? Or has he been imprisoned in a more secretive place? Thinking about the oppressive feeling from the gaze he felt in Mary Geos, Nicholas muttered to himself. In the dead of night. Within the World Economic News mobile newspaper, a sudden howling cry echoed out, startling the employees who had just fallen asleep after working overtime to finish their articles. Plap. Many of the newspaper's staff, who had just fallen asleep due to exhaustion from overtime, were startled awake by the sudden howling cry from Morgans. By the time everyone gathered in the office, they found their editor-in-chief in a state of frenzy, with scattered files and office supplies strewn all over the floor. At this moment, Morgans, who had lost his composure, was lying on the ground, wailing loudly. Chief, what's wrong? One employee couldn't help but ask curiously. After all, today they had received first-hand explosive news. As long as it was published tomorrow, their newspaper's reputation would surely skyrocket again. But Morgans seemed a bit unhappy, didn't he? Hearing the employee's question, Morgans became excited, his face turning red. This is a big news. Those bastards actually won't let us publish it. We should have burned them all alive in Mary Geos. Hearing Morgans's words, many employees came to their senses and began to ponder. It involved the Holy Land and the Celestial Dragons. For Morgans, who was always fearless in publishing news, it was inevitable to consider the consequences. Originally, they had decided to publish the news the next day, but who knew that the world government would intervene? If they didn't want to lose their foothold in this sea in the future, suppressing the news was the best choice. But if they didn't publish it, wouldn't there be regrets in life? But if they did publish it, life might end soon. After thinking for a moment, Morgans made a decisive decision and shouted loudly, Everyone, prepare to rewrite the articles. Publish the news as planned, but don't mention Nicholas. Just say that Mary Geos has been hit by a plague and fire, resulting in heavy casualties. Many employees brightened up at the sight. The next day. A groundbreaking newspaper flew to all corners of the world under the delivery of news birds. Chapter 238 At noon, high above the clear sky, the sea sovereign was sailing towards the east blue. Nicholas sat at the table, unable to help but smile as he looked at the newspaper spread out on the table. This Morgan's guy. On the front page of the newspaper, instead of the photos taken by flame paparazzi with Nicholas as the main focus, there were images of the devastation caused by the fire in Mary Geos. Along with photos of the huge mushroom clouds blossoming over Mary Geos, interspersed with expressions of panic from the celestial dragons, and photos of the holy guards rushing to the scene along with CP0. The content vividly described the tragedy that had occurred in Mary Geos, creating a vivid depiction of the event. 
Although there was no mention of the invaders, the newspaper strongly implied that Mary Geos had been invaded. For those unaware, their first reaction upon seeing the newspaper would be that Mary Geos had indeed been invaded. Even rumors began to spread along with the newspaper, describing scenes as if they had witnessed Nicholas invading Mary Geos and kidnapping celestial dragons. World Economic News Agency, huh? Nicholas Gaze slowly scanned the various reports in the newspaper, and an image of a humanoid albatross flashed through his mind. Not bad, quite a bold fellow. Nicholas muttered softly to himself. To dare to put such news on the front page, Morgans truly possessed extraordinary courage. One must know that once they angered the world government, it would be a disaster for the World Economic News Agency. The attack on Mary Geos, which shocked the entire world, swept through the world like a hurricane. And Nicholas, who played an important role in it, once again resonated throughout the world with his name. On an island serving as a temporary resting place for the Revolutionary Army and others. At this point, their foundation had not yet stabilized, and they did not have a fixed stronghold. Describing them as citizens of the world would be an exaggeration. Morley, why don't your giants overthrow the world government since you're so powerful? As Lindbergh adjusted the instruments in front of him, he asked the giant companion beside him. I don't know, when is Dragon returning, though? Morley supported his chin with both hands, looking into the distance as if waiting for something. Dragon has things to attend to, but it shouldn't be long. Dressed in a helmet shaped like a bear, smoking a pipe, and with a beard all over his face, a man who looked like a bear muttered while studying the sea chart in his hand. Hey, Terry, don't you find it boring to look at those things all day? Morley asked curiously, looking at his companion who was meticulously marking the sea chart. Not at all, you know, intelligence is crucial for us. If there's a problem with the intelligence, it's a huge disaster for us. And combining maps with intelligence can provide us with a lot of information that will be very helpful for our revolutionary army's next move. After marking the final location on the map, Terry Giltio looked up and smiled at his giant companion, and at that moment, he also noticed the news birds flying in groups in the sky. Standing up, he took out a berry from his pocket and waved it. Soon, a news bird broke away from the flock and flew towards the direction of the Revolutionary Army. After stuffing the berry into the news bird's designated pocket, Terry took the newspaper from the news bird's mouth. Something big has happened. After opening the newspaper, Terry Giltio's face changed drastically, and then he exclaimed in astonishment. The others were surprised by Terry's strange reaction, and quickly gathered around to look at the content of the newspaper in Terry's hands. Ha! Huh. After reading the headlines, Lindbergh's eyes widened, and an expression of disbelief appeared on his face. Someone dared to attack Mary Geos, and not only did they retreat unscathed, but they also kidnapped celestial dragons. Inazuma, who had been enjoying wine on the side, was suddenly shocked, and immediately leaned in to look at the newspaper in Terry's hands. Ten seconds later, Morley's sharp voice echoed throughout the island, startling a flock of birds. So strong, really strong. Morley stared at the burning Mary Geos in the photo, murmuring with an extremely admiring tone. The Revolutionary Army, despite its development to this point, was still relatively weak compared to the world government, the Marines, and the Celestial Dragons. Their revolution was not child's play they faced the world government, the Marines, and the ruling world nobles, the Celestial Dragons. So even though they might have thought about attacking Mary Geos and targeting the Celestial Dragons, it was just wishful thinking. After all, their cause was not something that could be accomplished overnight. They were more focused on quietly accumulating strength and patiently waiting for an opportunity. And not like Nicholas, who directly launched a shocking attack on the Holy Land. What was even more astonishing was that Nicholas managed to retreat unscathed. Do we need to contact Nicholas? Inazuma muttered to herself, and this statement plunged Lindbergh, Terry, and others into deep thought. Obviously, if they had someone like Nicholas join them, the likelihood of their cause succeeding would undoubtedly increase, and they might even be able to change the world much sooner. No need, Nicholas wouldn't join us. Just then, a voice rang out from beside them, accompanied by a rush of wind, and Dragon's figure appeared. Dragon, you're back. Is everything going smoothly? 
Lindbergh couldn't help but ask as Dragon returned. Yeah, it went smoothly. Dragon nodded, then turned his gaze to the newspaper in Terry's hands. Looking at the burning Mary Geos, Dragon also fell into contemplation. Clearly, compared to the combined strength of the world government, the marines, and the celestial dragons, the revolutionary army was still somewhat weak. Fishman Island, Jim, who delayed his departure for a day due to the commotion in Mary Geos, was currently discussing the trip to Sabaity with Neptune in the throne room of the Ryugu Palace. Your Majesty Neptune, this time we brought back a total of 40 merfolk and 120 fishmen. We've sent people to cross-check with the registered missing persons. I'm sorry, but some merfolk and fishmen have been sent to Mary Geos and various other places and cannot be brought back temporarily. Jim sat cross-legged on the ground, reporting to Neptune. Very well, Jim. Bringing back so many compatriots is already commendable. Neptune said in a deep voice. It could be said that for the first time in many years, Fishman Island had rescued captured comrades, a significant step for Fishman Island. Your Majesty Neptune, according to my estimation, this attack on Mary Geos was most likely carried out by Nicholas. Therefore, we must remain vigilant on Fishman Island during this time to avoid retaliation from the world government. Don't worry, I've made arrangements. I never thought that the poison passed down in the Ryugu Palace would be used in this way. If it had been discovered earlier, perhaps Fishman Island wouldn't be in such a passive situation. Clearly, Neptune was confident, and he also reaffirmed his determination to follow Nicholas. Just a few words had almost multiplied the strength of Fishman Island by tens of times. Perhaps that guy Nicholas could really fulfill the promise and lead Fishman Island to the surface land. Chapter 239 Marine Headquarters, Admiral's Office Garp sat on the sofa in the reception area, his arms crossed, his expression serious. If you ignored the slowly growing snoring and the gradually increasing nasal bubbles, there was no doubt he exuded a commanding presence. Because of Garp's demeanor, even Kazan standing behind him felt somewhat awkward. On the other side of the sofa sat Suru, holding a cup of tea. Standing behind Suru was Isho, who had already earned his code name in the Marines. Similarly, standing behind Sengoku were Sakazuki and Borsalino, both of whom were pillars of the future Marines. This attack on Mary Geos and the kidnapping of celestial dragons have prompted the world government to demand an explanation from us Marines. What do you think, Sengoku? Suru glanced at the sleeping garp on the sofa and then turned his gaze to Sengoku. Explanation. What explanation? Sengoku sat on the sofa, his tone sharp. This whole thing was entirely the celestial dragons doing. They took action without consulting us marines, captured people, and then dumped them directly into impel down without any communication with us marines. Where does that leave us? Now that something has happened, they want an explanation from us marines. Are they out of their minds? It could be said that Sengoku's mood was quite bad. For the marines, every pirate on the open sea was a subject of close monitoring, as these individuals were essentially walking disasters, capable of causing massive destruction with just one slip-up. Originally, Nicholas didn't pose much of a threat to the marines, considering that he hadn't expanded his territory significantly over the years. Compared to the aggressively expanding Big Mom pirates in the Totaland Sea and Kaido's crew causing trouble everywhere with their tough and resilient members, the danger posed by Nicholas in the open sea was not on the same level. Yet, despite being such a peaceful individual, he was driven to act by the celestial dragons of Mary Geos. Sengoku, control your emotions. Suru placed her teacup on the table calmly and spoke softly. It seemed that even Sengoku, who was known for his Buddha-like wisdom and composure, was being driven to frustration by his teammates. You know as well, that guy Nicholas won't just stay quiet. This incident simply gave him a reason. Now, we need to think about how to deal with this situation. Sakazuki, Borsalino, Kazan, and Isho, do any of you have any good suggestions? Suru looked at the four of them, clearly indicating that they were being groomed as the future leaders of the Marines. Sakazuki's gaze was as cold as the wind, as he said in a low voice, we will not tolerate acts of evil. All right, I understand your point. 
Before Sakazuki could finish, Sengoku waved his hand to indicate that he understood. He was actually quite satisfied with Sakazuki he was a qualified soldier. However, he couldn't quite understand his somewhat eccentric personality, even though he claimed to have muscles in his brain. Sakazuki's implication was clear, what was there to discuss with pirates? Just take action and be done with it. But the problem was, aside from ensuring the safety of the celestial dragons, was Nicholas really that easy to deal with? Although the marines were currently stronger than ever, pirates were not to be trifled with, especially with the current whereabouts of the pirate king, G.O.L.D. Roger, unknown. He was a huge potential threat, and if the marines were to engage in a conflict with Nicholas, what if Roger suddenly appeared and rallied the pirates against them? That would be interesting indeed. Meanwhile, Garp, who was trimming his nails with a nail clipper, suddenly felt a gaze upon him. He stopped what he was doing and spoke up, I think what Suru-san said makes sense. With Garp's words, the atmosphere in the room instantly cooled. Sengoku's forehead even bulged with veins. Garp, did you even listen to anything? GRK. Just then, the office door was pushed open, breaking the awkward atmosphere. Sengoku sat behind the desk, his hands clasped under his chin, looking solemnly at the three CP0 members in front of him. Nicholas. That's Sun Nova. Sengoku tapped the documents on the table with his fingers, his eyes showing a hint of anger as he said, so this is the world government's command? Yes. If their faces weren't covered by masks, Sengoku would surely see the extremely unpleasant expressions on the faces of the three CP0 members. They didn't like dealing with the marines in the first place, and now this task had fallen to them. This is an order from the five elders. The safety of Samafeld must be ensured, said the lead CP0 member. Although they knew the marines wouldn't harm them, the oppressive atmosphere in this small office made them feel as if they were facing the five elders themselves. Those proud and arrogant CP0 members, for a moment, seemed to show a hint of humility. After all, Facing almost a room full of the top powerhouses on the open sea, it wasn't embarrassing to lower one's head. Rarely did they see CP0 being put in their place, and Sengoku couldn't help but feel unhappy. From the moment Nicholas kidnapped the celestial dragons, the initiative had firmly been in his hands. Upon hearing this, Sengoku sighed and picked up the Den Den Mushi that had been delivered from Impel Down. Without hesitation, he dialed the number on the Den Den Mushi. After a moment, the call connected. Where is Bidek? The Den Den Mushi, resembling a miniature version of Nicholas, relayed Nicholas's voice. As soon as Nicholas spoke, Sengoku immediately interrupted, his voice low, Do you think I called to hear you say that? Although the three CP0 members were flustered, Sengoku's reprimand was making them fear that Samafeld might be in real danger. With a stern expression, Sengoku looked down at the Den Den Mushi and said, what you've done undoubtedly amounts to declaring war against the world government. Do you really think you can stand up to the world government? After a moment of silence, Nicholas' voice came through the Den Den Mushi. I see. How terrifying. Do you think that by threatening me a little, I'll be scared? Honestly, if you scare me, I might do something irrational. With a voice that bore a resemblance to Nicholas, the Den Den Mushi spoke up again. Chapter 240. If it weren't for that stupid celestial dragon, the marines wouldn't be in such a passive position. When Nicholas attacked Mary Geos and captured the celestial dragon, the initiative immediately shifted. Now, Nicholas firmly held the initiative between the two sides. Of course, if the marines didn't have to consider the life and death of the celestial dragons, the so-called initiative would be a joke. But obviously, the marines couldn't ignore the lives of the celestial dragons. Once Nicholas set a bad precedent by attacking Mary Geos and capturing a celestial dragon, their lofty status would be seriously questioned. So, with Nicholas holding the initiative, he naturally wouldn't take the vague threats from the marines seriously. Enough with the small talk, let's get to the point. Without waiting for a response from the marine side, Nicholas continued, exchanged the celestial dragon for Bidek and also Bidek subordinates. I'll determine the location and time of the exchange, all right? Fine. Sengoku narrowed his eyes. One moment, he was thinking about how to pressure Nicholas, and the next moment, 
he agreed without hesitation to Nicholas's proposal. Honestly, under the circumstances where Nicholas held the celestial dragons as bargaining chips, Sengoku hadn't expected Nicholas's request to be so simple. He had thought Nicholas would take this opportunity to make exorbitant demands, openly extorting the Marines and the world government. But unexpectedly, Nicholas chose to exchange a celestial dragon for one of his subordinates, which was not considered important by various factions. After all, in this power-oriented world, there were plenty of people who could replace those without power. Perhaps the reason Nicholas didn't make outrageous demands was because he had already gained significant benefits, such as reputation. Attacking Mary Geos and capturing a celestial dragon, then using the celestial dragon to exchange for one of his subordinates once this news got out, it would bring Nicholas unprecedented prestige. Time. Location. As if worried that Nicholas might change his mind, Sengoku quickly asked. Two weeks from now, in the East Blue at the town of the Magic Valley. Admirals or higher-ranked officers, don't bother coming in person, or I might get the wrong idea. All right, but don't play any tricks, Nicholas. Shouldn't I be the one saying that? What kind of people are the world government and you Marines? Don't you know yourselves? Also, if you can contact the CP department, have them take one billion berries from Samafeld's wealth and bring it to me when the time comes. Nicholas, you. Don't be so angry. If you damage my business, it's only fair to compensate me, right? One billion berries is already a reasonable price. Click. Nicholas hung up the Den Den Mushi without waiting for a response. Sengoku took a deep breath, his expression dark. He slowly put down the Den Den Mushi and looked at the three CP0 members standing in the office, coldly saying, did you hear Nicholas's request just now? Resolve the matter of the one billion berries yourselves. The three CP0 members could only nod silently after hearing Sengoku's words. Marine Science Division Laboratory. Caesar entered the lab with his usual smirk. Hey, Vegapunk, I just got some news from the Marines. Wanna know what it is? Caesar walked into Vegapunk's busy laboratory, looking at Vegapunk, who was working at the workbench, and grinned mischievously. Upon hearing Caesar's words, Vegapunk didn't stop his work, but asked without turning around, what news? Seeing Vegapunk seemingly unaffected, as if asking about a trivial matter, Caesar felt a bit crestfallen. Humph, I'm not telling you. Caesar snorted arrogantly, clearly displeased with Vegapunk's attitude. Caesar, did you know? I suddenly thought about researching poison weapons and some of your idiotic research lately. Mary Geos was attacked, a celestial dragon was kidnapped by Nicholas. I thought I still had an experiment to finish, so I left first. After saying this, Caesar left the laboratory without looking back, obviously intimidated by Vegapunk's words. Is that so? What a pity. I was thinking about studying you recently. After all, a gas man of the natural type should be very valuable for research. Vegapunk sounded regretful, and just as Caesar stepped out of the lab, his body froze, then he hurriedly quickened his pace. He decided not to leave the lab for a while. After all, with Vegapunk's research abilities, if he were to research poisons in other fields, he would probably achieve results quickly. When that happened, if Vegapunk applied to research him, the world government would definitely agree without hesitation. So, for the sake of his own life, it was better not to wander around Vegapunk. On board the marine flagship. Nicholas sat in a chair, with a Den Den Mushi in front of him that he had just closed his eyes. Vista stood quietly behind Nicholas, just like in the beginning. Captain, are you really going to return that guy to the marines? Unable to hold back anymore, Vista spoke up. Vista. You've known me for more than just a day. Huh? Vista looked at Nicholas's profile, puzzled. Nicholas turned his head, meeting Vista's questioning gaze with a smile. I said I would return the celestial dragon to them, but I never promised what would happen after that. Seeing Vista still somewhat puzzled, Nicholas continued, Vista, don't worry. I'm a man of integrity. How could I do such a thing? He'll die naturally, of course. Nicholas propped his cheek with his hand, speaking earnestly. Captain, do you intend to kill him after returning the Celestial Dragon to the Marines? 
wouldn't that be inappropriate? No, I'm very trustworthy. Why would I do such a thing? He'll die of natural causes, naturally. Nicholas's eyes were deep and calm. For trash like the celestial dragons, if there were no need to consider the consequences, what did it matter if they were killed? But, won't the Marines and the world government take precautions after the incident in Mary Geos? Vista expressed his doubts. After all, June's ability to spread the plague in Mary Geos would surely make the other side vigilant. Don't worry, June's ability isn't so easy to crack. Even if the Marines have a clear understanding of her ability, they will only take preventive measures against possible tampering. The main thing is, they won't expect us to actually kill the Celestial Dragon. At the mention of killing the Celestial Dragon, Vista's eyes lit up. Nicholas's gaze was deep and calm. For trash like the Celestial Dragons, if there were no need to consider the consequences, what did it matter if they were killed? So before that, let's go see what secrets our friend is hiding. Nicholas turned his head, looking in the direction of the cell block. Chapter 241 Nicholas and Vista quickly arrived at the cell located within the ship's cabin. Inside the cell, Samafeld was curled up in the corner, while Brooke sat on a chair outside the cell, responsible for guarding. Captain, you're here. Seeing Nicholas's arrival, Brooke stood up and spoke. Nicholas nodded and glanced at the celestial dragon in the cell, then gave Vista a look. Vista immediately stepped forward to open the cell door, dragging Samafeld out like a little chick. Brooke, come along. Let's see what secrets this celestial dragon has. Nicholas said to Brooke, and soon the three of them brought the celestial dragon to June's research room. What are you guys planning? Samafeld, bound to the operating table, panicked at the sight of Nicholas and the others. He looked around at the various strange things in the room and couldn't help but think of a secret base of a mad celestial dragon he once visited in Mary Geos and the slaves he researched there. Thinking of the plight of those slaves, Samafeld struggled even more fiercely. Let me go, I can give you anything you want. Money, wealth, women, whatever you want, I can give it to you. But all his efforts were in vain. Soon, Brooke voluntarily drew the curtains, blocking out the sunlight streaming in through the window. The room suddenly became dim. The shadowless lamp lit up, blinding Samafeld's eyes as he lay under it. Then Vista took a canister of gas from June and pressed it against Samafeld's face. With the inhalation of the gas, Samafeld's struggles gradually subsided, and he eventually lay motionless. Nicholas leaned against the wall next to the door, arms folded, curiously watching June. As for whether Nicholas and the others would disrupt the sterile environment here, June's ability was not just for show. Brooke, at some point, had changed into a white lab coat and stood beside June, looking like an assistant. After a while, with Brooke's manipulation, the thick protective suit on Samafeld's body was removed. Interesting protective suit. Brooke couldn't help but comment on the suit, which contained high-tech purification capabilities. The claim that celestial dragons breathe the different air as ordinary people might not be just talk. Captain, come take a look. Soon everyone's attention was drawn to the scene before them, because attached to Samafeld's heart was a crystal-like chip. Carefully removing it, Nicholas revealed a pensive expression. Perhaps this was the celestial dragon's identity chip, but it remained to be seen if it had any other uses besides proving the celestial dragon's identity. Soon, Samafeld, anesthetized, underwent his first dissection. Nicholas watched curiously from the side as Samafeld's chest cavity was opened, revealing his beating heart. June, Brooke, and the others also approached to observe the internal structure closely. If anyone else saw this scene, they would probably think they had encountered some mad scientist. Hmm, this looks completely identical to a normal person's body. Vista couldn't help scratching his head. In his opinion, since celestial dragons were so high and mighty, there must be some differences from ordinary people. But the fact that their bodies were identical to those of ordinary people was puzzling. Strictly speaking, it's not completely identical to a normal person. You see here and here, indicating that his organs are much stronger than an average person's. If trained systematically, he would definitely surpass most ordinary people in achievements. June supplemented from the side. Half an hour later. 
All right, that's enough. Let's leave a little gift for our friend. Nicholas raised his index finger, and a bolt of lightning extended from his fingertip, condensing into a small thunder bead beside Samafeld's heart. June, stitch him up. Nicholas said, and at the same time, the closed window was reopened. The bright sunlight flooded into the room, illuminating Samafeld. The gaze of everyone in the room followed the light source, focusing on Samafeld. Wake him up. Brooke took another canister of gas from June and sprayed it on Samafeld's face. A few seconds later, Samafeld slowly opened his eyes. The pain from awakening surged through Samafeld's body. It was so intense that veins popped out on his forehead and temples, and his eyes, filled with visible blood vessels, widened in agony. June had means to alleviate the pain, but it wasn't necessary. It hurt so much, it hurt so much. Just as Samafeld woke up, he felt excruciating pain in his chest, unable to help but scream in agony. Save me. I'm in so much pain. Someone, please help me. Samafeld cried out in misery, his nose and mouth uncontrollably oozing snot and saliva, looking extremely pathetic. Nicholas played with the identity chip in his hand, watching Samafeld's miserable state with an expressionless face. The pain Samafeld was experiencing now was probably less than 1% of the pain inflicted on ordinary people they arbitrarily bullied and killed. Vista, June, and Brooke silently watched Samafeld's frantic writhing and screaming, devoid of any sympathy. In this world, perhaps there were innocent celestial dragons, but Samafeld was definitely not one of them. After a while, Samafeld fainted from the intense pain. Having lived a pampered life in Mary Geos, his pain tolerance was pathetic. All right, throw him back into the cell. Also, June, give him some medication, don't let this guy die. After all, he's our bargaining chip. June nodded slightly, indicating that she understood. In the captain's room, Nicholas sat with his feet up on the table, playing with the identity chip. Clearly, the manufacturing technology of this identity chip far surpassed the current era. It's really an interesting thing. I wonder if that guy, Vegapunk, can decipher the secrets within it. Nicholas pinched the identity chip between his thumb and index finger, curiously saying. In Nicholas's room later that night. Nicholas held a report in his hand, while June spoke in a tone of disbelief. Throughout history, celestial dragons have always claimed to be descendants of the creators. Initially, Combining your statement, Nicholas, I thought that celestial dragons might have fabricated their origins to conceal their true identities. But through studying Samafeld's data, I discovered that certain aspects of celestial dragon genetics differ from those of ordinary people, so I conducted further research on them. And then? And then I found that celestial dragon genes, which claim to be descendants of the creators, have been edited in some way. Hmm. Are you saying they really are descendants of the creators? Nicholas was somewhat surprised he hadn't expected June to discover something like this. That statement isn't entirely accurate. Because through my comparison, celestial dragon genes have been optimized and modified based on human genes. That's why we found that Samafeld's body organs are different from those of ordinary people during the dissection. You could even say that, with systematic training, Celestial dragons have every qualification to become powerful individuals. Isn't it ridiculous? Those bunch of useless guys actually have more qualifications to become powerful individuals than countless ordinary people. As June explained, her expression remained strange. A look of astonishment flashed in Nicholas's eyes as he pondered with his chin in hand, slowly digesting this hidden secret information. Chapter 242 Two weeks later, at Jaya Town by the East Sea. On the seaside of Jaya Town, there stands a solitary half-house, where a middle-aged man is currently seated cross-legged. He is wearing a wetsuit, with a makeshift diving apparatus placed nearby. The ground beneath him is damp, indicating he has just emerged from the sea. The man sits quietly, gazing at the ocean, his thoughts a mystery. Not far from him, a teenager is engaged in physical training, lifting a log. His breathing is heavy. With a thud, the teenager drops the log and lies back on the grass, breathing heavily. Cricket, have you finished your physical training for today? The middle-aged man asks, turning to look at the teenager. 
Yes, father, Cricket replies. The teenager seems to have rested enough and sits down beside his father. Father, is it true that our ancestor was the great Noland? And is there truly a golden town, on par with the emerald capital? The teenager asks, somewhat bewildered. Since their ancestor was executed by the king and left with the nickname of Nolan the Liar, their ancestor moved from their homeland to here, attempting to find the golden town mentioned by their ancestor. It is true. Our ancestor, Diary has proven everything. Except for the golden town at the end, everything recorded in the ancestor, Diary is real. If our ancestor hadn't reached the golden town, how could there be such detailed descriptions? The middle-aged man replies firmly. Wow, I didn't expect there to be people here. It will soon become very dangerous here. You should go to the town for shelter, a voice suddenly speaks up. Who are you? Whoever you are, leave quickly. The middle-aged man and Cricket both looked alertly at Nicholas and Samifold whom Nicholas is dragging along with a rope. This appearance would make anyone think that Nicholas is some kind of dangerous criminal. Nicholas doesn't seem to care about the middle-aged man's verbal threat. You don't look too good. You only have about two years left to live, right? Is it because of long-term diving that your body has problems? Nicholas asks, keenly observing the man's condition. With Nicholas's opening, the atmosphere suddenly becomes quiet. The teenager, who was standing guard beside the middle-aged man, looks at his father with disbelief. Father, is what he said true? Cricket asks, his tone filled with urgency. Looking at his son, the middle-aged man remains silent. But this almost amounts to confirming Nicholas's words. Why didn't you tell me? We could have gone to find a doctor to cure you, Cricket's voice is filled with panic, almost on the verge of tears. Cricket, have you forgotten what I taught you? A man should not easily shed tears. The middle-aged man smiles, ruffling Cricket's hair, resigned to his impending death. Do you dive to find the lost golden town? Nicholas asks, observing the deep bond between father and son. Don't joke around. Where in this world is there such a thing as the golden town? The so-called golden town is nothing but a fantasy. The middle-aged man replies, his voice heavy. A fantasy? Nicholas smiled, coming to the side of the middle-aged man. But, the golden town does exist. It's not a fantasy at all. With just a simple sentence, the middle-aged man and Cricket are both shaken. Nicholas's words undoubtedly affirm the existence of the golden town they and their ancestor have been seeking for so many years, even suggesting that their ancestor was not the so-called great liar who deceived the world. Don't joke. The middle-aged man's voice trembled as he spoke, feeling that this was perhaps the closest he had come to proving that their ancestor was not the king of tall tales who deceived the world. Father, the golden village is real. This gentleman also said so, the golden village truly exists. Our ancestor didn't lie. Cricket exclaimed excitedly, recalling how every day since he could remember, he had seen his father diving into the deep sea in search of the golden village. Though they had salvaged some gold over the years, it was nothing compared to what their ancestor had recorded about the golden village. Shut up. The middle-aged man abruptly turned around, roaring angrily. What golden village? It's just a false story concocted by the king of tall tales, Noland. He yelled hysterically, but his eyes were red as he stared at Nicholas, as if waiting for a response. At that moment, thunder rumbled, and fierce winds whipped up on the sea, emitting a mournful howl. Noland didn't lie. The golden village is real, and the reason you haven't found it all these years is because you were going in the wrong direction. The wrong direction. The middle-aged man murmured to himself, then suddenly looked up at the densely clouded sky. You're not completely foolish after all. Yes, the golden village didn't sink to the bottom of the sea but was swept into the white sea by an unprecedented upwelling current. And Roger recently visited Jaya, so Nolan didn't deceive anyone. Thank you. After a moment of silence, the middle-aged man spoke, then grabbed Cricket and left. Now that they had an answer, their next step was to attempt to reach the White Sea and see if the golden village their ancestor spoke of truly existed there. After both father and son left, Nicholas sat quietly on the log, waiting for the arrival of the navy. 
Dark clouds covered the sky, but the sea remained remarkably calm, showing no sign of a storm. Two warships broke through the waves and slowly approached the coastline of the island, under Nicholas's watchful gaze. Nicholas narrowed his eyes as he looked at the bow of the warships and saw two familiar figures, Yukimura and Isho. Nicholas could understand Fire Yukimura's presence, but the appearance of Isho was somewhat surprising. After all, according to the conditions Nicholas had set, the navy could only send a rear admiral at most. While Yukimura's strength was top tier among rear admirals, he was still just a rear admiral. Isho, on the other hand, was a bona fide vice admiral. Nicholas scanned the decks of the warships carefully, using his observation hockey to thoroughly examine them. After confirming that there were no abnormalities inside, he retracted his hockey. Chapter 243 On the Warship The Navy looked up at the thick dark clouds overhead, with a hint of fear in their eyes, as lightning continued to dart through the clouds. Clearly, through naval intelligence, they were aware of how formidable Nicholas could be under such conditions. If the Logia were considered moving disasters, then when unleashed in their home environment, they were akin to gods. Yukimura's sword reflected flashes of lightning, and even though he typically wore a smile, his face now bore an unprecedented seriousness. Such weather is indeed troublesome. Despite voicing his concern, Yukimura gestured for his subordinates to start moving. A gangway was lowered onto the shore by the navy. Bring out the people and the money. Isho and Yukimura were the first to descend the gangway, instructing their subordinates to bring out Bidek and others, as well as the billion berries. Yes. The navy acted swiftly, and within seconds, they brought out Bidek and the others, who were shackled. Yukimura's nerves tensed slightly as he looked at the mountainous black clouds in the sky. Taking a deep breath, he then looked up, his gaze passing over the hundreds of meters to a figure standing with their back turned. Isho and Yukimura proceeded while other Navy members, armed cautiously, escorted the weary-looking Bidek and his crew, following closely behind. Before long, Isho and Yukimura reached Nicholas. Both of them looked at the celestial dragon lying at Nicholas's feet, resembling a dead dog, and their expressions changed involuntarily. Truly an audacious pirate. Yukimura observed the filthy and disheveled celestial dragon, who seemed worse off than Bidek, unable to refrain from commenting. Although Yukimura felt a certain satisfaction seeing the celestial dragon in such a pitiful state, he didn't show it outwardly. After all, everyone knew how abnormal the mental state of these celestial dragons could be. If they held a grudge, it could be quite troublesome. Oh, you navy folks aren't following the rules, are you? Nicholas greeted the two old acquaintances standing tens of meters away casually. Yukimura flashed a smile, appearing innocent. Mr. Nicholas, please don't misunderstand. I am indeed a rear admiral of the Marine Headquarters at the moment. Understanding what Nicholas meant, Isho explained, then took out a document and tossed it to Nicholas, who fell silent upon seeing Isho's information and his rank as rear admiral. Impressive, this move was truly extraordinary. Bringing Isho, a vice admiral, as a rear admiral was a crazy move. It gave the Navy some confidence in facing Nicholas while avoiding provoking him unnecessarily. Lord Nicholas. Bidek and his group, looking weary, perked up instantly upon seeing Nicholas, their faces filled with joy. After being captured and sent to impel down, Bidek had given up hope on his life. After all, few prisoners ever left impel down alive. But unexpectedly, after enduring imprisonment in impel down for only a couple of days, Bidek and his crew were taken out of the cells and kept in a separate room, with better food akin to what the guards had. Though they were still not free, compared to other prisoners in Impel Down, their conditions were almost like heaven. Only when they were escorted onto the Navy warship did Bidek realize that his boss had come to rescue them. Surviving the ordeal made Bidek and his crew sob uncontrollably. Seeing Bidek crying, Nicholas asked, Are you alright? Sob, Lord Nicholas, do I look okay to you? Look at my face and body, covered in wounds. We were thrown into impel down, where our skin peeled off layers. Sob. Seeing Nicholas, Bidek couldn't help but pour out his grievances. Nicholas, your people and money are here. How do you want to proceed with the exchange? 
Yukimura paid no mind to Bidek's tears. After all, every pirate sent to impel down had to undergo a baptism there. Those who survived would either languish in prison or perish. He looked at Nicholas and asked. Your things. Nicholas kicked the celestial dragon on the ground toward Isho and Yukimura. Referring to the celestial dragon as things and kicking him like trash caused Yukimura's expression to change again, while the navy behind him felt their hearts skip a beat. In contrast, Isho seemed oblivious to the scene unfolding before him. Yukimura gestured to his men behind him, and two navy doctors immediately approached, examining the battered celestial dragon. After a quick inspection, they hesitated when it came to mentioning the state of his body. Sensing something amiss, Yukimura approached and saw the Y-shaped wound on the celestial dragon's chest, looking somewhat bewildered as he glanced at Isho. As long as he's alive. At that moment, Isho, who had been silent, spoke up. Yukimura signaled for his men to bring Bidek and his crew forward. Out of caution, the navy did not remove the shackles and chains from Bidek and his crew but instead brought them before Nicholas. Nicholas calmly used his observation hockey to scan Bidek and his crew from head to toe, confirming that the navy hadn't tampered with them. Nicholas looked at Isho and Yukimura calmly. All right, you may leave now. Isho didn't speak but gestured, indicating for Yukimura and his crew to take the celestial dragon back to the warship while he stayed behind for a moment. Not showing any particular reaction to this, Nicholas quietly watched as Yukimura and his crew escorted the celestial dragon onto the warship. Then, he turned his gaze to Isho. Long time no see, Isho. Long time no see, Mr. Nicholas. Bidek. Seeing the two acting like old friends who hadn't seen each other for a while, Bidek was utterly bewildered. Then, Bidek glanced deeply at Nicholas. He had already found it incredible that Nicholas could exchange him from the Navy's hands using a celestial dragon, but now, he was astounded to learn that Nicholas was acquainted with a high-ranking officer like Isho. After all, the Navy officer before him wasn't just any rear admiral but one known as Fujitora, a prominent vice-admiral. For such a high-ranking Navy officer to be familiar with Nicholas was terrifying to think about. Realizing what the two had to discuss, Bidek and his men left, giving them space. How do you feel being in the Navy? Nicholas asked casually, as if chatting with a friend. Not bad. In the Navy, I've seen many aspects of truth, goodness, and beauty, as well as the opposite. Both have been beneficial to me. Isho responded seriously, expressing how his perspective had significantly improved since joining the Navy and participating in the North Blue Sweep under Tsuru, along with the intelligence he gained from the Navy. After a few more brief exchanges, they got to the point. Fleet Admiral Sengoku hopes to have a conversation with you. Upon hearing Isho's words, Nicholas was momentarily stunned, then frowned. It was unclear to him why Sengoku would want to speak with him. It's of a private nature. Understanding the implications, Nicholas nodded, curious about what Sengoku wanted. Soon, Isho took out two den den mushi, one large and one small. The large one was a regular communication den den mushi, but the small one caught Nicholas's interest because it was an anti eavesdropping den den mushi. If everything went as expected, Sengoku should have a similar anti eavesdropping den den mushi on his end. Beep, beep. As the den den mushi connected, its form changed into a likeness of Sengoku's face. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Isho. Sengoku's voice came through the Den Den Mushi. I'm Nicholas. Chapter 244 Half an hour later, Isho slowly climbed aboard the warship, tapping the ground with his staff as he did so. The mission is over, everyone return. After boarding, and once the gangway was secured, Isho issued the order. With the command given, the warship quickly turned and set sail towards the direction of the open sea. Let me go, let me go. Do you know who I am? I'm telling you, if you dare to stop me, when we return to Mary Geos, I'll have you all killed. At that moment, a noisy voice reached Isho's ears, causing him to furrow his brow. The longer he served in the navy, the stronger his aversion to celestial dragons became. Soon enough, using his status as a celestial dragon, Samafeld rushed towards Isho and Yukimura, standing tall in front of them. 
Looking up at the two much taller figures, Samafeld arrogantly commanded, I order you two to go and kill Nicholas for me. Clearly feeling empowered aboard the warship, Samafeld spoke brazenly. Yukimura could only scratch his head in exasperation and glanced at Isho. He wasn't stupid. Having spent time with the three natural disasters from headquarters, he knew just how terrifying Nicholas was. Did they want him to go kill Nicholas because they thought he had too much time on his hands? Sir, we are still in danger. For someone like Nicholas, this distance is nothing he could cross it in an instant. Moreover, in weather like this, Nicholas's strength could increase dramatically. If we anger him, everyone on this ship might end up fish food. Seemingly to echo Yukimura's words, thunder rumbled in the sky, causing Samafeld to involuntarily shrink his neck. Meanwhile, Nicholas looked on at the departing warship, lost in thought. He hadn't expected Sengoku to have his own plans as well. Things were getting more interesting indeed. Boom! The deafening thunder resounded, and lightning streaked across the sky, illuminating the faces of father and son, filled with astonishment. Seeing the unease and incredulity on the man's face, as well as the excitement on the face of the young man, Nicholas was silent, seemingly able to fulfill their wishes. You say you want to go to the Sky Island? Nicholas asked in confusion. The young man nodded heavily, looking at the gathering clouds on the horizon as if behind them lay the most beautiful thing imaginable. Sir, although this request is sudden, we hope you can help us. We are willing to pay all the wealth we have accumulated over the years. The man said solemnly, emptying the bag by his feet. Soon, a small mountain of gold appeared at his feet. Having heard Nicholas's words, the man was convinced, having pored over Roland's diary entries about Skypea and the specific time frames. Afterwards, they reviewed records about this sea area from both their local area and the surrounding islands, finally discovering that shortly after Roland left Skypea, a huge upwelling current appeared in this sea area. That upwelling current was created by the clash between the sea and the Earth's forces. If the upwelling current was powerful enough, it could send Skypea soaring to 10,000 meters in the sky. So, based on the information they had gathered, the man was convinced of Nicholas's words. Perhaps their ancestor, the great Noland, could finally be vindicated by them. However, while they knew where Skypea might be, the question of how to get there was a new problem. With all their hopes now pinned on Nicholas, the two fell into a short silence, the sea breeze causing their robes to flutter. This gold should be enough for your ship fare. Nicholas said, looking at the gold on the ground. After all, he also had to go to Skypea, so bringing these two descendants of Noland along shouldn't be a problem, and maybe they could help a lot. Ten minutes later, when the man and his son were wondering how to reach 10,000 meters high, a huge ship broke through the clouds and slowly descended from the sky. Seeing this scene, both the father and Cricket, were stunned. Don't just stand there, get on board. After saying this, Nicholas walked towards the sea sovereign ship, and the others followed suit. Accompanied by the rumble of thunder, the sea sovereign soon broke through the white sea, the ocean entirely composed of white clouds. However, this wasn't their destination. Looking at the sky, Nicholas pondered silently. In the blink of an eye, the sea sovereign passed through the white sea and reached the surface of the white sea. It's really amazing. Watching the various creatures leaping from the white sea, almost everyone leaned over the ship's railings. It was likely that many of them had never imagined that above their heads, there was another ocean. People with wings on their backs we are definitely on Sky Island. Standing at the bow of the ship, looking at the people of Skypea, Nicholas smiled. Ignoring the panic on Sky Island caused by the sudden appearance of the huge ship, Nicholas turned his gaze towards the distance, where there were dense green forests, flying birds, and a towering vine in the center of the forest. That's the other half of Jaya Island. With a glint in his eye, Nicholas smiled. Chapter 245 As the ship approached, the outline of Sky Island could already be seen. Is that Skypea? June stood at the bow of the ship, gazing at the island almost entirely composed of clouds. Nicholas approached June's side, looking ahead at the island. Nicholas was quite interested in Skypea or rather, its inhabitants. After all, the origins of these people might be quite remarkable. The natives of the moon, huh? 
having already seen the Lunarians before, now being able to see the natives of Skypea could provide valuable information if he was lucky. As Nicholas pondered, he suddenly heard a burst of sobbing behind him. Turning around, he saw Cricket and his father huddled together, crying. Hey, isn't this a bit much? It's just Skypea, isn't it? Is it really worth getting so emotional over? Bidek couldn't help but speak up, watching the exaggerated father and son duo on the deck. Unlike Cricket and his father, who seemed inexperienced, Bidek, being one of the underground giants of the Sabaeidi archipelago, might not have been to Skypea personally, but he knew enough about it. So, he couldn't understand why these two were so excited to see Skypea. How could you possibly understand, knowing nothing about it, to clear the stigma of the great liar Noland, which is our ancestor Noland's title, means a lot to our entire family. Cricket retorted, unable to contain his emotions. For him, the education he received from childhood was to use all his strength to find Shandora and clear Nolan's name, restoring the glory of the Montblanc family. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Calm down, calm down, Bedeck replied quickly, not wanting to discuss Cricket's obsession. So, he promptly changed the subject. Nicholas, seemingly oblivious to the commotion behind him, simply instructed Vista to steer the Sea Sovereign toward Sky Island. Wait a minute, Nicholas. At that moment, June suddenly called out to Nicholas. What's wrong, June? Nicholas looked at June curiously, waiting for her answer. I sense a strong presence of disease deep within that island, June said with a furrowed brow. Do you mean there's a plague on that island ahead? Nicholas asked surprised. He couldn't see any signs of a plague on the island, given the panic caused by their arrival, but he trusted June's words unconditionally. June nodded, saying, yes, although I don't know why the disease is so active and hasn't spread yet, if it's not dealt with properly, the entire island will succumb and become a dead zone. Hmm. Nicholas rubbed his chin, curious. Can't your devil fruit powers solve this? June remained calm, saying, of course it can. Nicholas was momentarily speechless. So, as long as they found that source, the problem wouldn't be a problem. Three minutes later, the Sea Sovereign docked at a beach on Sky Island. Vista remained on the ship to watch over it, while the others climbed the ladder onto Sky Island. After landing on the island, the group headed straight for a tavern. Boss, bring out your finest wine. Upon entering, Bedeck immediately placed an order. Mr. Bedeck, I can't drink alcohol as a skeleton. Just a glass of milk will do for me, Brooke reminded quietly from the side. Mr. Brooke, I apologize for my oversight, Bedeck quickly replied, eager to curry favor with Brooke, who was one of Nicholas's crew members and thus, someone he needed to butter up. The tavern owner, seeing Bedeck slap down a wad of berries on the table, looked at him with an expression of utter disbelief. Sir, we only accept extols here. Bidek and Brooke couldn't help but exclaim in surprise. Clearly, they had no idea what extols was, but encountering a tavern that didn't accept berries was a first for them. Boss, what about this? Nicholas took a bag from one of Bidek's subordinates and tossed it to the tavern owner. Seeing the bag on the counter, which was the size of a human head, the owner first, glanced casually, then opened it, and upon seeing its contents, his eyes widened in shock. What is this? This is. The tavern owner asked incredulously. Over fifty billion-year-old soil from the Jaya, commemorating its significance and having considerable collectible value, Nicholas said seriously. Then, to the astonishment of Bedeck and Cricket's father and son, the tavern owner carefully picked up a bit of soil with his index finger and tasted it. Pure and of high quality. Using these to pay for drinks is more than enough. The tavern owner carefully put the soil in a safe and gave Nicholas the most sincere smile. Soon, Nicholas and his companions were enjoying the local wine of Sky Island. Hey, Captain, are you sure you gave that guy a bag of random soil? Simon asked, drinking at the counter and looking at the tavern owner, who was smiling like a chrysanthemum. He couldn't understand. What does it matter? Rarity determines value don't you understand? Just like the special products from Sky Island and various other things that can be sold for a high price in Jaya, 
soil from Jaya that's not very valuable there is just as valuable as extols here on Sky Island, Nicholas explained nonchalantly. He had to admit that while Sky Island might not be as rich in resources as Jaya, its wine was quite unique. And Katie had already arranged to purchase a large quantity of Sky Island wine using two large crates of soil and a seedling of an orange tree. Are you guys coming directly from Jaya? Because of the soil, the tavern owner was exceptionally enthusiastic. Boss, how did you know? Brooke asked curiously. Ha ha ha, what kind of fortune telling would that be? If you had come through the normal channels, you would have passed through several sky islands before coming here. It's impossible not to know what extols is, a common currency in the White Sea, the tavern owner explained with a smile. Just as the group was chatting, they heard a commotion outside. Soon, about a hundred people had gathered outside the tavern. Listen up, people inside. We are the guardians of Skypea. You are surrounded. Surrender and you won't be harmed. I repeat, surrender and you won't be harmed. The people outside wielded weapons and gathered in groups, their expressions and words full of excitement, as if fearing that Nicholas and the others would resort to violence. Wow, why are there so many guardians of Skypea today? Did another group of pirates from Jaya come to Skypea? Simon asked, curious. Behind the crowd. A burly man with a golden earring and a large red prayer bead necklace, dressed in monk's attire and sporting a pair of wings on his back, curiously watched the tavern surrounded by the guardians of Skypea. Chapter 246 In the face of the threat from the god's guard, Nicholas was completely unconcerned. After all, with his current strength, there was simply no one on the entire Sky Island who could threaten him. Whether it was the youthful god of the Sky Island, Don Fall, or the chieftain of the Sandia tribe, they were not his opponents. Even without him taking action, Katie could easily deal with them. At this moment, the commotion outside also caught Nicholas's attention, and at the same time, he noticed June frowning as she looked outside, apparently puzzled by something she had noticed. Faintly, words like monster and undead could be heard coming from outside. For Nicholas. The world of pirates is vast, with millions of islands. However, the Red Land Continent and the Grand Line are separated by the Calm Belt, and the Grand Line is enveloped by it. This leads to the bizarre situation in this world, the stark contrast between the ancient islands and the technological islands. Strictly speaking, the root cause of this difference lies partly in the inconvenience of transportation and partly in the existence of the Red Land Continent and the Calm Belt. And the difference between the White Sea and the Blue Sea is even greater. Although transportation is inconvenient in the Four Seas, there is still some communication between them. But there is almost no communication between the White Sea and the Blue Sea except for the occasional people from the Blue Sea who mistakenly enter the White Sea. I am the friend of your Sky Island God, Don Fall. Is this how you treat your guests? Nicholas said without a hint of embarrassment. If he didn't plan to use the Sky Island as another base of his own, Nicholas wouldn't bother with this hassle, he could solve the problem with just his fists. Upon hearing Nicholas's words, the people outside were suddenly stunned, as if digesting what Nicholas had just said. Soon, a burly man separated from the crowd outside and walked into the tavern. As soon as he entered the tavern, he said to the owner, Boss, the usual. As a qualified human trafficker, Nicholas recognized the man's identity at the first glance of his distinctive attire. The guy who walked into the tavern was none other than Urich, one of the supernovas many years later, and at the same time, a monk who surpassed the others in age. Why don't you stay in the depths of the island and come out? Aren't you afraid of being caught and barbecued by those guys? You should know that Lord Gonfall won't be able to save you every time. The boss brought out a large barrel of wine while speaking to Urich. Oh, just ran out of wine again. Urich opened the wine barrel and started drinking heartily. After drinking his fill, he put the wine barrel on the counter and wiped his mouth with his hand, saying with a smile. Here, this is cloud pig meat. I know you've been craving this. But Urich, you can't keep going on like this. Why don't you tell those guys the truth? The tavern owner said with some confusion. No need, thanks, boss. 
Yurij smiled and then noticed the curious gazes from Nicholas and the others, turning his head to look. Oh ho! Quite interesting. Brooke suddenly burst into laughter as he looked at Yurij. Nicholas looked at the monk sitting there. His gaze swept over the exposed skin of the monk, revealing a hint of green. Infected? Nicholas, what I sensed earlier was this guy. It can be said that he's a moving source of infection. Moving source of infection? Yes, although I don't know why he can keep the virus inside his body, there's no doubt he's infected. All right. Incubation period is five to seven days. Early symptoms include fever, body aches, and the appearance of leaf-like colors on the skin. If not suppressed, the incubation period will lead to an outbreak within three days after the incubation period, and there will be almost no way to cure it. This is called the tree fever disease. June said to Nicholas. Clack. As Eurich, who was about to leave with the wine barrel, staggered and fell forward, seemingly due to fatigue in his legs. After a few breaths, Eurich propped himself up with his hand and continued to walk out of the tavern. Looks like it's time for the outbreak. What I can confirm is that if this person isn't treated, he can only live for two more days at most. As June's words fell, Eurich took a few steps forward again, but stumbled and fell to the ground once more. This time, he didn't get up. The people looked at each other in astonishment. Could this guy really just die like this? Guests, you don't need to worry about it. He'll be fine after a while. It's an old problem of his. If you come into contact with him rashly, you'll die if you get infected with this disease. Seemingly seeing the confusion of Nicholas and the others, the tavern owner said casually, apparently accustomed to such situations. And as the monk fell, the guards and onlookers who had been surrounding the tavern seemed to have seen the most terrifying thing and fled in all directions. Nicholas took a few steps forward and came to Eurich's side, squatting down to look at the seemingly unconscious Eurich with an interested expression. Could it be that even in a near unconscious state, he can still maintain his abilities with strong willpower? June, treat him first. Okay, but I need a quiet room. June looked at Eurich on the ground and said calmly. For her, a plague that others would avoid at all costs was just a little trouble. Upon hearing June's words, Nicholas looked at the tavern owner. If you don't mind, I have a quiet room in the back for you. The tavern owner looked at Eurich on the ground and said, apparently having heard June's words. Captain, let me carry him. Seeing Brooke's indifferent attitude towards the infectious disease, Nicholas agreed. As a captain, it wasn't appropriate for him to do such things, and June, being immune, couldn't do it either. So, having someone with decent strength like Brooke was necessary to be on hand in case the guy woke up and caused trouble. Soon, Brooke carried Eurich's bulky body into the room behind the tavern, where June began to treat him. Meanwhile, as June treated Eurich, a melancholic neighing of horses was heard from outside the tavern, followed by a strong man in medieval knight armor pushing open the tavern door and walking in. I heard my friend is here. The Sky Island God, Don Fall, fixed his gaze on Nicholas and said in a deep voice. Chapter 247 As the Skypea God entered, others also held spears in their hands, with jet devices under their feet, scattered behind Gon Fall, faintly surrounding Nicholas and the others. As long as Nicholas and the others dared to move a bit, they would immediately face the thunderous attacks of the God Guards. Are you Gon Fall? Nicholas asked curiously, looking at the muscular man in front of him whose arms seemed capable of running horses, completely different from the skinny old man over twenty years later. My lord, didn't you say you're a friend of mine? How come you don't even know me? Gon Fall looked at Nicholas and said in a deep voice. He hadn't turned against Nicholas and the others yet because he had heard reports from his subordinates. Facing the Verth people, who had arrived on Skypea and scathed, Gon Fall couldn't help but feel a great deal of apprehension. To have an entire ship arrive safely on Skypea was not something that could be accomplished solely with great strength. Seeing the people in front of him, Gon Fall somehow thought of the group he had seen two years ago, the terrifying ones who dared to rush into the White Sea riding monster currents from the Verth Sea. Initially, the guards of Skypea under his leadership had friction with them, but considering the terrifying strength of those people and the crew on the ship, even Gon Fall still felt apprehensive. 
If those people hadn't been looking for some historical text and weren't dangerous elements, the Skypea might have been destroyed long ago. I am friends with Roger, and since you are a friend of Roger's, then we are friends too, right? Nicholas said calmly, without any embarrassment. Hearing Nicholas mention Roger's name, Don Fall also let go of his suspended heart. Since the other party was a friend of Roger's, it meant there was room for communication with them. At the same time, Don Fall was also grateful that Roger's crew had struck a heavy blow to the arrogance of the Skypea guards last time. Otherwise, given the personalities of these people, they would probably have clashed with them long ago. Since you're a friend of Roger's, then you're a friend of our Skypea, Don Fall said, opening up their relationship as friends. By the way, are you here looking for historical texts too? Don Fall sat down familiarly beside Nicholas and the others, asking curiously while letting the bartender bring drinks. Haven't you seen the historical texts? After Roger and the others left, didn't you try to find them? Nicholas looked at Don Fall with some puzzlement. Roger and the others should have informed Don Fall of their intentions after the friendly exchange. So after Roger's crew left Skypea, Don Fall should have tried to find the historical texts mentioned by Roger. But now, it seemed that Don Fall had never seen the historical texts. Hearing Nicholas's words, Don Fall's cheeks reddened. After Roger left, he did try to search Upper Yard for the items Roger's crew was searching for. However, he had encountered the Sky Master on his first trip to Upper Yard after Roger left, and had been chased around. Then, before he even set foot on Upper Yard, he was discovered by the Shandya people. After several conflicts, Don Fall gave up searching for the items Roger's crew was looking for. Even though they couldn't allow the Shandya people to occupy Upper Yard, the Shandya people couldn't tolerate them occupying Upper Yard either. And soon, Nicholas probably guessed that it was because of the Shandya people's obstruction that Don Fall had failed to find the historical texts. To Nicholas, the conflict between the Skypea people and the Shandya people was completely unreasonable. Upper Yard had been pushed onto Skypea by an unprecedented upward current, but anyone with a brain could understand that such a huge island being pushed into the sky would have caused a sensation. Even in Nicholas's eyes, the indigenous people of Skypea were invaders to the Shandya people. Initially, the Skypea people had caught the Shandya people off guard with their special weapons such as impact shells and shell strikes. But with the existence of the great warrior Calgara, the Skypea people couldn't gain much advantage. But after the death of the great warrior Calgara, the Skypea people gradually drove the Shandya people out of Upper Yard. However, in the days that followed, the Shandya people, who had gradually mastered various shellfish, became evenly matched with the indigenous people of Skypea. Neither side could do anything to the other, let alone completely occupy Upper Yard. It seems that your conflict with the Shandya people is quite intense. But trying to take over someone else's homeland and drive them out seems a bit unkind, Nicholas raised his eyebrows and smiled, looking at Don Fall. Listening to Nicholas's words, Don Fall's eyes narrowed. It could be said that the conflict between the indigenous people of Skypea and the Shandya people had never been disclosed to outsiders. Even Roger and the others didn't know the historical conflicts between the two sides. Unexpectedly, the man in front of him could speak it out. What do you mean? Don Fall asked in a deep voice. If Nicholas and his crew were here just to find some historical texts in Upper Yard, Don Fall wouldn't mind offering some help. But if they had any intentions towards Upper Yard or were helping the Shandya people, then they would definitely show them some colors. Nicholas straightened up and said, no ulterior motive, just to help others fulfill the covenant between their ancestors. Also, we plan to see what the legendary Golden Bell looks like. If you're just here to fulfill the covenant, then we won't interfere. But as for the Golden Bell, you better not even think about it. Don Fall changed his attitude abruptly, speaking quite firmly. That Golden Bell, let alone its ownerless now, even back then, it was left by the ancestors of the Shandya people. It's none of your so-called Skypea gods' business to say anything about it, Nicholas said with a cold smile. The actions of the indigenous people of Skypea reminded him of the white necks who came to America in the past. The so-called Skypea god Don Fall appeared later in the story as an old man, but now he was in his prime, the strongest period of his life, speaking with confidence as the strongest person on Skypea. 
It seemed that as a god on Skypea, how could he be easy to speak to? It's probably because he experienced the truly invincible posture of Enel's descent into godhood that he gradually changed his personality and became that kind old man's appearance. Otherwise, as someone who understood the origins of Upper Yard, he wouldn't understand the relationship between the Shandya people and Upper Yard. Yet, even after understanding this relationship, he still chose to contest the ownership of Upper Yard. This can explain a lot of problems. Ha! Huh. As the atmosphere between the two sides became tense, the god guards drew their weapons and aimed them at Nicholas and his group, their eyes filled with tension and coldness. Gonfall also stared at them tightly, while Nicholas continued to drink his wine unconcernedly, and the atmosphere suddenly became tense. I advise you to have your men move their weapons away from our captain, otherwise. Gonfall widened his eyes, unable to believe that the man beside Nicholas, with a toothpick in his mouth and a gun in his hand, was pointing it at him. The fact that the Skypea god could be killed with just one shot was something Gonfall found hard to accept. This Skypea god seemed to be about to be killed by a single shot. Chapter 248 After Brooke threw Eurage onto the bed, June immediately walked to the bedside, lowering her head to look at the unconscious Eurage. Eurage's condition was obviously not good at this time. The greenish hue on his face was nearing a dangerous level, and his body was starting to turn a deep red. I'm going to start the surgery. Oh, Miss June, should I stay away? Brooke asked curiously, taking two steps back. Then, with a curious expression, he waited for June to begin the surgery. Watching Brooke's behavior, June felt speechless. Then June didn't start the surgery immediately but said helplessly, Brooke, I should have told you that I can control bacteria, and besides, you're just a skeleton, what are you afraid of? Oh, right, I'm a skeleton, nothing to fear, Brooke suddenly realized, then approached the bed again. Seeing Brooke's face almost touching Eurich's, June raised an eyebrow again but didn't say anything. Forget it. June sighed inwardly once again. With June's fingers lightly touching Eurich's head, a semispherical membrane unfolded, enveloping the unconscious Eurich. June raised her index finger, and an invisible force connected her with Eurich. Detachment With June's soft command, a green bridge appeared on Eurich's forehead where her finger touched. Under Brooke's astonished gaze, the green color on Eurich's body began to fade at a visible speed. This guy is really lucky. The virus didn't completely attack his heart. Otherwise, it would have been quite troublesome to deal with. June muttered to herself. Then, using her ability, she removed the virus residing in Eurich's body and guided it out, storing it in her index finger. As the virus was continuously extracted, Eurich's complexion improved, and June's index finger became lush green. At this point, her finger contained a large amount of virus. If June were to touch an ordinary person with her finger now, someone with a weak constitution would probably be in excruciating pain. After extracting most of the virus, June opened a small pouch she carried and took out a test tube, carefully injecting all the virus from her finger into the test tube. The whole surgery took only a few minutes, but it still left June slightly out of breath. After all, saving lives was much more difficult than mere killing. If June were to release bacteria, it would be a piece of cake, but removing the bacteria from a person's body was a delicate task. Due to the unique nature of the bacteria, it required constant combing within the body to minimize the chance of missing any, or else it would be treating the symptoms rather than the root cause. To reduce the bacteria to a level acceptable by the human body, June had to do a lot of unnecessary work, which consumed a lot of energy. But ultimately, June's physical strength couldn't keep up with the precision and nature of her ability. After the surgery, the effect was remarkable. Eurich, lying on the bed, slowly regained consciousness. Upon awakening, Eurich looked at June and Brooke with a dazed gaze. Then, he rubbed his groggy head with his hand. Both sides quietly stared at each other. After a moment, Eurich realized what had happened and spoke up. You saved me. Uh. You could say that. June didn't answer, but Brooke, standing beside her, replied. Thank you. Eurich smiled, acknowledging that although he could have managed on his own, it was only proper to thank someone who helped reduce his troubles. You must be a devil fruit user, right? 
June picked up the test tube from earlier, asking. Then she continued, although your body is very strong, it still has a normal structure, and the amount of bacteria extracted should be enough to kill a thousand people. Yurij was stunned for a moment, then smiled foolishly, my name is Yurij, indeed I am a devil fruit user. I can store so much bacteria in my body thanks to the power of the fruit. Stop. I'm not interested in that. Anyway, you should be almost healed now, so we'll be leaving. With that, June walked out, as for her, saving someone was just something she did in passing. The sky was cloudless, and the sea was calm. In the world government's exclusive port in the Red Soil Continent, three warships were ready to set sail. On the decks of the warships, world government personnel were working together to unload crates filled with supplies from the cargo hold. A man wearing a white robe and a mask with a scar across his face supervised his subordinates as they unloaded the supplies onto the deck. Sir, the cargo loading is complete, and everyone is in position. We can depart at any time. A man in a black suit with sunglasses approached the CP0 officer. Mm. CP0 nodded, then turned his gaze towards the direction of the captain's cabin. There, a figure in protective clothing with a hood was gritting his teeth, looking at the route map to Fishman Island. Samifold was acting strangely, having barely escaped with his life from Nicholas, he immediately returned to Mary Geos and ordered world government personnel to go to Fishman Island. And now, Samifold, looking at the route map before him, was filled with anger. It could be said that his greatest secret had not yet been discovered. He needed to go to Fishman Island and seize control before the Gorosei and those guys noticed. Because only by controlling Fishman Island could he negotiate with Nicholas. He didn't want to end up like that idiot homing, if he lost his status as a celestial dragon, what would be the difference between that and death? Samifold, everything is ready, we can depart any time. A man in a black suit entered the captain's cabin and reported earnestly. Good, tell the other two ships to depart immediately for Fishman Island. Samifold eagerly gave the order. Understood. With the order given, the three warships quickly coated themselves with a membrane and submerged beneath the sea. Soon, the three warships, now coated with a membrane, arrived thousands of meters below the surface of the sea. As they ventured deeper into the ocean, the light became dimmer. Oh no! Suddenly, a panicked voice came from the lookout tower. Samifold's face changed, and he instinctively looked towards the lookout tower. Soldiers responsible for reconnaissance emerged from the lookout tower, their faces filled with fear. Sir, large numbers of small sea kings have been spotted on both sides of the ship. Samifold and the many black suits on the deck had their expressions changed drastically. Encountering a large number of Sea King's attacks at such depths in the sea would be fatal. Chapter 249 When faced with a threat to life, the sky god Gonfall resolutely chose hospitality, much like how the invention of the Maxim machine gun made the nations that once roamed the Eurasian continent dance with joy. The other half of Jaya Island, now called the sacred domain of Upper Yard by the natives of Skypea, is surrounded by the White Sea. The change in environment seems to have invigorated the island even more. The tall trees on the island have become even taller due to the unique environment of the White White Sea. At this moment, under the watchful yet unwilling eyes of Gon Fall and the other Skypea guards, Nicholas and his group also set foot on this island. Simon leaped onto one of the large tree branches, observing the surroundings. Meanwhile, Cricket and his father, upon stepping onto this land for the first time, knelt down, tears streaming down their faces, holding the soil in their hands. Having fulfilled the regrets of their ancestors by stepping onto this island, their next task is to head to the golden village of Shandora to fulfill the final agreement between their ancestors and Shandora. Is this the origin of the tree fever? Yurij asked Brooke, astonished by the sight of Upper Yard in front of them, a type of island he had never seen before. Yes, tree fever almost destroyed the entire human population of Jaya Island back then. It was Nolan who discovered the cure for tree fever, Brooke replied. Yurij had been infected with tree fever when he arrived at Skypea, and Brooke accompanied him since then, knowing why Yurij had so many tree fever bacteria in his body. Skypea had lost many lives to tree fever before the cure was discovered. As they traveled through the jungle, 
Nicholas and his group arrived at an ancient ruin. The dilapidated buildings filled with history, vines covering the broken walls, all spoke of the ancient years this place had endured. The traces of time, though worn, conveyed a profound sense of history. In the empty old city, besides the occasional roar of beasts from the forest, the only sound was the footsteps of the group on the ground. It was quiet here, imbued with a strong sense of history. Nicholas wasn't an archaeologist he couldn't even pass O'Hara's exams but as he walked among these relics of history, he couldn't help but appreciate and learn from them, feeling the grandeur of the ancient Shandora. In this world, as in the earth of his previous life, ancient wonders and structures stood as testaments to the wisdom and style of their respective eras. The materials left behind by these bygone days still held a special charm, even after enduring the passage of time. To walk among these relics was like engaging in a dialogue with the past, witnessing the ingenuity of ancient people. This, perhaps, was the allure of archaeology. As they approached a towering vine, Nicholas headed towards it, wanting to see the golden bell atop the vine. Hiss. Suddenly, a massive snake head emerged from behind the vine, its cold eyes staring at them, warning them not to approach. Is this the Sky Lord? Nicholas exclaimed, feeling the awe of seeing such a giant creature. Hiss. Though the giant snake couldn't understand human language, its keen intuition could sense the threatening aura emanating from the group. I have brought the descendants of Nolan to fulfill the agreement with Calgara, Nicholas said directly, striking a chord in the giant snake's soul. Hiss. The giant snake hissed lowly, lowering its head slightly upon seeing Cricket's hairstyle, similar to that of Nolan. When faced with such a monstrous beast up close, Cricket himself knew the fear and anxiety better than anyone else. SS. Seemingly acknowledging their identity, the giant snake slithered over the ancient city and disappeared into the forest. Before the group could recover from the shock of encountering the giant snake and its sudden departure, a dark figure flashed through the jungle. A sharp black light flashed, aimed directly at Nicholas's neck. CHK. The sharp sound of a blade piercing his neck echoed, and the blade lodged into the opposite wall. Direct hit. That guy. From the jungle, a crisp exclamation of excitement rang out, followed by a hasty silence, as if they had hidden again in the forest. As Nicholas turned to look at the direction where the voice came from, electric currents shimmered on his neck, dissipating after a few breaths. Turning his head to the wall, he saw a bone-made dagger embedded in it. Ugh. A voice came from the jungle, then abruptly stopped, as if someone had covered their mouth. How is this possible? That guy clearly, clearly got hit by my dagger in the neck. Exclaimed the woman behind the tree. I know. I saw it too. Said another companion with a grim expression. They had encountered unexpected trouble with the events that had just transpired on Nicholas's body. They wanted to leave immediately and bring the news back to their tribe, as only the great chief could confront such adversaries. Let's go. Let's go now, before they notice us. Hurry back to the tribe and inform them. Perhaps only the great chief can deal with these people. A man wearing a cloud wolf hat said, taking a deep breath, and then addressing his companions. He was surrounded by three men and one woman, the standard configuration of their team. Apparently realizing the seriousness of what had just happened to Nicholas, they wanted to leave immediately and bring the news back to their tribe. But just as they turned to leave, a figure appeared. Miss, can you show me your panties? Came an unexpected voice, as a skeletal figure emerged from behind a tree. Seeing the talking skeleton, the shocked group stood there with their mouths agape, as if they had witnessed the most shocking event of the year. What is this? exclaimed the female with a shrill voice, breaking the tranquility of the forest and startling a flock of birds. Even the Sky Lord, still crawling, couldn't help but shudder as if he had heard something terrifying. Chapter 250 The air was filled with a terrifying atmosphere as the skeleton walked upright, wielding weapon and emanating a dangerous aura, as if an invisible hand had clenched the hearts of those present. What shocked the five individuals even more was that that was clearly a skeleton that had long decayed, yet it was moving even emitting sounds just like humans. Encountering such a scene for the first time, they were truly unable to comprehend. With a crackle of electricity, 
Nicholas quickly materialized above, surrounded by lightning, looking down at the five below. Why did you ambush me? He asked coldly, observing the sweat dripping from the foreheads of the five. W what are you? The woman asked in fear. This man had clearly been the one she had pierced through the neck with her dagger earlier, but now he showed no signs of injury. Attack! Suddenly, the leader wearing a hat adorned with a wolf emblem shouted. Behind him, three figures, with dark skin and dressed in animal skins, also reacted, swiftly pulling out shells from their pockets and launching them towards Nicholas. Boom! Hiss! Hiss! With three distinct sounds, the shells landing in front of Nicholas erupted into dazzling flashes and huge smoke clouds, enveloping the group and obscuring their movements. At the same time, several rushing sounds came from within the smoke, indicating that the assailants intended to take advantage of the cover to escape. Offending me, and you think you can escape so easily? You! The woman exclaimed in shock, watching Nicholas reappear before her eyes. In the haze, seeing Nicholas suddenly appear again, the group didn't hesitate to brandish their weapons. In an instant, a spear pierced Nicholas's chest, and a long knife slashed across his body. Looking down at the sparks coursing through his body in the weapons, Nicholas's expression turned grim. These people seemed to have lived isolated lives on their sky island for too long their perception and skills were lacking. Very impolite. Since that's the case, then you can all quiet down for a while. With his words, electricity crackled around Nicholas as thunder roared, shaking the air. In an instant, the woman couldn't even see his movements clearly her four companions beside her were sent flying by the force, breaking branches and crashing to the ground, motionless. You're too strong. This guy is too dangerous. I must find a way to send word back. In the smoke, amidst the chaos, the woman resolved to send a message. Sorry for my rudeness, we thought you were from the temple, the woman said, her voice filled with regret. You, you are something else, she continued, staring at Nicholas in awe. This guy was supposed to be the one I stabbed earlier, but he doesn't seem injured at all now, she thought to herself. If you're not from the temple, what are you? She finally asked Nicholas. I should ask you who you are, attacking me without reason, Nicholas replied coldly. Meanwhile, a commotion could be heard from the ground nearby, cries and shouts indicating that the four warriors under Bachelor's command were still struggling. We are from the Shandya tribe. Aren't you from the temple? The woman suddenly realized, looking at Nicholas inquisitively. Quickly, she noticed something even more surprising. You don't even have wings. I'm not from the Sky Island, so naturally, I don't have wings, Nicholas replied. The woman bit her lip, feeling embarrassed and ashamed. I'm sorry, we thought you were from the temple, so we attacked you, she apologized. If it weren't for my strength, I would have died in that sneak attack just now. What's the point of apologizing to a dead person? Nicholas said coldly. The woman, named Lorna, felt a suffocating sensation as Nicholas's hand tightened around her neck, pressing her against a thick branch. She began to feel faint. Too strong. This guy is too dangerous. I have to find a way to send a message back. Lorna thought desperately. From Nicholas's sudden appearance to their attack, not even five seconds had passed. This mysterious man had effortlessly dealt with Bachelor and three elite warriors, and now he had easily subdued her. Even facing him, Lorna couldn't land a hit or cause any effective damage. It seemed that in terms of strength, speed, or the mysterious lightning, this sudden stranger surpassed their imagination. In Lorna's mind, this young man was even stronger than the Sky Island's deity, Gonfall. After all, their team wouldn't have lost so decisively to Gonfall. Seems like 400 years away from Jaya made the Shandya people forget how to treat guests, Nicholas said coldly. Ice ran through Lorna's veins as Nicholas's words reached her ears. She felt the pressure on her neck loosen slightly. You. Are you from Verth? Nicholas nodded. Yes, I am from Verth. You. Lorna exclaimed, looking at Nicholas in disbelief. You're a Verth person. Nicholas nodded again. Yes, I am from Verth. You. 
Lorna's jaw dropped, realizing how different their thought processes were. Don't worry about it. I'm not interested in your life. Keep it for yourself. By the way, are you Shandya people? Wasn't the Golden City Shandora once the territory of your ancestors? As Nicholas spoke, Lorna's eyes lit up with recognition at the mention of the name she had only heard among the elders. The Golden City. Lorna exclaimed. Yes, Shandora was once the territory of our ancestors. Even the so-called Holy Land of Upper Yard, claimed by the people of the Sky Island, was the territory of our Shandya people. Lorna's eyes filled with shame and anger. After all, their ancestors had lost their territory to the shameless people of the Sky Island after the great warrior Calgara passed away. They were driven out and forced to live in a small village, which was a disgrace to their ancestors. I have a favor to ask of you. If you help me, I'll forgive your earlier transgression. What favor? Take me to see your tribe leader, Nicholas said calmly. What for? Lorna hesitated. Taking this powerful stranger to see their tribe leader meant bringing him to their settlement. If anything went wrong, they couldn't afford the consequences. Don't worry, I mean no harm. Take me to your tribe leader. Besides, with my strength, finding your Shandya people's settlement isn't difficult. It just takes a bit of time. Nicholas turned his head, smiling at another direction.